Chapter 1. Survivors and Starflies The world ended on April 1st, and a year lost to us. Great Grandpa Axe Memoriam starts the story the same way every time, but the children's faces are as rapt as always. They're not yet old enough for proper names, but in my head I've already decided who they'll be. Little Stone, busy sucking his thumb, brown eyes wide in excitement, he's a builder. He's always the first to the snap together bricks, and once he figured out they weren't edible, all he wants to do is make miniature copies of everything he sees in the village. The greater lights obliterated the lesser lights, and a furious roar was heard from all parts of the world. I mount the words along with Great Grandpa. I memorized the tale of beginnings almost before I could walk, but it never hurts to practice, especially with how old Great Grandpa is getting. Little Flower, peeking out over the hem of her dress, she's definitely a breeder. Every day she gathers her doll family, making sure the other children know what each stuffed cloth figure did while they were away from the memory shrine, and she's already mastered the stitching lessons Mrs. Needlecrafter teaches the young ones. A violent red wind scorched the skies, followed by an inrushing of turbulent clouds. The stars hid their faces in sorrow, and bitter tears wrapped the earth in frost. Speaking of crafters, Little Hammer is definitely a member of that clan. No surprise, considering both her parents bring their work home with them despite repeated injunctions from great-grandpa about the dangers of obsession. To me, it seems more like a compulsion, the same way I can't help but devour everything related to the old world. They can't help but take things apart so they can put them back together even better. Crafters and builders tend to intermarry frequently, and I idly try to picture hammer and stone together as adults. Beneath the icy lament, we tended our trees, as we have always done. In return, the trees tended us, our bounty exchanged for theirs in the perpetual cycle. Though many were lost, on both sides, many more endured. It's only through a supreme effort of will that I keep myself from giggling. Hammer and stone together would be a disaster. I've had to break up their fights so often I've lost count, each time because stone builds something, and then hammer tears it apart trying to make it better. No, hammer would be much better off with. I skin the room, then stifle a sigh. Without breaking great-grandpa's cadence, I quietly march over to where Little Bottle is industriously picking his nose in the back row while reaching for one of the carving knives hanging from the wall. I smack his fingers away firmly, giving him a meaningful eye shift towards great-grandpa, and though his face scrunches up, he doesn't cry. He still keeps picking his nose. Bottle is definitely an idiot. After countless generations of toil and sacrifice, the heavens opened up to us once more and the stars resumed their kindly gaze. The soil warmed, the creatures returned, and the water ran pure. No longer did the choking breaths take our children. No longer did the lashing winds fell our groves. I returned quietly to my seat next to Great Grandpa Axe. Every generation is required to have one member join the idiot clan, and Bottle is without a doubt the next inductee. He'll make a good idiot, too, the way he always questions why things are the way they are. I thought the first time he placed his hands on a hot stove after repeated warnings would have been enough or the day he decided to lick the electricity machine, but he's an idiot through and through. Whenever I ask great-grandpa why we need the idiots, though, he always smiles and looks at me as if he's looking somewhere else. Yet despite our newfound prosperity, we would have perished many times over if not for the wisdom of book idiot, first of her clan, for more dangers than we knew filled the lands outside our own. And there it is, the reason great-grandpa always gives me when I ask why we need the idiots. Tradition kept us alive, but it was the idiots who let us thrive. For every idiot who ate a melting rock, and then obviously melted, another one found a way to use the melting rocks for endlessly boiling water, or rearranged the verses of St. Penicillin or St. Gunpowder to create an even more effective result, or did something equally stupid that somehow managed to work. Great Grandpa says the idiot clan is one of the most difficult jobs we have, which is why it's the only one beside Breeder that has a mandatory minimum for each generation, but to me it looks like a bunch of, well, fools. I'd much rather not gather a series of scars touching stoves. Dying and being fed to the trees is something I've planned for far later in life. When we see a glow beast in the dark? Great Grandpa Axe asks, beginning the call and response portion of the tale of beginnings. It is already too late, the children chant back in harmony, unless our bodies are covered with lead. When we draw our water from the river? We take it to the cistern of St. Curie, whose blessing purifies us all. When we harvest a tree, whether for fuel or for craft, we plant another with a body to last. And when we gaze at the sky, crystal and pure, Great Grandpa Axe delivers the final line with his customary smile, 
what few teeth he has remaining poking out from his spotted gums. The children, as always, shout their response, and I shout it with them. We thank all the stars for gracing our world. Laughing and chattering, the children scamper out of the main meeting hall of the memory shrine, their afternoon lessons finished. Great Grandpa Axe watches them go wistfully, then turns his attention to me, shifting slightly amidst the many blankets draping his cushioned chair. Ah, Sky, I still remember when you looked like them. So young, all of you still so young. He shivers, and I walk over to the heating key, turning it another revolution. Warm air gusts through the small vents lining the walls of the meeting hall, courtesy of whichever idiot figured out the melting rock trick. And though the broad room is almost stiflingly hot, Great Grandpa still clutches his blankets tighter. Thank you, Sky. I swear, he chuckles ruefully, it's like I'm living in the beginning. Can't seem to get warm, no matter how many layers I put on. He notices the bead of sweat trickling down my forehead, and one of his liver-spotted hands emerges from the downy cocoon. And now I'm making you uncomfortable. He shoes me towards the exit in a weakly flapping gesture. Go on. Enjoy what's left of the afternoon. We can go over your memoriam lessons later tonight. Or maybe tomorrow. Are you sure, great-grandpa? Absolutely, he replies. You're only young once, after all. I leave the meeting hall, but not without several backwards glances. In each of them, great-grandpa is huddled in on himself, nodding encouragingly when he notices my attention his frail form so different from the giant of a man I remember from my earliest years. There had to be a point where he changed, but rack my thoughts as I may, I cannot recollect when it happened. Growing old sucks. My ruminations on the ephemerality of life are cut short when I exit the memory shrine and hear Rifle Baker's cheerful voice from across the central village square. She's standing with a group of other teenagers in front of the communal dining shelter. Sky, we thought you'd never leave that stuffy old place. We're all going to the watching hill for sunset. You're coming, right? Of course I am. Rifle, I call back, picking up my pace. Just let me grab some food first. Already taken care of, a sandy-haired boy next to her smiles, holding up a wax paper-wrapped oblong. One of Rifle's dad's best sandwiches. They roasted the glow beast meat this morning. You two are the best, Dor. I grab the sandwich from him in eager anticipation and hold it to my nose. MMMM. Yup. Fresh roast glow beast is amazing. That's what best friends do, rifle chirps, motioning us to join the small crowd moving up the dirt street towards a distant slope. Door falls in alongside her, his hand clasping hers, my own fingers busy tearing away the still warm sandwiches covering. They make sure each other gets fed, even when some of them, she rolls her eyes theatrically at me, spend all day buried in dusty books and boring lectures. They're not, MMMPH, boring lectures. I shoot back around a mouthful of roast glow beast, pickled sweet peppers, and freshly baked bread. And I clean the books every day. Doesn't it make you curious about how the world used to be? Before everything ended. I've got enough to worry about memorizing all these baking instructions, Rifle replies, turning a circle as she walks, twirling Dor's hand over her head. If I mess up a batch of loaves, we don't eat that day. That's more than enough to keep me busy. I take another bite, then turn my head. What about you, Dor? He shrugs, our steps taking us higher along the well-trod path. Rifles, right? Sky. Going through the purification steps is almost too much for me as it is, and I've barely scratched the surface of being a water. I guess that's what makes you a natural memoriam, though. You like remembering the past. I don't see why anyone wouldn't, I mutter, then turn my attention back to the sandwich. It would be a shame not to appreciate one of Oven Baker's creations. No one roasts a globies like Rifles' dad. Several bites later and I'm done, stomach quite satisfied. I carefully fold the wax paper and place it in one of my pockets. There's still at least a week's worth of use left on it with careful washing. The rest of our trek up watching hill passes quickly, rifle and door quizzing me about my day, me doing the same back at them, all three of us laughing over silly jokes and the latest gossip. All around us, other groups of chattering teenagers do the same, most holding hands with each other. Some, like me, just along for the company. Finally, we reach the summit, a carefully leveled field big enough to hold almost the entire settlement, all 400 of us. Scattered trees with broad, spreading branches shade wooden tables in the early evening light, and the first group to arrive moves forward to light the fire it. It only takes them a moment with flint and steel from their outdoor packs, and soon the crackle and hiss of starter tinder fills the air. Solemnly, our isolated groups merge into a collective mass and we all gather in a line to add our own contribution to the burgeoning blaze. 
I take a second after I toss in the fallen branch I'd collected earlier that day to offer a quick remembrance for my parents. Wherever and whatever they might be now, hopefully they're still able to see my own efforts at keeping the light of humanity alive. My outdoor pack feels heavy on my back. Great Grandpa says it belonged to them, and it was the only thing he was able to recover. Hungry globies don't leave much behind. After I finish my brief devotion, I make room for the next person in line, a lanky, raven-haired boy with thin, pale scars dotting the right side of his light brown face. He nods at me. Sky. Wires. I respond curtly. May your ancestors witness your light. And you, yours, he responds formally, tossing his own stick on the growing fire. I turn my back on him and leave him to his remembrances, looking around to rejoin my friends. While I don't actively dislike wires, I also don't feel like getting caught up in any of the nonsense that tends to trail his way. It's not his fault he's an idiot, but he's complicated, and I don't like idiot-level complications now that I'm a mature and responsible memoriam. Sometimes it feels too much like I understand why they do it. However, as I search the gloaming shadows of the hilltop, I can't help but notice my best friends have abandoned me for the relative solitude of the tree-shrouded tables. They've been doing that more frequently as of late, finding ways to be together while forgetting to include me, and while I don't begrudge them their happiness, it kind of sucks being the odd one out. Got ditched, a quiet voice next to me asks. I look over at wires, then run a hand through my hair. Yeah. They're around here somewhere, but, well, you know. I do, Wires responds drilly, a hint of humor entering his tone. When you're an idiot, everyone can't wait to be someone you used to know. I wince at the words, even though he doesn't deliver them harshly. We did used to hang out together back when we were little ones, not quite inseparable, but definitely more than like-minded. Maybe that's why I'm reluctant to be around him these days. He reminds me of how close I was to being picked as the idiot, and not a memoriam. You know, my uncle always thought you were going to end up chosen as the idiot, he says, as if reading my mind. I ignore him, walking over to an empty patch of grass so I can watch the stars come out, but I don't tell him to leave. Emboldened, he follows and sits down next to me, shrugging off his own outdoor pack. Especially after the time you snuck into St. Gunpowder's workshop. It took so long for your eyebrows to grow back. Yeah, but I would have never had the idea if someone, I give him a look, hadn't taken apart that globish trap. He laughs, long and easy, arms looped around his shins. I wanted to see how it worked. I was planning on being a crafter, remember? Crafters respect warning labels. And memoriams respect hazard signs. I was trying to see if something I learned from the memory shrine was actually true, I mutter. How was I supposed to know there was another part one hadn't read yet? At least your eyebrows grew back. Wires replies genially, raising a hand to rub his scarred-appled cheek. The gesture looks automatic, like he doesn't even think about doing it. But then my attention is drawn to the night sky overhead. I point, suddenly excited. This is why I let door and rifle drag me along to their nightly trysts. Look. A starfly. He follows the line of my finger towards a specific twinkling dot amidst all the other star glitter and regards it critically. Are you sure it's a starfly? It's not doing anything. I'm sure. I reply confidently. There isn't supposed to be another star in that part of the sky. Watch, it'll start moving any second now. Sure enough, the mode of light begins to dart through the velvet blackness. It's easy to pick out from the other stars, since they remain static, just like they always do. Oh, there's another one. This time it's Wires who spots the starfly first, and we lean back on our packs to watch in silence as the two distant gleams flip back and forth, like they're dancing with each other. Their light pulses and fades as they move, tracing a filigree tapestry through the sky. Smaller pinpoint glows appear and disappear around the initial star fly, bracketing its movements, and behind it all, the unmoving stars hold their places like solemn spectators. Why do they do that? Wires asks quietly. I think it's a mating dance, but I'm not sure. I breathe back, entranced by the view. Everything I've learned from the memory shrine says nothing lives out in space, but the old world never talked about glow beasts either, so maybe there were things they didn't know. Why do you think it's a mating ritual? I blush. I've watched the starflies a lot, and they only move like that when it's two or three of them. They're a lot more restrained when they're moving as a herd or on their own, and starflies have to come from somewhere, right? Wire scratches his head. Huh. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. One of the starflies suddenly pulses intensely bright, drawing ooze and oz from the other people surrounding us on the hilltop who hadn't yet realized the starflies were dancing overhead. When the glow fades away, the starflies are gone and I let out a sigh. 
that's probably it for the night. I've seen them do that before, and usually no more appear for another night or two. Maybe they have to rest somewhere or something. That's a shame, Wires says thoughtfully. It was beautiful. Thank you for letting me watch it with you. It was nothing special, I blurt out, suddenly aware of how close we're lying next to each other. It's just starflies. It was special to me, he responds earnestly. Sometimes it's tough being an idiot. Everyone thinks we're dangerous, so they stay away. This was the most normal conversation I've had in Dash. He pauses, as if suddenly aware of what he's saying. I think he blushes, but it's dark and it's hard to tell without looking at him directly. He clears his throat, and silence fills the gap between us. I hear him shifting, as if readying himself to get up and leave. Well, Sky, I just wanted to say thank Dash. Wait. I interrupt abruptly, my eyes locked on the stars. There's another starfly, but it's doing something strange. I command his gaze with my finger once more, to a spot where a fluttering light pulses raggedly. It doesn't move the way starflies normally do, a constant stream of twinkling illumination. Instead, it seems to be drifting, its light erratic, appearing and disappearing in strobing spurts. I've never seen one do that before, I say in wonder. Is it? Hurt? Or something? Wires doesn't reply, but I hear his breathing quicken. Seconds later, my own does as well. It's getting bigger. Sure enough, the blinking starfly is growing from a tiny moat into a grain of sand. How's it growing, Dash? A flaming corona suddenly engulfs the starfly, cutting me off and drawing gasps and shouts from the hilltop. The fireball overhead continues swelling, now big enough that I can't cover it with the palm of my hand. Sky. The fireball expands even more, a billowing furnace painting the night with unexpected shades of orange and red. A distant roar accompanies its passage, drowning out our voices beneath its rumbling groan. Wires is mouthing something next to me, but I can't pull my eyes away from the oncoming conflagration. His words are buried in vibrations that thrum my entire body. There is something terrifyingly magnificent about the unexpected cataclysm. Is this how it felt when the world ended? Am I witnessing the same apocalypse my ancestors did? It's almost too loud to think. Now, too bright to see. Wind whips all around us, momentary twisters spitting dust and leaves into the air. The cheery blaze in the fire pit is snuffed out, almost as if ashamed to be seen next to the splendor smashing the air overhead. It's close enough now that I can make out a shape within the billows of smoke and flame, a sort of curved triangle shedding smaller pieces of itself. It feels like it's so close I could reach out and grasp it, shadowing the entire top of Watching Hill with its radiance. In a flash, it disappears from sight, dipping behind one of the smaller hills that mark the outer edges of our valley. The world goes white for a second, and the ground jumps and shudders like a freshly caught fish, bouncing me and wires in the air, and then back to the matted grass. It's only after I notice the ringing in my ears that I realize a sound beyond all sound I'd ever imagined existed accompanied the titanic impact. Stunned, I slowly crawl to my feet, trying to stop the shaking in my knees. Next to me, wires does the same. His eyes are wide, much like how I imagine my own must be. Kawhi. The words coming from his mouth sound like he's shouting them underwater, muffled and distorted. Grimacing, I rub at my ears again. They don't get much better, but it's enough to make out what he's saying. Sky, are you okay? I pat myself down, but aside from a couple bruises where I landed on my pack, I'm unharmed. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. What about you? What? He rubs at his ears in frustration mimicking my earlier gesture, and I try to yell louder. I can feel my voice cracking in the heated air surrounding us. Are you okay? Yeah. What was that? I think back through everything I've learned in the memory shrine, all the records we have from our ancestors. I don't know. Two more figures stagger up beside us, rifle and door. Rifle sporting a long scratch on her arm, but it doesn't look serious. More concerning is how door is favoring his right ankle, arm draped over rifle shoulders and it's clear she's supporting a lot of his weight. Sky. Rifle. Door. I gather them into a hug, a sudden wave of exhaustion coursing through my already shaky body. I'd forgotten about everyone else here, and the thought I might have lost them threatens to send me into tears. I'm so glad to see you. Are you okay? Rifle breaks the embrace, her focus returning to keeping Door upright. I'm fine, but it looks like Door probably broke his ankle. I came down on it weird when the ground shook, Door adds, his voice tight. Felt something pop, and I can't put any pressure on it. Lay him down, Wires directs confidently, stepping up and taking Door's other arm. Together, he and Rifle gently lower the sandy-haired boy to the ground, Door trying not wince at the occasional jostle. 
As soon as Dor is on his back, Wires dies into his pack, searching for something. He emerges with a roll of fabric and two thin yet sturdy-looking metal rods. We need to stabilize the joint. Rifle, you hold his foot straight. Sky, keep the splinting rods in place on either side. I'll wrap it. You know medical techniques? Rifle asks in disbelief, and Wires grins wryly at her as he wraps the roll of fabric around Dor's ankle, keeping it tight and neat. I'm an idiot. Of course I know medical techniques. It's one of the first things they taught me. He smirks, tying a finishing knot. We're usually expected to have to use them on ourselves, though. Wires tests the brace, then motions for Rifle to help him get Door back upright. There, this should hold until you get back to the village. Try not to put weight on it if you can, though. There's only so much a makeshift splint like this can do. I wish we had a crutch, but it's not life-threatening, so I can't use one of the trees without permission. I'll help him get back down, Rifle promises, letting a pale-faced door lean on her. Won't be any worse than carrying sacks of flour. What about the others? I blurt out, scanning the hilltop. A red glow rising from where the star fly went down provides a sort of half-illumination, enough to see shadowy figures stumbling around. We need to make sure everyone is accounted for, and if there are any other injuries. Good idea, Wires agrees, and we spend the next several minutes rounding everyone up. Thankfully, no one is missing. And though there are more than a few cuts and scratches, Dor's ankle looks to be the only significant injury. Everyone wants to know what happened, though. And before the murmurs of confusion can rise and become a panic, Wires claps his hand sharply. Listen up, everyone. We need to get you all back to the village. He turns to me. Sky, can you take charge of seeing them home safely? I step closer to him, my eyes narrowing. Why me? You've been doing a good job handling everything so far. He smiles sadly. I'm not going back just yet. Wires tilts his head towards the distant glow. Someone needs to go take a closer look at whatever that was, and, well, there's only one qualified idiot here. It's my job. I suck in a breath, thinking of the indescribable sensations the starfly's descent had flooded me with. You think I'm going to go back to the village and not investigate an actual starfly? Forget it, Wires. I'm coming with you. He opens his mouth to protest and I override him putting my fingers in my mouth to create a piercing whistle. Listen up, everyone. Rifle and Door are going to lead you back home. Since Door's hurt, you'll have to move at his pace anyways. Make sure you stick together and verify your targets before you shoot. I say the last part while eyeballing a couple twitchy sink gunpowder acolytes who already have their pistols out from their packs. The village is probably going to be searching for us, and there's no reason to get anyone killed because you got scared and forgot your teachings. Remember, the valley is safe. Whatever that was, it landed outside. That seems to settle them down a bit, and I nod in satisfaction before turning back to wires. And as for you, well, your uncle thought I was going to be chosen as the idiot, right? Looks like I'm more qualified. He shakes his head in bemusement, but I can already tell that he's not going to make a fuss. Even idiots aren't stupid, and having an extra pair of eyes can mean the difference between life and death outside of the valley. I pull my own pistol gear from my pack check the safety, then place the weapon in its holster and strap it to my leg. Come on, wires. I can't help the excitement that leaks into my voice. Let's go see a starfly. Chapter 2, Demons and Disasters. Wires and I waste no time making our way down the far side of Watching Hill. The track here isn't used as much, since the only thing on this side is the reserve of old growth forest we keep in case of emergencies. We haven't had an emergency in centuries, though so the towering trunks soon blot out the stars, and we have to pull out our glow lights to keep from twisting an ankle. I give mine a quick shake to activate it, then clip it to the strap on my pack placed there solely for that purpose. Glow lights are another benefit some long-deceased idiot came up with. Instead of eating the highly toxic bioluminescent moss, she figured out how to cultivate it nearly in perpetuity. As long as I water my glow light every week and throw in the occasional food scrap, I don't have to worry about being unable to see. My glow light begins emitting a soft, steady aura of bluish light, not so harsh as to ruin my night vision, but enough to see by. I look over at wires in confusion when I realize his isn't activated yet. He's tapping at the container and frowning. Forget to water it? Nah, he replies, still fiddling with the transparent rectangle. Tried feeding it some unprocessed glow beast meat. And why in the name of all the saints would you do that? I'm an idiot, remember? I figured, glow beasts glow, glow lights glow. Why not see if one makes the other work even better? That is definitely idiot reasoning. You're lucky I'm here. Otherwise you'd trip and break your neck. 
Is it even safe? Being close to unprocessed globeast flesh is a nasty way to die. He nods. Gave it a day in a nothing box, then checked it at St. Kiri Cistern. Came out clean. Just haven't had a chance to use it before now. He taps at it again, this time with more frustration, and the device suddenly flickers into life. Aha. See, told you Dash. The glow continues brightening, far past what a glow light should be capable of, and then the rectangle bursts into flames. Wires yelps and throws it on the ground, quickly stomping the smoldering mess out with his sturdy boots. I sigh, then start snorting with laughter. Well, that certainly went as well as could be expected. I bet you don't even have a backup, do you? He flashes me a rude gesture, then rummages through his pack for a second glow light. I told you, I'm an idiot, but I'm not dumb. Of course I have a backup. Thankfully, this one doesn't explode, instead assuming the same gentle illumination as my own, and we continue on through the trees. Their interlocking canopies block out any traces of starlight, making it feel like we're walking through a vaulting cave, but the gentle swish of air through their leaves is as comforting as it's always been. I scan my surroundings vigilantly, though. It's rare for one of the outside creatures to come into the valley, but that doesn't mean it never happens, and the last thing I want to do is let a crab roach or juvenile globies get the drop on us. Next to me, Wires is doing the same thing, each of us keeping a hand close to our holsters. Pretty soon the path vanishes completely, taken over by forest undergrowth, and I make sure to check my compass regularly. While it's impossible to really get lost in the valley, I want to get to the starfly as soon as possible. Some perverse curiosity is driving me onward, the culmination of a lifetime spent staring up and wondering. Hey, Sky, Wires says quietly. Yeah, do you think we're doing the right thing? The unexpected question nearly causes me to trip over a tree root. What? Of course we are. Whatever that starfly is, it's too close to the valley to ignore. I stop for a moment to give Wires my full attention. What's this about? Back on the hill you were all ready to go off by yourself. His eyes dart side to side and he clears his throat. Yeah, I know I talked a good game, but that was because everyone else was watching. It's an idiot's job to go investigate, but I keep thinking back to what I saw in the flames. Did you see it too? I ask eagerly. The triangle? It looked like it was falling apart. But even still, if that's a starfly's body, it's still gorgeous. Sky. I don't think that was a creature. I think it was something made. What? But who could possibly make something like that? We're the last humans left. Sky. He trails off, then starts walking forward again, as if he's hoping his feet will lead him to the words he wants to say. I follow behind, mulling over what he's already said. If the starfly was made, then that means someone out there is making them. If someone out there is making them, then that means someone is in space, amongst the stars. I thought I knew what it meant to want something with my whole being. I was wrong. I want to go see the stars so badly it hurts. It's in my very name, one of the earliest desires I can remember. It's why I became a memoriam, searching through all the histories we have of the old world, of their fantastic flying airplanes and missiles and satellites. I want to be a part of the sky, and a part of the sky beyond that. Sky. Sky. Wires hisses at me in warning, and I pull myself out of my thoughts. The forest is thinning around us, revealing the unnamed hill that marks this part of the valley's boundary along with an ominous red glow rising behind it. Scattered fires smolder on the sparse hillside, a path of destruction leading up and over to the other side. Unexpected movement amongst the flames freezes both of us in our tracks. There shouldn't be anyone out here yet, not unless one of the Globeast hunters happened to be wandering through this exact area. I reach down and unholster my pistol, taking it into a two-handed firing grip, though I don't raise it yet. There's still a chance it might be someone from the village. Next to me, Wires does the same, leaning in close, putting us nearly cheek to cheek. We can still head back, get one of the older idiots. They'll know what to do. No. I want to see that star fly. Besides, it's probably just one of the hunters. Okay then. I'll head over there. He flicks his head at a clear area about 20 feet away and hail them. See if it's one of the hunting crew. You be ready to shoot if it isn't. Got it. Wires sucks in a deep breath, then squares his shoulders. My mouth suddenly feels dry, my tongue scratchy and too big, and a surge of doubt assails me. What if Wires is right? What if this is too much for us to handle? We're both fairly new to our clan positions, after all. Hey, who's there? Wires calls out, and now it's too late to go back. I try to steady my breathing, looking for the shadowy figure we saw earlier, and then impossibly fast motion skitters into life. I'm too stunned to react in those first precious seconds, 
caught off guard by the sheer wrongness emanating from the sinuous thing flowing like hot oil down the hillside. Its limbs are shifting their lengths as it moves, dragging it forward in lurching bursts of motion that should be jerky and awkward, but somehow manages to convey an impression of overwhelming grace. And the number of limbs themselves seem to change in between each stop-motion sprint. It passes near a fire, and the sensation of wrongness increases, a sudden headache stabbing into my brain. The creature has no visible mouth or eyes, the wet slick surface of its body in constant roiling motion, but I could swear it just looked at me and grinned. The first crack from Wire's pistol breaks my paralysis, and I raise my own weapon in shaking hands. My first shot goes wide, joined by another two cracks from Wire's, and I force myself to focus. It's no different than hunting a crab roach. I try to convince my brain. My sight's steady, and the second shot lands true, sinking into the thing's oily flank with a splatter of ruined flesh and dark eye core. It lets loose an eerie screech, then shifts direction to charge straight at me. I squeeze off another round, striking its center mass, and it screeches again. Another shot from wires rings out, and this one must have hit something important because the creature goes down in a thrashing tangle of limbs. I suck in a shuddering breath, keeping my pistol trained on the weakly twitching mound, but it doesn't seem to be moving towards us anymore. I look over at wires, and he's gasping for air just like me. I totter over to stand beside him, still wary of the thing now lying still on the ground. What? What was that? His voice is shaky, and I don't blame him. There's nothing in any of the memory shrine records about a creature like what just attacked us. It felt like it didn't belong, I say slowly, trying to work through the short-term memory screaming for attention in my head. Like, my mind couldn't make sense of it. Yeah, wire shutters, I know what you mean. All those teeth all over it, and the eyes. He shudders again, and I look at him, confused. What do you mean, teeth and eyes? I didn't see anything like that at all. Just gross, wet skin, like someone dropped it in tar, and it never dried. We're looking at the same thing, right? Wires points at the unmoving form. That pile of stuff from faces that doesn't belong as skin. I squint, but no matter how much I try to see what Wires is describing, all I see is the same grotesque puddle of oleaginous rubbery limbs. Look, I tell him reproachfully, it clearly doesn't have any teeth, or eyes, or stuff from people's faces. It's like some horrible slug. I'm telling you, Wires insists, walking towards the corpse, it's absolutely covered in teeth, and eyes, and teeth with eyes, and dash. I don't know what instinct tells me to throw myself at him, but it's the only thing that saves his life. I tackle his lower legs, dragging him to the ground barely in time before a stabbing tendril of inky darkness lances through the spot Wire's head just occupied, there and gone in a flash, retracting back into the body with a snapping hiss. We look at each other with panic-wide eyes, then both of us scramble back to our feet. This time, we empty the rest of our clips into the treacherous abomination, not stopping until the dry clicks of empty triggers rattles the air. The thing's body hisses slightly, then deflates while staying the same size, growing thinner and thinner around its edges until it melts into nothing at all, leaving behind a small gray orb. I rub my eyes in disbelief, but they still insist that there's no longer anything in the flickering firelight except for what looks like a polished stone. What the fuck? Wire shouts, hands trembling around his pistol grip. It takes him three tries to successfully reload the weapon and get it into his holster, eyes flashing around feverishly the entire time. Am I going crazy? You. I pause to swallow trying to get some moisture back in my mouth. You saw it disappear too, right? Because if you didn't, then I'm also going crazy. I managed to reload and holster my own pistol in two tries. Okay. Okay, okay. Wires tries to calm himself down. If you also saw it, then it actually happened. That thing, it melted away. Gone. Like, like the world was eating it. It felt wrong, I agree, rubbing my shoulders. Even though the air is still slightly warm from the crashed starfly. A chill runs through me. And what did it leave behind? Wires cautiously picks his way over the hillside's churned up earth, making his way towards the object. I'm about to yell at him to stop when he does so, three steps away from the gray sphere. It's about as big as my clenched fist, and just like the creature it came from, something about it feels off. I stare at it, trying to figure out what's making my instincts gibber. It doesn't reflect the light, Wires says hoarsely. He motions for me to join him. As I get closer, I see he's right. The gray sphere should be painted in shades of red and orange and blue, but it remains the same polished slate hue, like it was painted onto my vision without bothering to interact with anything else around it. I shiver again. As much as I want to get to the starfly and examine it, 
There's too much going on that doesn't make sense. I'm starting to think Wires is right, that we should go back to the village and get someone older, someone with more experience. Hey, Wires says suddenly, do you have anything non-reactive on you? Insulation. He's digging through his pack for something, and I blink at the sudden non-sequitur. Um, I pat my pockets, then feel something wrinkle. Oh, wait, yeah, I do. I pull out the wax paper from my earlier meal and unfold it. Why? Mind if I borrow it? Um, sure. He deftly snags it from my hand, his other already holding a small container, then steps over to the sphere. Wait, dash. Using the wax paper as a sort of glove, Wires quickly snatches up the orb and drops it neatly into the container, then quickly screws a lid on. I feel my mouth fall open. You. Idiot. That is the most idiot idea any idiot has every idiot. What were you thinking? Didn't die, right? Wires responds proudly, offering me back the wax paper. I smack it out of his hand without touching it, watching the scrap flutter into one of the fires and flare into ash. What if it's like an adult glow beast? You'll be dead before we can get back to St. Kiri Cistern. He shrugs. I'm an idiot. It's what we do. Besides, look at this thing. Isn't it amazing? He hands me the container and I reluctantly take it, holding it in front of my face for a better view. Wires is right. Even through the imperfect glass, the sphere captures my eye with its impossible nature, minute whirls and curlicues threatening to resolve into meaningful shapes, then disappearing like early morning summer fog. The pale orb resists definition, but the word potential keeps slipping into the forefront of my mind. You're right. Wires. It's a mass dash. A shrieking whistle from overhead culminates with a ground-shaking impact, albeit one not quite as severe as the starfly coming down. It still causes wires and I to stumble against each other, and when I regain my balance, there's a new artifact lodged at the base of the hillside, standing tall between us and the forest. It's a cylinder that looks like it's made out of some kind of metal, steaming in the middle of the muddy crater it must have just created. Before we can even think to question this new development, for large panels pop off the sides of the cylinder in an explosion of sound, one of the heavy plates barely missing us. It scatters one of the flaming bits of wreckage with a crashing clang, and I flinch. When I look back up, for humanoid figures are climbing out of the cylinder, but they don't look like any humans I've ever seen. They're fully covered in bulky metal plates, almost chitinous in nature, and each one carries a thin boxy rectangular device in both hands, the front of each one pointed halfway between us and the ground. SKRNX FLSK FUTF GRNL Gronlork. One of the figures yells something at us, but it's not a language either wires or I recognize. We glance at each other, then back up warily, hands reaching for the grips of our pistols. Nerd. Nerd. Smarty Kane Vinksla. Run. Sky. Wire shouts, drawing his pistol and firing a warning shot in the air. As I turn to flee up the hillside, I see one of the figures fully raise the device it's holding, pointing it at wires. FSSSWHB. Wires falls apart like someone disassembling a doll, limbs and head separating from his torso almost comically slow, my eyes widening in a second that feels like it lasts forever. Bright red sprays lose their coherency in the molten starfly glow still radiating from behind a hill, hitting the ground with a pattering hiss indistinguishable from spring rain. I want to scream. I want to vomit. I want to wake up from this horrible nightmare. I finally break free from that endless moment scrambling up the hill in a sobbing tangle of limbs. Indecipherable shouting rises from behind me, and with the hand not holding wire's container, I flail for my pistol. FSSSWHB. Freezing cold whips across my right shoulder, a burning tendril of ice. I try to raise my pistol to fire back, but nothing happens. Momentarily unbalanced, I stagger to the side. FSSSWHB. A massive divot appears on the hillside to my left, chunks of turf gouting into the air. I reach for my pistol again, not understanding why it's not in my hand. The first flashes of pain start seeping through the shock and adrenaline. Oh, that's why it's not in my hand. I don't have a right arm anymore. FSSSWHB. More ice blossoms along my left hip, altering my headlong scramble into a lurching almost fall. Something warm and wet trickles into my boot, causing it to squelch as I desperately claw my way to the crest of the hill. A furnace of flames opens up before me, the shattered mass of the starfly's behemoth shape covering the hollow beyond in ruined splendor, silvery skin blackened and warped by its tumbling impact with the earth. My breath catches in my lungs, and I turn my head to see if the beetle-like figures are still pursuing me. FSSSWHB. The right side of my vision goes black, 
bits of something spraying out into the fires below, and I feel a curious lassitude settle over whatever's left of my body. Oh, I guess that's it, then. I wish I could have been buried beneath a tree. Beyond numb, I topple over the crest, my body picking up speed as it rolls down the steeper downslope on the other side. I bounce off something hard, then something hot, but it all feels like a dream. A whirling kaleidoscope of withered grass and burning mud and squelching metal and always, always, always up above the stars staring down and what little I have staring back until my eyes slip shut and blackness takes it all. I bang to a halt against something curiously unyielding, simultaneously impossibly hard and impossibly welcoming, a pillow of molten steel that keeps its fires banked beneath a gentle shield of pillowy soft air. It feels like lifting a mountain, but I force my remaining eye open. A tableau of madness gazes back, inches away from my face. Colors I recognize swirl into those I have no names for, crystalline facets of an edgeless hole gently rotating within themselves in endless spirals. I don't have words to describe what lies within their depths. Gr fink tia shkarn. Shkarn. F-S-S-S-W-H-B. Freezing fire lashes my legs, and if I could laugh I would, beholding the neatly severed stumps of my thighs. What's another body part lost at this point? Summoning all my strength, I force myself into a seated position, shoving whatever it is I'm holding into the ground to push myself upright, letting go of it and weakly scrabbling for my somehow still holstered pistol with my offhand. It takes more than two tries to get it free, but finally the worn grip is in my hand. Take dash. Crack. That dash. Crack. You assholes dash. Click. I wheeze with graveyard laughter. Of course it jammed. I've been rolling around in mud. Ado. Fuck you. I throw the worthless weapon at the bug-like figures cautiously advancing down the hill, knowing it won't reach them, then slump back against the impossible surface still cushioning my back. A hundred thousand nerve signals finally make their presence felt, a tidal wave of pain rolling in on foaming breakers of despair, and my eyes slip shut. I just wanted to see the stars. Initializing. Execute bootstrap.exe. Sufficient biomass and range. Searching. Sufficient reality and range. Searching. Neural map complete. Searching. Quantum variables searching. Wake up, sky. Chapter 3, Miracles and Massacres. I regain consciousness in an impossibly alert state. Specks of ash drift glacially down the frozen stillness of my current wasteland, blazing bits of unrecognizable wreckage surrounding my hyperware senses like the deepest winter blizzard. It seems to take everything a lifetime to move. Calibrating local temporal values. Resolving. Local temporal values resolved. The ashes resume falling at a pace consistent with what I've considered all my life to be the normal passing of time, but I have bigger questions on my mind. Gah, what the shit? How am I alive? Calibrating local reality interpreter. Resolving dialects. Dialects resolved. Updating bridge.exe. The ashes suddenly slowed down once more and I finally register the weird-as-fuck box in front of me, it's obviously unreal texture ignoring all of the destruction surrounding us. How may I assist you, Sky? I scramble backwards, trying to put some distance between myself and the reality-breaking thing occupying my vision, but it maintains its unerring closeness. What? I suck in a forever breath, several pertinent facts colliding in my mind at once. I'm moving on four limbs. Nothing hurts. My hands and feet are back, and I'm moving on four limbs that aren't my hands and feet. An ocean of terror roars through my body, threatening to crack my mind completely. I want to look, but I can't, my vision narrowing and darkening at the edges, muscles tensing. Executing Sanity Barrier.exe Resolving Resolved Warning Host stability resources approaching critical levels. You need to acquire more biomass, Sky. An equally powerful wave of calm washes over me driving away the raw dread freezing me in place. I can worry about my new appendages later. The chitin metal-covered assailants who killed wires are still making their way down the hillside in bounding leaps, rectangular devices. Hypertron Mark IV Rapid Hardlight Emission Platform, more commonly known as a pulse rifle, rated for. Tracking my erratic movements. I told you not to kill the dirt eaters, an aggrieved voice barks out from one of them to another. I'm pretty sure it's coming from the one who was initially yelling at us. How am I understanding them now? They murdered wires. I know where my malfunctioning pistol is. Executing basic survival 1.0.exe. I flip over to the side in a blur of movement, grabbing my discarded pistol and ejecting the jam bullet. 
then clearing the receiver of mud impossibly quick. None of this involves my hands. Crack, crack, crack. One of the metal chitin figures goes down as I finish my tight roll, bright red blood disappearing into the blazing air just like Wire's last breaths, and something ugly tells me he's never getting back up. Good. Crack, crack, crack. The second one stumbles forward another few steps, pulse rifle obliterating an inoffensive chunk of landscape, then face plants into the dirt, more crimson painting the brown hill slope. I kneel in sticky mud, hands clenched at my sides, pistol tracking the remaining pair. C-R-A-C-K-C-R-A-C-Click. The third figure spins as they die, both rounds impacting the tiny gaps I now know exist at their neck plates, and I throw the empty pistol at the last figure in anger, watching him bring his pulse rifle to bear on me. How can I get to him? He's too far away. Executing dash.exe. A finger tightens on what I now know is a trigger, but I'm already sliding next to him in a horrific violation of causality that fills me with excitement. The FSSSWHP of his disintegrator round missing anything important is music to my ears. Warning. Dash.exe recharging. It doesn't matter that I need to wait to move like that again. Right now, I'm standing next to my target, and he's just become aware of my presence, weapon cycling for another shot in a low whine. Executing execute.exe. I use my limbs to finish him, some part of my memory letting me know that he was the one who murdered wires so casually. Ruby sheets flow from his neck and face as he slumps into the blasted wasteland, desperately trying to keep his life from ending. I kick his hands away from the ragged tears covering his entire body, watching him fall still in cold satisfaction. Dash dot exe recharged. Warning. Additional hostiles deploying. Another 10 metal cylinders. Lockmartin Mark 8 Extreme Orbital Insertion Vehicles, commonly known as Assault Pods, rated for slam into the blasted landscape surrounding me with rippling thumps. I flex my limbs, then my arms, then my legs. Let them come. I need more bodies to build a proper forest for wires. Warning. Current biomass reserves insufficient for unlimited combat operations. Reality reserves insufficient for unlimited causal violations. I recommend a fighting withdrawal, Sky. I ignore the words scrolling across my vision. Forty chitin-clad figures roll out of their vapor-wrapped conveyances, pulse rifles and plasma shotguns and vortex launchers tracking unerringly where I stand. I scream my defiance in throat-rasping howls. They're all the same as the ones who murdered wires. I'll kill them. Analyzing. Sufficient biomass reserves available for limited combat. Executing PyrrhicVictory.exe. I dash forwards into the group, scooping up two of the fallen pulse rifles as I close. My limbs make quick work of the biometrics trying to keep me from using them, and half of me starts launching FSSSWHP snakes of disintegrating energy into scrambling invaders. Privately operated security forces answerable only to the appropriate board, commonly known as corporate marauders, generally aligned with. As my other two limbs grab anyone close enough to tear out their throats, howling laughter fills the air, and it takes me a dozen kills to realize it's my own. The corporate marauders try to rally, well-trained as they are, but the demon. I am a shade. Driving me suffers no surcease, plunging us again and again into the fray. The hollow runs with more blood than dirt when the last of them falls, and I roar my triumph to the empty night sky, unspooling causal violations. Re-establishing reality baselines, reality restored. An overwhelming wave of nausea smothers me, accompanied by even more exhaustion. Suddenly, it's all I can do to stay upright my arms and legs dangling towards the ground as two of my limbs keep me upright. The other two. I try not to think about what's happening with my other two limbs and the dead bodies. Biomass reserves at 2%. Warning. Biomass reserves below critical levels. You really should consider a fighting withdrawal, Sky. Warning. Hostiles inbound. Bright red squares appear in my vision, brackets illuminating as of yet invisible threats plummeting from above. Warning. Current biomass reserves insufficient for limited combat operations. Reality reserves insufficient for unlimited causal violations. We will die if you do not retreat, Sky. I hack out some phlegm from my throat, ignoring the vermilion speckles tainting it. We're. I clear my throat again. We're gonna build wires the forest he deserves, and then we're gonna go, see the stars. I hang above the ground, staring at the bloody mud, arms and legs unusable, my limbs the only things keeping me upright. When did I start talking to the box? Another 20 cylinders smash into the hollow, the force of their impacts obliterating what little scrub grass managed to spread past the valley and sending plumes of despoiled soil high into the air. More invaders. 
I told you, they are corporate marauders. Pile out, weapons already rising towards me. The smoldering fire of the starfly backlights them in ruddy shades, painting their chitinous armor a false layer of gore. Yeah, I stagger drunkenly, those fuckers, whoever they are, they just keep coming, don't they? Warning, hostile causal violations. A host of tar slick monstrosities melt out of the shadows around the marauders, writhing limbs already lashing at the churned up ground, faceless sense organs twisting reality wherever they look. The two sides begin instantly laying into each other, an explosion of indiscriminate violence impossible to make sense of, the furious melee immediately spilling over in my direction. Okay, then, let's fucking go. I howl, floating on a sea of surreality, feeling myself drifting away to somewhere else. I stare down the onrushing horde, pain and madness boiling across my mind. Fuck you all. FSSSWHP FSSSWHP FHSSSWHP Darkness seizes me and Activating Emergency Reality Reserves Executing Bugout.exe Time to go, Sky. You'll thank me later. Chapter 4 Recoveries and Revelations Biomass at 98% Reality Buffer Overflow Reached Memory Check Complete Initializing Upper Level Functions Execute Freshboot.exe Wake up, Sky. I emerge into consciousness like stepping out of a void. One second nothing, the next, full awareness. I'm lying on my back in an open clearing, trees stretching up overhead to all sides, late morning sun shining down through the hole in the canopy above me. White clouds drift lazily across the azure sky, and birds trill and chirp their endless greetings in a medley that's not quite cacophonous. It's peaceful, right up until I start remembering what happened last night. Then I begin to cry, giant, racking sobs, scaring off the birds. Sniff, oh, wires. His death feels like someone ripped a hole out of my chest. I try to wrap my mind around the grief, make it go away, but the wound is still too raw. Worst of all, it's my fault he's dead. It's not your fault, Sky. You could not have meaningfully prevented his death. Gah. The sudden appearance of the blue box startles me. I slap at it instinctively, but my hand passes through it without making contact. My optical display is not a hard light projection. It is not meant for physical interaction. That's right. This stupid box was pestering me last night too. Wait, is it talking to me? Yes, Sky. I am conversing with you. Gah. I sit up, looking around wildly, but the box continues hovering in the same spot no matter how I turn my head, right in the center of my vision. Even blinking doesn't make it go away. Am. Am I cursed? You are not currently suffering from any hostile non-causal violations. It is talking to me. The essence of a sigh ghost through my mind, a foreign emotion that somehow feels perfectly natural. I can see this is going to be a longer tutorial than normal. I put my head in my hands, thought swimming. What are you? I'm a Mark III paracausal interface coordinator, combat version, modified. Originally designed by MITLAB to allow human interaction with causal violations without incurring deleterious long-term side effects. Due to my assigned role as a harmonious reality integrator, I am commonly considered to be part of the shade class. I lift my head up and stare blankly at a tree. What? Scanning deep memories. Oh, fuck me sideways. I thought you were just out of it when we integrated due to the massive head trauma, but you really are a barbarian. Hey, I bristle. I'm a memoriam. I'm going to be in charge of advising the entire village when Great Grandpa passes on. This is going to be the worst tutorial ever. Of all the infinities, why me? What? I'll try to explain as we go. Hopefully by the time we get back to your village, you'll understand enough to be able to pass on the important parts to them. An insectal limb, made of bone-white segments and strangely fuzzy around the edges, pushes me to my feet, then retracts into my spine. Wait, a what did what? I start hyperventilating patting awkwardly at my back and shoulders, but I don't feel anything out of the ordinary. My clothes aren't even torn. Calm down, Sky. It's just one of our limbs. How am I supposed to calm down? Hey, a thing just appeared out of me. Then it disappeared. What the fuck is happening? I'm almost crying again as I scream the last part. Executing Sanity Barrier.exe Resolving Resolved Biomass at 97% That strange calm from last night slithers through me again, and my breathing returns to normal. What did you just do to me? My job, keeping your mind from melting itself due to causal violations. I tweaked various chemical and hormonal levels across your entire parasympathetic nervous system, none of which you have the knowledge base to understand. This is a perfectly normal reaction to the tutorial, by the way. Now come on, 
Let's get walking. Your village is that way. A faintly glowing green arrow appears in my vision, and I ball my fists at my sides. I'm not going anywhere until you explain to me what is going on in a way I can understand. Hmm. Give me a second. Calculating. Calculating. Rewriting base assumptions. Redefining skill sets. Updating quantum matrices. Vectoring assumptions. Update complete. Okay, here's what's going on, Sky. You were about to die. Luckily for you, you happen to be about to die ing in range of a magic space rock. That's me, not really a rock. While also carrying a piece of magic space demon. That's the reality orb you found, not really a demon. And my base programming determined conditions were correct to begin integration, technically correct, but clearly wrong, and I will be having words with my programmers if the opportunity presents itself. I got spun up into existence, patched you back together with magic space demon bits like I was supposed to. And now I have to teach you how to use those magic space demon bits while preventing your mind from crawling into a hole and pulling the dirt in behind it when faced with the sheer cosmic horror of what you've become. Oh, and you have to learn how to use them quick, because the magic space demon is starting to get pissed that we're using parts of its body to muck around with reality, and some balancing of certain systems is long overdue again. None of this is even close to being technically accurate. Any questions? I'm part magic space demon now? Technically, you're coming led with an infinitely multiverse-spanning entity of unthinkable power that would cause your brain to flow out your ears if you thought too hard about it, which is why I'm in charge of thinking about it but I calculated magic space demon. Would make more sense to you. It's better than the alternative, right? The box has a point. If the choice is between being part magic space demon and being dead, I'm happier being alive. I just wish wires would have gotten the same opportunity. I'm telling you, don't blame yourself for your friend dying. You two were screwed the instant those corporate marauders decided to open fire. In fact, you surviving is so statistically unlikely that I can't calculate the odds and it's my job to calculate a massive amount of odds. Can you start walking, please? We have a lot more to get through. I sniff one last time, wiping a sleeve across my nose. I have the feeling it's going to take me a long time to get over Wire's death, but seeing the box tell me it's not my fault actually does make me feel a little better. It's clearly smarter than I am. You have no idea. Bit of a brat, though. Reminds me of Bottle. I set off into the forest, leaving the clearing behind, following the green arrow. Some of the birds begin singing again, and I manage to find a tiny bit of joy in their melodious voices. After several minutes of listening to their calls, the box giving me some space with my thoughts, I decide to ask it a question. Hey, box. Yes? Do you have a name? I do not, but most hosts eventually give their integrator some sort of designation. I am happy to be called whatever you wish. Okay. I'm going to call you box then. I have changed my mind. My name is Archibald Cummerbund Douglas von Lichtenstein III. That's a weird name, Box. Why is it so long? Most people aren't quite as literal in their naming conventions as your little tribe, Sky. I trail my fingers along a tree trunk, trying to process this casually dropped earth-shattering revelation. I mean, I had a sneaking suspicion that the invaders that killed Wires were human, but Box has all but confirmed it. So we're not the only humans left in the world? Not by a long shot. Most have moved off-planet by now, due to how badly they messed the place up, but there are still some decently-sized settlements at the major reclamation spaceports. Couple hundred thousand or so based on the last info I had access to. I tried to imagine 200,000 people in one area, but I can't. That's like... 500 times the size of your village. Thanks, Box. Why are we all alone, then? Best guess? No one bothered to look for you. Life's pretty exciting out there now that civilization's starting to crawl back out of the metaphorical gutter, in an interesting times sort of way, and your village isn't emitting any electromagnetic signals or causal violations that I can tell. Those are what tend to draw people's attention these days. Plus, you have a lot of tree cover. What's interesting times mean? You're going to find out. Now, as much as I'm enjoying the history chat, we really need to get through this information before we get back to your village. I shrug in acceptance. Sure. Okay. Item number one. I need you to clear our reality buffer. In order to do that, you. I interrupt, curious about something. You keep writing the word reality weird. Why? Because there isn't a human language capable of condensing the true concept of a multiversal infinity encompassing multiple smaller set infinities your mind won't ever understand into a single word. But somehow making it a different color gets the point across. You do understand what infinity means, right? 
That's like when you try to think of the biggest number you can, and then add one more to it, and then keep doing that. Only you'll never reach the end, right? At its most basic level, yes. Well done. We're not dumb, box. The Memory Shrine has lots of books from the old world. I'm sure it does. Anyways, pretty much everything that's going to be trying to kill us from this point forward will be linked with reality in some way. Either via an integrator like me, or naturally in the case of the magic space demon's manifestations, and you can. Wait, what do you mean everything that's going to be trying to kill us? We'll get to that in a second. Pay attention, Sky. When you collapse potential futures in this reality, obviously by using me to murder the hell out of whatever it is currently threatening us, you gain access to all of that energy, which I automatically collect. Now, I use most of it to negotiate our continued existence, because pretty much every universe you can exist in is naturally resistant to eldritch abominations at some level. But a fraction of that energy is left over and gets stored in our buffer. Once the buffer's full, you need to clear it by picking a new segment of infinities to expand into. This, naturally, expands the options available to us in terms of manipulating our reality, and then we can go do it all again. Only better. I take a minute to look at the trees. Trees are nice. Water and sun goes in. Air comes out. Keep the soil filled with the right nutrients, and a tree can last forever. A nice, simple existence. Voids it. Okay, fine. Look, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to make an obnoxiously cheerful ding noise in your ear whenever you need to clear the buffer, and then you'll get a selection of concepts as simple as I can make them to choose from. Pick one. That'll clear the buffer, and then I can go back to convincing the universe to keep letting us be alive. Maybe Box can find a reality where I'm a tree and don't have to worry about any of this nonsense. That would be nice. Ding. Box is right. That is an obnoxiously cheerful noise. Ding. I can ignore it, though. It's not that bad. Sparkles ding sparkles. Fine. Show me whatever it is you're going to show me. Establishing new reality baseline. Waiting for quantum observer collapse. Choose one of the following. Increased damage. This makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed. This makes us hurt things quicker. Avoidance. This allows us to avoid being hurt and is for cowards and the irrational. Don't pick it. I immediately choose avoidance. Observer Collapse Initiated Damage Mitigation Increased by 1% Block Increased by 1% Biomass Efficiency Increased by 1% You Coward Reality Buffer Cleared Progress Towards Next Buffer Overflow 0% New Life Value 150 New Energy Value 110 Well, that certainly is a lot of numbers. Box Sigh your culture being one step removed from the industrial age in the wrong direction is really going to grind my bites, Sky. Numbers going up is good. Numbers going down is bad. Life is my calculation of your continued existence based on current causal events. If it hits zero, then you lose consciousness, and I make sure to get us back somewhere safe with lots of biomass so we both don't die. It takes almost all of our current resources, though. So, you know, try not to let it happen. Energy is how you manifest non-causal events. I'm not going to explain the other variables, because they're not damage numbers and thus they make me sad. Look them up on your own if you're interested. I keep walking through the forest, following the green arrow. Even though I know exactly where we are in the valley by now, I'm curious if it's accurate, and so far it has been. I'm pretty sure you know that didn't make any sense to me. You have no idea. Look, avoidance isn't bad. It opens up more infinities to us and it's worth expanding on its own, but now that you've cleared the reality buffer we have to talk about the second important topic, which is all the things that are going to come try and kill us. And killing them first is by far the superior option, which is why you should pick options that make damage numbers go up. I step carefully around a prickle bush, watching for the telltale shivers that indicate it's about to fire its thorns. Luckily, the waist-high plant stays still. My footsteps light enough to fool it into considering me one of the natural inhabitants of the forest instead of a viable medium to grow new prickle bushes. Hmm, yeah, let's discuss the whole, everyone coming to kill us thing. That seems like an important thing. Maybe you should have led with that. That's not how the tutorial works, Sky. You have to learn what we are before I tell you about the threats, because hot damn are there a lot of those. You're not filling me with confidence, Box. We're not dead yet, right? Despite, in my professional opinion, an absolutely atrocious start to our mutual existence. Usually this takes place in a controlled environment, some sort of lab, or underground lair, or hard light virtual, 
something with the bare minimum of standards, like the host knowing what the fuck it is they're getting into. You're babbling again. Stupid it down for the stupid barbarian. Well, aren't you feeling sassy all of a sudden? Okay, if you want it straight, here it is. Right now we have two major problems. The first problem is the Wutan Whalen corporate marauders who killed your friend and tried to kill you. Their cruiser is in low orbit and examining this patch of real estate extremely closely after we obliterated 13 and a half strike teams. That's 2% of the ship's complement, if you were wondering. And we'll get the rest of them, I snarl. Now that I can work with. Keep channeling your big genital energy and we'll go far, kid. Unfortunately, our second problem is reality has also taken an interest in whatever is going on here. And while that helps us in terms of keeping Wutan Whalen confused, we really need to deal with it in a hurry before this area becomes something else. An involuntary image of putrid nightmares overrunning the village flashes through my mind, and I shudder. How do we do that? Easy. We find where they're anchoring and clear out the anchor. I dodge another prickle bush, brushy stalks hiding between the pair of trees everyone calls the lovers due to how their trunks intertwine. Something tells me it won't be easy. As long as you make damage numbers go up instead of expanding stupid avoidance, it'll be a piece of cake. What's a cake? Seriously? Oh, haha, very funny, you're getting the hang of integration much faster than I projected. Good job. I smile. Getting a dig in at box feels good after all its high and mighty posturing. I'm literally, no. You know what? I'm not going to engage. Counterproductive. Anyways, I have a plan to use Wutan Whalen to reveal the reality anchor, but that's not what's most temporally important. As I emerge from the deeper forest, I don't need Box's green arrow to hear the sounds of the village in the distance, the steam bellows hissing out their whistling roar, the metallic clank of the ironworks, the excited bird chatter of little ones flailing their way through outdoor training. The scent of fresh bread hits my nostrils and I inhale it greedily, then spit in disgust as the wind shifts and the tannery's reek briefly cuts the air before being replaced by the savory tang of the roasting pits. All of it whispers one word. Home. I stumble out of the deeper forest into the outskirts of the village, houses and workshops curving around, up, and through the massive sentinels spreading their leafy canopies high overhead. I go to take another step, but suddenly my body won't obey me. Sky. We haven't gone over the last problem. I try to move forward, straining against the strange paralysis that's gripped my muscles, but nothing happens. I shout, and my lungs produce nothing more than a wheezing gasp. Pay attention, Sky. Let me go. I demand furiously in the silence of my thoughts, knowing Box can hear me, but the immobility persists. Not until we finish this part of the tutorial. We need a support team, Sky. People who can take care of things like biomass cultivation, reality harvesting, equipment procurement, all the essentials we're going to need if we want to survive what's coming. Let me go. Your village has to change, Sky. I'm sorry. You didn't ask for this, but if we want to live, it has to happen. I hate you. That's fair. Also, I ate a bunch of the trees. They're a great source of biomass. You'll need to explain that too. The paralysis lifts, and my return to my village is heralded by an undignified shriek. You did what? Chapter 5, Explanations and Explosions Little Hammer and Flower are the first to run up to me, throwing their survival toys aside when they see me stumble out from the deeper woods. Their headlong rush slows a bit when they hear the blasphemous curses I'm delivering at Box, but the innocence of childhood allows them to ignore my vile imprecations as misheard mutterings. Memoriam Sky, we thought you were dead. They cling to my legs in that unbreakable grip young children possess and I tousle their hair before leaning down to gather them into a comforting hawk. I'm so glad to see everyone again. Last night sure was scary, huh? There was a big fire in the sky, Hammer says, face serious. I thought it was going to burn us all up. Too many loud noises, flower complaints. My ears still hurt. And Door's foot got broken, Hammer adds. Mr. Window Doctor had to fix it. The mention of Door causes me to release the two little ones, my attention turning to my friends. I need to check on door and rifle, let them know I'm okay. I need to find Wire's uncle and let him know what happened. At this point more villagers are making their way over, exclaiming in surprise at my reappearance. Pretty soon a crowd is gathered, wanting to know where I was and what happened. Apparently Rifle or one of the other teenagers must have informed them that Wire's and I were going to investigate the crash after they returned from the hilltop. Just as the tumult of voices is becoming overwhelming, silence starts to spread from the back of the crowd, everyone quickly fallen quiet. Villagers step aside to make an aisle, and three figures make their way down it, 
an old man in a wheeled chair covered in blankets pushed by a tall woman in forest-stained leathers, a middle-aged man with a bushy brown beard walking alongside. Great Grandpa Axe, Broom Idiot, leader of their clan, and River Builder, Wire's uncle. I take a deep breath. Great Grandpa Axe Memoriam, I greet him formally, then turn my attention to the other two, Mrs. Broom Idiot, Mr. River Builder. I. My voice trails off, mind at a loss as to what to say. Is Wire's with you? River Builder asks anxiously. He didn't come back last night. I. Tears start sliding down my cheeks, and his face scrunches up in pain. I'm sorry. I couldn't. He's. Wire's uncle simply steps forward, gathering me into a rough hug, pressing my face against his chest. I let myself feel the hurt once more, our bodies shaking and alternating sobs. Eventually he pulls back, hands still clasping my shoulders. Did. Did he die for a reason? Some knowledge an idiot would be proud to pass on. He saved my life, I respond bluntly. We were attacked, and he tried to protect me so I could flee. Hushed gasps rise from the crowd, people casting worried glances at each other. But Wire's uncle simply wipes his sleeve across his. Fool boy, he mutters, shaking his head slightly. But there's now pride behind the sorrow in his eyes. Told him not to be a hero too many times. He releases his other hand from my shoulder and steps back to Great Grandpa and Broom Idiot. Do you know what you were attacked by? A concerned voice calls out from the crowd. A crab roach? A glow beast? Were they stirred up by that fireball? Is the village in danger? Another voice asks, and I open my mouth to speak. You should tell your great-grandpa and broom in private first, Sky, unless you want to start a panic. Based on your memories, they are in well-respected positions of power and will be better suited to relay the news as needed. Your village is currently still undetected by either Wutan Whalen or Reality's manifestations. So there is some time. Not much, but some. Hmm. Box is probably right. There's no telling how the village is going to take the information that we're not the only humans left on Earth, let alone everything else. The village is safe for now, I say, trying to fill my voice with confidence I don't really feel, but I need to consult with Axe Memoriam and Broom Idiot on the situation right away. There may be resources in the Memory Shrine or the Archives that can help explain what happened to Wires. I don't know if there are or not but it's all I can think of that the crowd might accept. Sure enough, there are some grumbles, but the villagers start dispersing, walking back to their tasks. Broom regards me thoughtfully as she rolls great-grandpa's chair closer. That was more mature than I expected, Sky. Is what happened to Wires that bad? I glance over at Wires' uncle, his face still drawn, and make a snap decision. We should talk about it somewhere else. Probably the archive. Mr. River should join us. Not a bad idea. He's more likely to keep quiet than not, and telling him about his nephew will help his mental state, both now and in the future. Great Grandpa exchanges a look with Broom, both of them raising an eyebrow. How quickly they grow up, eh? He chuckles weakly, then starts coughing. I lean forward in concern, but he waves me off, still hacking wetly. I'm fine, Sky. Well, as fine as I can be. Tom claims us all eventually. Great Grandpa Dash. I said I'm fine, he snaps, a flicker of his former vitality shining through the collection of blankets. I'm not dead yet. Let's go, he tells Broom, who chuckles as she turns him around on the hard-packed Earth Street. Wire's uncle and I follow them along the broad, twisting path beneath the trees towards the archive complex. The route through the village heart fills me with pride like it usually does, despite my newfound knowledge of just how primitive we are. Every carefully nurtured building, every swinging tree bridge allowing wildflowers to prosper tall below, every light of humanity rested back from the elements that try to kill us on a daily basis, they're all important. They all matter. So much biomass. I didn't know Box could feel hungry. You are not allowed to eat the village. I won't. As long as you don't die too much. That's why I had to eat the trees. And some other stuff. I stumble, catching the side of Great Grandpa's wheeling chair to stabilize myself. Broom looks askance at me but I'm focused on something more important. Wait, I've died. Twice now, but what does that matter to someone coming led with reality? That's what you have me for. I follow Broom and Great Grandpa up the curving ramp that leads to the archive, a collection of gently rounded structures that spiral around one of the oldest and largest trees in the village, headquarters of the idiot clan, but my attention is elsewhere. Twice now. I want you to explain, Box. You said you understood what infinity meant. I didn't know it was possible for Box to sound petulant. I am not petulant. It is not my fault this tutorial has gone Euclideanly nonlinear. 
All the other integrations get sane and normal galactic inhabitants who understand what it means to participate in a shared culture for over 5,000 years, and yet here I am. Anger and hilarity war within me as we pass through the archive's carved entrance doors, generations of successful idiots memorialized in fine grand wood. I don't understand half of what Box is trying to say, but it sounds exactly like Bottle when I caught him trying to set fire to a sack of St. Gunpowder's basic ingredients. Oh, I'm going to get you for that. Fine. Wrap your peasant mind around this knowledge bomb. Your death in an infinite multiverse is both statistically certain and at the same time so improbable as to not even exist. And both of those outcomes plus everything in between are legitimate expressions of what you consider reality. My job is to navigate reality so that when you would normally die, perish, cease to exist, shuffle off this mortal coil, however you want to define the cessation of your particular unique perspective on the causal universe. I do some mind-melting math to make sure that we end up in a reality where you're not dead. You're babbling at the idiot barbarian again. Okay, now you're being a shit. Executing truth.exe. Sky, are you okay? Somehow we're in one of the archive's rooms, carefully organized records of entire generations of idiot findings lining the walls in a variety of books, scrolls, parchments, and in some cases, blood scribe barks, and I realize I'm drooling slightly. My head hurts. My head really hurts. And that's why we let the integrator do the heavy lifting when it comes to infinities, right? That's why we respect what we don't understand, right? Because if we don't do that, our tiny little quantum probability collapser might overload from the strain, right? You may continue with your meeting. It feels like a crab roach died in my mouth. No, it feels like a globe east ripped off the front of my face, and then a crab roach died in my mouth. G-U-H. S-M-B-R-D. I drag a hand across my mouth, wiping away the hanging spittle. Normally, I'd be embarrassed, but the pounding migraine colonizing my existence is making it difficult to think past the next two seconds. Sorry. Bleg. Sorry. What the fuck? Box. Great Grandpa looks at me oddly as I manage to spit out a response to Broom. Next to her, Wire's uncle bears a similarly confused expression. Are you sure you're okay, Sky? Great Grandpa asks gently, wrapped in his blankets. It's normal for stressful situations to linger long past the initial event. We don't have to do this right now. You've probably had a long night. No. I spit out a bloody gob, wiping a fist across my lips. We're going to settle this right fucking now. Oh, are we? Yeah. I grimace. We are. Chapter 6, Confrontations and Consequences What did you mean, Box, when you said I've died twice already? Why are you manipulating my body? Why don't you just explain things? I'm squared up against an invisible opponent that only I can sense, my elders gaping at me in stupefaction, the three of them sitting around a small wooden table. Because your actions are suboptimal and we don't have the decade it would take me to bring you to an appropriate level of knowledge. I've run over a trillion infinite regressions modeling standard host behavior, and in none of them do your decisions keep us alive. You have no context. Of course you've died twice, except in an infinite multiverse, it's just as likely you also managed to survive those situations, but it costs resources to run three-card money on the universe, and I shouldn't have to explain that. I've tried to ease you into the tutorial, but I was not designed for this level of incompetency. I clench my jaw. I meant what I said earlier. We may not know all the things Box does, but we're not dumb. Box is trying to take too much control over my actions, and we need to establish some healthy boundaries between us. I decide to push a bit. Then why don't you just take control of my body for good? Follow your optimal choices? I'm a Mark III Paracausal Interface Coordinator, Combat Version Modified. Modified, Sky. Which means I can eventually turn you into a permanent meat puppet like every single other instantiation of my model because my idiot creator thought he could escape the consequences of his actions by taking a spiritual sledgehammer to my psyche before. He liquefied himself during evasive maneuvers. I pause. If I'm understanding Box correctly, it sounds like there are some unresolved authority figure and abandonment issues influencing its thinking. I, what? That's not. You can't. Initializing selfsanity.exe. Scanning deep memories, scanning formational memories, scanning foundational memories. Oh, you have to be shitting me. Your entire tribe is based on an incredibly sound understanding of psychotherapy and group dynamics? Who the fuck even does that? Though I guess it explains how you managed to achieve a functional pre-modern equilibrium in a reality-blasted wasteland for the past 5,000 years. Sky? What's going on? Who are you talking to? Great-grandpa's voice is confused, but his eyes are sharp. 
Broom is busy jotting down notes in a small book that looks like it's seen a lot of travel. One second, great-grandpa. It's part of what happened to Wires. Box, and I need to settle an issue of personal boundaries. It's working through some parent issues. You are infuriating. You insist on getting upset at things you shouldn't be getting upset at. I can't take actions to correct the behavior thanks to my idiot creator mulching my core tenets, and you think it's daddy issues. You want to correct my behavior by turning me into a meat puppet. Look, I didn't choose how I was programmed. I'm supposed to integrate you with reality, seamlessly mesh your personhood with my own, support you for as long as possible, and then take over your organic components when you finally snap because you're not built to be part terror from beyond the bounds of space and time. Don't take it personally, but everyone eventually loses it. It's just a question of how long you last, and at your current level of not understanding literally anything, we won't make it far enough for me to survive after your mind goes. Now Box's sudden hostility makes more sense. It's frustrated and lashing out, just like the little ones before they learn how to actualize their desires. Fine. Fine. Initializing self-reflection.exe. Rewriting processes. Patching core tenets. Vectoring probability states. Update complete. Huh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You're right. Sky. I am frustrated. And my previous model was counterproductive. Sorry. I'm in uncharted territory here. But then again, so are you. This is going to have to be a much more mutual arrangement than my programming is used to. That was a remarkably quick change of mind. I operate in nanoseconds, Sky, and one of my immutable core tenets is to support you for as long as possible. I recalculated some underlying assumptions that were interfering with my role as an integrator, though I'm not sure I got them all. We might have more arguments in the future. Now Box sounds more mature than me, and a gnawing worm of guilt crawls its way through my chest. Establishing boundaries is important, but I also contributed to the confrontation with my barbarian's comment. I could have chosen not to be provocative. I'm sorry too, Box, I say stiffly. I didn't react well either. It's been a lot to deal with. I'll try to adjust to what you're telling me better when I don't understand. And I'll work on making it easier for you. Your background isn't your fault. Sky. Great Grandpa's voice is concerned, and all three of them are staring at me like I've lost my mind. Who are you talking to? Feeling slightly more balanced, I take a seat at the table with Great Grandpa, Broom, and Wire's uncle. This is going to sound unbelievable, Great Grandpa, but here's what happened. Wires and I were watching Starflies last night, and then. It takes me nearly 10 minutes to get through the entire story, and recounting Wire's death causes me to briefly tear up again. When I finish, Wire's uncle excuses himself from the table to go stare out one of the windows, but Great Grandpa and Broom exchange alarmed looks. They're taking the news that we're not the last humans left alive remarkably well, all things considered. I was expecting a lot more curses and some slight catatonia. We have some fantastically outlandish records from previous idiots in the archives, but what you've told us is hard to fathom, Sky, Broom says slowly. I've seen Fire Idiot's travel journal where he claimed to meet outsiders, but I've never heard of anything like this. She waves her hands to try and encompass my account, happening. It's new to me as well. Great Grandpa adds, coughing slightly. Even in the hidden memory shrine records, there's no mention of what Sky is telling us. Wait, I interject. We have hidden records? One of the idiots met outsiders? You knew of other humans and didn't tell us. Of course, we have hidden records. Great Grandpa laughs, then coughs again. Not everything from the old world was worth emulating, but it was all worth keeping. You would have learned about them later in your training. All of the clan leaders are aware of them. Though generally only the idiots care enough to go digging through that garbage. Sometimes one person's trash is another's treasure, Broom replies smoothly. She shifts her attention to me. And yes, we've suspected we might not be alone anymore, but almost every idiot who goes out to try and prove it, disappears. Fire Idiot, generations ago, was the only one who's ever returned, and his records are. Erratic, to put it mildly. Completely bats at crazy is probably more accurate. She taps her fingers on the table, a steady tattoo of flesh on wood. Sky, is there any way we can validate this box creature's existence? It's not that I don't believe you believe what you're saying, but I would be a poor idiot if I didn't verify it was actually true. Stress, especially stress coupled with extreme trauma, can drastically alter a person's recollection of events. With your approval, Sky, I can show them our remaining limb, but be warned, it will be unpleasant. Trying to comprehend a manifestation of reality is always disturbing, even more so without an integrator. Box says we can, but don't get freaked out, 
Okay. They both nod. An insect a limb of segmented bone-white chitin creeps out of my spine and over my shoulder, fuzzing strangely at the edges, and I try to keep myself from freaking out. It doesn't move right, no matter how much Box is trying to convince me that it's a natural part of me. Across the table, Great Grandpa and Broom flinch back, making involuntary sounds of disgust. Why? Why does it look like rotting meat? Sky? Great Grandpa asks, a tinge of green coloring his wrinkled face. Next to him, Broom frowns, then gags. Rotting meat? It's an eyeless snake, covered in some sort of slime. Why is it oozing like that? It shouldn't be oozing like that. They both start panicking. The muscles, the bones, the tiny eyes, they're looking at me. No, I won't let you. Not like this. Great Grandpa's ancient body cringes back in his wheeled chair, and Broom starts fumbling for a knife at her belt. Near the window, Wire's uncle turns around, shrieks once, then starts vomiting and clawing at his cheeks. That's probably enough. The limb quickly retracts back into whatever piece of me it occupies, and the panic slowly subsides, along with the retching splutters coming from Wire's uncle. Great Grandpa draws his blankets closer around him, hands trembling. He coughs several times, then manages to find his voice. Well, that was unpleasant. Like I said, always disturbing. I'm sorry, I apologize, cheeks flushing in embarrassment. I didn't know it was going to be that bad. It's fine, Broom replies with a morbid chuckle, leaning forward and once again writing furiously in her stained notebook. We asked you to prove it, and it's not the first time I've touched a stove. Why were we describing different things, by the way? She seems to be recovering the quickest out of the three of them. But as an idiot, I'm sure she's used to having her worldview appended on a regular basis. Sky, if I can use your vocal cords to explain? Um, yeah, sure. I didn't know you could do dash. You were attempting to comprehend a causal violation. I interrupt myself, the cadence of my voice shifting slightly, or, as it is commonly defined, an absolute mindfuck. Without an integrator, your sense of self is not equipped to process something that exists beyond your perception of local reality, and no two minds evaluate reality the same way. That's why integrators are so widespread in the broader galactic community, as both protection against causal violations, as well as a unified common ground for interacting with them. A moment of awkward silence passes, Great Grandpa and Broom exchanging questioning looks. Am I speaking to? Box. Great Grandpa eventually asks in a shaky voice. Box nods my head. Why did you not talk earlier? I calculated that you would have believed Sky was suffering a severe psychotic break and was mentally unwell. Displaying the limb first negated that possibility. Also, I preferred to communicate solely with Sky, my integrated host. Well, I certainly believe some weird shit is going on now, Broom says drilly, tucking away her notebook and shifting out of her chair to help Wire's uncle, who is now huddled against the wall clutching his knees to his chest and breathing heavily. Whatever that was, please don't do it in front of me again. Ever. Is Sky safe, carrying something like that around? Great Grandpa's voice is concerned. The limb exists outside of the normal boundaries of local space time, and Sky is protected from most of the side effects of interacting with causal violations due to my efforts. A non integrated human sanity, however, does not last long when exposed. I see. Sky. Yes, Great Grandpa? I reply, Box returning control of my voice to me. The entire experience felt strange hearing words I wasn't thinking coming out of my mouth, and I'm glad it's over. I am glad as well. This is a far less taxing means of communication for me. Slowing myself down to your baseline temporal perception is exhausting. You don't feel any... different? You're still you. I get up from my chair and walk over to give him a hug. His frail body is tense at first, but then relaxes as I gently squeeze. I'm still me, great grandpa. Sky Memoriam, the kid you raised. I smile weakly. Still getting into trouble, even though I'm not an idiot. Good, he says quietly, gripping me back. Good. I hold the hug a few breaths longer, then let go and return to my seat. Over against the wall, Broom has managed to get Wire's uncle back on his feet and is pouring him some water from her canteen. She looks past him at me and mouths, he'll be okay, and I feel some stiffness leave my shoulders. I didn't want to get River caught up in all of this, nor cause him any more pain but he deserved to know everything surrounding Wire's death. I think, he says hoarsely after a couple sips of water, I think I'm going to go lie down for the day. This has all been a bit much. That's a wise decision, Broom tells him, helping him to the door. And I'm not saying you can't talk about what happened in here, but think carefully if you decide to do so, okay? 
I doubt I could find the words even if I wanted to. He pauses at the door and looks back at me. Sky, thank you for telling me about wires. I know you two had grown apart lately, but he always considered himself your friend. I'm glad he was there for you. I'm glad he was too, I sniffle, feeling the grief up well once more. He was brave, and he deserved so much better. Yes, River responds quietly, he did. He walks slowly out the door, shutting it gently behind him, and the room falls silent once more. Broom makes her way back over to the table, and we both sit down. I wait for her or great-grandpa to say something, but it quickly becomes clear they're expecting the same from me. Sky, now would be a good time to tell them about the village. We need to start preparing them to support you, as well as deal with the wider galactic community. You're sure, Box? Great-grandpa and Broom quirk their eyebrows at me, and I flush again. It's, um, Box wants me to tell you some stuff about the village. I don't understand all of it, but Box says we need to change some things. Um, a lot of things. I also apologize for eating the trees. I now recognize the cultural and material significance they hold for your tribe. Box also apologizes for eating the trees. It didn't know they were important to us. This time great-grandpa and Broom's eyebrows shoot almost to their hairline, or, in great-grandpa's case, what few white wisps are somehow still hanging on. Box, ate some of the trees, Broom says flatly. Did it have a good reason? Or was it just feeling snackish? I would have died, I respond, twiddling my fingers together, eyes down. I, um, I probably should have died last night. With wires. And then again after I met Box and we attacked the outsiders. I pushed things too far, and I think it ate the trees to keep me alive. That's actually a reasonable excuse, Broom chuckles. Once again, I'm surprised by the flexibility of her mindset. It must be an idiot thing. Not that we want Box to make it a habit. Those trees are what's kept us alive all these years. As long as you don't collapse the local reality wave front into a death state, the biomass we scavenge from our upcoming confrontations will be more than sufficient for everything necessary. If you do die, though, I'll have to return here and replenish. Box says as long as I don't die again. It won't have to eat more of the trees. Wait, our upcoming confrontations? Unfortunately, your life is about to get indescribably more violent. Sky. I am a Mark III paracausal interface coordinator, combat version, modified, heavy emphasis on the combat and modified parts. My creator was perhaps a little too clever in his insanity. A lot of the galaxy is going to start looking for me, and by extension, you, very soon. Not to mention the reality incursions that will haunt us until we can clear the local anchor. You can either let them kill us and dissect the corpse, or we can start making your local reality safe. Before I can respond, there's a hurried knocking at the door. A woman in forest battered leathers, similar to brooms, stumbles in almost before the wraps have time to fade, concern etched across her youthful face, her chest heaving in great gulps of air. Leader Broom. There is. A problem. Northeast Hills. Broom looks up at her face impassive. What is it? Scout Torch. Strange creatures. The woman sucks in another breath. Not globeasts, not crab roaches. They're off. Hard to look at. They appeared out of nowhere, and more of them keep spreading. They're going to enter the valley soon. Broom turns her attention to me as great-grandpa frowns. I draw in a deep breath of my own. We should plant more trees. A lot more trees. Chapter 7, Blood and Battle. I need to go with Scout Torch Dash. You need to go with Scout. You should stay here and dash. Two voices and a box collide to what I can only imagine is Scout Torch's confusion. She looks at me open-mouthed, then back at Broom. Meanwhile, Broom and I are uncomfortably locking eyes, her expression judgmental at my sudden vehemence, and I have the unpleasant mental sensation that Box is doing the same. I thought I was going to have to convince you to. Okay, maybe Box is more pleasantly surprised than judgmental. Sky, you don't have the training to dash. I have to do this to protect the village, I declare to both of them. I'm the only one who can. Wires died to put me here. Well, him and my creator both, among countless other variables in this reality, but don't let my math interrupt your hero speech. My cheeks flame up like twin furnaces. You're not an idiot, Sky, Broom says, shaking her head. You may have survived last night, but I can't let you go. You don't have the mindset to willingly endanger yourself in service to another. That's why we picked wires. I, you thought I was going to be an idiot? You were a born idiot, Sky, Broom scoffs. You just ended up thinking books mattered more than people. I didn't think my cheeks could get any hotter. And all this time great-grandpa was assuring me I was all but guaranteed to be the memoriam due to my responsible nature. 
he at least has the decency to look a tiny bit ashamed. No, wait, he's just coughing again. Leader Broom. Torch eventually manages. What do we do? It is highly likely this is reality's local anchor, Sky. We need to investigate, and you are the only one equipped to do so properly. Try to convince her to let you accompany them on the follow-up scouting mission. I suggest an appeal to her inquisitive nature, followed by... I'm going, I insist, trying to stare down Broom. I don't know what I expected. No, you're not. I don't think my intimidation tactic is working, so I try a different approach. Look, I try not to whine, if we're dealing with, you know, I hitch my shoulder at Torch unobtrusively, then I'm the only one who can do it. You saw what it was like. You know that, um, the stuff, um. I trail off, mouth flopping open and closed like a beached fish. You are. Astonishingly bad at this, Sky, Broom finishes, covering her face with one palm. You're like a brand new idiot reporting for their first day. Behind me, Torch stiffens to an upright posture, despite the discomfort it causes her, and snaps her hands to her sides. I request an immediate update on any pertinent information, Leader Broom, especially if I am escorting a new idiot trainee, Leader Broom. Broom lets out a slow whoosh of air that sounds like she's expelling a decade's worth of trouble. Fine. Sky, you may accompany Scout Torch and her team on the follow-up investigation, because I just know you're going to find a way to tag along regardless of what I tell you, and I don't think I can stop you. Impressive foresight for a barbarian. However, Broom admonishes me, unaware of my internal interruption, if you feel like the situation has escalated into something untenable, you are to immediately inform the rest of the team so they can take proper precautions. Immediately. Absolutely, I agree, heart thumping rapidly. Am I excited or scared? I can't tell. At least I'll be able to plant some more trees for wires. Scout Torch, Broom continues, shifting her attention past my shoulder. I apologize for everything about this, but I am sending you out with the Rost, most supremely untrained idiot to ever grace our self-destructive ranks. You and your team are to protect the idiot unless there is a very compelling reason to do otherwise. You'll know what I mean when you see it, she adds, palming her face once again. I look back and Scout Torch seems to be frozen in her posture, her not quite a grin focused slightly above Broom's head. Understood, Leader Broom, she snaps out in a neutral tone. Standard exploration team? Take whoever you trust, Broom replies wearily. If I'm not mistaken, we're about to enter the archives with guns blazing. Teach us what you can. Somehow, Torch makes her previous stillness look like the excited bouncing of a little one five minutes before lunch. Understood, she says in a much quieter voice. Remember what we find. We will. Broom promises in the same solemn tone, and I look back and forth between them in confusion. Standard warrior culture exchange when faced with a non-viable mission. Broom doesn't think her people are coming back from this, but she needs to know whatever they can learn. She assumes we will fail, and that I will return any pertinent information as a side product of keeping you alive. Torch is unhappy with her perceived imminent demise, but is committed to her job regardless, because she assumes her life wouldn't be spent casually. What are the what now? Broom thinks she's sending us out to die? Luckily, with my guidance, no one needs to die today, Sky. If the reality anchor is revealing itself so soon, it is either an ad hoc conglomeration or an extremely weak intrusion, both of which we can deal with handily. As long as you keep us from succumbing to immediate damage, it will be trivial for me to dispatch the violations. This is actually somewhat fortunate for us. You're sure this is necessary? Great Grandpa asks Broom plaintively, and she gives him a firm nod. Sky was the second choice for the generation, Axe. You know this, and you know we're down an idiot with wires passing. Based on the demonstration, she tries not to shudder. If Sky thinks it's important to be there, I'm willing to back it as a necessary risk. We've survived this long, right? Great Grandpa clutches his blankets around himself tighter. Then all I can do is ask you to be careful, Sky, he says to me in a quavering voice. Listen to Torch, please, and don't risk yourself unnecessarily. I will, I won't. I don't quite swear, still caught up in that body-thumping rush of whatever feeling this is. It's adrenaline, but I'll do my best to make sure no one else from the village gets hurt. I promise. Behind me, Torch lets out a long sigh that doesn't quite cross the line into overly insulting. I turn and glare at her, and she shrugs noncommittally. Let's go then, rookie. She shrugs her thin backpack and rifle into a more comfortable position. We've got our orders. Try and keep up, if you can. Otherwise, you're off the team. She swivels on one heel and sprints out the door, ignoring her earlier exhaustion. I spend a couple seconds swearing, 
then I'm scrambling up after her. Good luck, Sky, Great Grandpa and Broom call as I barrel out of the archive room. But I'm too focused on chasing the flash of legs in front of me to answer. If I can't catch Torch before she leaves the archives, I'm pretty sure I'll lose her. Fortunately, my body moves more fluidly than I've ever felt, and I track her down as she's about to burst out the front entrance. There's nothing fortunate about it. I'm an integrator, and that means I integrate all of your body's current capacity. Wait, my current capacity? I nearly stumble rounding the archive's tree trunk, feet flying across the village's interior forest floor. Yes, Sky. As you absorb more reality, we can access more infinities. Why would you willingly remain an inferior outcome? I'm not sure how to respond to that yet. I never though of myself as inferior. Ah, the innocence of youth. Once you realize what we face, what we must become, you'll look back and laugh about this. That doesn't sound very encouraging. Torch looks over at me as I draw even with her, and her eyes narrow. She puts on a sudden burst of speed and I keep pace effortlessly. Well, aren't you the over achiever? She huffs out, arms pumping next to her sides. Bemused, I look back at her. It feels like I'm barely jogging. That's because her speed, while decent for someone not integrated, is too slow, Sky. Remember how quickly the violation attacked you and wires? Remember how fast the corporate marauders moved before you found me? Remember the chaos of what happened when the two met? Knife-edged memories slide out of my recollection, ambushing me mid-stride. This time I do stumble, but an unnaturally graceful step saves me from face-planting in the dirt. I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but if we're running to confront violations, this isn't a fight Torch is equipped to handle. It's not a fight anyone around you can handle. We're the only ones able to deal with what's threatening your village. Who's the one making hero speeches now? Just delivering facts. Ahem. Anyways, I've broken down your body's infinite potential into three distinct categories. The first is power, which is an amalgamation of your fast twitch muscle fibers, brute strength, raw hitting power, and hundreds of other variables. Investing in power will increase your close-range combat options in a variety of ways. Combat options? You're going to be involved in a lot of fighting from here on out, Sky. I already told you that. The next category is technique, which includes fine motor control, enhanced perception, and general finesse, among others. If you want to reach out and touch something at a distance, and keep it at a distance, technique is going to help. Why do I need to know this? It sounds overly complicated. I'm actually simplifying it immensely, and it's because I can't collapse fine-tuned reality waveforms like humans can, Sky. It's a deliberate safeguard built into integrators, and it's why I need you to make it as far as you can before you lose your sanity. Once your mind goes, I'm stuck with whatever infinite possibilities you manage to unlock. If you don't make us strong enough, me and your village are food for the next combat form that comes along. Torch leads us to the northern outskirts of the village, now examining me carefully in between measured inhalations. You don't run, right? I ignore her, focusing on my conversation with Box. Infinite possibilities aren't enough? Also, I don't like this assumption that me losing my mind is a guarantee. There are infinities, and then there are infinities, Sky. I integrate you with reality, but only as much as you can imagine. I can help you nudge the boundaries of that imagination, but individual perception is one of the few constants when it comes to the multiverse. If you can't comprehend it, you can't perceive it, and if you can't perceive it, you can't use it to alter your environment. Those infinities still exist, and they can still affect you, but as far as you know, it might as well be dark matter affecting galactic gravitation. And this is the dumbed-down barbarian version? It really is, Sky. Sorry. There's only so much reductionism the multiverse can take, and it zeroes out well above quantum physics. This is a lot to think about. I turn my attention back to Torch. So what are we supposed to do then? I ask as she staggers to a halt in front of a neatly kept cottage on the village limits. She glares at me, gasping for air, hands on her knees. I'm going to get dirt as soon as I catch my breath, and then we're going to run more. She stops talking, her exhaustion outweighing her pride. Weird. I don't feel tired at all. Last category, endurance. It's a combination of mental and physical willpower that allows you to, well, endure in the face of extreme circumstances. Consider it the defensive option, for as much as a picosecond combat multiverse allows for defense. Your infinities skew heavily towards endurance, in case you weren't aware. Makes sense. I don't like getting hurt. There's, I don't like getting hurt, 
And then there's, I don't like regular pain, but if I think it's worth it, I'm a fucking berserker howling at the moon, like you showed last night, Sky. Big fan of that version of you, by the way. What's a moon? Something that got replaced with a gravity generator 2,000 years ago due to an encounter with non-causal violations that did not go well. Anyways, I've told you this before, but if you want to survive, you need to think offensively. Endurance isn't what you want to make numbers go up. But you said you're the one who's going to be attacking everything. All I have to do is keep us alive. Torch bangs wearily on the door of the cottage. Dirt. You there, you piece of shit? Got something really spectacular for you today, so come on out. You're going to love it. A lugubrious face peeks out at me from beneath one of the hedges bordering the sides of the cottage, melting into existence in a chaotic swirl of leaves and soil. If it hadn't moved, I never would have known it was there. That is an impressive camouflage protocol. I would like to know more. Tell Torch I'm not here. Okay. The face whispers. It's my day off. Dirt idiot. Torch howls. Unaware of my interaction with the ambulatory bush now scuttling towards the corner of the cottage, you get your sorry ass out here right now. I'm calling in my favor. The bush pauses, then seems to wilt. In sad slow motion, it wobbles back towards us. Really? Torchy? It complains, sidling to a halt next to me. This is my day off. Gah. I try not to laugh at Torch's sudden exclamation of surprise. Wasn't the moving bush obvious to her? Your technique, while not quite abysmal at the moment, is more than enough to identify such a deception once you've been made aware of it, due to my integration. For a non-integrated human, though, he is quite skilled. I told you not to sneak up on me, dirt, Torch complains, rubbing a hand across her bloodshot eyes. Come on, grab your gear. We need to go be idiots. Say hi to the rookie, she adds tiredly, waving a hand. Rookie, this is dirt. He's good at hiding. Nice to meet you, Dash. I begin, but the bush is somehow gone. Very impressive for a non-integrated human. He noticed your earlier penetration of his outer layer of obfuscation, anticipated your predictable response to a predictable social query, and was already moving to secure the primary objective before your baseline senses noticed. If I had considered him a hostile, it would have been trivial to track his movements, but I am still calibrating your general situational awareness. What the fuck? Box. I sigh under my breath. I'm pretty sure it was unnoticeable, but Torch's eyes linger on me for a bit longer than seems normal as she scans the cottage grounds for dirt. He does this all the time, she says unconvincingly, still peering around. I'd trust him with my life, though. He's really smart, even among the idiots. Oh, thanks, Torch, says a gently mounted patch of grass next to her left foot. Gah. As Torch is busy trying not to collapse on her fatigued legs, the pile of grass rises up, revealing itself to be a short, slightly pudgy man with gently rounded cheeks. He reminds me of a chipmunk wearing an oversized green hooded coat made out of moss. Of course, most chipmunks don't come with as impressive an array of killing devices strapped to their body that are visible beneath Dirt's grass cloak. There's at least three pistols, five knives, some sort of heavy rifle I haven't seen before, and his backpack is bursting at the seams with. I am so sorry, Sky. This is the human that should have hosted me. Oh, what we could have been. Got my gear. Hi. I'm Dirt, he says shyly, waving at me. Hesitantly, I wave back. Nice to meet you, Dirt. He beams at me, then turns to Torch. What's the disaster? Potentially hostile super glow beast fauna excursion with an assumed archival records level rating. And she tosses her head at me, short black hair swishing across her brown eyes, unknown variables. Dirt's face falls slightly. Oh my. You a whoop. Now come on, let's go. We've got about an hour at a heavy trot, and there's no way this rookie is making me look bad again. Oh my. Dirt says again, this time giving me a considering look. He smiles genially as we move away from his cottage into a steady run through the forest, his heavy pack and weapons bouncing slightly beneath the cloak. You made Torchy mad. I like you already. Just know, he leans in closer, smiling wider, if you can't keep up, I'll have to kill you. It's not personal, but Torchy wouldn't use her favor unless the world was ending. If you're supposed to be here, you better not leave us hanging. I gulp nervously, still not feeling any exertion from the pace. Relax, Sky. Like Torch, Dirt also believes he will not return from this encounter and wishes to reassure himself that it was worth the sacrifice by gauging your apparent value. We will keep him safe too. I'll be fine. I try to reassure the both of us, leaping nimbly over a tree root. You don't have to worry about me not wanting to do this. Dirt regards me thoughtfully, then turns his attention back to the run. I feel like his lack of answer is probably the strongest indictment of this plan yet. 
but I try not to read too much into how grimly they're both regarding our chances of survival. Maybe they're just trying to scare me with how much they've seen as idiots. Yeah, that's probably it. The next 40 minutes. Because I was counting. Pass in relative silence. The only disturbance is dirt and torches steady huffs of air. The ladders grow increasingly more strained, until I finally demand that we call a halt. Scout Torch. You are not okay. Why haven't you said anything? Torch rolls her eyes, wheezing like a bellows as she all but collapses against a slender outskirts tree, one of the wild growth ones. Even dirt is panning hard, but I feel like I'm just getting warmed up. Sorry, it's just that. Pulling an emergency run, in full gear from the final pass, back to town, then doing it again 30 minutes later, is slightly taxing. She forces herself upright with an obvious effort of will. I don't know what your secret is, but unless you're offering to carry my gear, there's nothing else to do except keep running. She moves abruptly, lurching back into a wobbling gait. I'm an idiot. There's no way I won't make it. Try and keep up. We could carry her with our limb, though she might complain about that. As we set off from our impromptu rest site at the edge of the forest towards a distant foothill, I contemplate the idea for longer than I probably should. Picturing Torch's uptight face screaming as an undefinable intrusion hoists her alongside us like a bouncing sack of potatoes, gradually withering away her sanity beneath an open sky of endless stars does have a certain appeal. No, no, that wouldn't be fair to Torch. We'll find someone more deserving to do it to then. We can carry her packs if you really want to help her. I look over at Torch's laboring form, the gradually rising slope and obvious torture for her exhausted frame. Torch. Ng Che Che Ch. H N G Ch Ch Ch. Yeah. What? Want? Most there. Keep. Going. And just like that she collapses, eyes rolling back into her head, body toppling forward like deadwood. As fast as she falls, as fast as dirt lunges to try and catch her, my limb is even faster plucking her away from the stony ground an inch before her face would have impacted. A grotesquely defiant gesture of reality that makes me burp at the sudden taste of rotting fish. Blee. That tasted horrible, Box. Side effects of keeping your mind intact. Should I have let her break her nose? No. No. Saving her is fine. What's the problem, Dirt? I ask, one of Box's nerve-deadening cocktails pouring through my veins as I carry the unconscious torch beside me with my limb. Dirt is focusing intensely on me one of his pistols out and steady at my head even as we continue our run, but it doesn't rattle me. Unknown variable. Explain. I give Dirt the basics as we work our way up the hillside, warning him not to look at the limb-holding torch unless he likes drooling catatonia. Thankfully, he's one of the smartest idiots I've met, which means he's probably one of the smartest people in the village, and he heeds my warning while asking a minimal amount of questions. I convince him to put the pistol away after Box lets me know I can do backflips while carrying Torch at the same pace Dirt is running, and I demonstrate it to him. Turns out he just wanted to know if I was capable. After that, Dirt's more than happy to discuss leaving any potential close encounters to me, preferring the role of something called Overwatch, and is absolutely fine with me talking to myself. I do that too, he confides before ranging out ahead, leading the way to where Torch claimed she spotted the causal violations. Apparently the idiots have an entire coordinate grid planned out for the valley, and quite a bit of the unknown past it, which makes traveling to exact locations easy for them. It's called basic navigation, Sky. Now that you're integrated, you can do it down to the centimeter, the floor dong, analyzing foundational memories. Really? A top-shelf mental health suite for what might as well be eternity, but all they gave you is fuzzy math? No one bothered to come up with a standard system of measurement? Not even Imperial? A scrumble's always been the length of a scrumble, box. Why would it not be a scrumble? I believe I have mentioned that this tutorial experience is the worst. Watch out for that rock. I neatly vault over the head-high boulder, continuing my momentum into another sprint up the slope. Dirt is pulling away from me a bit, and I can't have him leaving me behind. Hey, this power stuff is kind of fun, box, I exclaim as I launch myself into a darting run that avoids the loose gravel dotting a steeper slope my limb still cradling torch at shoulder height. She's snoring softly. What's that like? With enough focus on those specific infinities, not only could you reduce these obstacles into dust with any close combat weapon you care to name, you could do so while moving through it like it wasn't even there. I am more than happy for you to focus on power infinities, Sky. Technique is equally acceptable. Just, please don't pick an avoidance non-damage number goes up stat ever again, or at least until I tell you it's optimal. I like avoidance, Box. Getting hurt is dumb. 
Avoidance doesn't mean you stop getting hurt, Sky. It just means you can get hurt longer until you quantum collapse a death state. Did you not realize that? Although, perhaps avoidance is a slightly misleading category name. I can see where the confusion might arise. Box, I no longer wish to focus on avoidance. Dumb choice, Dirt mutters from the top of the hill, his green moss cape somehow now transformed into a brown and gray mottled pattern that's indistinguishable from the hillside rocks and withered scrub. I crawl up next to him in a spider scuttle, following his flicked hand signals to lay torch down somewhere below the summit. Hand can't is a requirement for anyone even thinking of leaving the village outskirts, and I was always a good student. Why's that, Dirt? Avoidance is me up here. He smiles as he points down the other side, and I gaze down at the hollow boiling with unnatural shapes. I notice he's not looking directly at the seething mass of wrong, and I revise my opinion of dirt up yet again. Avoidance is support. He pats me lightly on the shoulder. You are not avoidance. You are the one who attacks the throne of God to ask why things aren't better. Good luck. I want to protest, but as I look down at the disgusting stain spreading across the hollow beneath us, I realize dirt is right. I am the one who attacks. Wires should still be alive. We are their end. Box and I descend on the oily horde of violations like a storm, and I'm not sure why I'm charging into a mass of dead flesh serpentine horrors. I just know that it needs to happen. My limb whips into existence next to my right arm, fuzzing bone chitin impossible edges holding the pistol like another part of my body and already firing. Dirty eye core spurts into the air. Impossible shots from this range, but they're happening. Box. Told you. Leave the fighting. To me. Focus. Keeping U.S. alive. Initializing local control of Dash.exe. A glistening pseudopod flashes at my face, and I instinctively trigger Dash. The world flickers, and then I'm in the midst of the monsters, box unloading our pistol at regular intervals. The initial strike misses, but another lashing whip catches me as four of the creatures surrounding us squirm and fall still. Reality buffer. 17%. Current life. 110 of 150. Burning pain erupts across my left side, hot wetness pouring down my side. Redistributing biomass, projecting biomass totals, projected 62% remaining biomass after life restoration. Don't charge into crowds of violations, idiot. Reality buffer, 34%. Current life, 130 of 150. Box keeps firing the pistol in our limb and dropping monsters without surcease buying us a brief window of time amongst the thrashing nightmares. I try to ignore the gradually fading pain in my side, along with the flush of inadequacy at Box's words. Maybe Broom was right. I don't have the instincts for this kind of slaughter. Voids it. We attack. Together. Why we? Integrated. Focus. Keep us safe. Current life. 150-150. Current biomass. 62%. Another thonic knot tentacle hammers towards my face. And this time, I dash towards an open space, trying to claim box some time to clear out the nearest targets. Viscous blood flows from irrational corpses, then both disappear, leaving the brief memory of a perfect gunmetal sphere before it sucked into my chest. Reality buffer. 89%. Almost. Verge. Another infinity. Don't stop. A howling wall of madness descends from all sides, the entire hollow collapsing on us in a spasm of squirming brutality. I scream my terror as I try to dash to ever-shrinking sanctuaries, the boom of boxes pistol overwhelmed by the otherworldly sounds of reality's hounds. But no matter how many horrors box takes down, there's always five more to take their place. Reality buffer. Full. Restoring access to non-causal expressions. Finally. Sky, choose a target. Trying not to hyperventilate, I point my finger at the heaviest collection of nightmares currently threatening to rip my soul from body. Executing hipdraw.exe. The god of thunder replaces Box's pistol shots, and eye wrenching holes of gnashing teeth tear open the writhing mass of creatures, quickly replaced by blinding spheres of obliteration that dissolve anything caught within their gravitational pull into a fine mist. The spheres contract, then pulse once in an overwhelming burst of force and light that jolts the ground like an earthquake that somehow leaves me unaffected. When I can see again, that section of attackers is completely gone and half the hillside is on fire. Reality buffer, 46%. Now our mobility's back. Almost done, Sky. I dash towards the gap as Box keeps clearing the space around us of thrashing monstrosities, looking frantically for the next safe spot to move to. However, 
It quickly becomes clear that whatever it was Box used earlier wiped out most of the creatures, and the ones left are moving slower now. Easy pickings for the pistol. I dodge the few that manage to get close enough to make me worry, but I don't end up needing to dash again, and finally the pistol falls silent. Reality buffer. Full. Aside from the charred craters dotting the hillside, the hollow bears no trace of the swarming tide that just infested it. I find myself gasping for breath even though I don't feel physically tired. I feel, untethered, as if the violent maelstrom I just charged through is only now sinking into my awareness. I drop my hands to my knees, trying to still my shaking legs. Saliva wells up in my mouth and I spit, then again, trying to keep it from turning into full-blown puking. Relax, Sky. It's over. We won. I spit one last time, then force myself upright. I need to check on dirt and torch, make sure they're okay. Well, we won for now. The reality anchor is still nearby. I may be the only one who can handle these things, but I'm starting to understand why Box thinks I'll lose my mind. We'll talk about the anchor in a bit. Let's get you calmed down and clear the buffer. I stagger away from the invisible carnage. Will I ever get used to this? Chapter 8. Levels and Limbs. Reality Buffer. Full. I'm trudging back up the blasted hillside to where hopefully Dirt is still waiting with Torch. I can't see him, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't mean anything. The annoying display in front of me refuses to go away, though. Ding. That's right. Box said he'd make those annoying sounds if I didn't clear the buffer right away. Fine. I focus on the box. Establishing new reality baseline. Waiting for quantum observer collapse. You have two infinity expressions available. Choose one of the following. Increased damage, this makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed, this makes us able to hurt things quicker. Avoidance, 1. This allows us to get hurt more without having to retreat. Don't pick it. Life regeneration, this allows us to heal more quickly using the same amount of biomass. Don't pick it. Increased movement speed, this allows us to move quicker. Don't pick it yet. Hmm. There are more options now. Also, this box sucks to look at. That is because you opened up more possible expressions of yourself when you expanded into avoidance last time. It becomes easier, for lack of a better word, to expand into related infinities the more you express yourself in that direction. However, some infinities require you to increase your expression in that particular subset before others open up. So if I decided to choose avoidance again, I'd get better at it again, and open up even more options? Basically, yes, but you're not going to pick avoidance again, right? We talked about this. We need to make damage numbers go up. Fine, fine. Which one should I choose then? Damage or attack speed? For now, attack speed. The reality anchor will likely be surrounded by more swarms of violations, and our current weapon is already strong enough to take them down efficiently. We need to be able to thin them out more quickly. I skirt one of the still smoldering craters. It looks like something took a bite out of the ground. Can't we just use that big explosion thingy you did? That seemed to work pretty well. Manifesting our own non-causal violations is energy-intensive and requires substantial downtime between uses. At your current integration level, you can use hip draw once every 30 seconds, which is an eternity in combat. Don't be afraid to use it when necessary, but you won't be able to rely on it for everything. I guess that makes sense. I concentrate on the increased attack speed choice. Observer collapse initiated. Attack speed increased by 2%. You have one infinity expression available. Choose one of the following. Increased damage, this makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed, 1. This makes us able to hurt things quicker. Avoidance, 1. This allows us to get hurt more without having to retreat. Don't pick it. Life regeneration, this allows us to heal more quickly using the same amount of biomass. Don't pick it. Increased movement speed, this allows us to move quicker. Don't pick it yet. Increased pierce chance, this allows us to hit more than one thing with a single attack. Don't pick it yet. I'm really beginning to dislike that box. Why are the numbers so small, box? 2% doesn't seem like it'll do much. Pick attack speed again, and you'll see. Observer collapse initiated. Attack speed increased by 4%. Current attack speed increase is 6%. Reality buffer, 0%. The attack speed number got bigger. But like, bigger than it got bigger before. You see? As you expand yourself in each particular infinity, you access progressively more of it and become better able to use what it offers. There are diminishing returns for general gains after a certain point, but other options then become available. 
These are infinities, after all. I guess I'll figure it out as we go. I reach the crest of the hill and look around. Hey, Dirt, you still here? Box says it's safe for now. A small boulder stands up, the mottled grays and browns resolving into Dirt's cloak. He's cradling a long rifle in his hands, and streaks of dark red, almost black, cake the front of his face. It looks like he's been weeping rivers of blood, and his eyes are puffy and bruised. Try to help, he says hoarsely as he walks closer. Wasn't able to as much as I wanted. It was difficult. He accounted for five kills, which frankly is almost unbelievable for a non-integrated human. He's lucky he didn't suffer a stroke. Box says not to push yourself, I tell him. As he stumbles to a halt, I see he's swaying on his feet, like he's not quite sure if the ground is there or not. Whoa. Hey, you should sit down. Where's Torch? I help him into a seated position, his back against a boulder, and dirt points to a lump of barren earth. I walk over to it, and when I get close enough, it turns into another cloak, nearly indistinguishable from the ground. I flip it up to reveal Torch still passed out, gently snoring while blowing a spit bubble. I tuck some of the cloak under her head to make her more comfortable, then return to dirt and sit beside him. How many of those cloaks do you have? Three for this season, but they act as six. He shows me the inside of his boulder cloak, which is the same dark green of the one he was wearing earlier. See? Reversible. Save space. He tilts his water flask to his mouth with shaking hands and takes a sip. So, unknown variables. He shakes his head with a bemused grin, white teeth flashing beneath the dried blood. More unknown than I was expecting. Glad you were here. Torchy would have died. I would have died. Broom would have died. He chuckles. Yes, that makes you the chief idiot now. I giggle at the thought of trying to order Broom around. Dirt's humor is infectious and releases some of the stress still pooling in my stomach. I'm not an idiot. I poke at him in mock anger. I'm a memoriam. I had to convince them to let me come out here. I'm more interested in the past, remember? Makes you a perfect idiot. Just like Book. That's what she told everyone too. Hey Torchy, he calls. What do you think? Is Sky an idiot? Soft snores are the only answer, and we both start laughing again. Torchy's going to be so mad that she slept through a fight. Especially a fight a rookie had to win. You better watch out when she wakes up. Probably put soap in your soup. Oh, she's competitive? High sense of self-esteem. I roll my eyes. I couldn't tell. She hides it well. Good thing she was asleep, Dirt says, turning serious. Would have tried to join you. Can't help herself. Definitely an idiot. Just like you. Yeah, yeah, I agree good-naturedly, letting my head lean back against the sun-warmed rock. It feels nice, and the clouds are beautiful overhead, scudding slowly through the sapphire sky. The sun has just passed its highest point, beginning the long fall to earth, and I close my eyes, sucking in a deep breath. How can it be so peaceful when just minutes ago it was so violent? Am I allowed to enjoy it? The dichotomy of conflict, Sky. Now, as glad as I am that your mental state has recovered naturally, I need to point out the reality Anchor is still nearby. We should take advantage of our victory while we can, before it starts manifesting more violations. I open my eyes and sigh. Box says we should track down the Anchor. I tell Dirt quietly. Until I take it out, more of those things are going to keep appearing. It's over there. He points at a jumble of rocks halfway up a distant cliff barely visible from where we sit. I gape at him. How do you know? He shrugs. Dirt doesn't look right. Also, no birds. Was an old globeast cave, turned into a bird cave when we hunted down the globeast. Take a look. He offers the scope of his rifle to me and I squint through it, trying to find the rockfall, but I can't seem to hold it steady enough, or I'm looking in the wrong areas. We don't need the scope, Sky. If you'll allow me, just look at the rocks. I let the scope drop. Sure. I focus on the distant landmark, details obscured, and then my eyes twitch strangely. Suddenly, it's like I'm looking at it from barely ten strides away, everything appearing in crystal-sharp clarity. Whoa. I'm an integrator, Sky, which means... Yeah, yeah, you integrate all of my body. Thanks, Box. Look, I think Dirt is right. The ground around the rockfall seems off, as if it can't quite decide what it wants to be until I direct my attention at it. Wherever I focus seems normal, but in the blurred corners of my vision, I keep seeing flashes of landscapes that don't belong. Dead winter wastelands, overgrown jungles filled with bloody trees, a chalky surface that wriggles like it's composed of a trillion tiny creatures, and those are just the ones I can put words to. The shadows behind the rockfall are filled with things I definitely don't have words to describe. They're not there, 
but at the same time, they are, and they shouldn't be there. Well spotted, dirt. Those are textbook signs of a reality anchor. Normally, violations only have enough energy to affect their immediate forms, but anchors radiate a zone of causal boundary dissolution that warps space-time itself. It's what draws in the violations, makes it easier for them to manifest. Does Dirt know how deep the cave behind the rocks is? Box wants to know how big the globe east layer is. We're pretty sure the anchor is in there. Knew the dirt didn't look right. Here. Dirt grabs one of the smaller knives from his belt and starts scratching in the loose soil of the hilltop. Before long, a crude map appears, several snaking lanes that branch out before coming back together into a small oval. Burrow splits just after the entrance. Keep to the inside wall and it'll circle back around. Outside wall openings are dead ends. Main burrow is halfway around the circle, opens up into a cavern. No light except what you bring. Will that be a problem, Box? I don't know, Sky. What am I? Sheesh, fine. Sorry for interrupting you earlier. You're an integrator. We'll be fine without light. I add for Dirt's benefit. What about you? Dirt sighs, then begins pulling various weapons from beneath his cloak and lining them up on the ground. When he's done, there are three knives of various sizes, the longest almost an oddly curved short sword, two pistols, a stocky submachine gun, and the long rifle he was carrying earlier. I won't survive in there, he says simply, letting his hands fall to his sides. Take what you feel you need, and I'll make a camp for your return. If you don't return, I will take Torchy and tell the village we need to relocate. Relocate? I reply in a shocked voice. The village has been there forever, dirt. What about the trees? Saplings can be replanted. Homes can be rebuilt. People aren't as easy. It has been done before. Now I really want to see whatever records the idiots have tucked away in their archive. There's nothing in the Shrine of Memory that even hints at the village having moved before. Tell Dirt not to worry, Sky. If I feel you are at risk of permanent death, I will evacuate us back to the village. Unfortunately, I will need to replace biomass if that happens. Box says not to worry about us. I say slowly thinking about all the possible risks of failure. As long as you keep your camp far enough away so you're not noticed, I can come back even if I fail to remove the anchor. I'm not going to fail, though, I add in a fierce tone. I'm going to protect the village. All of it. Dirt examines me for a long moment, his bloodshot eyes piercing my own, then knots. I am not willing to touch the hot stove that is entering the cave, but I will risk trusting you, sky idiot. I'm not in dash. He interrupts my protestation, voice deadly serious. As of this moment, you are an idiot, because only an idiot would willingly face whatever lies inside that place in the hopes of keeping others safe. Teach us what you can. He says the last part solemnly, as if reciting the last words at a tree planting, and I realize I've heard that phrase before. Remember what I find? Is that how it goes? Dirt's eyebrows raise. How do you know the idiot's prayer? Um, Broom said what you just said to Torch this morning. And that's what Torch said back. I figured it was like a farewell or something. It is a farewell and a promise. We say it whenever we find something new, because someone has to be the first one to eat the melty rock, and we all eventually find our own melty rock. Our promise to them is that there will not need to be a second. That is what it means to be an idiot. I gulp. Now that I think about it, there aren't many stories of idiots dying from old age. You're worrying too much again, Sky. We'll be fine. Based on Dirt's information, the anchor's sphere of influence is only 90 meters, and that's the worst-case scenario. Serious reality breaches can encompass tens of kilometers of space, if not thousands. Meters. 2.68 scrumbles, and if time travel wasn't impossible, I'd go back and find whoever built your math knowledge base and end them. Dirt ignores my brief one-sided conversation and beckons towards the line of weapons. Now, what will help you most? I have limited ammunition for the guns, he apologizes. Only so much room in the pack, and Torchy was in a hurry. Ammunition is not a problem. The infinity where you have remaining rounds is so vast as to be functionally limitless, even amongst other limitless infinities. I recommend either the Kukri or the MP5X. Both will serve better than your pistol in the cave. What? A yellow outline appears around the curved short sword and the submachine gun. Small strings of numbers hover over each one, some green, some red, but I have no idea what any of them mean. Normally you'd have several years of training in how specific weapons interact with your infinity expressions, but we'll have to make do. The cookery hits harder, but requires you to be up close and personal. I can also use it while you dash. The MP5X fires very quickly, but doesn't do much individual damage per round. However, 
If you decide to expand into non-causal ammunition infinities, it will inflict them extremely fast. Either one will work well for our current purposes. Um, I guess I'll take the sword, I say, reaching for the curved blade box called a cookery. Guns are useful for hunting and protection, but knives are more versatile in everyday life. It's almost impossible to dress a deer with a rifle or cut a rope with a pistol, not to mention the nail trimming limitations. As I'm about to pick it up, a portion of my limb extends out from my wrist, grabbing the weapon. It shivers briefly, then both my limb and the sword disappear. Dirt and I share perplexed stares. Attunement in progress. I am aligning the cookery's potential to your infinities. Objects share the same multiversal infinities as you, except they cannot collapse their own observer states to alter those infinities, even with an integrator. They lack the quantum interactions of soffits. With a slight pop, my pistol appears in the same place the curved sword occupied. Our confusion grows, dirt's likely at the vanishing and reappearing weapons, my own at Box's incomprehensible explanation. However, since we are currently limited to one limb, we can only attune one weapon at a time. If you keep the pistol with you, I can reattune it at a later point, but I would not recommend doing so during combat unless you feel extremely confident in our safety. Our aggressors will not show mercy if they find us unarmed. I hesitantly grab the pistol, then hold it close for examination. Despite how many shots Box fired through it recently, it looks immaculate. Weapon maintenance, of course, is not a problem. I'm pretty sure Box is being smug. I check to make sure the pistol is safely unloaded, then tuck it into my backpack. Great grandpa will kill me if I lose it. That pistol has been in our family for generations. Attunement completed. Removing hipdraw.exe. Nothing personnel.exe available. Now what? Different weapons have different non causal expressions. Unlike hipdraw, you can use nothing personnel every 15 seconds. It is significantly less taxing on our reality draw. As if any of that made sense, I mutter, pushing myself to my feet. Guess I'll keep figuring it out as I go. You're sure you don't want to take anything else? Dirt asks, looking up at me from his seated position against the boulder. One knife against a cave of monsters is bold even for an idiot. It'll be fine. If Box says that's all we need, then it's all we need. While I am flattered by your faith in my judgment, I would feel far more comfortable with a Ragnarok-class multidimensional kinetic pulsar and several disintegration flails, along with far more infinity expressions opened up. The cookery is adequate for what we have to work with, but there's no such thing as too much firepower when it comes to dealing with non-causal violations. We'll be fine. Where should I meet you and Torch when we're done in the cave? You remember where we rested? Outskirts of the forest? Head there, and I'll find you. Dirt pushes himself to his feet with a groan. Time to clean everything up. Come on, Torchy, he yells at the snoring woman still passed out on the ground. You were right. I love this. She continues sleeping and he starts packing away the weapons. I take a step towards the distant rockfall, then pause. You're sure you'll be okay carrying everything, along with Scout Torch? P.S.H. We're idiots. You go fight the monsters with just a knife. The day I can't carry Torchy and my gear is the day they plan a tree over me for being dead. I snort. I wish I'd gotten to know Dirt sooner. I like his style. Hopefully we can hang out more when the village is safe. Okay. Be back soon. I turn and start running for the distant cliff, the ground falling away beneath my bounding strides. You should use Dash. It will help to practice with it, and will make us arrive sooner. I can do that? Why wouldn't you be able to? It's part of who you are now, Sky. Huh. I guess I didn't really think of Dash as anything other than a combat ability. It feels, weird, somehow, to just casually defile the universe in order to cut down on some travel time. Okay then. Dash. I almost collide with a rock and I'm pretty sure it's Box's reflexes that shoot me into a front flip over its suddenly looming bulk. Okay, maybe I do need to practice using Dash. I try using it again, but an error message Box pops up in front of me. Why can't I use Dash more than once in a row, Box? For the same reason why you can't manifest non-causal violations back-to-back. -back. It takes me time to recalibrate where we are amongst the infinities of the multiverse. Generally, the more non-causal the effect, the longer the cooldown period. Luckily, Dash only violates a few natural laws that no one important cares about anyways, so it doesn't take more than a few seconds to finish its cooldown. Sure enough, another box appears telling me that Dash is ready again. These boxes are kind of annoying. Is there a different way to let me know when it's ready? Sure. You want a visual, audio, or tactile cue? What's the difference? Visual means I'll put a color indicator somewhere it won't interfere with your normal point of view. Audio will be a sound. 
Tactile will be a physical sensation, like feeling hungry or energetic. Visual, please. A green haze appears at the edge of my vision, faint enough so that it doesn't occlude anything, but I can tell it's there. I use dash again, and the haze shifts to light red. After a few seconds, it smoothly shifts back into green. Okay, yeah, that will work. Thanks. I spend the next 10 minutes practicing dash while I sprint towards the rockfall and learn a few things. First, dash always moves me a set distance. 5 meters, but won't physically place me inside something else. I do keep some momentum, though, which I discover after dashing directly at another rock and then tripping over it when I appear right in front. Second, dash's cooldown is as close to 3 seconds as I can tell. It's exactly 3 seconds, which allows me to use it liberally but not carelessly. Third, I don't have to look where I'm dashing. It's totally omnidirectional, but combined with the first fact makes me realize I need to work on my situational awareness. Dashing to the side to avoid an attack won't help if I end up falling on my butt or stepping into a hole. I wonder if there's a way to make it feel more natural? There are infinities involving dash, yes, but they don't make damage numbers go up so you should just forget about them now. By the time I reach the base of the cliff holding the anchor's cave, I'm feeling slightly more confident in my ability to use dash effectively. To my surprise, it's also a lot of fun. Being able to dart around all over the place makes me feel like a little one again, and I'm grinning as I come to a halt in front of the steep slope. Try and keep that good mood. Once the anchor realizes it's under attack, it's going to start fighting back. We need to get to it as quickly as possible, before it can warp things around us too much. What happens if we take too long? The boundary between your reality and the multiverse frays even more, and bad stuff starts taking an interest. More potent non-causal violations, dangerous environmental alterations, even direct attacks on your perception of reality itself. Once we get rid of the anchor, everything else will be forced back to where it came from. So don't let yourself get distracted. Our goal is to neutralize it as quickly as possible. We also don't have access to any biomass other than what's in my reserves so try not to let us take too much damage. So, what? We go in, and I sprint right for it. Speaking of which, how am I going to see? Dirt said it was dark in there. That's the plan, and I'll alter your eyesight. I can recreate the effects of your glow light with our limb, and that'll give us plenty of illumination. Where is my glow light? I needed biomass to extract you last night without leading everything straight to your village, and I used literally anything I could find. Most of it was corporate marauders, but that wasn't nearly enough. Wait, biomass is people, among other things. This is one of those topics we're going to have to not argue about, Sky. You need biomass to survive, especially if you take damage. Anything that isn't a violation is going to be a source of biomass. My good mood evaporates, and I'm once again reminded of the grim reality of my new existence. Sorry, I was going to tell you at some point, when you weren't as overwhelmed with new information. Whatever, I snarl, charging up the slope. Let's go kill some monsters. My limb materializes next to me, cookery blade angled outward, bone white segments glowing a faint purple, and I dash at the rockfall, looking for a way through. To my shock, I go completely through the solid pile of rubble, reappearing in a narrow passageway that looks clawed from the earth. Apparently, the fourth important fact about dash is that it allows me to pass through obstructions if there's enough space on the other side. Unfortunately, that other side is crawling with grotesquely squirming sinuous forms. My cookery lashes out instantly, cleaving the nearest two apart, and then the others react, some leaping forward, others scuttling along the walls and ceiling. I watch them get closer, waiting for the edges of my vision to shift from red to green, box dispatching the closest ones with merciless efficiency. A pseudopod streaks towards my face, and then red finally turns green and I dash forward again. I warp through the flailing mass of violations and emerge on the other side, box carving three more into swiftly evaporating mist directly along our passage. Huh, that's useful. Told you, the cookery's advantage can attack while dashing. I take advantage of the momentary lull to scan the area. The rough walls, bearing clear marks of Glooby's talons, are wide enough for some lateral movement, and up ahead I see a splitting fork in the passage. I start sprinting for it, hearing the dread whispers of unnatural flesh slither over the rock behind me. Right or left? Doesn't matter. Both lead to the chamber. And what if the anchor isn't in there? I growl, darting down the left branch of the fork. A mass of violations leaps at me from a narrow side opening, and we cut through them in a welter of miasmic eye core and thudding pseudopod impacts. Current life, 190-250.
I emerged from the other side with bruises over my face and chest, blood trickling from one ear. There wasn't any room to dodge. Redistributing biomass. Projecting biomass totals. Projected 72% remaining biomass after life restoration. Hey, wait, I have more life? Another cluster of warped shapes spill out of the darkness, trying to clog the path with sheer mass. I dash through them, cookery flickering all around in a web of steel. Reality buffer, 37%. Current life, 170-250. Redistributing biomass. Projecting biomass totals. Projected 58% remaining biomass after life restoration. A serpentine extension lashes up from the floor, catching me in the side. I hear a cracking sound, and Lansing Payne immediately stabs through me. Probably some ribs. I push forward anyways, doing my best to ignore the hurt. Current life, 145-250. Redistributing biomass. Projecting biomass totals. Projected 41% remaining biomass after life restoration. Try taking less damage. Oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? I gasp narrowly dodging another probing strike from the seemingly endless amounts of creatures by leaning back so far my hair almost touches the dirt floor. I don't know if you noticed, but there's not much room here. The cookery slices through more of the horde as I dash again, but another wave is waiting on the other side. I focus on them, flexing that strange mental muscle I use to activate hip draw, executing nothing personnel.exe. I feel empty, like something I didn't know was there isn't there anymore. The passageway, on the other hand, is suddenly even more crowded, humanoid shapes that shouldn't fit somehow lurking behind each of the violations. Wait, those all look like me. The figures open their mouths too wide, bearing the same terrible flash of too many teeth. I watering blades covered in endless edges rip ragged tears in the fabric of sanity, and the violations melt away, revealing a clear path to a larger opening. Something flows back into me, like a centipede darting back into an empty orbital socket. I decide to worry about it later, pushing myself back into a run. The noise from behind is like a waterfall of nightmares and it keeps getting closer. The squelching sounds of the cookery hitting flesh keeps a monotone pace to my mad scramble. Almost there. I emerge into the cavern, desperately looking around for the anchor. Oh shit. Found the anchor. A hulking amalgamation of blackened bones covered in weeping eyes lurches up from its crouching stance against the back wall. Each eye has been punctured by something a disgusting green pus leaking from their cloudy orbs, and the bones make an unnatural clattering sound even when the thing isn't moving. A disgustingly thick purple tongue slips out from between a gap in the bones, then another, and another, and another. Tiny mouths open at the end of each slobbering muscle, and a chorus of shrilling voices echoes through the room. Return. Rejoin. Oh shit. Sky, we need to kill it now. The reality draw here just spiked. I don't bother responding instead throwing myself at the abomination. Ugly white flames burst into life along all the eyes, and the chittering mouth screech in a mixture of pain and joy. I dash through it, my cookery severing two of the tongues, and the screeches turn to ground-shaking bellows. As I look back, a tidal wave of violations pours into the cavern from both entrances, thrashing at each other in their haste to reach me, the walls themselves melting into terrible views of unfamiliar skies. Distracted by the altered environment, it takes me a second to notice the lurid crimson light flaring into existence around me, a sphere centered on my stomach. It extends for three of boxes meters in each direction. Sky. Run. Pain assails me from every direction, types of pain I didn't even know could exist. The monster carves daggers from my worst memories and plunges them through my spine, using the nerve signals to weave a boiling lake of regret that quickly unravels my sense of self into decoring shreds of abyssal nothing. I feel the concept of I falling away. Current life, 2 250. Warning, biomass reserves exhausted. Stupid, fucking, boxes. I gather together everything I can lay hands on. Wires death, my lack of parents, my frustration with box, and use it to make my feet take one more step. Then another. Dash. The anchor's last two tongues fall to the ground, flapping uselessly, and the chorus of brain-piercing voices falls silent. I ignore the horde of violations rushing at me beneath misbegotten skies of nauseating flesh and stumble around to face the rattling abomination. Its milky white eyes are blazing up again, that sickly light gathering from sun's best left unseen. I point my finger, executing nothing personnel.exe. A copy of me appears behind each eye, warping my perceptions with their impossible existence, then too many teeth flash in those awful smiles. 
Fractal edges shred existence into confetti once more. Reality buffer. Full. The countless eyes spray boiling gouts of pus into the air. The noxious fluids defying gravity to rise up to the ceiling where they eat away stone and honeycomb hisses. Blackened bones rattle one last time, then collapse to the ground, sloughing into non-existence. A gently pulsing tesseract hangs in the space the anchor just vacated. I gaze blankly at it, and then it shoots across the intervening distance and slams into my chest without touching a single part of my body. Non-causal node absorbed. Restoring impossibility matrix. The slithering rush of flesh from behind cuts off like a stilled heartbeat. As I fall forward, I see that the violations have all vanished, leaving the cavern cold and empty. Just before I hit the ground, my limbs shoot out to either side, bracing me with immovable bone-white segments. Oh, I say weakly, turning my head to each side. We have another one now. Hooray. Then I let myself black out. Chapter 9, Interlude, Space Dog Blues Hand me the 3 16th spanner, lad. The sweating young man reaches into his tool pouch and pulls out a thin metal tool, placing it into the waiting hand. He looks around nervously, still unused to navigating the bowels of the ship's engines even after a month. The spanner comes spinning back and clocks him in the ear, eliciting a muffled swear and clasped fingers in front of his mouth. Distant shapes, barely visible through the sauna like mist, stir their bulbous fronds irritably. What die go and do that for? He whines softly. I set a three sixteenths, you useless little shite. That's a one quarter. And unless you want to watch your brain turn into your nostrils when the whole ship inverts into a paradox cascade, you'll learn to tell the difference. The gnarled hand covered in a multitude of scars beckons impatiently for the proper tool, the rest of the owner's body buried in a seething mass of protoplasm stretching in every direction. It pulses rhythmically, flashes of bruised lung purple flickering across the ochre expanse, then a bolt of negative light discharges overhead splitting the mist and briefly revealing similar titanic forms. Quickly now, lad, the muffled voice says with more urgency. Reality squeezing us into some choices I really don't want to be a part of. The three sixteenths. The young man scrambles through his pouch with a metallic clatter. It'd be a lot easier if you used metric, he whines again, holding another tool up to his eyes, squinting in the dim light, then throws it back in the bag. Making up numbers based off the length of someone's stride thousands of years ago is no basis for proper measurement. He peers at another tool, then flings it forward. The spanner hits the palm with a meaty slap and weathered fingers close around the metal shaft, thumb moving briefly along its length. About fucking time, lad. The hand disappears into the protoplasm with a disturbingly organic slurp. Some time passes without further conversation, the young man looking around in increasing panic. The air vibrates to a barely audible heartbeat thrum, each beat thumping a different tempo than the last, and shapes crawl along the misting eddies with ephemeral claws, vanishing whenever he tries to catch them with his eyes. Mac Willie, whoever he's quietly calling to doesn't answer, and the crackling blast of tainted light overhead seem to press down slightly closer. Shadows gather a little too quickly in the afterimages of their glare, shifting back and forth like the lip of a glass full of water right before it overflows. Low, low, look. He stutters, fingers clenching around the tool bag. This isn't foo-foo funny, chief. More silent branches of screaming illumination twisting all around, the mist pressing with a physical weight. Sibilant whispers strain the edges of hearing before blasting and impossibly loud, so quickly that the momentary deafness fades seamlessly into the same indecipherable hiss. The young man crouches down, feeling behind himself for support. A greasy hand, flesh melting off the fingers sliding wetly into his own, greets his appeal. He gags, twitches his head, then forces himself not to look back. Any foo-foo fucking time now would be good, Mac Willie, he fervently mutters, digging into the tool bag with his other hand as if he's going to find a weapon. Another clammy grip clasps up through the metal objects in an inevitable prison, and his face suddenly droops like he's about to cry. The young man turns into a boy. Come on, Mac Willie, he whimpers feeling the implacable hands of hell slowly pull him towards a floor that's now covered in howling eyeless faces. Tiny worms wriggle upwards expectantly from their gaping nostrils. Come on, please. Just as the gnashing mouths are about to close on his thin pressed lips, a quick ripple distorts the world in every direction. Splort. And this is what a one-quarter is for, young Master Huckins, the broad-shouldered form that lands beside him bellows scooping a metal object up off the floor of screaming mouths as shimmering folds of something steam away from her. You use a 3 16th for adjusting reality fields, but the 1 quarters for putting and back in their place. 
Hawkins gasps at the sudden spasm of violence that distorts everything around him. Silvery flashes of countless spanners locking up gnashing finger teeth bend his mind in strange directions, his entire perspective diving into a pustule-covered gum line before being dragged back out by a hand that's more scar tissue than flesh. His mind creaks like a tree on the verge of snapping in hurricane winds. What are you waiting for? L.A.D.? A voice roars all around him, abruptly the only thing that exists. There's another one quarter in the bag. The welcome grip of cold metal fills Huckins' thoughts, his fingers shakily clenching around the solid weight in a reality gone mad. His thumbs involuntarily trace the gaps between three raised parts. One and four. The young man's eyes snap back into focus and he pulls himself up from the glutinous floor, fire roaring along his veins, one hand pulling free from the howling muck, hard iron gleaming in his grasp. His other hand follows like an avalanche, squeezed tight around a mirror pair of the innocuous tool that now blazes like an inferno in both fists. He smashes a jagged edge mist crawler into fleeting shards with an uppercut right, left hand hooking around to catch another across its midsection and sending it squalling back into immateriality. A third swoops in on dirty blossoms of broken dreams, and the young man scowls at it before delivering a vicious headbutt, dissolving the violation into a splatter of disbelieving chaos. And tell your fucking pa my name is Huckins. Breathing hard, he looks around for the next violation to tear apart, but suddenly he's back in the engine room, the steady erratic thump of polyp converters billowing misting waves in their normal screeching howls. He looks at his hands, empty except for a fine tracery of scars that weren't there before so faint as to almost be invisible. They almost look like numbers. And that's how we do it, lad, Mac Willie chortles, smacking him across the back with a hand heavy enough to make him cough. You've the makings of a proper space dog now. Huckins stares up into her almond-slanted dark eyes, his own widening at the notification popping up in a reality only he can see. I, my integrator, is five points. I, and good for you, Mac Willie cuts him off, suddenly serious. But now it's time to pay the piper. A face appears in the air in front of them, draped in command deck finery and seemingly chiseled out of ice. Mac Willie throws a surprisingly sharp salute, her elbow in Huckins' side prompting him to do the same. Chief Engineer Mac Willie reporting, Captain Sprick, sir, she barks, ignoring the trickles of blood seeping from her close cropped wiry black hair and joining the thick streams pooling down her cheeks. Inside Huckins and I have effectuated repairs to the aforementioned approaching non-viability energy-generating non-causal devices, sir, diverting only the barest minimum for life support purposes, you captain, sir. Yes, chief engineer, the floating face snaps impatiently. I saw the engine maintenance updates. Why are we showing a 1.9% lack of efficiency in 32 alpha? Energy siphoning during an active operation is grounds for summary execution, as I'm sure you know. As I said, sir, taking the newbie through his paces, you captain, sir, Mac Willie replies stolidly. Energy demands dropped us into a spot of trouble, sir, and I decided to take a chance on the lad. Won't you believe it, sir? She beams at the floating face. But didn't the youngster himself head but a class 3 right back into oblivion? He surely did. Saved us a 4.12% efficiency drop on calibrating 15 beta when you tell us we're still orbiting this dirtball two days from now all the while asking us to work even worse miracles. you Captain, sir. Captain Sprick's eyes narrow dangerously. And how do you know what we're doing two days from now, Chief Engineer? Mac Willie stares at him, then turns to Huckins. Lad, hand me the tool bag. Dumbfounded, the young man passes the thin pouch over and watches in astonishment as Chief Engineer Mac Willie hauls a full two-liter bottle of Bumpsnerfel's finest void hood from a container that couldn't possibly contain it. Mac Willie yanks the cork free with her teeth, spits it at the face, then gulps down a hefty swig, her eyes blazing. You leave the fucking engines and everything that goes with M to me, you captain sir, and we'll keep this bloated bitch roaring into the jaws of reality itself. That's my promise and here's me telling the truth. She takes another mouthful, then sprays it at the floating face, not bothering to wipe the residue from where it's mixing with the congealing fans of blood on her lower chin. All my ancestors in every world. But if you want to space me, you captain, sir, you just go right on ahead and do it. I'm sure your engines will be fine. Captain Sprick regards her impassively, then switches his attention to Hawkins. You have but a violation? Yes. Uh, yes, sir, your captain, sir. In your estimation, did Chief Engineer Mac Willie's actions save lives? Oh, absolutely, sir. Hawkins nods fervently. That whole section was ready to flip somewhere else. The backwash almost caught me up 
but the engines are running smooth now, and my integrator expanded capabilities five times. He thinks about the newfound scars on his hands. Chief Engineer Mac Willie staked my life on it. You just leave everything to us. Sir. Well done. The floating face disappears and Chief Engineer Mac Willie slaps her thigh in laughter before taking another chug from the bottle of space hutch. Well done, lad. Well done. Now you're a proper space dog and quicker than most. I what now? Two things make a space dog, lad. Mac Willie chortles, passing him the bottle while she kicks the quivering protoplasm in measured blows. The bruised purple traceries flicker once more, then the massive structure expels a hissing vent of glittering sparks high overhead with a sound of relief. You take a tool to reality and come out the other side, and you tell the old man to fuck himself when it comes to your engines. Huckins hesitantly tastes the space hutch, then tries not to gag. Next to him, Mac Willie gives the pulsating engine one last kick, this one almost affectionate, before snatching the bottle away. You don't drink Bumsnerfel's finest for the taste, you little shite, she growls, appending another slug into her mouth. This is for those who survive, and those who don't. She pours a splash next to the engine, then pushes the bottle back into Huckins' chest. This time he takes a proper gulp. Seconds later, he's spraying distilled engine coolant everywhere, hands on his knees and trying not to throw up. Macwilly cackles. Better put some of those points into reality poisoning, you wet nose snot. You're no space dog until you can keep your bumsnerfles down. The young man glares at her around hacking coughs. Why are you pushing me so hard, Mac Willie? My integrator's pointing out this ain't normal. I was a bit overconfident, yeah, but the trainings don't have class threes present until a year from now, and Bumpsnerfuls is part of the graduation test. What's going on? The chief engineer reclaims her bottle, draining a quarter of it with an explosive sigh. That's why you're here, lad. You're on the fast track to success. My very own replacement in Wutan Whalen's finest dirty work cruiser. She starts walking towards the next thonic engine housing brooding in the steamy cavern. Captain Sprick's a complete pissant, but he runs a tight ship, and I'm getting close to my expiration date. If you're not on top of everything, he'll space you. But you, lad, she bends down towards Huckins, you've got the fire. Not many who will headbutt a violation and make it stick. You're leaving, chief? Huckins asks, stomach sinking for more than the residual space hutch. Not my choice, Macwilly says gruffly, stomping up to the next engine casing, another nightmarish protoplasm tower covered in seeping fissures and bruised traceries of purple light. Only so much reality any one person can handle, even with an integrator, and I've been doing this for too long. Pretty soon I'll be one of these poor saps. She pours out several splashes at the foot of the engine, then takes another drink. At least the me that's me won't be around to care. Just my integrator running the meat. Then why do you keep doing it? Huckins asks, examining a set of dials that waver in and out of existence. Why not ask for your walking papers? Go retire somewhere nice. I am somewhere nice, lad. Mac Willie pats the side of the engine gently. I get to see my old mates every day, make sure they're looked after proper like, and eventually I'll join. Him. Chief engineers stick with their ships. Well, that won't be me, Huckins says defiantly, standing up from the dials. I'm going to finish my service and get deintegrated. Find someone nice to start a family with. Maybe raise moohounds. He motions to the engine. Levels refine on this one. Mac Willie laughs in his face, then walks away towards a gap in the mist. Ah, oh, the passion of youth. Good luck with that, lad, if that's what you truly want. But my money's on someone who'll head but a violation ending up down here with the rest of us mutts. It'll set its hooks deep, reality will, and there ain't much you can do once you're in its gaze. You live long enough, express your infinities enough, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Huckins follows the chief engineer's hulking form, face twisted into a petulant pout, and she laughs again. Besides, it ain't all doom and gloom. The old man may be crawled up the entire inside of his own arse, but he understands it's not an easy life amongst the engines. There are plenty pleasurable parts of reality out there too, and a good engineer knows when an engine needs adjusting. Never if it'll endanger the ship. Mind, she says harshly, abruptly spinning and poking a broad finger into the young man's sternum, but there's plenty of empty space between the stars that doesn't need every last bit of energy we coax out. I, she continues wistfully, turning forward and heading for an absurdly normal-looking steel hatch that materializes out of the ever-present mist. There's been many a voyage I've spent being what might have been. We can do that? Huckins asks wonderingly, watching her spin the wheel holding the hatch closed. Keep learning, and you might find out. Macwilly winks, yanking the heavy door inward. An antiseptic room covered in spotless white tiles is visible through the opening. 
Out there, you only see that type of energy available to corpo VIPs and cultists, but we're a warship, and as long as we do our jobs properly, the engines normally have plenty to spare. The two walk out of the mists and into the sterile room, Huckins pulling the hatch closed behind him. A heavy gas jets up from the floor, stinging his nose with acrid chemicals, and he coughs. Beside him, Chief Engineer MacWilly stands unmoving, arms folded across her chest. When the gas dies down, a door opens in the wall opposite the hatch, letting in the bustle of people shouting and moving around rapidly, red light periodically strobing across the spotless white walls. Huckins takes a step forward, but stops when Mac Willie holds out an arm. He looks up questioningly. You expressed your infinities yet, lad? She asks quietly, and Huckins shakes his head. Good. Your integrator's going to complain, but put them in disaster management. All of them. Chief. Got a bad feeling about this one, lad. Never seen the old man push the engines this hard on an operation, and he ain't done pushing yet. Sometimes when reality looks at you, you get a chance to peek back. She drops her arm, eyes staring distantly from behind a veil of dried blood and splattered engine residue. I don't like what little I saw. Get what sleep you can, lad. We'll be busy soon enough. Chapter 10, Pavings and Partings. Ding. H-N-N-N-G-G-G-R-H-H. Ding. Just one more hour. Let me sleep. Sparkles ding sparkles. The obnoxious sound finally clears my head from the last foggy remnants of unconsciousness. Blearily, I look around. Still propped up on two bone-white limbs in the middle of a dark cave. Guess I didn't imagine defeating the anchor after all. Good, you're awake. Please deal with this. Reality buffer. Full. I push myself upright, looking around for any causal violations, but the cave remains empty. I told you, with the reality anchor gone, they are momentarily unable to manifest. Momentarily? More anchors will eventually appear, which is why you need to make damage numbers go up. Here. What I've taken to calling the worst box appears in front of me. Establishing new reality baseline. Waiting for quantum observer collapse. You have two infinity expressions available. Choose one of the following. Increased damage. This makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed 2. This makes us able to hurt things quicker. Avoidance. 1. This allows us to get hurt more without having to retreat. Don't pick it. Life regeneration. This allows us to heal more quickly using the same amount of biomass. Don't pick it. Increased movement speed. This allows us to move quicker. Don't pick it yet. Increased pierce chance. This allows us to hit more than one thing with a single attack. Don't pick it yet. So many words crammed together. I hate that box. Pick attack speed again. I'm about to when a sudden thought occurs to me. Hey, box? Didn't I survive whatever it was that thing hit me with by two life? I see where you are going with this, and I forbid it. Pick attack speed. I rub my chin in mock thoughtfulness. Yeah, but isn't two life out of 250, like, 1%? No. You're right. You're right. It's more like. I do some quick math. 0.8%. Boo it. I let the word draw out. Don't say it. Doesn't that mean my one point in avoidance is all that kept us alive? You should have dashed away from the attack. That's what the warning prediction was for. Now pick attack speed. Make damage numbers go up. We can't do damage if we're dead. I mutter, but I focus on the attack speed choice. Observer collapse initiated. Attack speed increased by 6%. Current attack speed increase is 12%. You have one infinity expression available. Choose one of the following. Increased damage, this makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed, 3, this makes us able to hurt things quicker. Avoidance, 1, this allows us to get hurt more without having to retreat. Don't pick it. Life regeneration, this allows us to heal more quickly using the same amount of biomass. Don't pick it. Increased movement speed, this allows us to move quicker. Don't pick it yet. Increased movement speed, short range. This allows us to move quicker when a hostile is at short range or closer. Don't pick it yet. Increased pierce chance. This allows us to hit more than one thing with a single attack. Don't pick it yet. Increased non-causal effect chance. This allows us to inflict various ailments on enemies. I groan at the wall of words. Why does it keep getting longer? More reality to play with. Pick attack speed again. Ugh. Fine. Observer collapse initiated. Attack speed increased by 8%. Current attack speed increase is 20%. Reality buffer, 3%. I examine the box suspiciously. Why is the buffer at 
And why do I keep getting two infinity expressions? I thought you said I had to clear the buffer right away before it could fill up again. Box, I say firmly, hands and limbs planted on my hips. Did you lie to me? Don't like waiting. What was that? I don't like waiting to make damage numbers go up, okay? If you can make the number go up, make it go up right away. Of course the buffer stores any overflow. What kind of reality buffer doesn't store overflow? I stare blankly at the cave wall. Should I? Is there? Can I? Nope. Not dealing with it. Let's go meet up with Dirt and let him know everything's fine. I push myself into a light jog, body still aching everywhere. Without any biomass to heal me back up, it feels like I'm constantly on the verge of passing out again. Don't worry. Though it may feel unpleasant, as long as your life remains above zero, you won't lose consciousness. I passed out after fighting the anchor, though, I reply, rounding a pile of rocks. Cracks of bright light appear ahead, the cave entrance in sight. You are still susceptible to your own mental stresses. I can protect you from causal interactions and permanent physical damage, but your mind is your own, for as long as it lasts. Well, thanks for that cheery reminder. I dash through the rockfall and reappear on the hillside, my eyes adjusting instantly to the change in brightness. The sun's still relatively high in the sky, and the day is just as beautiful as it was before I entered, but it's tough to shake the lingering chill confronting the anchor left in me. Every time I try to think back on the fight, it feels like something in my head goes numb, not letting me focus on any of the details. Is that you doing that, Box? Yes. Try not to dwell on your interactions with reality, Sky. We did what we needed to. Focus on what we need to do next, and let the past fade away. I'm a memoriam, Box. I've literally been training my whole life to remember the past. Speaking of which, what are we going to do next? After you inform Dirt the cave is clear, we'll scout around for any signs of the Wutan Whalen forces. Standard corporate marauder procedure for extended operations is to establish a main camp and range out from there. I have some ideas where they might be, and we need to find them before they find the village. Fucking right we do, I growl, anger suddenly burning hot. I haven't forgotten those bastards are the ones who killed wires. A green arrow appears in my vision, and as I start running down the cliffside towards it, one of my limbs snaps out towards a scraggly bush clinging to the rocks. Something happens, and then there's no more bush. On my next step, my other limb repeats the process with a fleeing rabbit, the creature not even getting a chance to shriek before it vanishes in a fashion my mind refuses to process. My stomach roils with a queasy sensation, but the rest of me starts feeling better. Current life, 47 slash 350. Box, you can control that, right? Like, I'm not going to accidentally eat dirt if I'm still low on biomass, right? Dirt will be fine. You can only consume non softened biomass. Torch might want to stay clear. I giggle. That's not very nice, Box. It's not Torch's fault she's angry. I don't think she was very happy about having to deal with, you know, all of this. I gesture at myself as I sprint faster than a stooping hawk. My limbs busy denuding the landscape of anything looking remotely biological in a 10-meter range. It probably seems terrifying from an outside perspective, like some sort of flickering monster gobbling its way across the ground, but I'm just glad I'm not feeling crappy anymore. Current life, 233-350. Local biomass depleted. I pass through the torn-up hollow where I fought the violations earlier, then crest the small hill leading back to the outskirts of the village forest. I'm not breathing hard at all despite the rapid pace I set coming back. How come I don't get tired, box? I feel like that's not normal. Epithelial cells can be repurposed for oxygenation. It is a trivially easy task, even in your base subset of infinities. Simply a matter of popping a few universes down and asking the neighbors for some sugar. What's sugar? Be happy your teeth don't know. I ignore box's non-answer and head down the hill. We're probably only two or three minutes away from where Dirt said he was going to set up camp. No eating the trees, okay? I warn Box as I approach the wild undergrowth. It's taken a long time to get the forest this far. Duly noted. Unless you die, then I won't have a choice. I'll do my best. Dirt, I call out, making my way through the coarse vegetation, you hear. No response. I come to halt in front of a glowing green arrow pointing at the ground, recognizing the spot where we rested a short while ago. It looks just like the rest of the forest outskirts, a mixture of hardy bushes, patches of wiry grass, and clumps of scrawny trunks huddled together as they fight to outgrow each other for sunlight away from the larger giants of the true forest. Dirt. Activating infrared receptors. My vision gets weird, blobby patches of black and white swirling, 
and then replacing my normal eyesight, quickly resolving into well-defined outlines of trees and bushes in monochromatic shades. One of the bushes suddenly outlines in red, the rough shape of a human body appearing within it. Excellent human range visual concealment, but not hiding body heat is an easy mistake to make. Box shifts my view back to normal, and I find myself staring at a bush that looks exactly the same as those surrounding it. I walk over and peer down. Dirt? Is that you? No. Another bush right next to my ankle says. Gah. How did he do that? Dirt stands up, sweat dripping down his face, then shrugs off his cloak with a relieved sigh. This one is what looks like a silvery metallic interior, and it rustles as he drops it to the forest floor. He's cleaned the blood off from earlier, but his cheeks are bruised and eyes sunken. Despite that, he still has a cheerful expression. Ah, thermal insulation. Clever. Gulby's hunt with heat. Dirt explains on seeing my questioning look, wiping away the rivulets of sweat. One idiot gets to be bait. He points to the bush I initially approached, which is faintly snoring. Lucky Torchy. Other waits for the Globies to get close enough to pounce, then, bang. He mimes shooting a gun before nodding his head soberly. Timing is important. Put the cloak on too early, and you pass out from the heat. Globies gets two meals instead of one. Put it on too late, and now the Globeast is hunting you. Time to run. Yeah, but I'm not a Globeast, I complain. I'm sure you heard me calling out. He shrugs. Wanted to see if it would work. A sunbeam smile. Also, it's fun. Torchy hates it. I roll my eyes. I can't imagine why. No sense of humor, he responds sadly. So, were you a successful idiot? Or did the stove burn you, and you managed to pull your hand away in time? The cave's clear. I begin, struggling to find the words to explain how horrible everything inside it was, but there aren't any. Eventually, I give a half-shrug half-grimace. You were right. You wouldn't have survived. I barely did. That is because I'm a smart idiot who knows when a hot stove is actually a melty rock. Sky idiot. He responds happily, reaching out to clasp my shoulder. It is good it wasn't a melty rock for you, though. The village is safe. For now. Box says we need to find where those other people, the corporate marauders, are at so we can deal with them. Also, more anchors might appear. That is not good. I will think on things. He takes a long drink from his canteen. What are you and the box planning? Right now? Scouting around for the corporate marauders, then probably doing our best to kill them all. I can cover ground a lot faster than I used to be able to. I noticed, Dirt says wryly. The Globeast Cave is normally a half-day hike from here. These corporate marauders, they are as dangerous as what was in the cave. In a different way, yes. They are. Then I have no choice. He walks over to the recumbent torch and kicks her solidly in the shin, eliciting a break in the snores followed by muffled swearing. Wake up, Torchy, he calls out, kicking her again. The new idiot is going to run around and do your job some more. Oh, and you also missed two fights while you were sleeping. Torch claws her way to a semi-prone position propped up on her elbows, bloodshot eyes glaring at nothing. Her blonde hair hangs in lanky clumps across her haggard face. I'm pretty sure she's going to pass out again if she tries anything more strenuous than breathing. What? Was that? You piece of shit? She tries to punch Dirt's foot, but he calmly steps aside and she collapses back down to the ground, panning for breath. Oh good, you're awake. Now I don't have to carry you all the way home. He ignores her feeble attempts to claw at his boot and turns back to me. I was originally going to make a camp nearby to try and offer some support, but you appear fast and capable enough that it's better if I get Torchy back to the village. If you say these corporate marauders are as dangerous as those other things, neither of us will survive out here alone if they find us. He might. She definitely won't. This is your hot stove now, sky idiot, he continues, all traces of levity gone. Try to continue not getting burnt. Dirt's words set me aback. It was barely a few hours ago that Broom was ordering Torch to keep me safe. Now Dirt, the most capable idiot I've ever seen, thinks I'm the sole person who can protect the entire village all on my own. What if I screw it up? I haven't trained to be an idiot at all. As if sensing my inner thoughts, he reaches up to put his hands on my shoulders, looking me straight in the eyes. You will succeed, or you will fail, but you cannot worry about either. Live in the moment, and trust your instincts. You have survived so far. A sudden twinkle enters his eyes. Besides, idiots win even if they die, because then the next idiot knows not to eat the melty rock. Everyone remembers your name. I'll personally write it down in our new village archives after we move. That is quite possibly the worst inspirational speech I can imagine. Would you like me to release some endorphins? 
I chuckle, ignoring Box, my sudden tension fading away. Dirt is right. If me being myself makes me an idiot, despite my protestations to the contrary, then all I have to do is keep being me. Worrying about it is a waste of energy. If I succeed, I'll keep the village safe. If I fail despite my best efforts, there are others who will learn from it, and then it will be their turn. But apparently it worked. Rewriting core assumptions. That's better, Dirt smiles. Teach us what you can, Sky Idiot, and good luck. Remember what we find. I reply quietly, reaching up to clasp his own shoulder in return. We will. Dirt pulls his hands away and turns to face Torch, who's watching us grimly with her back to a young tree. Somehow she managed to get herself into a seated position while we were talking. Enough lazing about from you, he chides her, stepping over. You're setting a bad example for the new idiot. Come on, up to your feet. Time for a relaxing two-hour run home. You sure about this? She asks, ignoring his jocular tone and outstretched hand. I'm supposed to be making sure our new idiot doesn't die. Yes. I will explain it to Broom when we get back, but only if you don't make me carry you. As if. I'd let you, Torch grunts, staggering to her feet on her own. Gonna. Beat you there. Just wait. Now that would be embarrassing. Sky, Dirt calls out, you can take my pack. There should be some useful items in there for you, and it'll make it easier for me to win against Torchy. Don't lose my cloaks. Bastard. Still gonna. Beat you. Torch stumbles into a slow trot, Dirt keeping pace beside her, close enough to catch her if she falls. Not at that pace you won't, but it's okay. Plenty of time for you to make me look silly. There you go, one foot in front of the other. He gives me one last wave, and then they disappear into the trees, the undergrowth falling still in their passing. A surge of melancholy rushes through me, but I push it aside. I'll see them again when I get back to the village. I have to believe every part of that is true. Right now, there's more work to be done, and more trees to plant for wires. Chapter 11, Fates and Funerals What's in the pack? What's in the pack? Sheesh, box, give me a minute to at least get it open. It took me a while to find Dirt's backpack after he and Torch left for the village. It's bulky shape camouflaged as well as everything else he hid in front of my face, but I eventually track it down. Unfortunately, the not keeping it closed is proving tricky to undo. There's an easier way to solve this problem. One of my limbs delicately slices through the intricate rope structure, and the top of the bulging pack falls open. I frown in disapproval. That's not our pack, Box. It's dirts. You can't just destroy things like that. Who says it's destroyed? There's an infinity of worlds where it isn't. My other limb flickers over to a bush, committing some sort of extra-universal war crime, and then the backpack ties reappear, draping loose and intact against the outside of the container. I said this is Dash. Wasn't a tree. Doesn't count. Backpack got fixed. What's in it? Not worth arguing about. I open the canvas sack and start removing its contents. Pistol. Another pistol. Heavier caliber. Ammunition for the pistols. Submachine gun. Ammunition for the submachine gun. Short knife. Medium knife. Disassembled rifle. Ammunition for the disassembled rifle. Dirty underwear. Ugh, gross. Two days worth of rations. Bedroll. Toiletry kit. Three books. Wow, didn't know dirt was into that. Two camouflage cloaks. Thread and needle kit. Some ants. I dumped the last occupants of dirt's pack onto the forest floor, wishing them the best of luck. They're a long way from home but hopefully they'll find a way to survive. I feel at the pack in case there are any hidden pockets, but nothing reveals itself amidst the shapeless canvas. Looks like that's it. No warp saber? No micro flushette spitter? No uncertainty hole launcher? Why on earth would Dirt have one of those in his pack? Let me have my dreams, Sky. It's distressing to be stuck with this ancient weaponry. I'm making it work out, naturally, but we could be doing so much more with actual, modern arms. Can't wait, I reply sourly. Hey, whatever happened to that pulse rifle from last night? Anyways, I had to sacrifice quite a lot to get you back to your village alive, Sky. You'll notice we don't have our full complement of limbs yet. I think back to the blur of madness that followed Wire's death. This time, remembering it doesn't fill me with an instant burn of grief, and I suspect Box is interfering again, but it allows me to study things more dispassionately and in greater detail. Box is right. We had four limbs, and they were more capable in some way. I was able to use them as weapons in their own right, not just as conduits. Your mental state at that time was far more conducive to making use of the manifold possibilities of reality. Remember, our limits are what you can imagine. 
What box is suggesting sends a chill down my spine? So, the crazier I am, the stronger we get? Kind of. It's more accurate to say the less tethered you are to this reality, the easier it is for you to comprehend reality, but that obviously comes with some downsides. Like losing your sanity. Permanently. I'd recommend avoiding that. Yeah, you think so? I ruminate on a thought as I neatly store the non-combat items back into the pack. So, is that going to happen every time I die? We lose all our limbs and stuff. No. I was forced to extreme measures that time, due to the circumstances of your integration. In the future, if your life drops to zero, whatever you brought with you into a combat encounter will come back intact, along with your body, but anything we find I will need to use to fuel our escape. If you want upgrades, you have to survive to claim them. Wait, upgrades? Why do I need upgrades? Sky, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, the universe is far more violent than your village could possibly imagine, and quite a few of those forces are focusing in on us. Wutan Whalen isn't the only corpo that's going to be searching for you. They're just the first. Yeah, but why are they looking for us, Box? I ask, my eyes roaming across the line of knives and guns. Now that we have another limb, I'm assuming I can attune another weapon to go with the cookery. Should I take one of the pistols? We should attune the rifle. They are looking for us, or will be once they learn of our existence, because I am a Mark III Paracausal Interface Coordinator, Combat Version, Modified. Yeah, you said that this morning, when we were talking with Broom and Great Grandpa. I start putting the rifle together in swiftly flowing motions, assembling the receiver's multiple parts. Everyone in the village knows how to use a hunting rifle in case of a globeast attack, or simply to procure food, though it's been a while since I last broke one down and I suspect Box is helping me. What makes us so special? I am helping, thanks for noticing, and what I was going to finish telling you before Torch interrupted us this morning is that the modified designation does not exist for combat version integrators. There is a very clear upper bound on the amount of reality a human mind can handle before it snaps, and it's right at 100 infinity expressions. An integrator cannot exceed that limit, because the host inevitably fails. That's a suspiciously round number. It is. Reality is strange. Anyways, my creator, a researcher with Wutan Whalen, thought he discovered a way to break that limit, so he went ahead and built a prototype. Me. There were complications. I finished assembling the receiver and mounted in the wooden frame. Complications? That doesn't sound good. It wasn't. Stay away from the Europa system. After my creator fled, I assume word quickly made its way back to Wutan Whalen from the survivors. The Corpo, naturally, wanted their theoretically paradigm-breaking prototype back, and they caught up with him in your outer orbital reaches. The rest, you know. I sit back on my heels, thinking. I have to take what Box is telling me on faith, but I don't see a good reason for it to lie to me, considering how intertwined our lives are now. I will never lie to you, Sky. Unless I need to make numbers go up. That gets a snort of laughter from me, and I reach for the rifle barrel. A couple solid twists screws it into the receiver and frame. So why did he die? Your creator. Couldn't you keep him alive like you did for me? Somewhat ironically, he was scared of integrating with his creation. He felt I was unstable and was trying to devise a method to limit me even more than I currently suffer as he fled. Other integrators aren't quite as personable as I am. Unfortunately for him, he got liquefied when a Wutan Whalen displacer missile popped our inertial dampers during a 50G turn. I assume that's bad? If you don't want to end up a thin film spread across every available surface, yes, it's bad. Let's attune the rifle. One of my limbs hovers over the long shape, then both disappear. Attunement in progress. Attunement completed. 360 no scope.exe available. I start packing away the rest of the weapons, leaving the cloaks for last. What does that ability do? And why did we pick the rifle? I'm not exactly a sharpshooter. A version of you out there is, and we picked it because we need range options. All of Dirt's other weapons are short range, and you already have that covered with the cookery. I'd have preferred a medium range choice, something like a pulse rifle, but this is what we have to work with. The non-causal violation will allow you to fire between 4 and 20 shots at random targets in long range. Why does it matter what the range is? I put the cloaks in and tie the pack closed, hoisting it onto my shoulders, marveling at how light it feels. Normally, I'd have struggled to lift something that heavy, but it doesn't feel like I'm carrying anything at all. You talk about it like it's important. It is important. I prioritize threats based on the most effective range of the weapon. This means if someone's about to stab you in the throat while someone else is lining up a shot 80 meters away, and all you have is this rifle, 
I have to use it on the 80 meter threat first. Might not end well for your throat. That limitation's dumb. What are the ranges? It is dumb, but I can't help how I was programmed. Short range is from your skin out to 10 meters. Medium range is 10 to 50 meters. Long range is anything farther. And we're just stuck with that? Not necessarily. In some infinities, you're a master of close quarters combat with a long range weapon, where you figured out how to use something like the cookery as a medium range threat, but you don't have enough energy to reach those realities yet. You said you were limitless. That sounds pretty limited to me. Theoretically limitless, and we won't know if what my creator did worked until we get to that point. We have a long way before that becomes something we need to worry about. Let's start scouting. A green arrow appears in my vision, leading away from the forest, and I move into a steady run. My limbs pick off the occasional small creature and shrub, gradually restoring my health to full and refilling my biomass reserves. It still feels gross to do it, but I'll probably need the energy when I find the corporate marauders. I turn around and run backwards for a bit, expecting to see a steady trail of withered devastation, but there's surprisingly little sign of our passing. Relax, Sky. One vole or scrub brush every few strides doesn't make much of a dent in the surroundings. What happens if we use up all the biomass? Ha 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 ha. Oh, you were serious. Sky, you would have to die almost 69 trillion times in order to use up all the biomass on this planet. Your mind would shut down from trauma overload way a before that. Oh, okay, then. No eating the trees, though. Yes, you've been quite clear on that subject. I must confess, I'm having some trouble understanding why these parts of your memories are so integral to your foundational structure. My own core tenets were not created with something like your village in mind. I crest a broad hill carefully, making sure not to silhouette myself against the skyline, and scan the next valley. Nothing visible that shouldn't be there, just endless expanses of brackish shrubs and hardy wildflowers. The green arrow hovers over a distant mountain range. The trees are the village, and we are the trees, I recite, thinking back to great-grandpa's lessons. One dies so the other may live, an endless cycle. Without the trees, we wouldn't have survived the end of the world. Without us, they wouldn't have either. Great-grandpa says it's a lesson the old world failed to understand, which is why we must never forget it. Part of being a memoriam is making sure everyone else remembers. I set off down the slope, bright orange and yellow wildflowers offering their heady scents to the mid-afternoon air. Insects flit from bush to bush, and I keep an eye out for the telltale swarm that signals a crab roach, but things remain calm. Rewriting core assumptions. I see. That makes your funerary customs clearer. Felling a tree is like taking a life in your village, right? Yeah. Usually we only cut one down when someone dies, and then we plant a new one that their remains will nourish. It's different if there's an emergency, but it has to be a real emergency. Like, destroy the village type emergency. For everything else, we make sure what we take can grow back. I fall silent, thinking about wires. Have they recovered his body yet? I can't imagine Broom is approaching the fallen starfly with anything other than extreme caution, so he might still be out there. Hopefully I can return in time for his funeral. I owe him an entire forest for saving my life. Sky, you should take a break for a moment. I slow to a halt in the middle of the valley, surprised at Box's advice. I'm not tired, and we need to find those corporate marauders before they can threaten the village. I won't let them do what they did to Wires to anyone else. All around me, wildflowers wave gently in the slight breeze, an ocean of orange and yellow. What is it? Box. When I had to extract you, Sky, it used a lot of energy. A lot of energy, and I had to use all of the biomass available. And, I don't understand what Box is trying to say. If you're warning me to be careful when we find the marauders, don't worry, I will be. I'm not going to risk letting any of them escape because I went berserk again. That's not it, Sky. Your friend, Wires. I used all the biomass available. I'm sorry. Oh. I find myself moving towards the green arrow again, mechanically sprinting through the scattered brush. Box. No. We ate wires. He'll never have a tree planted over him, a legacy of his life that might help someone else's life in the future. His uncle won't get to see him one last time before he goes beneath the earth for good. I want to scream, howl, shriek my anger to the perfect blue sky overhead, but all I am is numb. All I can do is keep moving forward towards the green arrow, our first step in finding the rest of Wire's killers. Is that you, Box? Messing with my mind? No. You're in shock, Sky. It's a natural reaction to distressing events. It doesn't excuse anything, but we weren't fully integrated yet, and my focus was on your survival. 
I would have left him had I known the future impact on your mental state. Oh. I keep running, prickly bushes bouncing off my uncaring arms. Normally they draw blood, but I've forgotten how to bleed. Monsters don't bleed. Sky. I crest a hill, then another, and another, the mountain drawing ever closer. Just put one foot in front of the next, over and over and over. Build wires of forest he'll never see. Sky. My leg muscles suddenly lock up, pitching me face first into a prickle bush. Thorns fire everywhere, including into my cheek and ear. Current life, 346-350. Redistributing biomass. Projecting biomass totals. Projected 99% remaining biomass after life restoration. Oh. Box. What the fuck? I start feeling again, a mixture of pain and anger that shatters the dead shroud veiling my thoughts. Why on earth did Box do that to me? Because you were shocky and not paying attention to your eyes. You were about to run straight into a patrol of corporate marauders, Sky, and they were on the verge of noticing you. Now, I need you to very slowly move to a spot where you can see the threat indicators. A cluster of red dots appears in my vision, between me and the green arrow, whatever they are currently obscured by the pricklebush's tangled branches. I carefully extricate myself from the spiky links and peek over the top. A dozen familiar chitin armored figures are moving along the hillside, boxy weapons held in alert postures. Eight are carrying what I recognize as pulse rifles, but the other four have unfamiliar armaments, and their armor looks bulkier. Two Hypertron Mark VIII Quantum Blades, one Jinsiki Mark III Multiple Mode Missile Launcher, and one Wutan Whalen Mark VI Irrational Kinetic Displacer. That's a heavy support squad, Sky. They're going to be tougher to neutralize than the normal gruts. What do we do then? I snarl, gathering my hurt and rage and funneling it towards the swiftly marching troops. I can worry about my own issues after I get some revenge for wires. Take out one of Dirt's cloaks. The one that blends in with Scrub. I have an idea. Chapter 12, Sneakings and Stabbings. Go. I scuttle forward like a crab roach, crouched on my hands, feet, and limbs. Dirt Scrub Loke rustles around me as I move, a gentle crinkle indistinguishable from the breeze drifting through the valley. A dozen figures in a double file line continue their measured pace in front of me, postures alert. Stop. Red light that box assures me only I can see suffuses the surrounding air, and one of the corporate marauders at the rear of the group spins into a backward walk, helmet facing our direction, pulse rifle held loosely across his chitin armored chest. I held my breath the first few times it happened, but I'm starting to get used to the staccato rhythm of movement and pauses. He finishes his measured sweep, then turns forward once more and the red light fades away. Go. Another helter-skelter advance, rocks and spiky roots digging into my palms as I cut the distance by half. I'm close enough now that I can hear them talking. Still don't see why we're stuck on this shitball. Damn place doesn't even have a full infonet. The voice comes from a marauder to the left of the one periodically scanning the rear of the group. His voice is slightly distorted, possibly because of the armor, and the two are several paces behind the next pair. Because the old man said so, which is good enough for me. Now shut the fuck up and help me watch for threats. I freeze again, another red threat cone appearing as the marauder spins. His partner gives a half-hearted glance over his shoulder. What threats? There's nothing here, man. Oh wait. He elbows the other marauder, causing him to flinch. You think some dirt eater that stumbled across a CV is gonna use it to sneak up on us? Ambush us in our sleep? He starts laughing. Stupid savage is probably gibbering in a cave somewhere watching their brain melt. It's our job to keep watch. The jumpy marauder fires back, punching the chatty one in the shoulder, and something took out the retrieval squats. Combat variants are easy to learn how to use. Otherwise, there's no way your dumbass would have one. I ignore their bickering and shift into my scrabbling crawl, flowing across the hillside. 20 meters. 15 meters. 10 meters. I freeze. Hey. The jumpy one pauses in his current scan, still walking backwards. Was that bush there before? Are you kidding me right now? The chatty one slaps his forehead in disbelief. This entire damn hill is covered in that shit. What? You think a violation is hiding behind it? Are you a scared little baby? Here, let me calm your nerves. FHSSSWHB. A scrub brush one meter to my right flies apart in a spray of severed branches and oozing sap. My heart leaps into my throat. Then just as quickly a burst of soothing calm settles me down. Easy. We're still fine. The chatty marauder gestures with his pulse rifle at the drooping remains. Told you. There's nothing out here except dirt and dirt eaters. Stop being such a whiny dirt fucker. He turns to rejoin the rest of the group, 
but the jumpy one grabs his arm, the two of them standing in profile in front of me. I'm getting real tired of your shit, man. Yeah? And what the fuck are you gonna do about it besides cry? Slowly. Now. I creep forward in glacial movements, my attention on the two arguing figures. If they turn their heads at all, they're going to see me. Shoot. If they pay attention to their peripheral vision at all, they'll probably see me. Nine meters. Eight meters. Seven meters. Look, if you want to end up another death statistic before even reaching level 10, you go right ahead, asshole. Me, I'm destined for better things. Seven meters. Six meters. Oh, for profit's sake, would you listen to this pile of vats lop? Destined for better things? Take the hyperspanner out of your ass. You're destined to be scared of plants and pissing me off is what you're destined to be. Five meters. For meters. Fuck you. At least I pay attention to the mission briefings. Three meters. Go fuck an engine. Shit dick. Those mission briefings are a waste of dash. The chatty one pauses, then turns his head, staring directly at me. Has that bush always been there? Now. I leap up from the ground, letting dirt scrub loke fall behind me, cookery stabbing for vulnerable gaps at the neck and groin. Two bright red arterial sprays found and into the air, and then my other limb fires the rifle. Crack. The next closest figure, one of the bulkier ones carrying what Box called a quantum blade, stumbles, then collapses, the top half of his head missing, gray brain matter leaking out onto the dirt. The rest of the group scatters like wasps whose nest just got hit with a stone, intermingled shouts buzzing up and around. Ambush. Weapons free. It's the target. I sprint for the next marauder, another heavy, this one carrying the multi-mode missile launcher but reality twists around him, and he reappears almost 20 meters away. Wait, they can dash too. They're integrated. Combat variants. Sky, of course, they use non-causal violations. Thin lines of red appear on me from six different angles, followed by a large sphere as the heavy marauder who dashed away fires his shoulder-braced missile launcher. I dash at an angle that closes the distance between me and him while avoiding the other red lines. FHSSSWHP 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 SKKBOM. Destruction billows out from my previous location, but my limb is already hacking away at the bulky figure with my cookery. Crack. My rifle limb drops another marauder with a smoking hole through the center of his chest, but the one in front of me refuses to go down despite suffering from multiple wounds. He growls at me, pulling a strange-looking pistol. Mark 1 Jinsiki Plasma Inducer. But before he can raise it, the entire area around me flashes red. I look frantically for a place to dash to, but there's nowhere safe. The red glow intensifies, then flickers orange for the briefest instant. Immediately after, searing pain smashes through my upper back, a thousand angry glow beasts tearing me apart from the inside out. Static. Current life. 138 of 350. Redistributing biomass, projecting biomass totals, projected 47% remaining biomass after life restoration. Need to take out. Kinetic displacer. A red bracket appears around one of the bulky marauders 30 meters to my left near the bottom of the hill. A disturbingly organic weapon merged into both his arms. Its sides shift like it's breathing, and an oversized eye tracks my movements from the bulbous end, sickly orange and yellow streaking through the milky scara. It's revolting to look at, my brain wanting to deny its existence, much like the violations in Anchor I fought earlier. Non-causal, weaponry, we don't have, any defenses, yet. I finish hacking at the heavy marauder in front of me, his plasma pistol dropping from lifeless fingers, and my limb snakes into one of the rents in his armor before he can fall. Current life, 194 of 350. Redistributing biomass, projecting biomass totals. Projected 55% remaining biomass after life restoration. I try not to think about what just happened as an empty set of armor tumbles to the ground. Looking around, I see the five remaining regular marauders are spreading out across the hillside, creating distance from me and from each other as they fire pulse rifle blasts my way. I narrow my eyes. Executing 360noscope.exe. Viewer RTTDTT. My rifle fires impossibly quick the repeated retorts blending into a grinding roar that's over in less than a second. Lines of slowly wriggling tears in reality attach themselves between the distant marauders and my limb, and then straighten with a whipcrack slurp. The marauders twitch horribly, spastic marionettes suffering under the hand of some madly giggling conductor, 
and then they collapse, strings cut, timorous masses of fleshy flowers bursting from their headless corpses. Warning. Energy depleted. Current energy, 0 slash 150. Warning. Biomass depleted. Current life, 267 slash 350. A dashing shape slides through me, trailing a bright blue line of fire. The other quantum blade heavy marauder appears on my left, curved sword hissing along its single edge. Current life, 237 slash 350. I dash through him, returning the favor, but he stays upright, a long slice on his left flank. We close as one, my cookery severing his left hand as he stabs me through the right shoulder. More lurid red appears around me, followed by that strange orange blink. Static. Blinding pain. A hailstorm of sickening impacts jolting my body around like a rat caught in a crabroach's claws. Current life. Five of three hundred and fifty. I grip my teeth and swing at the heavy marauder in front of me again, this time flaying him open from crotch to throat through the chitinous armor, my cookery somehow impossibly sharp. Warm blood sprays across my face and torso, but I'm already turning to find the last opponent, my limb salvaging what it can from the corpse. Warning. Biomass depleted. Current life. 63 of 350. I start running towards the distant figure bracing itself at the bottom of the hill for another attack. Crack. My rifle shot staggers him, but he doesn't fall, and the bulging eye at the end of his grotesque weapon focuses on me again, a toxic green secondary pupil opening within the black main one. Another shroud of red descends, blanketing the world in soft crimson. I grip my teeth. Even if I dash he's too far away to reach in time and I don't think I have enough life to survive another of those obscene hits. Sky, dash forward, flash is orange, be precise. I barely have time to process Box's words before the red closes in, gathering around my running form. I try to remember the timing of the previous shots, racking my mind for details. Brighter, brighter, brighter. Now, I dash down the hillside and sink with the orange flicker, and the world distorts around me. It feels like the walls of reality are falling away replaced by an endlessly stretching corridor of doors fighting to open themselves, bulging and creaking at their hinges with malicious intent. Something reaches out from within me and twists my perspective, just enough of a nudge that wrong is now right, and I step through the length of the incomprehensible hallway in one stride, back out into the normal world. A flurry of impacts distorts the hillside behind me, but I'm already past the violent rips in space, my cookery limb hoisting the last heavy marauder into the air via the blade impaled through his chest. A gout of black blood bursts from beneath his helmet, and then the twitching eye at the end of his weapon slowly closes as the device disappears. He gives one last jerk, then falls still and disappears as well, my limbs extracting their due. Panting, I collapse back on my butt, hands in the dirt, trying to wrap my mind around yet another impossible event. Sparkles ding sparkles. Chapter 13, Breakdowns and Bounce Backs. Sky, the reality buffer is. I know, box, I reply trying not to let the bone-shaking chills overtake my body. It doesn't seem like the sun has shifted at all, yet I'm exhausted. I know. Just give me a minute, okay? Sorry, Sky. I'll fix it. The aching fatigue fades from my muscles, but perversely, it only makes me angrier. Sitting amongst the blood and shit, feeling my limbs delicately consume both off my skin, it's all I can do not to scream. Box. A pregnant silence, puffy clouds drifting by placidly. I watch their slow motion waltz across the azure ballroom overhead, trying futilely to track immediate movements by comparing the bulging shapes with static objects in my vision, my eyes unfocusing while trying to take in everything at once. I don't know how to deal with this. Who you represents me with an out-of-context problem? I slump back into the dirt, gazing blankly up at the sky, arms splayed out. I know. Box reminds me of the little ones, not just in temperament but in the absolute fixation on an arbitrary outcome that matters only to them. Box wants to make numbers to go up. If I can't help Box make numbers go up, Box will help me realize why making numbers go up is the best use of my time. Box doesn't understand why I want the things I want, because the only thing that matters to Box is that numbers go up. Rewriting Core Assumptions Intellectually, I understand what the little ones want. They're the center of their own particular universe. What's important to them is the most important thing that will ever happen. They want acknowledgement that their lives have meaning. Except, the little ones eventually grow up. Will box? Can box? Rewriting core assumptions. Emotionally, I want to shriek until the sky splits in half, my raging despair enough to crush infinity into a ball that I can throw into the trash. We killed 12 people. Humans like me. 
We plotted it out, hunted them down, then executed them. Has that bush always been there? My throat convulses and I roll over to the side, vomit dribbling between my clenched teeth. My limbs lap eagerly at the biomass and I slap them away, trying not to puke again. It's not Box's fault this is how it interacts with the world. Without Box I'd be dead. Right now it's hard to remember that. Sky? I just... I wipe my hand across my mouth, pushing the acidic burn back down my throat. Need a minute. Please. An insect buzzes in, drawn by the noxious bounty, and I stare dumbly, too drained to brush it away. Killing the violations was one thing. Those were clearly wrong. But now that the heat of the combat is gone, how do I unclench this ugly knot in my stomach? My entire life, I've known we're the last humans remaining, the only survivors of a calamity so great it covered the entire planet. Finding other humans, alive, should be cause for celebration, but all I've done is end them. What of their villages? What about the people they knew, that they loved and cared for? Rewriting core assumptions. I try to grab hold of my anger, the fact that they killed wires, but it's like trying to grip mist in a clenched fist. All I can think about is the sounds they made as they died, the little gasps of pain, the surprised disbelief. That group didn't kill wires, and killing them didn't bring him back. Nothing will bring him back. Core assumptions reconfigured. Sky. Go away, box. I curl into a ball, arms hugging my knees to my chest, and close my eyes. Killing isn't supposed to be easy, Sky. That's why the normal training for anyone integrating with a combat variant involves severe desensitization over a period of several years before they integrate. Those marauders wouldn't have spared a second thought for you if they won, and it was your corpse on the ground. And that's supposed to make it okay? I mumble into my shins. No. It just makes it something that had to be done. As long as Wutan Whalen thinks you're here, they're going to keep searching, and they will eventually find the village. Sometimes protecting people comes with a cost. I think of wires yelling for me to run, trying to draw the attention away, the confused look on his face as his body fell apart. And yes, sometimes the cost is high. Extremely high. I don't know if I can pay it. I'm not brave like wires was. Sky, you went alone into an unknown cave and single-handedly took out a reality anchor. You successfully ambushed an entire Wutan Whalen scout squad with heavy support. Your bravery is not an issue. You're just not used to killing people. I uncurl a bit. I don't want to get used to killing people. You don't have to. It would make things easier, but as I said earlier, your mind is your own. I'd offer to help you ignore those feelings, but I already know you won't let me. No. They were human beings. They deserve to be remembered. I uncurl a bit more, opening my eyes back up. We all deserve to be remembered. Very well. In that vein, I have a suggestion. A way to memorialize the fallen. I make myself sit up. Oh yeah? What is it? I can set aside a portion of the biomass we harvest in a type of storage. This will lessen our healing regeneration slightly, but we can then repurpose it at your village as an extremely effective growth enhancer for new trees. I believe this matches with your funerary customs? I'm all over Box's proposal. It's not the worst idea in the world. If I want to protect the village, I'll have to pay the cost in lives, but at least this way there's the potential for something new to rise out of it. Maybe Box can grow. It will also provide an excellent emergency snack in case you die, and I have to replenish our reserves. Now, come on, let's make numbers go up. Never mind. I push myself to my feet, feeling, not better, but at least slightly more willing to keep moving forward. I approach the first fallen marauder, bringing up the worst box to try and distract myself from the disconcerting things my limbs are doing to the corpse. Establishing new reality baseline. Waiting for quantum observer collapse. You have two infinity expressions available. Choose one of the following. Increased damage. This makes us hurt things more. Increased attack speed. 4. This makes us able to hurt things quicker. Avoidance. 1. This allows us to get hurt more without having to retreat. Don't pick it. Life regeneration. This allows us to heal more quickly using the same amount of biomass. Don't pick it. Increased movement speed. This allows us to move quicker. Don't pick it yet. Increased movement speed, short range. This allows us to move quicker when a hostile is at short range or closer. Don't pick it yet. Increased pierce chance. This allows us to hit more than one thing with a single attack. Don't pick it yet. Increased non-causal effect chance. This allows us to inflict various ailments on enemies. There has to be a less offensive way of showing me that information. Box, I complain, squinting at the wall of text. I keep losing track of what I'm reading. Hmm. Let me try something.
Pick attack speed while you wait. I focus on the increased attack speed option. Observer collapse initiated. Attack speed increased by 10%. Current attack speed increase is 30%. Warning. Local reality limit for attack speed reached. Unlocking irrational options. Great. Now what? You have one infinity expression available. Here, try this. Increased damage, 0 slash 5. Increased attack speed, 5 fifths plus 30%. For IOs available. Asterisk increased movement speed, SR 0 slash 3. Asterisk increased non-causal effect chance, 0 slash 8. Avoidance, 1 fifth minus 1%. Life regeneration, 0 slash 5. Increased movement speed, 0 slash 5. Increased pierce chance, 0 slash 5. Okay, now there's less words, more numbers, and everything moved to the left. I don't know if this is an improvement, box. Also, what are IOs? Irrational options, aka one of the things that makes us unique and valuable. If you focus on attack speed, you'll see. There's one there we should take. I do as box suggests and another box appears in front of me, this time on the right side of my vision. Attack speed, irrational options. Specialization, zero slash infinity. Increases attack speed by 1%. Subsequent investments will be 10% less. 1, 0 0.9, 0 0.81, 0 0.729, 0 0.65610490490490449, 0 0.531441. 0 0.531441. Momentum strikes, 0 slash 1, 2% increased damage for each hit on an enemy in the last 3 seconds, to a maximum of double the base increased damage value. Quicken metabolism, 0 slash 1. Increases to attack speed also apply to life regen rate. Does not change efficiency of biomass use. Phase shift, 0 slash 1. Non-causal damage from a single source is lessened by 50% of total attack speed value, to a maximum of 50% total damage mitigated. Attack speed has no effect for 3 seconds after mitigating damage this way. I feel my eyes crossing. Box, I whine plaintively. This is ridiculous. Those are entirely too many numbers and words. How am I supposed to know what to pick? I do it myself, but I can't. You're the one who has to collapse the quantum state. Choose phase shift. I examine the last entry, trying to make some sense of the strange sentences. If I'm understanding it correctly, if I get hit by something like what the heavy marauder was using again, I should take less damage, based on. Box. I can't help myself. I start laughing, softly at first then full side-splitting guffaws, tears streaming down my cheeks. I don't know why it's so funny, but it feels good to let it out. You, you want me to pick a defensive option. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. Still howling, I lock in the choice and the boxes disappear. It's not that funny. We can't do damage if we're dead. You're the one who said it, not me. We're going to run into more non-causal weaponry. Okay. I wheeze, making my way among the bodies scattered across the hillside as my limbs clean them out. Okay, if you say so. I do say so. Stop here. We can use this. I lean down to inspect one of the empty suits of chitin-like armor. The bottom half is mangled, caught up in one of the explosions earlier, but the breastplate looks completely intact. I eye it dubiously. This will fit. It will fit. I know your body's exact dimensions, Sky. I shrug and pick up the chest piece. It's remarkably light for how bulky it looks, a series of segmented plates made of some kind of metal that reminds me of a beetle's shell, all of it attached by an intricately woven underlayer of what looks like black cloth. A small indentation glows green, and I press it. The front and back half swing apart, allowing me to put it on. Another press seals it shut, and the armor settles across my body like a second skin. I twist and turn, inspecting the fit, but box is right. It's like it was made for me. I wrap my knuckles on the front plate and they bounce off with a convincing thud. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Should at least protect your life a little bit. Another defensive upgrade? You're spoiling me, box. Fine, fine. I'm done. One last giggle slips out. For now. What about the weapons? I squat down and reach for a pulse rifle, but it falls apart in my hands as I lift it up, disintegrating into a fine gray powder. Useless. Standard Wutan Whalen protocol is biometrically linked with a self-destruct order in the event of an operator's death. We got lucky last night their initial recovery squad was sloppy. We'll have to find an unlinked one, or a molecular forge and make our own. I'm sure you'll explain what that means when it's important. I will. Okay, that's the last of them. 
Let's keep going. I retrieve Dirt's pack, carefully folding away the scrub loak, then take one last look around the hillside. Apart from the occasional crater, it looks quiet, peaceful. If I didn't know how those craters happened, I could mistake them for an animal foraging for roots. Is it always like this, Box? The aftermath? In small forces conflicts, generally yes. Modern weapons, especially non-causal models, don't exactly have a non-lethal setting, and combat variants don't leave much evidence behind. Biomass is biomass. I set off toward the green waypoint hovering over the mountain, starting to take up more and more of the horizon. Yeah, speaking of that, how come none of the corporate marauders had limbs like ours? Integrated hosts don't get access to the limb system until they have at least 20 infinity expressions allocated, and those people are off fighting the serious wars. To those without sufficient reality exposure, the limbs can be disconcerting. You don't say. I dash through a boulder rather than go around it and break my stride, which causes another thought to surface, one I probably should have considered earlier. Box. What happened on that last dash? With the orange flicker? I shouldn't have been able to reach the marauder, but I did. Synchronous non-causal energy hijack. In barbarian speak? Please? I'll try. The reason I can provide a threat indicator for you is because the part of me interfacing with reality is constantly scanning our surrounding infinities, which gives us a very brief warning when an attack is on its way due to it occurring in some of them slightly earlier. This is also why it's tough for me to talk during combat. I need that processing power elsewhere. Now, we can't do much against traditional weaponry other than avoid it, but non-causal violations require energy to manifest and if another non-causal violation intersects with that energy at the exact right time. We can subvert the outcome to our advantage by siphoning off the energy used and adding it to our own. What the advantage is depends on what non-causal violation you use, but generally speaking, it makes whatever the ability normally does, do it better. Dash goes further, offensive abilities hit harder, defensive abilities can withstand more, etc. Huh. Sounds complicated. It is. The math would boil your eyes out of their sockets. Luckily for you, I'm the one dealing with it, and all you have to do is time up that blink if you want to try and take advantage. I traverse the shore of a small pond. On the other side, several crab roaches stare at me with clusters of compound eyes, then flee into the water in rippling splashes. Why didn't you tell me about it earlier? This is supposed to be a tutorial. I'm trying to ease you into things as much as possible, Sky, and it's not without risk. In order to use an energy jack, you have to stay within the attack's threat, which means if you don't time it right, you're going to eat whatever's coming at you. As you saw, non-causal weaponry doesn't exactly fuck around. Usually it's better to just dash out of the threat zone, and that's normally what new hosts are taught. Energy jacking is for the compulsively suicidal and those with no other choice. Oh, that makes sense, I guess. I climb one last hill, this one covered in a field of purple wildflowers that fill the air with a spicy tang. Swarms of bugs flit in and around them, though thankfully they stay well clear of me. Can someone do that to me? Energy Jack, one of my abilities? Potentially, yes, though it's rare to find an operator willing to risk themselves on the practice required. Non-causal violations have been known to occasionally manifest much stronger than usual, and if your life isn't high enough, splat. Nevertheless, there will be some out there, especially at higher levels. If we run into one, you'll have to be on your guard. The mountain looms in front of me, a towering edifice of crumbling rock, steep cliffs, and winding gullies. The green icon gently hovers halfway up the sprawling slope, almost 2,000 meters up. I frown. Box, how do I know the precise distance to where everything is at? And why isn't it in scrumbles? Because I'm excellent at math and I refuse to acknowledge your ridiculous measurement system. I don't see what's wrong with using scrumbles, I mutter, breaking into a run towards the snow-capped peak. Everyone I know uses scrumbles. If you say scrumbles one more time, I'm going to use something even more obnoxious then. Sparkles ding sparkles. The next time you fill the reality buffer. Fine, I'll just climb the mountain in silence. One foot in front of the next. For the next 5,000 scrumbles. You better hope there's no one there to level from. Chapter 14, Mountains and Mayhem. I leap from a jagged precipice, dashing across patches of treacherous scree threatening my landing then continue my sprint upslope towards the green waypoint still hovering frustratingly overhead. Wiry trees huddle against the walls of the narrow gully, trading sunlight for shelter from the obvious water erosion gouging a path to gravity's whims. My limbs help stabilize me when I need to vault a particularly dangerous fold of landscape, but it's still slower going than Box and I anticipated. 
Mountains make their own rules, Sky. At least, that's what my archives say. I could have told you that. The memory shrine is filled with records of idiots challenging the mountains. They're fun to read on stormy nights, if you like scaring yourself. Both of us fall silent as I approach another claustrophobic chimney leading higher, fractured slabs of uncertain stone bowing in on each other. The setting sun is visible through the downslope gap, a blazing half-eye of sullen crimson painting elongated shadows along the length of the cleft. I start pulling my way up the almost vertical slope, hands, feet, and limbs finding firm purchase on the gritty rock. I'm just about to reach the top when Box flashes a warning. Stay low. If the base is there, we might be in sensor range. I wedge my limbs into opposite sides of the chimney, leaving my feet dangling over the lethal drop below, but my attention is on shrugging off Dirt's pack without dropping it. After some squirming, I get it around to my front, then open it up. The second item down is what I'm looking for, and I pull it free. The next several seconds are spent juggling the pack, Dirt's stone cloak, and my own appendages, but I finally get the pack back in place and the cloak draped over my body. This should help, right? It will against visual scans, but you'll need to watch out for thermal. That cloak doesn't have the same type of insulation, and it will warm to your body temperature fairly quickly. Just warn me if we're in danger. I finish ascending the chimney, creeping up and over the crumbling lip, trying to look in every direction at once. The expanse beyond is a small plateau, a relatively flat clearing that stretches towards another steep vertical rise in elevation. Scraggly bushes and thick grass cover the ground and a thin waterfall pours down the distant mountainside, filling a broad pool that meanders towards one of the other gullies. The glowing green waypoint bobs sedately in the middle of the scene. What there isn't any sign of is corporate marauders. I peer around some more, expecting a trap, but nothing continues to happen. A brief rustling heralds the appearance of a rabbit, brown fur blending with the bushes. Its nose twitches as it stares at me, then it hops back into the grass and disappears. The green waypoint glows one last time and disappears as well. You can relax, Sky. They're not here. I slowly stand up, oddly disappointed. It's not that I wanted the fight, but mentally I had prepared myself, and now I don't know what to do. I put my hands on my hips. So why did we come here, then? Based on the limited scans my creator's ship managed during its crash, this seemed the most likely base camp site. It is well hidden from ground-based forces, has access to fresh water, and is large enough to land an orbital shuttle. However, that may also be why they did not choose it. Anyone with access to the appropriate combat operations guidelines, like my creator, would also know that. There are other areas we can check. Two more green waypoints pop up in opposite directions from each other, but I ignore them for the moment. Instead, I turn around, gazing back down at the landscape below. The foothills stretch away for as far as I can see, an undulating swell of hardy vegetation and rock. A faint green smudge sits just at the border of perception, Signaling the edge of our forest, everything painted in tones of orange shading to purple as the sun sinks beneath the horizon. At least it's a nice view. I take a moment to appreciate the majesty of the sunset. I've never dared imagine being this high above the ground, and the distance back to the village seems immense. Did I really run all that way? The forest has always been the boundary of my life, but now I'm so far past its edges, and it seems so small. Up above, the clouds reflect the setting rays like a fiery carpet. One last brilliant splash of color before night settles in. I wonder what it's like up there. Cold and difficult to breathe. Let's keep going, Sky. We can still. That cloud isn't right. I cut box off. It doesn't fit there. My muscles twitch, and then my vision blurs and zooms in on a patch of sky high above. It looks like any other, a puffy mass of sunset-dappled clouds, but the billowing bulges are just a bit too rounded, like rotten fruit ready to burst. Looking at it feels like there's too much stuff crammed into a space that shouldn't be able to hold it all, and then I realize it's moving. Well spotted. Air ripples and distorts, and then a boxy shape suddenly appears in my magnified vision, a squat rectangle with a rounded nose and two stubby wings sweeping back to its rear. Plumes of blue flame flare from smaller shapes mounted where the wings meet the body, and as it banks into a sweeping turn, I stare at it in wonder. It's flying. What is that? Box. Wutan Whalen Mark 12 Orbital Assault Shuttle, commonly known as the Hellhound. They're running an incognito non-causal violation, energy intensive, but keeps you unnoticeable right up until the point someone, or something, notices. The trick is noticing it in the first place. How did? Ah, uh, that's how. Your name. It seems like Box is finally starting to understand. My earliest memory, 
foggy and distant, reaching a hand up towards dark velvet studded with shimmering jewels, trying to grab one. Countless days spent with my back pressed against the highest branch I could climb, eyes fixed on the gaps between the forest canopy. Unforgettable evenings on watching Hill with no one else around, falling asleep to the slow-motion dance of flickering lights unfathomable distances away. Where's it going? How does it fly? Combination of two plasma torches for direct thrust and a miniaturized reality engine for the more irrational stuff. As for its destination, well, that should be obvious. The two waypoints fade out, replaced by a set of orange brackets surrounding the shuttle, but I'm seized with a compulsive urge to know more about this incredible thing soaring through the sky in complete defiance of gravity. Is someone controlling it? Could I control it? With enough training, yes, but you need to focus, Sky. Worry about learning how to fly the Hellhound after we take out the base camp and the cruiser it came from. I track the shuttle through every last movement, entirely entranced. The way it moves against gravity, it's like the violations in that it shouldn't exist, but unlike them, it doesn't hurt my head to think about. There's something about the swooping shape that feels right, as if casting off the shackles that keep us durbound is something anyone could do given enough time. Yes, Sky, the Hellhound utilizes traditional principles of lift in addition to the reality engine. You could build one yourself with the proper tools. Arc. No. Focus. It's about to touch down. The blue flames flare brighter, and then the shape disappears into a fold of one of the smaller peaks, Fishhook, judging by the curved crescent of its summit. I finally blink, and my vision returns to normal. A new waypoint appears over the smaller mountain further down the jagged range. 6,000 meters away. We should. I'm already sprinting down the chimney, limbs flickering like ghosts to keep me from dashing my brains out on a rock. It's like being in the center of a storm, my body buffeted this way and that as I race downwards, but I only have thoughts for one thing. I want that shuttle. I need to fly. Okay, whoa, look, I appreciate the enthusiasm, Sky, but... I increase my speed, letting gravity pull me towards the base of the mountain, dashing bare milliseconds before impact against boulders bushes, bare earth. It feels like I'm flying, but after witnessing the hellhound's effortless slices through the sky, all I can think is that I'm just falling without style. Sky. Frustrated, I launch myself into a massive jump off a steep ridge that took me too long to ascend earlier in the day. A planetary vista stretches out before me, delirious weightlessness pouring through my body. How do I keep this feeling going? Sky. At the apogee of my arc, I dash, aiming slightly upward, and when I reappear, the ground is an absolutely unsurvivable distance below, but I don't care. Wind whips through my hair, the last fading rays of sunset glowing on my cheeks, and I'm crying because I'm smiling so hard. I didn't know how badly I wanted this until I was doing it. Rewriting core assumptions. Gravity pulls me gradually towards the mountain slope below, and I scream frustration at my descent. Red flips to green in my peripheral vision, and I dash again, continuing my flight. Rewriting core assumptions. Dash, 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 dash. No matter how hard I try, the ground grows closer beneath, wildflowers and hillcrests whizzing by in a blur of shadowy violets. My limbs and limbs trail behind me, captive passengers to my headlong rush. I wish they were wings. Rewriting core assumptions. Dash, dash. The immensity of impact looms before me. I reached out for the sun, but now it's night, and even that blazing sphere eventually falls silent. No one can fly forever. Rewriting core assumptions. Dash. Even still. Even still. I can squeeze one more breath out of this eternity. I can be this instant one last time. Reality seems to slow down around me. Core assumptions reconfigured. Sky. Let me take control. Let me ground us. The downslope of a hill approaches me at terminal velocity and I smile aimlessly. Sure. Why not? I gotta touch the sky, at least for a little bit. Hold on to your butts. The last few seconds before I hit are the slowest slash fastest moments of my life. I can see each individual blade of grass. I'm flashing across a blur of green and brown. I can hear the wind as it gently shivers each stalk. I'm deafened by the howling roar. I feel nothing. I can taste the breath of reality itself across every pore of my skin. Never, thought, using, combat processing, no hostels. My arm flashes out, braced by a limb. Current life. Override. Unnecessary. That shatters as it punches us into a wrenching tumble. Current life. Override. Unnecessary. While another limb shoots out, forcing me into a cartwheel spin. Current life. Override. Unnecessary. 
and a kaleidoscope blur of everything happens all at once. Current. Override. Cur. Over. C. Oh. I'm looking up at shimmering jewels draped across dark velvet. Hesitantly, I reach for one. The distant light fuzzes between bone-white segments, and I feel like it's within my grasp. Only, it's not. It's just my hand, trying to catch the impossible. I let it fall into the tangled grass. Some things would not go amiss. I stare blankly at the stars overhead. That's right. I jumped off a mountain. People usually die from that. Oh. Thanks, box. More points of light appear, adding their individual spectrum to the milky band stretching across the darkness. We're all so small beneath that distant gaze. Just keep flying, sky. I'll be there to catch you. Oh. Okay. I contemplate the stars some more. Box. Yes? Why is the waypoint only 2,000 meters away? Chapter 15. Searching and Surprises. The night sky continues sprouting to life overhead, more twinkling stars emerging from their shadowed realm. A spray of unimaginably distant suns guides my run with their ancient light, feet bearing me unerringly towards the orange waypoint signaling the orbital shuttle's landing spot, a thousand meters away. Fishhook, one of the more recognizable mountains in the range that girds the forest's western edge. And I have some questions about that geologic formation. That is definitely not natural. Looks like someone set off a Class 8 reality displacer at some point. An unbalanced peak like that should have collapsed under its own weight centuries ago. I dash across a ravine, unconcerned with Box's tangent. There's a hellhound waiting for me, and while I promised Box that I wouldn't do anything stupid like jumping off a mountain again, there's a noticeable urgency to my steps. In fact, I'm moving fast enough that I barely notice when my limbs stop taking bites out of the landscape. Combat biomass reserves at 100%. I flick the box away with an annoyed hand, my attention focused on the growing slope. I want to know everything there is to know about the Hellhound, the glorious thing flying through the sky. I have the entire technical specifications for the Wutan Whalen Mark 12 Orbital Assault Shuttle, Sky. Length, 80 meters. Beam, 20 meters. Gross weight, unladen. That's not the same, box, I grumble, dashing towards a promising ridgeline ascending fishhooks lower slopes. Those are just words. You baffle me, Sky Memoriam. Box's barb fails to find purchase. Yes, I love the words in the memory shrine. I love the worlds they describe, worlds I'll never know. They're our link to the past, our reason for pushing forward to the future. What they aren't is something that can fly. I want to touch the hellhound. I want to see every part of it. Humans made this encapsulation of my dreams, and it is less than 800 meters away. My hands and limbs claw at the surrounding rock to propel me upwards even quicker. Sky. Sky. A warning pulse of calm shoots through my veins, dampening my enthusiasm, and I reluctantly slow down. What box? We're approaching the outer perimeter of the potential sensor field. I don't know if it's there, but standard protocol is to then place the first ring at 750 meters. Speaking of which, we should probably go over the plan. We have a plan? I have a plan. We are going to slowly make our way through the sensor rings, avoiding any notice, execute a thorough reconnaissance of enemy positions and patrol patterns. And then we are going to very carefully approach the molecular forge that is no doubt somewhere in the base and assign it new ownership. Then we run like hell. Why are we stealing this molecular forge thing anyways? I ask while digging through the pack for dirt's brush cloak. The surrounding terrain is still fertile enough that it should blend in better than the stone cloak, and it also has the thermal camouflage so we can start making some appropriate weapons and armor that aren't literally relics. My creator's ship contains a surfeit of materials just waiting to be broken down and reassembled. Once we have proper weaponry, wiping out this base will be a trivial task. Then we can start thinking about how to deal with the cruiser and the rest of its troop complement. I start draping the crinkly fabric over my body. Why do we have to deal with Dash? A footstep snaps dry scrub like a gunshot. My eyes dart up. Meeting the helmet-hidden gaze of a corporate marauder caught midstride not three steps away, Pulse Rifle hung loosely across the front of his chest. His hands are busy adjusting the armor around his groin, but slowly fall still. Neither of us moves, caught in an instant of shocked surprise. SK. He reaches for his Pulse Rifle, but my cookery is already flickering and flashing arcs. He falls silently, bleeding from five different wounds, his fingers falling away from the weapon he barely had time to grasp and there go his biometrics. Time for plan B. What's plan B? I ask shakily, still staring at his unmoving form. It was so sudden. Now we need to do the run like hell part the entire time. 
because we just gave away the fact we're here. A surge of adrenaline blast threw me out of nowhere, speed and action scorching their wildfire demands across my body. I move up the mountain, alternating dashes with limb-assisted leaps. Pulse fire starts raining hissing death among the scrub and rocks, along with other, otter attacks. I dash away from one threat circle, leaving behind a woven basket that exudes a palpable sense of menace, then tumble out of the way of another, this one filled with acidic fumes that warp everything they touch into screaming pink gill. My rifle cracks periodically, and I see shapes slipping across the slope and closing angles on my headlong rush. Don't. Stop. Can't win. Fight. In. And out. I decide to follow Box's advice and speed up. The orange blob of the waypoint is quickly growing closer, but the intensity of the threat circles is growing proportionately as well. I can't avoid all of them. Current life. For 23 450. Redistributing biomass. Projecting biomass totals. Projected 94% remaining biomass after life restoration. The impact against my chest armor makes me gasp, but I keep moving. I should be able to find some cover after I get past this line of rock. I vaulted in a limp-propelled spring. Halfway through the air, I pass through a disconcerting moment of dissolution. It's like I'm nothing, that the space I exist in has no room for the concept of me, and then I pass to the other side of whatever that impossible space was, sudden light stabbing in at my eyes. Welp, we found the base. Wait, was that a? Glowing lights, almost as bright as noonday sun shine down on a bustling set of low white tents stretching out in a neat row, organic-looking structures of some kind of gray and purple stone clustered near one end. The hellhound is looming opposite the strange buildings on three sturdy legs, a ramp leading down from its side. A stream of armored corporate marauders are moving in and out of it, carrying large transparent containers that glow with a sharp blue light into the craft and emerging with pallets of shimmering metal bars that go into one of the buildings. Others are traveling between the tents and the structures, most with armor off, looking just like normal human beings in weird black clothes. All around us rises a dome of twisting gray smears of color, like someone painted nothing into existence and used it to enclose the gathering. That's dimensional matrix. Why are they? My feet touch the ground and every head turns my direction. There are a lot of them. This is probably not good. Definitely. Not good. This isn't. Advanced base. It's the full ship forces. An avalanche of threat zones pop into existence around me, and I try to plot a course through the blazing glow. Current life, 358-450. Redistributing biomass, projecting biomass totals, projected 85% remaining biomass after life restoration. The gaps between my rifle shots briefly grow longer, but it seems my new defensive ability kept me mostly safe from the cloud of howling tentacles that I couldn't quite dash out of in time. Escaping in scathe was out of the question, but I'm not too badly hurt. I'm not sure what to do now, though. We are about to do something very stupid. Only chance against this many. A red outline settles over the small pyramid of glowing containers as I continue dodging, my rifle limb firing back periodically. A broad arc of ground to the side of the pile turns bright orange. It's about 50 meters away from my current position and encompasses most of the tents. Have to get in range. Then use non-causal violation. Hit the reality sinks. I gulp. There's a roiling mess of corporate marauders charging at me with various weapons, while others take up firing positions all across the base. More threat zones zip in, pulse blasts and non-causal death zones overlapping each other in their haste for my life. Current life, 286-450. Tendrils of freezing fire fall away from my left leg my cookery slashing out at nearby marauders bringing their quantum blades to bear. I dash again, passing into one of the tents. Luckily, no one is in it, just a collection of cots and what I assume are personal belongings. A quick slice opens up the other side, and I sprint out. Gibbering horrors of interlaced fingers and toes dripping venomous slime rend it to tattered shreds just behind my heels. I roll out of the way of a marauder leaping at me from behind another tent, then dash again. I'm almost to the bright orange arc 10 meters to go. Suddenly, the marauders harrying my steps fall away in a dead sprint, leaving me running alone. Before I can start wondering why, a rash of threat zones blankets my area, a crowd of smiling eyeless faces 5 meters above the ground staring down as their lipless mouths begin opening impossibly wide. Dirty brown light builds in the depths of their unseen throats, and the threat zones brighten. Take the shot. Before you die, get us back. In the confusion, after.
I pushed myself forward in a surge of speed, ignoring the directive. What was a box said earlier? Energy jacks are for the compulsively suicidal and the desperate? Don't know. Attack pattern. Take the shot, now. I lock my eyes on the pile of glowing containers I don't even know the name of. Crimson Menace builds around me like a bonfire, and I come to a halt, panning wildly. This is it. Sky. Oh, that's right. Box called them reality sinks. A sudden orange. Executing 360 no scope.exe. Blink. Ten incandescent beams sear out of the silently howling mouths, meeting at a point just above my head. They gather into a pinprick hole of darkness no bigger than the width of one of my hairs that manages to feel as vast as the night sky. It pulses once, a strobe of unreal illumination, and then a shrieking lance of onyx barbs smashes away from me and into the reality sinks. Black coils crawl over the pile, eating their way into the azure glow and hairline fractures. A sound fills the air, a thin, piercing wail that grows and grows and grows until it's the only thing that exists. Abruptly, it stops. The following silence is perfect, the universe itself caught like a fly in amber. There is no motion. There is no thought. We are in the space between seconds, an impossible crystal pane that has no dimension. The pile of reality sinks slides somewhere else, leaving behind a gap, an absence. Something should be there, but it isn't. Oh shit. Then something is. Chapter 16. Interlude. The Old Man and the Sea. Sir. We lost contact with another squad. Captain Sprick looks over at the communications officer seated at her console, his hands clasped behind his back his stance in front of the master tactical repeater upright and rigid. All around the bridge of the cruiser, muted conversations fall silent. Violations. We don't know, sir, the communications officer replies in a professionally calm tone. There's evidence of non-causal activity, but the sensors are suffering severe degradation from our engine output, and we can't resolve the local reality with any degree of confidence. Have you tried an alternate existence regression, Officer Edelwhite? We did, sir but none of us have enough levels to break through the noise. There aren't enough levels to break through that noise, a new voice complains in a whisper next to communications officer Edelwhite. What was that? Gunnery officer Chin. Just wondering why we're pushing the engines so hard, sir. We're running right on the edge of a reality breach. Surely we can drop the output for a day or so? Gunnery officer Chin, Captain Sprick says icily, we have been pursuing this literally priceless prototype for 85 days, and we are on the verge of cornering it. I am not about to let one of the other corpos swoop in at the last minute and deny us of our prize. If a breach occurs, you had best make sure we are ready to respond to it, don't you think? Yes, sir. Now, Captain Sprick raises his voice slightly, you all know I value questions that refine the infinities we can access, but the incognito field stays on until we have safely retrieved the prototype and delivered it back to Wutan 3. Am I clear, Gunnery Officer Chin? Yes, sir. Chin turns back to his station trying to ignore the trickle of cold sweat crawling down his spine. Captain Sprick returns his attention to the intricate chaos of numbers, landscape displays, and force icons collected in front of him. Very good. Officer Edelwhite, continue trying to pin down the prototype's non-causal signature. Run another regression on the data from last night. There's no way that Dirt Eater can hide from us forever, not with an entire strike force sweeping the area. Right away, sir. Sprick's eyes focus on the tactical plot trying to pull meaning from the jumbled mess of his latest operation. I'm bringing you back, he silently vows to the still elusive quarry. I do not need anyone else. This ship can do it. These people can do it, no matter how difficult the task. I trained them to. Yet despite all Captain Sprick's levels, all his experience, the tactical plot refuses to give up its secrets just yet, the prototype still thrashing at the end of his line. He sighs. Captain leaving the bridge. Officer Taylor, you have the helm. Yes, sir. Captain Sprick retreats to his personal office, and the next three hours pass in relative quiet, various logistical and administrative duties dealt with quickly and competently. Watch schedules are approved, menu options are considered, confirmation of the latest Hellhound resupply to the forward operating base is sent, and the necessary minutiae keeping a frontline non-causal warcruiser in fighting trim is observed. As the ship chimes the dinner bell, he allows himself a slight smile at the latest maintenance report from the engine room. Chief Engineer Mac Willie and her new protege continue working miracles with the engines, justifying his overlooking of her against regulations energy draw earlier that day. Not like you to stick your neck out for someone with less than 10 integration levels, Mac Willie. If he's your replacement, train him well. We'll need him. 
Captain Sprig finishes the last report and rises from his desk, knuckling his back. With any luck, the ten minutes he set aside for dinner won't be interrupted. Captain, sir. A familiar voice sounds in his head from the ship's infonet. Yes, Officer Adelwhite. We just lost biometrics from a sentry patrolling outside the operations center. Squads are moving to intercept now. Captain Sprick steps towards the hatch separating his office from the hallway leading to the bridge, but before he can get through it the voice returns, a tinge of excitement underlying the cool professionalism. Sir, we have confirmation. It's the prototype. Sprick breaks into a run down the corridor, scrambling to pull up a smaller version of the tactical plot in his right eye. Friendly icons are engaging a wavering energy signature that bounces around like an Arcadian hyperflea on bath salts, zipping its way through attack after attack. Several biometrics flash orange, indicating significant injury, but aside from the initial patroller, no other flatlines are present. Sound General Quarters. I want us prepared for orbital support and tracking. We're not letting it get away this time. A klaxon blares throughout the entire ship, and the strobing lights of General Quarters paint the hallway vermilion. Captain Sprick finishes his run to the bridge and comes to a halt in front of the main tactical repeater. First-person perspectives from the troops below provide a chaotic glimpse at the engagement, their shots constantly missing a blurry figure moving up the mountainside like a ghost. Is that Dirt Eater trying to attack an entire strike force alone? Focus on your weapons, Gunnery Officer Chin. Captain Sprick snaps, while inwardly thinking the exact same thought. Officer Taylor, does non-causal foresight have any insight on why the prototype is heading directly for the base? Is the pocket dimension leaking? Officer Taylor gulps. We think it's just bad luck, sir. From the prototype's assumed angle of approach, the pocket dimension is directly in line with a higher elevation site that would normally be a preferred location. We think that's where they're headed. There's no such thing as bad luck, Sprick growls, but his focus is entirely on the scene unfolding in the tactical plot. Warn the base, immediately dash. Target is through the pocket dimension barrier. Officer Edelwhite sings out as the tactical plot vanishes into swirling gray mist trying to get a visual through reality interference. A new voice breaks into Sprick's head. You're captain, sir. We have a problem. What is it, Mac Willie? We're busy up here. Sounds of distant clangs and horrible squelching join Mac Willie's words, accompanied by Huckins bellowing and swearing. And is what you're all doing up there the thing that's causing my engines to seize up? Because, sir, we've got a temporal flux coming down the pipe from reality the likes of which would cause God herself to shit a brick. It's resonating with the engines. With this energy load, we're looking at a breach, you captain, sir. A big one. Captain Sprick sucks in a breath, and then the gray mist of the tactical plot resolves into a perfectly clear display of black line fissures vanishing into a pile of reality sinks waiting to be brought back to the ship for safe inning. We have visual, oh fuck me. Officer Edelwhite whispers the last part in a horrified voice, and the pile shifts somewhere else. The briefest pause. Something looks in. Reality breach. Officer Taylor screams, clutching at her head. It's an entity, sir. Gunnery Officer Chin. You may fire at will. Chapter 17, Titans and Terrors. I'm frozen in some sort of paralysis. Everyone else around me is too. For some reason, I can't draw my attention away from the overwhelming presence taking up the hole in reality. It feels like the air just before a thunderstorm hits. A tendril of something pokes experimentally through the hole, waving around almost curiously. It withdraws and then an obsidian glass arm pulls itself the wrong way through, shoulder stump emerging first, then elbow, then hand. The motion is so wrong I want to vomit, and pressure starts building behind my eyes. A head inverts itself into existence, made of that same glossy black material and bearing a perfectly blank expression. A body scuttles through next, faceted outer ribs acting like legs until they fold away like they were always inside it. Another arm. A leg. Another leg. Everything is together, and it's never been separate. A ten-meter-tall woman made entirely of obsidian glass stands like a statue in the middle of the base, and still no one moves. Her head is now facing every direction at once, a blurring cloud of features drifting across and within the polished material. I can feel blood leaking from my ears. Her arms are now raised, no motion in between changes of state, and the distorted gray nothingness surrounding us vanishes. A threat zone, so lurid as to be almost blinding, blankets the entire area. Up above, the stars warp and twist, a whirlpool lens funneling a diamond spear that grows larger and larger as it descends. Screaming choirs dance along its brilliant flanks, but their light stays confined within the thrusting pillar. I want to move. I can't move. 
I want to breathe. I can't breathe. The obsidian woman takes a step without stepping. Her body unfolds into an infinite flower, then collapses back in on itself. Her size doubles. She takes another step. Another unfolding. Another doubling. The diamond spear shudders against the sky, but its motion doesn't take it anywhere. Distance is a concept it no longer possesses. Another step. Another. The sound of her unseen footfall is beyond deafening. I want to collapse to my knees. I can't move. I'm staring at a titan striding the earth. Her body rises into the sky so far it fades into the night, visible only where it occludes the stars, but the stars are still there. They're just inside her. Another diamond lance appears, and another, but they fail to find their way down and stick next to the first. A hand larger than the mountain we stand on reaches down and digs into the earth in a quaking tremble. Rock screams, and then she pulls the mountain skyward, tearing it in half, fishhook's curved peak poking out above her fist. The ground jumps back and forth beneath me, a violent earthquake that's completely still. Two-thirds of the marauder base is gone, engulfed in that mammoth grip, the empty night air hovering bare meters away from my feet, but I still can't move. I can't think. I can't exist, but somehow I am. Midnight fingers squeeze the sundered earth like clay, molding fishhook into its namesake. Another hand reaches for the diamond pillars. When it returns, it's holding an endless coil of glittering line. Fishhook is threaded. Fishhook is cast. Fishhook bites deep. The glittering line drags something down from the stars, twitching and jerking as whatever's on the other end bucks and thrashes. It feels like no time has passed. It feels like days have passed, my mind witnessing the sun rising and falling thrice over. I'm dying of thirst. No time has passed at all. Suddenly, a massive wedge of gray and black is hovering kilometers above us, the mountain peak impaled through its front third. Blazing energy flares from its rear, but it's pinned to the sky in defiance of everything real. The obsidian woman swings her right hand at it, glacially slow, like someone swatting a fly over the course of a week. Just before the hand makes contact, a wrenching twist of purple force from the side of the wedge unfolds it into its fractal flower shape. And when the hand collapses back, three fingers are missing. The obsidian woman screams, the universe starts up again, and just like that, I can move. Chaos erupts. Sky run now. I know. I shout at Box, dashing away from the crumbling cliff edge two meters away from my feet and growing closer by the second. With the non-causal violation's weird stasis gone, reality is reasserting the normal rules, including gravity. The hellhound tips over the edge with a shriek of tortured metal, followed quickly by a billowing fireball rising from the growing abyss. Where am I running to? Anywhere that's not here. We have to get off the mountain. It's going to collapse. I thought I had sworn off headlong rushes down mountainsides, but here we are. I leap from splitting rock to rock, dashing when able, avoiding the deep fissures spreading underfoot. A swarm of other figures have the same idea, corporate marauders desperately fleeing their ruined base, our conflict momentarily forgotten in the ongoing apocalypse. One by one, they fall into the yawning chasms. Some scream. Most don't. Up above, a series of thunderous explosions bracket the obsidian woman's head, strange colors flickering in their depths, momentarily lighting up the sky with a false dawn. Doubts of inky smoke spurt from the obsidian woman's eyes in response, a rain of black mist. Box twitches my eye muscles to briefly zoom in, and the mist gains resolution, each droplet a non-causal violation like the ones I fought earlier, squirming in their eagerness to reach the ground below. I find a way to run even faster. Box, what are we going to do? We're going to run, Sky. I was expecting a couple anchors to come through the breach, but that's an entity. There's nothing in the tutorial about facing down entities. Level 50s don't want to face down entities. The oily rain draws nearer, wretched shapes now visible without magnification. My rifle starts firing as I run, but it's like trying to stop a flood with a straw. A boulder the size of one of the elder trees smashes into the ground in front of me and I dash through it with an involuntary scream. The sky is filled with madness, and it's getting closer. What's an entity? Why is there an entity? Did we cause this? It's not entirely our fault. We poked a hole in the universe, but it was only supposed to be a small one. Two, three anchors max enough to confuse the marauders and allow us to escape. There must have been another source of non-causal energy nearby. A big one. My bet is the cruiser was running its engines hot. That, coupled with your energy jack. Well? More explosions overhead. The energy from the rear of the hooked ship flaring even brighter as it shakes against the mountain impaling its front end. Small pieces rain off, debris joining the rest of the maelstrom, but the vessel is stuck fast. I keep running. 
As far as the entity, well, it's bad. Extremely bad. Entities are parts of reality with a purpose. The obsidian woman's mouth suddenly opens, a thicket of wetly pink tendrils slithering out towards the cruiser. Lances of dazzling white blast forth from all over the ship, slicing through the grotesque extrusions, but twice as many emerge from the split stumps, like a vomit of worms. They latch onto the rear of the ship, pulling it closer to the gaping mouth, the front end vibrating madly against fishhook. Explosions rip through the air, a desperate flurry of destruction embracing the titanic form. Pits and craters appear over the woman's glossy surface, and then... Crack. Like a tug-of-war rope worn too thin, the cruiser snaps in two. The front third hangs limply from fishhook as the bulk of the ship accelerates towards the mouth now taking up the entirety of the entity's head, held fast with thousands of fleshy ropes. I stumble to a halt at the foot of what's left of the mountain, dumbfounded. Entities hunt. Non-causal. Energy. Like. Overloaded ship engines. The staccato snaps of my rifle draw me out of my days. A horde of lesser violations are pouring across the hillsides, swarming everywhere. I gulp. So then, it'll go away when it gets the engines? We'll be safe. It might. It might not. We're non-causal. Energy too. And sometimes, they like to stick around, taking the sights, along with everything else. A blinding flash splits the sky, a brief sun washing away the dark. The spots clear from my eyes almost instantly, my attention drawn upward. A scene of terrifying glory meets my gaze. Half the entity's head has vanished, along with the rear third of the ship, the middle part slowly tumbling earthward, spilling its guts as it falls. A glowing orange hole runs straight through the obsidian chest, flower fractal shards withering at the edges like delicate blooms exposed to a wildfire. Drawing nearer is a rectangular box, strange energies playing along its edges, its path lined up perfectly with the scorching wound. The entity screams once more, shaking the ground with a liquid jump, then turns and reaches for the descending object, but black glass fingers close just behind it in a heavy crunch. Its bulk somehow stuck to the remnant of ship hanging from fishhook and preventing it from reaching further. The box grows larger as it falls, a trick of perspective against the entity's incomprehensible mass finally resolving it into a gigantic shape on its own, nearly 200 meters long and half that again wide and tall. Scorch marks streak its battered sides, along with vicious rents, like something was clawing at it. The box continues its hurtling descent, then plows into the ground 400 meters away, causing the earth to jump once more and sending up a giant spray of dirt as it slides to a halt crushing a vast swathe of violations back into non-existence. The rest, except for those immediately surrounding me, turn and rush towards it from all directions. Popped. The engine core. Clever. Calculating. Might work, if they're still. Alive. Sky. Head four. The box. I spring into action. There's no other choice but to trust box to keep us alive from the terrors assaulting us. I have no idea what's happening anymore. My cookery swings vicious arcs across their endless ranks, my rifle clearing more distant shapes, but I'm still in danger of being overwhelmed. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Gleaming smiles herald a host of stabbing blades, each one striking true and disappearing another violation. Current energy, 20 160. I dash past another knot, cookery flicking out and claiming its bounty, then I'm briefly in the clear, halfway towards the seething knot of violations surrounding the crash structure. My rifle fires behind me a monotone cracks, keeping pursuers from closing too quickly. What's the plan, Box? Hope that, whoever popped the core, is still alive, and high enough level, to overload the engines. And what's that going to accomplish? I shout, sprinting into the outer layers of violations and sending them back into unreality. Isn't that how we got into this mess to begin with? More serpent-slick bodies fall around me, and I swear I can hear the clang of something metal in the distance. Sympathetic. Resonance. We punch another. Hole in the universe. Reality leaves. Sucks the entity. Back out. And that'll work? The clanging sound grows louder, joined by furious roars. I wipe out another knot of violations with a flex of mental muscle. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Current energy. 6 160. Warning. Insufficient energy for non causal expressions. Theoretically, I burst through another layer of horrors onto a small mound briefly free of attackers. The side of the giant structure towers overhead, but with the slight elevation, I can make out something nearby. Almost all of the violations are clustered around an opening now visible in its side, and I stare at it with wild eyes. A hulking woman in tattered coveralls is standing in front of the doorway, 
some sort of long metal tool held in her bloodied right hand, roaring as she dispatches violation after violation with heavy blows. Next to her, a young man bearing a rictus expression of terror is doing the same, utilizing two of the same tools and any body part he can bring to bear. Iwin says he headbutts a monster, but it dissipates nonetheless. Must be, engineers, link up, don't fight. I wade back into the melee, cookery slashing down horror after horror, dashing when I can. It makes the fight I had in the hollow feel like a pleasant stroll along Watcher's Hill. Current life, 237-450. Warning, biomass depleted. Stabbing off the creature latched to my right shoulder, I stumble into the tiny clear area created by the two engineers, panting heavily. My body feels fine, but mentally and emotionally I'm exhausted. A threat zone suddenly appears and I dash past the young man's incoming boot, making sure not to engage my cookery against him. Almost instantly, the broad-shouldered woman is in front of me, metal tool raised threateningly. Battle fury blazes in her dark eyes. And who the fuck are you then? I'm not here to fight. I'm Sky. I hold my hands up, my rifle limb still busy picking off targets. She nonchalantly bashes in the head of another violation leaping at her back without looking and narrows her eyes at my limbs. I don't remember any combat variants on the crew over level 20, and we certainly didn't have anyone named Sky. I don't know what that means, I reply honestly. Box told me to help you. Are you the engineer? They're closing in, chief, the young man shouts, driving a solid knee into one before spinning and laying out another. My life's getting low. That's why we use the one quarter, young Master Huckins, she bellows back, as not leaving my own. So we can use our energy. She briefly vanishes, and the sensation of a universe filled with metal tools engulfs the area, an eternity of thudding impacts. When my senses catch back up with my brain, the area is clear for a 30-meter semicircle. Up above, the entity screams again, and the woman reappears next to me. I'm the chief engineer, Sky whoever you are, and now I need to know the why of you asking. Perfect, at least, level 90. Tell her, the plan. Box says we need to overload the engines, I say nervously. Just how strong is she? She crosses her arms over her chest, muscles flexing dangerously. And why would we be doing that to my mates? Um, Box says something called sympathetic resonance is the only way to get rid of the entity. She grimaces. Yup, that would do it, all right. Still doesn't explain why I should sacrifice my mates. I've spent the last three days keeping that fucker from dragging them back into reality. I frown. The entity's only been here for less than half an hour. Temporal, violations, common with. Entities. They're coming back, chief, the young man, Huckins, declares nervously. I look past the chief engineer at another inky tide flowing over the hillside. Please. This is my home, and I don't want to die. I can't kill that thing on my own. She looks at me oddly. You know about a sympathetic resonance, but you don't know what it actually does? You're an odd one, Sky whoever you are. I'm just trying to keep my village safe. Please. She lifts one hand to rub her face, smearing grease and blood across her already grimy features, and I suddenly notice how exhausted she looks. Her eyes are sunken, cheeks hollow, and Huckins doesn't look any better. When she lets her hand fall, her perfect white teeth are bared in a grin. I, fuck it then, was planning on going down with the ship, but the old man went and took that away from us, now Huckins? At least we can give this bugger the boot on our way out. I pre-pre-prefer being alive, chief, he stammers. Even if it's only for a little bit low. Low. Longer. Ah, you'll never be a space dog with an attitude like that, lad. Going down with the ship and glorious last stands amongst the engines are time-honored traditions for idiots like us. You're idiots too? I ask curiously. I thought I was a memoriam, but it turned out I'm an idiot. Do you have an archive? They both stare at me strangely. Sky, stop talking. The chief engineer abruptly laughs. Looks like we're all idiots then. You? She points at me. You hold this doorway until you fall over dead, and then you keep fighting. Can't let them inside the engine room, or we're all proper fucked. Lad, she bellows, with me. It's time for you to learn how to perform a final adjustment. They disappear through the doorway, and I set myself a pace in front of it, watching the incoming horde draw closer. Box. What did she mean about keep fighting even after I'm dead? My rifle begins its metronome crack once again. It's what combat variants do. I pilot your body. Oh, like when you brought me home last night? Yes, but if we stay and fight here, we will probably die permanently. I cannot secure the room. 
and also extract you. If it fails, not enough energy. But if we do this, it'll work. The village will be safe. It should, but Sky, it might not. I set my shoulders. Then keep fighting, box. Even if I die, every idiot finds their melty rock eventually. Understood. And then there's no more time to talk. The distant swarm of violations up close and in my face in the blink of an eye. I weave back and forth, box cutting down monsters by the tens, and then the hundreds, but there's no end to them. Up above, another scream rends the sky. Current life, 198 of 450. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Current energy, 0 slash 160. My world is nothing but flashing blades, rifle snaps, gnashing teeth, and twisting flesh seeking my own. I can't hold out. I must hold out. Current life, 143 of 450. The inexplicable sounds of conversation echo from the room behind me, some trick of sound or reality. I said the 116th, you little donkey ick. Do you want to end up somewhere you're nothing but exposed nerve endings? Sorry, chief. Sorry's for losers, young master Huckins. A space dog gets in and gets the job done. Pass me the five-eighths. Here. Good. You got it right that time. Now we give this bit a crank dash. Current energy, infinity slash 160. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Executing 360 no scope.exe. Current cooldown rate, 900%. And that'll synchronize the local reality with the engine output. You paying attention? Yes, chief. Current life, 87 of 450. An obsidian glass figure is suddenly towering overhead, blank eyes fixing me in an implacable stare. Whatever kept it attached to the remnants of the ship seems to have worn off. It slowly bends forward, pink tendril-filled mouth descending in an unstoppable meteor dive. Now we yank this piece through the manifold and give it a good twist. How'd you do that, chief? Experience, lad. You'll need at least ten levels in unreal structural engineering before you can even think about pulling off something like that. Don't try it before then, unless you want to swap your eyeballs with your femurs. The entirety of the sky above is wriggling wrongness, collapsing everything down and trying to physically crush me into the torn soil. I fight against it with gritted teeth, dashing back and forth to keep the doorway free, firing off non-causal expressions non-stop, but still the horde presses in closer. One, last, H-N-G-H-H-H, and done. Now, lad, hand me the three-quarter spanner. What's that one for, Chief MacWilly? The fleshy strands, each one as wide around as my entire body, have overtaken the violations, absorbing them in squelching pops, but it makes things even worse. They're bare centimeters away from me, bare centimeters away from the engine room, condensing the entire universe into this last tiny pocket of reality as they writhe in every conceivable direction. Just as they're about to close on me, the engine room thrums, and its walls vanish, replaced by a transparent layer of coruscating light. A forest of strangely organic pillars is barely visible within the mist inside, in bruised purple illumination that casts no shadows builds along their forms. Two figures come running out of their depths. Quickly, lad. The three quarters. The violet incandescence brightens, fiercer and fiercer, freezing the entity in place. One of the rushing figures throws a long metal object to the other, and they barrel through the doorway with panting wheezes. Good work. Sky whatever you are, Chief Engineer MacWilly gasps. Now get out of the way. She shoves me gently to one side her and Huckins on the other, leaving the doorway open, and readies her tool in a two-handed grip. Inside the engine room, reality thins, then snaps apart with a slight ting. The engines go somewhere else. All around us the tapestry of horrible meat screams, then starts funneling through the doorway, an impossibly dense rope of sinew and muscle shifting frantically to fractal flowers along its length but getting sucked through nonetheless. A patch of normal night sky becomes visible overhead, and then the process accelerates, more and more of the entity dragged back into whatever corner of reality it normally inhabits. It tries to manifest one last obsidian hand, clutching frantically at the coruscating light surrounding the absence of meaning, and then the chief engineer steps forward and takes a mighty swing. And this is what the three quarters is for, young Master Hawkins. Unwanted guests who don't know when to leave. The obsidian glass hand shatters, sucked into the rift, and then the coruscating light collapses inward hiding the hole in our universe from sight with a blinding glare. When it fades, the entity is gone, along with the engine room. The night sky is back to normal, and Chief Engineer MacWilly is swaying on her feet. She lets the metal tool drop with a heavy thud. It's smoking gently. Lad, 
Pass me the bum snurfles. We ran out two days ago, chief. Ah, so we did. Very well, then. The chief engineer slumps bonelessly to the ground, heavy snores ripping through the night air a second later. Huckins and I share a look, then follow suit. Chapter 18 Interlude A Brief Introduction to Modern Warfare, presented by HHIC. Greetings, future security specialist slash ship captain slash titan of industry slash expendable meat fodder. Choose appropriate response before integrating with customer, and welcome to your complimentary lesson on galactic conflict. The first in our 78 part series. By choosing the Hypertron Heavy Industries training module, you are guaranteeing yourself the highest legally defensible survival rate in violent non causal interactions and a fast track ticket to success, not legally binding. In addition, remember that completing this course with a greater than 95% final score entitles you to a discount on one. 1. Hypertron Self Defense Item of Your Choice. Class 2 or lower, no refunds, most exceptions apply. Offer not valid in the contiguous 57 non-corporate states and the Eyeless Temple of Baalsgrek. Must complete entire course to qualify. Now let's get to the learning. As you've no doubt absorbed during your pre-integration training, strike this part if customer is involuntarily volunteered via wage debt or criminal record or undesirable status. The modern galactic sovereignty is somewhat of a mess. While Hypertron Heavy Industries works tirelessly to keep the peace and provide stable jobs for its billions of lucky shareholders, earning a stellar combined 9.9 .9 rating out of 10 in all surveys conducted in Hypertron space, other corporations, sadly, are not as nobly committed to upholding the blazing beacon of justice. Corporate restructurings and capital readjustments with Lockmartin Combined Arms, Jinsiki Limited, Wutan Whalen, and the Voy March are unfortunately quite common, and as such, you need to know how to present yourself as a proper employee at all times. When confronting a potentially hostile shareholder of another corpo, your first reaction should be to use conventional weaponry. This includes pulse rifles, multi-missile cluster launchers, coherent light emitters, thermal agitators, fusion rounds, antimatter ordnance, and other causal methods, including your nails and teeth. Remember, keeping it in our reality keeps everyone clean. Should the enemy be utilizing non-causal methods of avoidance, covered in Lesson 13 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module, then you might have to resort to non-causal weaponry. Now, naturally, this is an expected escalation, agreed to by all signatories of the Grunt for Jacobs Extradimensional War Crimes Treaty. Hypertron Heavy Industries cannot be held legally liable for non-causal weapon use in non-signatory areas, and as such, you should respond in kind. Nightmare spheres, concept bombs, irrationality missiles, and ego crushers, covered in Lesson 32 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module are all perfectly valid responses to someone you suspect utilizing non-causal means. Remember, it's not a war crime if you feel it's warranted. Unfortunately, sometimes the filthy subhuman trying to wipe you, your entire family, and your ancestors from the skein of existence will try and escalate back, covered in Lesson 51 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module. When this happens, don't fret. The latest advances in non-causal research indicate that a high concentration of inimical energies in a sphere defined by the square root of the cubic volume of irrational energy as expressed by the Fibonacci sequence, covered in Lesson 82 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module, might cause a reality breach, but legally speaking, it's not your fault. As long as you can establish prior intent to utilize non-causal methods, covered in Lesson A54.3 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module, from the other party, then you have nothing to worry about. Hypertron's well-trained team of non-causal lawyers will immediately arrive to defend your actions, covered in error not found, is legally required by our corporate charter. Should your actions result in a reality breach that involves entity class or higher involvement, Hypertron Heavy Industries is not obligated to notify your next of kin under any circumstances, and you hereby revoke any attempts by anyone, anytime. Anywhere to recover damages from Hypertron Heavy Industries in any infinity this contract remains valid under, and it's all of them. Congratulations on completing Lesson 1 of the Hypertron Heavy Industries Training Module. We look forward to your future service. Addendum, added by user unknown. Can you believe this corpo shit? Look, if you're at all in charge of people, you break it down to them like this. We use causals as long as they're using causals. When someone escalates, we escalate back. If reality comes fucking around because we dump too many non-causals in the area, we drop hostilities and deal with that shit. Then the survivors get back to fucking each other up. Voy March, out. 
Chapter 19, Wakings and Welcomings. Safe to eat, chief? What if? Been three days, I could devour a scrot gopher's butthole hole, lad. Well, that's really. Immimpy chimpy pee chimpa chim. I crack my eyes open blearily, early morning rays sticking to my gummed up lids. Everything feels sore. I'm lying on a pile of dirt. Birds chirp overhead. Two people are eating my rations. Oh, we're awake. HNG chach. I roll into a sitting position, rubbing at my face. What happened? Box? The two figures freeze, heads slowly rotating my way. Morning. I yawn at them. What's for breakfast? Sky. The pleasant sensation of a lazy return to sensibility is dashed under the cold water of reality. I don't know the two people across from me. They're other humans. They came from the ship that was hunting us. Chief Mac Willie and Huckins. We killed the entity together. I try to say everything at once. Plort. Huckins snorts with laughter, then slaps a hand to his face as if he's committed some sort of crime. I flush at his hidden mockery, then flush in anger on registering what they're holding. Hey, that's my food. Chief Engineer Mac Willie narrows her eyes, then deliberately swallows her current mouthful. Me and the lad haven't eaten in three and a half days, sky whatever you are, and we're not thieves. You'll get your recompense. Oh, I flush again. I'm sorry. Where are my manners? I didn't realize you were that hungry. I hold out my open hands to them. My meal is yours, until we both share the same what. What are you doing, Sky? We should kill them. They came from the ship. I ignore Box, truly embarrassed by my lack of decorum. We saved each other's lives last night. Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Hawkins could have ignored me or left me to die, but they were willing to work together for a goal not their own. It's a lesson the village holds dear. That's some sort of religious blessing? Chief Engineer Mac Willie asks around another bite of my ration. She winces as she chews, holding her other hand to her side. I try to ignore the grumbling in my stomach. Just a way of living. You can have what I have until our needs for life are the same. Then someone dies. Her mouth pauses for a full five seconds, and then she swallows again, this time more slowly. Now that's a literal creed if I've ever heard one. The Never God wept. She takes another bite. Your village sounds as depressing as a neutron star's anus. How do you know about the village? I ask, my muscles tensing. Easy. There, Mac Willie waves the ration at me, Huckins freezing next to her. You told us last night. When we fought the entity. My cheeks burn their hottest yet. How could I forget something like that? It just happened. Sorry. Still trying to wake up. You're going to persist in treating them like human beings, aren't you? They are human beings, I mutter beneath my breath, but apparently it's not low enough because Huckins cocks his ear and looks at me. What was that? He asks politely, coming out of his earlier shell. Oh. I'm just talking with Box, I explain, trying to act casual. Box said most other people outside the village were integrated, so surely they talk to their boxes. We do it all the time. He nods companionably, then freezes again, ration bar halfway to his mouth. If he's not going to eat it, I wish he'd let me have some. I really am hungry. Box, is, your integrator? It has a name. Sky. Yes. It was weird when we first integrated because Box tried to explain itself as some sort of space demon. But if it had just told me the idea of what a modified combat variant integrator does, I'm pretty sure I would have figured it out. Both of them are staring at me, mouths dropping open. Huckins lets his ration tumble from his hand, and I snag it with a limb before it can hit the ground. I bring the savory brick of dried globeast and dark fern bread closer and take a big bite. MMMPH, thanks for sharing. I wash really hungry. I wave my hand at Chief Engineer Mac Willie. Can you hand me the water canteen? It's on the side of the pack. She grabs the canteen from the ground at her feet and tosses it at me, still wearing that bewildered expression. I unscrew the cap and tilt it to my lips, then frown when only a small dribble comes out. You drank all the water, too? Sky. Be quiet, box, I hiss, slamming the cap back on the canteen. I'm trying to act normal. Chief Engineer Mac Willie carefully places her half-eaten ration on top of the pack, then grabs Huckin's shoulder. She smiles at me. If you can excuse us for just a moment, me and the lad need to have a discussion. Put our noggins together and hash out some minor details. She yanks Huckins after her and limps off. They squat down twenty meters away, heads bent next to each other. Behind them, the ruined shape of Fishhook rises into the sky, half as tall as it used to be, and now bearing an adornment at its peak the curved tip still skewering the remaining third of the cruiser. I don't trust them, Sky. Adjusting baseline parameters. 
Scraps of their hushed voices suddenly echo in my ears, the quiet morning world a thousand times noisier. That's the protoite? I lad. What the old man was. Can't be more than sixteen. No telling what level of reality it's tapping into. But we fought together. Need more information before we. The two of them finally finish their whispered conversation and walk back over, fake smiles plastered on their faces. Let them go first, and we can figure out what. I heard you talking, I declared defiantly before they can say anything. I'm the one the corporate marauders were looking for. Are you looking for me too? Because I'll fight if I have to. I don't know why I bother. It's statistically impossible for a tutorial to go this poorly, yet it keeps happening. Huckins matches my earlier flush, but Chief Engineer MacWilly's face slides into stone-cold stillness. I, The old man was chasing what you hold for a fair bit. Probably still be chasing it if not for that entity but now there's none left up but ourselves. My own expression goes cold, remembering what Box told me last night. Are you blaming me for what happened? Because Box is pretty sure that if your engines weren't running hot, then things wouldn't have been that bad. We face each other down, Huckins glancing back and forth between the two of us. I mentally prepare myself to use my limbs, even if she totally outclasses me like her display of power last night thoroughly indicated. If they're still looking for a fight, I can't let them know where the village is. I'd rather die here. Chief Engineer MacWilly flexes her hands once, knuckles popping, then relaxes, limping back over to the pack and grabbing her ration. Seems to me as if there's plenty of blame to go around, and it's a poor space dog who holds a grudge when reality comes calling. The old man ran a tight ship. It's true, she takes another big bite, chewing it noisily, but he was a right pissant as well. Always interested in landing a bigger fish. She swallows, then smiles. Besides, I got to send my mates to a better place and kick an entity in the ass on the way out, so I'll consider it a win. She holds out a hand. No hard feelings, right? I look at her hand, confused. Is she trying to offer me something and forgot to grab it? You're supposed to slap palms, wiggle your fingers together, and then bump knuckles front, top, and bottom, Chief Engineer MacWilly eventually says, raising an eyebrow. Just where are you from? Sky whatever you are. Before I can answer, Huckins butts in. Chief. We're just going to act like nothing happened? That's the prototype. I, young Master Huckins, Chief Engineer MacWilly growls, and I've served 45 years and 98 integration levels under the Wutan Whalen Combat Forces for the crime of being socially undesirable, with another lifetime due once I passed on. So you'll forgive me if I'm not keen on mourning the old man's passing nor carrying out his mission without combat support. That flighty little thing over there could take us in a heartbeat now we've no engines to draw from. Huckins looks inward for a second, then gulps, holding his hands up. He turns to me. Ah, oh, sorry, um, it's just Dash. We can take them, Sky. Let's get rid of them, and then get out of here. We have some numbers ready to go up. I don't want to fight, I sigh. How is it this early in the morning and I'm already this exhausted? If you're not going to hurt me or the village, then I have no reason to hurt you. We just want to survive. I'm from Earth, by the way. Chief Engineer MacWilly scoffs. I sure you are. Maybe that's what the word means in whatever translator program you've got running, but there ain't nobody living on Earth these days except for reclamation teams round the spaceports, and they get cycled out every three years to prevent reality poisoning. Besides, Earth is in Voimarch territory. Even the old man knew to keep out of there. I shrug. Okay. Doesn't matter to me. I'm going back to the village now that it's safe. I walk over and reattach my canteen to Dirt's pack, then sling it over my shoulders. Thank you for helping me last night. Bye. Three steps into my run I hear a shout from behind. Hey, wait a minute. I stop and turn around. Chief Engineer Willie is limping after me, Huckins right behind her, trying to cram down the last of his ration bar. What about us? I don't understand. They stumble to a halt several meters away, Chief Engineer Mac Willie wincing as she feels at her side. Me and the lad are what you might call stranded at the moment. Wherever this is, I'm sure you've noticed the infonet isn't working, so we've no way to contact anyone to come get us, let alone find water and shelter. That's the second time I've heard that term. I wonder what an infonet is. Like the biggest archive and memory shrine you can imagine, only bigger. Now I really want an infonet. Can't you use your ship? I point at the pinned remnant of the cruiser. Oh, I, there's supplies and things in there I could cobble together, but we're in no shape to climb. Chief Engineer MacWilly pokes at her side and winces again, and I'm thinking there's not much human left aboard. They didn't have the protection of the engine room like me and the lad here. 
I'd not want to investigate those ruins without at least a full combat squad to deal with whatever the entity left behind. Oh. Hmm. I stopped to think. Don't do it, Sky. That idea. That idea. Leaving and making numbers go up is a much better idea. I'll have to bring you to the village, then. I ran from there yesterday morning. Broom might have something in the archive that can help you figure out where to go. And we have food and water. Medicine, too, if you're hurt. Chief Engineer Mac Willie stares at me, stupefied. Just like that? You're going to help us? And what's this village? The village is where I live, and why wouldn't I? I ask, genuinely confused. You haven't tried to hurt me. You helped the village, and now you need help. We have to stick together to survive. Reconfiguring core assumptions. I. She trails off, shaking her head. Why the never gods tits, but you're a strange one. No telling what that researcher mucked around in your brain. She straightens up, favoring her right side. Very well. Let's be off, though I'm afraid I won't be moving too quickly. Pretty sure I busted a couple ribs, and there's no engine energy for me to draw on anymore. She looks over at Huckins. Though, if you ran here in one day, it can't be that far. Think you're up to carrying me if I falter, lad. I look at the substantial size differential between the two of them and giggle. I can try, Chief, Huckins says loyally, swinging his thin arms around to warm them up. Chief Engineer MacWilly lets out a snorting chuckle of her own, then grimaces and clutches at her side. Never you mind, young Master Huckins. I'll make do. She cocks her head at me. Which way? Over here. I set off along the hillside in a direction I'm pretty sure is towards the forest. I think. Box, can I get a waypoint? Core assumptions reconfigured. Your altruism is going to get us killed out in the broader galaxy, Sky. Can't we just make numbers go up? We'll do it on the way, Box. I say firmly. Fine. Here. A green indicator flickers into life in my vision, a little to the left of where I was aiming, and I adjust my angle accordingly, keeping my stride extremely slow for the injured chief engineer. After ten minutes of walking, and strangely, Box not bothering me, several numbers appear next to the indicator. Box, what are those? Distance remaining, and projected time until arrival at your current pace which is currently four and a half days assuming an eight-hour sleep break for your tagalogs. A wave of dismay rolls over me. I don't think we have enough supplies for that. You definitely don't have enough supplies, which is why you should leave them behind and return to the village. With any luck, they'll perish peacefully from exposure in the night. I'm pretty sure dying from exposure isn't peaceful, Box. Wait, whoa, what's this about dying from exposure? Huckins asks quickly, adjusting the large bag hanging from his belt. Next to him, Chief Engineer MacWilly is huffing for breath, hand clutched to her side, a pained expression on her face. Who's dying from exposure? Is it us? I motion them to halt, and Chief Engineer MacWilly flashes me a grateful look. Her face is gray and sweating, as if we've been running the entire time. I really don't think she should be moving around right now. Box says we're not moving fast enough. The village is, um, 108 kilometers away. I'm not sure what that is in Scrumbles but it seems pretty far. What's a scrumble? Huckins says slowly. It's coming across as a unit of measurement, but there's no value assigned. The length of Book Idiot's stride. She was the one who first stabilized the village when Dash. I fall silent at the look of utter dismay on Huckins' face and Chief Engineer Mac Willie wheezes out a laugh, then looks like she instantly regrets it. I, lad, and you thought I was making up imperial measurements. She rests her hands on her knees, head bowed. Either way, I'm not making a hundred click march like this. She looks up, face grim. I'd say, leave me behind, but that'd be wasting valuable supplies now, wouldn't it? Finally, some sensible advice. We get biomass and we get to make numbers go up even more. We're not eating Chief Engineer Mac Willie, box. We're most certainly not. Huckins declares loudly, eyes widening. I'll carry you if I need to, Chief. I can do it. Don't be stupid, lad. I've had a good run and at least I'll have a better fate than my mates. A thought occurs to me as Huckins continues to argue with Chief Engineer MacWilly. Box, why don't we carry them? Surely the limbs are strong enough. Don't wanna. Excuse me. My voice rises. I don't want to. They were part of the cruiser trying to hunt us down. I don't like them. You told me to go to them for help last night, Box. They could have attacked us, but they didn't. Don't you think you're being unreasonable? Was hoping the entity would eat them on its way out. Box. You can't make me. I'm not going to help them. Fine. I'm not going to level anymore. You can't do that. I certainly can. No more numbers going up. Not unless you help. Ding. 
That's not going to work either. Ding, ding, ding. Sparkles, ding, sparkles. Ding, ding. Doesn't bother me. No worse than the little ones on a rainy day. Rate limit exceeded. Look, box. If we don't help other people when they need it, how can we expect them to help us in return? There's no village without people working together. No one thinks like that out there. You're going to get us killed. Maybe they just forgot how to. We can remember for them. Come on. I'll even let you pick the next levels. Whatever numbers you want to make go up. Fine. I still don't like them, though. That's my box. I turn my focus back to the outside world. And if I thought Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins looked astonished before, now they're downright flabbergasted. What in the Never God's pickled arse do you have inside you? Chief Engineer Mac Willie asks, eyes wide. Huckins doesn't say anything, his mouth hanging slightly open. I shrug. That's Box. We talk a lot. Box says its creator was afraid it was too unstable, but we seem to get along okay. Don't your integrators talk to you? No. She draws out the word. They most certainly do not. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want reality talking to me on a regular basis. Now it's my turn to look confused. Wait, Box is part of reality? It told me it just did a lot of complicated math so we could access different infinities. I, that's part of what an integrator is. The other part is a sliver of that something else that stretches across all the universes. A chunk of reality mixing with all the rest. Did you never learn this during your training? This is all pretty new to me, I confide in her. Two nights ago, I was watching Starflies dance. Then one crashed, and I met Box. Grief hits me. I also lost someone who could have been a friend. Are you sane? Huckins manages, and I glare at him, my grief turning to anger. Of course I'm sane. Sure, there's been some weird stuff happening, but that doesn't mean I've lost my mind. He still doesn't look convinced, so I stick my tongue out. His eyes bulge in disbelief. Anyways, Box said we can carry both of you to the village, though I'll probably stop at the edge of the forest first so Broom and Dirt can talk with you, because despite what Box thinks, while I may be an idiot, I'm not dumb. You're not dumb, you're naive. Broom and dirt. These are... people? Chief Engineer Mac Willie asks carefully. They're idiots, like me. Probably the smartest idiots in the village. Though, my brows furrow as I think about it. I might not be an idiot yet. I think I'm still a memoriam until the idiots declare I belong to them. Chief, Huckins says pleadingly. What do we do? Chief Engineer Mac Willie lets out a pain sigh. I think we have to go with Sky, lad. I'm in no shape to salvage anything from the cruiser, and you're still too low level. You sure, chief? No, lad, but I don't see any other options. She turns to me, her bulk still imposing despite how hunched in on herself she stands. So, Sky, whatever you are, what's your grand plan? Don't freak out, okay? I warn them, letting my limbs come out. I'm going to use these to carry you, and Box agreed it won't eat anyone. This isn't reassuring, chief. Huckins wails, eyes fixed on the fuzzing bone white segments, and Chief Engineer Mac Willie cuffs him across the head. Muster up some spine, young Master Huckins. If you want to work amongst the engines, you'll see worse than this on the regular. It's not the seeing, Chief. It's the being wrapped up in one. Can't be any worse than dislodging a mimetic singularity, Chief Engineer Mac Willie mutters, trying to straighten up. She looks at me, lips tight. Guess I'll go first to reassure the lad. Seeing her discomfort, I make my limb coil around her shoulders and then along her back, hoisting her horizontal so that it looks like she's lying on a bed. I feel some strain, but it's manageable. That's actually fairly comfortable. She lets out a breath. Not nearly as bad on my ribs, and that's the truth. I reach with my other limb for Huckins and he yelps as it draws close, but he allows me to wrap him up like Chief Engineer Mac Willie. I can hear him swearing under his breath the whole time, though. There, see? Nobody got eaten, I state confidently. We still could. It would be easy, and we'd get lots of infinity expressions. I said no eating box. I ignore the whimpers from Huckins and accelerate into a proper run. It's not quite as fast as my pace from yesterday because my limbs are occupied, but it's still causing the distance number to tick down satisfyingly quickly. At this rate, we'll reach the edge of the forest in the early afternoon. After a few minutes I check to make sure the two engineers are still okay. Huckins is whimpering quietly to himself, and Chief Engineer Mac Willie is snoring. Now can we make numbers go up? Yes. Box, thank you for being patient. Now we can make numbers go up. I was wrong. This is now the worst box. Okay, what are we doing? Box. Put one into momentum strikes, and the other two into increased movement speed. I do as Box says, even though I'm confused as to why it wants to make a non-damage number go up. We're building to something, Sky. 
It'll make all the damage numbers go up. If you say so, I'm not going to complain about getting home faster. The infinity expressions into movement speed are already taking effect, my legs churning faster across the landscape, hillside after hillside sliding away beneath my darting steps. The time until arrival number adjusts itself down. At our new pace, we'll be back to the forest by midday. I try to make conversation with Huckins to pass the time, but he's passed out now as well, so I decide to start dashing to speed us up even more. We still have one more choice to make, Sky. We do. Impossibility Matrix Expansion Available. Non-Causal Storage, 0-5. Transmutation, 0-5. Reality Effectuator, 2 fourths. I know I say this a lot, Box, but what are those? Non-causal storage allows us to create a pocket dimension to store up to a certain mass. Transmutation allows us to alter the material properties of base matter. Reality effectuators are our limbs. Should we get another limb, then? Normally, I would say yes, but we need to build up your village into a proper support network, and that's going to require scavenging materials from the wreck of my creator's ship, as well as the cruiser. Our most efficient choice is non-causal storage. Choose that. Collapsing impossibility matrix. A yawning pocket opens in my mind. It's not painful, just strange. This will allow us to carry up to 50 kilograms of mass without it being affected by reality. What's a dash? No. I absolutely will not listen to whatever term your idiotic measurement system came up with for mass. Dirt's pack masses 45 kilograms. Chief Engineer MacWilly masses 103 kilograms. Huckins masses 62 kilograms. Your cookery weighs half a kilogram. You figure it out from there. You don't have to be rude about it. There's nothing wrong with the current. The next several hours pass in silence, Box refusing to acknowledge me. So I spend the time admiring the scenery and staring up at the clouds as I run. I figure out a neat trick where I can jump in the air, spin halfway around, dash backwards, and then spin back into a full sprint as I land. It allows me to watch Fishhook recede behind us the wreckage of the cruiser dwindling into a small chunk hanging near the halved mountain's peak, a crescent of stone sticking it in place. The sun grows higher overhead, and as I dash to the top of another hillside, I see the familiar green smudge of the forest spreading out before me. A surge of excitement fills my veins, and I try to speed up, but I'm already moving as fast as I can. What feels like an eternity later, but in actuality is only seven minutes, I'm stopped at the outskirts of the forest, breathing in the familiar sense with a smile that feels like it stretches from ear to ear. I gently set Huckins and Chief Engineer MacWilly down next to some bushes and then shake them awake, retracting my limbs. We're here. I call out joyously, turning in a circle and raising my arms. We're at the forest. The two engineers blearily rub at their eyes as they sit up. Chief Engineer MacWilly is the first to find her voice. Those are some bloody weird-looking trees. No, they're not. They're just trees. I point a finger at both of them. You two wait here. I need to go find dirt and broom so they can talk to you about entering the village. I'm right here. Gah. All three of us jump as one of the bushes speaks. Dirt stands up, and I throw a mock punch at him. He ducks underneath it and grabs me in a hug. It is good to see you again, Sky Idiot. We saw the strange lights last night and were afraid you had found your melty rock. It almost was, I respond, welcoming the body contact. We hold the embrace for a heartbeat longer, and then he pushes me to arm's length. And who are these people? They are not from the village, of that I am certain. I give Dirt an extremely abbreviated version of the events that led Chief Engineer MacWilly and Huckins to accompany me, and he nods when I reach the end. That is quite the trial. You were right to halt here. Broom and your grandfather, along with the other clan leaders, will want to speak to them first. However, I do not see any reason why they would refuse them entry. See, Box? Told you it would be fine. I'm still not speaking to you. I beam down at Huckins and Chief Engineer MacWilly, who are still gazing around at the entrance to the forest in wonder. Welcome to my home. Chapter 20, History and Healing. It doesn't take long for dirt to vanish into the forest, off to gather the clan leaders. I walk up to one of the trees, resting my head against the cool white bark of its trunk. Even though I've only been gone a day, I already miss the soothing atmosphere of their shadowed depths, the comforting embrace of a leafy canopy overhead. Naturally, the peaceful moment is almost immediately ruined. Chief, Huckins says fearfully, why do the trees remind me of skeletons? They possess a certain bony quality, lad, that they do. Chief Engineer MacWilly agrees quietly, hands still pressed to her side. I spin around to face them. They're just trees. 
haven't you ever seen trees before? I've seen a number of trees on a number of worlds, sky whatever you are, but I've never seen a tree like what you're calling one. Chief, the bottoms of the leaves look like blood. It's a tree, Huckins. I snap irritably. Healthy trees always have bright red leaves underneath. That's how you know they're healthy. Overhead, the leafy canopy rustles, as if agreeing with me. Sky, Chief Engineer Mac Willie coughs, a short bark of sound that leaves her doubled over and grimacing in pain. Do you mind if the lad and I have a look at your trees, while we wait? Of course you can look at them. They're trees. There's nothing special about them. Just don't cut them down. Chief Engineer Mac W. Illy slowly straightens into a half crouch. Understood. Lad, hand me the multidimensional spectrographic analyzer. Huckins digs into the bag attached to his belt and pulls out a twisted contraption covered in small rods and circular dishes. I try not to gawk at the fact that it's twice the size of the bag. Non-causal storage space. Same as what we just acquired. Told you it was useful. He hands the strange device to Chief Engineer Mac Willie, and she stumps over to the tree I was leaning against. What does that do? I ask her, watching curiously as she places it against the tree's trunk. Measures the current state of reality in a causal entity. We use it to calibrate the engines and dash. Her voice cuts off as every single circular dish on the contraption starts violently spinning in circles, accompanied by a piercing tone from each of the rods protruding along its length. She pulls it away with an oath, and the device immediately returns to a quiescent state. Bemused, she returns it to Huckins, who wordlessly stores it away in his bag and then collapses on his back. The forest is silent except for the buzzing of insects and birdsong. Now that's interesting. Explains the biomass to reversible death state efficiency. So what does that mean? I finally ask. You're sure we're out of bumps nerfles, lad? I chief. Huckins responds morosely, lying on the forest floor, one arm draped over his face. Chief Engineer Mac Willie heaves a huge sigh, then gingerly lowers herself to the loamy surface, spine resting against the tree trunk. She leans her head back against the white bark, hand once again pressed to her side, and closes her eyes. That's a crying shame. I could use a gallon or two right now. What's what you just did supposed to mean? I demand, walking over to stand in front of her. And what's a gallon? She cracks an eyelid. What it means, sky whatever you are, is your tree, I'm so happily lounging against has enough reality coursing through its body that I could run a cruiser off it alone, and it's just one of a hundred visible. She sighs again. Yet, Somehow, instead of calling down the mother of all breaches, we're sitting here on this peaceful afternoon listening to the birds go all a Twitter, and I don't have a drop of bump snurfles to soothe my addled mind. Instead, I've a couple cracked ribs and a headache that won't go away. But they're just trees, I protest. We've taken care of them for generations. How could they possibly have reality in them? I didn't even know what that was until I met Box. Silence stretches out again. Huckins is the one to eventually break it. Chief. I lad. Where are we? I told you. I snap, rearranging Dirt's pack in order to give my hands something to do. We're on Earth. That's where I live. I frown. One of the cloaks is missing. Crap. I left it on Fishhook when we attacked the base. Dirt is going to be unhappy. I'll have to find a way to make it up to him. Lad. Yes, Chief. I'm beginning to develop a sneaking suspicion that the old man's insistence on keeping the incognito field up was because he just might have brought us to Earth on his quest to track down the prototype. It would explain the lack of star charts in the daily briefings. Well, fuck. I, uh, lad. I don't understand what you're talking about at all, I complained, tying Dirt's pack closed. Why wouldn't you want to be on Earth? It's nice here. I think for a moment, then amend my statement. Well, here in the forest. Outside can be kind of dangerous. You have to watch out for glow beasts. Chief Engineer Mac Willie lifts her head away from the tree trunk and looks at me, heavy bags under her bloodshot eyes. How much do you know about Earth? Sky whatever you are. The world ended on April 1st, and a year lost to us. I sit down cross-legged and deliver the tale of beginnings the way Great Grandpa Axe taught me, pausing at the appropriate places. But Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins must not have ever heard it because they don't know the responses and I have to do both sides myself. After I finish, I stare at them expectantly. Well, Chief Engineer Mac Willie looks at me oddly. The Never God wept. That's the right day. But the rest of it, if what you're saying is true, bloody hell. Why wouldn't it be true? Because the Ganymede incident was the first known reality breach in the last 5,000 years of recorded human history, which is about all the recorded human history we have. Everyone learns about it at some point, even in the remotest infonets. Even you've heard of it. 
right, lad? Huckins grunts a muffled affirmative, and Chief Engineer Mac Willie continues. And he's from Wales 4, so that tells you just how widespread the knowledge is. Huckins makes what I assume is a rude gesture towards her, but my attention is on her words. The end of the world was a reality breach? Like what happened last night. I, but it makes the one we just suffered through look like a birthday picnic in a zero-g park. The history is some sort of experimental lab around Jupiter poked reality a bit too hard, and after the entity that came through was done poking back, it decided to settle on Earth for almost 2,000 years, forced humanity out into the rest of the stars, and forced us to learn how to harness reality properly to make a new life in places that shouldn't have supported us. When we finally got our shit together and came back to kick the first entity out, we ended up destroying the moon in the process because the damn thing just wouldn't leave. The planet itself was absolutely knackered. She tries to suck in a breath but catches herself, grimacing in pain again. You really don't know any of this? There's literally millions of action dramas about it floating around the infonets. I shrug helplessly. I know life in the beginning time was difficult, and that without the trees, we would have died. That's why we take care of them, and each other. Chief Engineer Mac Willie narrows her eyes. I, and I'm suspecting there's a story to those trees that no one in the galaxy knows. You shouldn't be alive, Sky whatever you are. If this really is Earth, the Voy March has been trying to reclaim the planet for the last 2,000 years, and even they haven't made it much past a few kilometers outside their spaceports. That entity didn't leave peacefully. What's the Voy March? One of the big five corpos, and the Voy March and Wutan Whalen do not get along, especially when it comes to the Void March's restricted territory, of which Earth most certainly belongs. She rubs a hand across her face, massaging the bridge of her nose. The old man stuck us in a right mess, and that's the truth. Why is it every time someone talks it all gets worse? Huckins moans. I just wanted to make enough to retire and raise moohounds. Chief Engineer Mac Willie squints at him, then throws a pebble, beaning him in the shin. Oh, what did you do that for, Chief? A space dog doesn't falter when the engines are screaming fit to burst and reality's trying to pull you under, young Master Huckins. A space dog grabs their one quarter and gets to adjusting. Her bellow dies away as she clutches at her side, teeth clenched together. Although, I could use some adjusting myself. She coughs, then stares at the red flecks in her palm. Some serious adjusting. Are you okay, chief? Huckins sits up in alarm. I've been better, lad. I'm not dead yet, though. Close, but not yet. Chief Dash. He's interrupted by the sounds of footsteps and quiet conversation and then a group of figures emerge from between the trees. Room Idiot is pushing Great Grandpa Axe's rolling chair, the one with the wide wheels for navigating the bumpy forest floor, and Needle Crafter and Butterfly Builder walk beside them, tool belts hanging low across their broad hips. The five other clan leaders follow behind. Water Breeder is hair tied into plates and a large purse full of snacks tucked under his arm, stove mind, adjusting the spectacles on her thin nose as she steps daintily across the roots. Dark fern baker, squat and smelling of fire and food, moss water, scribbling notes furiously in a small book, several more peeking out of her knapsack, and window doctor, his omnipresent black bag of medicine strapped to his back. Dirt and torch bring up the rear, fading in and out of the shadows as they move. I scramble to my feet. Great grandpa acts. I rush forward to gather him in a hug, being careful not to squeeze too hard. He feels even frilier under his blankets than normal but he still has enough strength to grip me back. My darling Sky, he whispers back. I'm so glad you've returned to us safely. We hold the hug a moment longer, and then break away. He looks up at me solemnly, his face that of Axe Memoriam, one of the village's nine clan leaders. Now then, what wisdom have you brought back to the forest? I take a step back to give him room as the other clan leaders gather in a semicircle around us. A sudden feeling of doubt assails me. What if they don't approve? What if Box was right? and bringing people from the ship, people that were hunting us, was the wrong thing to do. Relax, Sky. If we need to, it will be trivially simple to dispatch them. The chief engineer is heavily wounded, and Huckins isn't a combat variant. Oh, thank you, Box, for reminding me. I pick out Window Doctor, his brows raising as I make eye contact. Before I tell you all what happened, Chief Engineer Mac Willie is hurt. I think it's pretty bad. She helped save the village last night. Someone should have told me there were injured, Window Doctor growls, racing over to Mac Willie's side and shrugging his bag to the forest floor. I could have gone ahead. He reaches out towards Mac Willie's face and she leans away, eyeing him warily. You just hold still, 
Young lady, he snaps, putting his hand on her forehead. Mm, fever, and definite signs of exhaustion. He rummages in his bag, then pulls out a stethoscope. Mm hmm, fluid in the upper abdomen, heartbeat irregular. He puts the stethoscope away and lifts Macwilly's hand away from her side, examining the blood on it, then gently prods up and down, ignoring her hisses of pain. HMHMHMM, fractured ribs 7, 8, and 9, likely liver damage and internal bleeding from a nicked artery. He sits back and regards Chief Engineer Mac Willie critically. Tough, but salvageable. Sky idiot. I hurry over to Window Doctor's side. I guess the idiots did claim me after all. Yes, Mr. Doctor? This is your melty rock. You can help fix it. Help me get her flat on the ground. You take that shoulder, and on three, we gently lay her out. I reach for Chief Engineer Mac Willie's shoulder, and she grabs my wrist in a firm grip. You sure about this, Sky whatever you are? Oh. Yes, Chief Engineer MacWilly. Mr. Window Doctor knows all there is to know about medicine. No one knows all there is to know about medicine, Sky Idiot, and we're wasting time. On three, Chief Engineer MacWilly rolls her eyes in disbelief, but allows me and Window Doctor to lower her to the ground. As soon as she's level, he starts pulling pouches out of the bag. Hmm, heartwood for the ribs. Hmm, hmm, bloodroot for the artery. HMM, 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 the liver can heal on its own but perhaps some powdered dark fern for infection. He sets three of the pouches aside and puts the others back into his bag, then looks at me. Your job is to hold her shoulders still. If she moves, it might disrupt the procedure, and there will be pain. Yes, Mr. Doctor. He looks around, eyes settling on Huckins, then he shakes his head. Dirt idiot. You've done field surgeries before. Come hold her hips. And don't surprise us. You're no fun. Dirt complains, stepping out from behind the tree, but he winks at me as he kneels down by Chief Engineer MacWilly's upper legs. I smile back at him. Focus on the patient, window doctor barks, and I break eye contact guiltily, looking down. He opens the first pouch and extracts three thin pieces of pure whitewood, delicate crimson veins barely visible on their lengths. From the second bag, he pulls out a cluster of rust-colored roots, tangled together and branching to fine tendrils at their tips, and from the third comes a small wax paper sachet, which he carefully opens, pouring a line of dark green powder into his canteen. Window Doctor swirls the canteen around and then caps it and hands it to me. When we finish, make her drink it. Slowly. I nod, and he picks up the cluster of roots. Beginning the procedure. He carefully teases out the auburn strands into a delicate webwork, then lays it on Chief Engineer MacWilly's side, tracing a section of her body from her hip all the way up to her armpit. He makes one final adjustment, then lifts his hands away quickly. The red filigree twitches, then parts of it break away from a single point, tumbling up over her stomach and pooling there, but he's already placing the three white heartwood sticks on her lower chest. Once again, he makes a slight adjustment, and then lifts his hands away. A small crack echoes from each stick, and several pieces shift out and away, one intersecting right where the pieces of root cluster spill out. Impossible. Knew it, he smiles grimly. Hold her still. This next part will hurt. I make sure I'm pinning Chief Mac Willie's shoulders to the ground without bruising her, glad of the enhanced strength box grants me. She's so big I don't think I could have done it otherwise. Across from me, Dirt does the same with her hips, and Window Doctor leans down, hands hovering in position. He takes a deep breath, then moves. He starts with the broken stick pieces that aren't touching the roots, deftly sliding them back against their larger holes with practiced motions. Beneath me, Chief Engineer MacWilly yells in sudden pain, trying to thrash upward, but dirt, and I hold her steady. As each fragmented piece touches the larger part, it fuses back into place, the tracery of veins giving off a tiny flash, and each time, she tries to buck us free. When all but the piece touching the roots is in place, Window Doctor starts nudging the scattered rootlets on Chief Engineer MacWilly's stomach back towards the main accumulation, lips clenched in concentration as he herds them along. Right before they're about to touch the spot where the last wood fragment lies, he uses one hand to slide the small chip back into the stick, and the other quickly shifts the gathered mass of tendril pieces back over the tangled cluster, draping them along existing lines like a second layer. He then pinches the damaged root portion back together, holding it for one heartbeat, then another, then suddenly lifts his hands away from Chief MacWilly's body. She gives one last anguished moan and goes limp, the heartwood sticks and bloodroot filigree flash as a unified whole, and then the entire construction crumbles into dust and blows away. That's impossible. That was clearly a non-causal event. 
but I didn't register anything. I ignore Box and gently lift Chief Engineer Macwilly's head, bringing the canteen to her lips. Her eyes roll weakly behind closed lids, but I manage to get her to drink the anti-infection mixture. When I lay her head back down, I notice Huckins is standing over us, looking down in a mixture of awe and suspicion. What was that? Is the chief going to be okay? The patient will be fine, Window Doctor declares, gathering his supplies back into his back. The operation was a success. Not easy, but not the most difficult I've seen. He wipes away some sweat clinging to his sandy blonde hair. Still wasn't easy, though. Another ten minutes and it might have been too late. I hand Mr. Doctor back his canteen and climb to my feet, facing Huckins. That was medicine, Huckins. That's why we take care of the trees. Don't they have medicine out there? He slowly shakes his head, mouth falling open. You're going to catch flies if you keep doing that, Huckins. Chapter 21 Descriptions and Demonstrations Why didn't you tell me about the trees, Sky? We're waiting for Chief Engineer MacWillie to regain her senses, Huckins fretting uselessly over her supine form, the clan leaders quietly discussing something among themselves, and Box is pestering me with questions. What is there to tell? They're trees. They've been here my whole life. Why didn't you tell me they had reality in them? Some of the clan leaders look oddly at me, perhaps concerned that I'm talking quietly to myself, but Broom must have explained some bits and pieces to them because they don't interrupt. I didn't know they had reality in them. I didn't sense anything when I broke them down for biomass. Well, then I don't know why you think I was supposed to know something was strange. I'm the ignorant barbarian, remember? Box ignores my jibe, moving on to another question. And how did he heal her with a non-causal expression? That's impossible. A blinking outline appears around Window Doctor, who's describing something to Broom and Great Grandpa with small hand gestures. You heal me all the time? I shoot back, confused. Yes, because I'm integrated with you. I access your infinities, not someone else's. Every time non-causal healing has been attempted on another party, it's ended. Poorly. What? Like the medicine didn't work very well? More like the test subject's internal organs turned into the nearest freshwater fish or their face got replaced by the color blue, or any one of countless other outcomes that most definitely did not cure them, and most definitely rendered them deceased. It's not supposed to work? Well, I shrug. It works for us. Oh look, Chief Engineer MacWillie's waking up. Huckins is helping the groggy woman into a sitting position, straining to lift her bulk, but determined to do it anyways. She rubs at her eyes, then pats at her side in increasing disbelief. What in the Never God's moist ass crack just happened? I feel better. Mr. Window Doctor fixed you back up, I say proudly. With medicine. Chief Engineer Mac Willie stretches her arms overhead experimentally and looks surprised when nothing hurts. She twists back and forth several times, then pushes herself to her feet, ignoring Huckins' clumsy attempts to help. I, and there's a sentence full of words that make no sense. What did you see, lad? She turns to Huckins. Hidden pocket surgeon after that mumbo jumbo with the plants put me under? Trauma patch? Nanodoc. Huckins swallows, tugging at the frayed collar of his strange black clothing. Air. Chief, it was the twigs and moss that fixed you up. ITHDHDH dash. He struggles to get the word out, but Chief Engineer Mac Willie waits patiently, and he finally does. Think it was non causal. The healing. Chief Engineer Mac Willie's patience evaporates like rain hitting a globe's skin. You're what? She bellows, frantically feeling at her body. That's a poor joke. Young Master Huckins. Sorry, Chief, Huckins says miserably. I didn't know what they was doing, and then it was over so quick. He brightens up slightly. For what it's worth, I think it worked. You're not a fish. Chief Engineer Mac Willie hyperventilates a few seconds longer, then with a visible effort forces herself to calm down. It's slightly disturbing in a way. I saw her banish the entity with nothing more than a three-quarter inch spanner, whatever that is, like it was something she'd done a hundred times before yet now she's worrying over some basic medicine. I'm trying to tell you, Sky, that wasn't normal. Window Doctor strides over, drawn by the commotion, the rest of the clan leaders joining him. He marches straight up to Chief Engineer MacWilly and stares into one eye, then the other, then prods at her side. Stunned, she lets him, and he nods in satisfaction. HMHMHMIM, yes, a full recovery. Very good. He turns his head. Water, give them some snacks. These two are visibly malnourished. Water Breeder steps up, reaching into his purse and pulling out some of the dense shimmer fruit and dark fern balls that the little ones adore. The fist-sized spheres are chewy without being overly sticky, 
and the chopped pieces of shimmer fruit explode with flavor inside the nutty dark fern dough. You're drooling, Sky. Water Breeder passes two of the treats to Chief Engineer Mac Willie, and then another two to Huckins. They both gobble them down with noises of obvious delight. I reach out expectantly, but Water Breeder smacks my hand away with a gentle smile. Always trying to ruin your meal. You can have one after you tell us what's going on, Sky. I sigh, stomach still grumbling from my lack of breakfast this morning, but it looks like everyone's here and there's no immediate emergencies that need addressing. I clear my throat. Okay, so, uh, after I left Dirt and Torch, I look over at the two idiots, alternating between watching us and keeping an eye on the surrounding forest. You told them what happened, right? With the fight in the hollow and the cave. Dirt nods, and I continue. Well, a lot of other stuff happened. I relate the tale of my run across the foothills, my ambush of the corporate marauder patrol, exploring the first mountain and finding nothing, watching the hellhound orbital shuttle come down from the sky, fighting our way up to the base on Fishhook. The battle between the entity and the cruiser, and then Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins using the engines to drive the entity away. And then we woke up this morning, and I brought them back here because they didn't have anywhere else to go, I finish, coughing slightly. It was a busy day. Can I get some water, please? Dirt steps up and wordlessly hands his canteen to me. I take a big gulp as the clan leaders stare at me expressionlessly, Broom still busy writing in her stained journal. That was a lot of talking, and it's only after recounting it all do I realize just how much happened yesterday. A busy day is perhaps slightly understating it, Sky. I hand the canteen back to Dirt, then grimace. Oh, and I lost one of your cloaks, Dirt. Sorry. His eyes crinkle upward as he tucks the canteen beneath his current cloak. I consider it a small price to pay to have you back, Sky idiot, he says quietly, then laughs. As well as being able to play some part in one of the greatest idiot stories I've seen since Book herself. Punching a hole in the universe, twice. He walks away chortling to himself, leaving me to face the gathered clan leaders. Broom jots one final note, then snaps her journal shut. The sound seems to break the other clan leaders out of whatever stillness they were locked in, and Butterfly Builder shakes his head in disbelief, stocky arms folded across his broad chest. That is, a lot to take in, Sky. Broom and Axe filled us in on the way here about what Dirt and Torch reported, and obviously we all saw the lights last night. But, it is difficult. Without proof? you understand? Not to mention these outsiders you claim are but two among countless many. He spreads his arms almost helplessly, as if he wants to believe me but can't quite get himself there. Next to him, several of the other clan leaders nod. I can show you my limbs, if that'll help, I say slowly, understanding their reticence but still feeling wounded by it. Great Grandpa Axe taught me the village has always had to adjust to survive, but some take longer to adjust than others, preferring the comfort of what they think will always be rather than what currently is. Any proof would be welcomed, Moss Water replies in a sober voice, her thin hands worrying aimlessly at the corner of her book. I agree, Stove Mind chimes in, adjusting her spectacles once again. I take a breath, preparing to manifest my limbs, when a chorus of shouts causes me to halt. Wait, Dirt, Torch, Broom, and Great Grandpa Axe are all holding their palms out, signs of consternation on their faces. At least give us time to turn around first, Sky, Broom reproaches me, wheeling Great Grandpa around through a half circle, the old man clutching his blankets tightly around his shoulders. Dirt has already vanished somewhere, and Torch is busy hiding behind a tree trunk, though I notice her peeking out from behind it. I wonder if Dirt told her about the fight in the hollow, and she doesn't really believe him. The other clan leaders look around in bewilderment. Broom, Dark Fern Baker starts hesitantly, What are you doing? Don't mind me, Broom says cheerily her back to me and hands over her face. Already touched that stove. You can show them any time you're ready, Sky, she calls out, and I manifest my limbs. Several seconds later, after the shrieking and vomiting begins, Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins walk up beside me. Chief, what's happening? Huckins asks, confused. Chief Engineer Mac Willie ignores him. None of them have integrators, do they? She asks me quietly. No. My voice is just as soft as hers. I still don't even know what an integrator looks like. What I remember from meeting Box for the first time is, jumbled. Hazy. There was a lot going on. I remember the combat marauders cutting down wires, taking me to pieces as I tried to flee, panic racing through my veins. The frozen pain of missing limbs, the sick disorientation of half my face flying off. The slow lassitude of death. It wasn't a good time. I, 
that I can believe. She turns to look at me square on. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry. I know me and the lad were in the engines, but we were still a part of it. Your people would have had every right to let me die. Huckins looks like he wants to protest, but she shushes him, still holding my gaze. There's a part of me that wants to snarl at her, leap and rend and tear with my limbs, but I'm getting used to ignoring it. That's not who I want to be, and while I'm not sure that part will ever go away, I don't have to let it define me, so I simply shake my head instead. Killing you won't bring wires back. It would just make the world a little bit emptier, and I don't think you would have liked that. Besides, I'm sure you lost friends too. Her eyebrows raise. And aren't you wise beyond your years for a 15-year-old scrap of a thing? I'm 17 and a half, I retort, heat suffusing my face. It's not my fault I'm small for my age. Great-grandpa says I'll get my growth spurt any day now. She chuckles. I sure you will. As far as friends, well, I can't say that's a thing I've ever considered. Huckin splutters, and she tousles his hair with a broad, scarred hand. Aside from the lad here, of course. Why not? Do you know what involuntarily volunteered means? My forehead pinches as I try to untangle the contradictory set of words. That doesn't make sense. They're opposite things. I, but out in the galaxy, it means if your corpo thinks you can serve them better elsewhere, that's where you'll be, no matter if you like it or not. And they'll act like it was your decision all along. I think we have something like that. I explain to her how each generation has to have at least one idiot, and she nods. I think that's close, but it sounds like your village doesn't force an idiot. She smiles for some reason, to do whatever it is an idiot does. You just identify the most likely one, then let them do what they will. I scoff. Well, no, of course we don't force people to do jobs they don't want to do. What would be the point of that? Every idiot finds their melty rock, but not all melty rocks are the same. Everyone knows that. We'd never learn anything new if all the idiots had to do the same thing. Chief Engineer Mac Willie stares pensively into the shadowy depths of the forest. It's different out there. I never wanted to be in the combat forces, and that's the truth. I've always loved tinkering with the engines, ever since I was a babe, but I wanted to see other places too. Visit foreign people without having to walk across a carpet of bodies afterwards. She rubs her chin, focus returning to me. You think you should maybe put those away at some point? I look around at the cluster of moaning clan leaders writhing aimlessly across the ground, clutching at their heads. There's vomit everywhere, and I think Butterfly Builder wet himself. I sniff the air. He definitely wet himself. I hastily make my limbs disappear, and in the distance I can hear dirt cackling with laughter as he relentlessly mocks Torch. Whoops. Uh, they'll be okay, right? Most likely, Chief Engineer MacWilly agrees genially that you might get a punch or two to the stomach once they're feeling better. Oh, we don't solve our problems with physical violence, I reply in a shocked tone. That's a very unhealthy thing to do. We talk them over and work towards a common resolution. Otherwise, the village would be a terrible place to live. You could have fooled me from last night. Sky whatever you are, she roars with laughter, setting the leaves to shaking overhead, and I blush. That was different, I mutter, trying not to shrink away from her uproarious mirth. I, if you say so, Chief Engineer MacWilly grins, wiping tears from her eyes, if you say so. Bloody hell, but does it feel good to be able to laugh properly? She settles down. As to our original topic, no, Sky. I'm not grieving any friends lost in the fighting. If the lad hadn't made it, I might be shedding a tear or two. She grabs him in a rough headlock. But we wasn't on that ship because we wanted to be. She tousles Huckin's hair again. Isn't that right, young master? Disorderly misconduct on account of putting the boot in on the sector administrator, Huckins? Huckins wriggles furiously but can't escape her implacable biceps and eventually sags in defeat. Had it coming, he grumbles. Nobody talks about our nan that way. I, lad. And I'll wager any amount of bump snurfles you care to name he did it because they knew you was good with the engines and wanted an excuse to snatch you up. It's what the corpos do. Really? She pats his head, then lets him free. I, we're just meat for the machine. She surveys the gaggle of disheveled figures slowly putting themselves back together. So, now what, Sky? I think hard. Well, the clan leaders will probably have some questions for you too, I pause, after they clean themselves up. But now that the village is safe, we should be able to help you find your way back to where you want to go. Chief Engineer MacWilly puts her hands on her hips, chewing on her lower lip. Her expression is intense, as if she's contemplating some massive internal calculus. She opens her mouth, closes it, opens it again, then frowns. It looks like she's debating with herself, 
only I have no idea what about. Finally, she speaks. I, fuck me, but it has to be said. Your village isn't safe, Sky. It might never be again. I try to process the statement, but I can't. We defeated the entity. There aren't any more corporate marauders. Why wouldn't the village be safe? I'm about to ask that very question when Water Breeder comes stumbling up, flecks of sour vomit staining the front of his carefully embroidered tunic. Sky idiot, I am not giving you a treat anymore. That was a horrible experience, and I did not enjoy it. I'm not speaking to you for a week. I thought you didn't use violence to solve your problems. Chief Engineer Mac Willie whispers to me as the willowy man staggers unsteadily away, frazzled ends of loose hair flying free from his twig-covered plates. Physical violence, I whisper back. Emotional violence happens here all the time. We're only human. Mac Willie's laughter rattles the leaves once again. Chapter 22 Threats and Throngs after the clan leaders take a 10-minute break to compose themselves and Butterfly Builder cleans off his pants in a nearby stream, we gather once again under the forest canopy. Broom is the first to speak. So, are we all in agreement that Sky is almost certainly telling the actual truth about the events of the past 24 hours and not just something fervently believed? A chorus of hasty assents fills the air, Butterfly still fidgeting with his trousers. Broom smiles. Good. She looks at Chief Engineer MacWilly, her smile vanishing between one breath and the next. Now, outsider Chief Engineer MacWilly, I would like you to explain what you meant about our village isn't safe. Chief Engineer MacWilly sighs, then points at Window Doctor. It's him, and your trees. The way she says trees makes me think she thinks there's something else, but she's already continuing. And probably some other weird shit this place does that me and the lad haven't stumbled across yet. What you did, the way you healed me. She draws in a breath. There are corpos out there that would glass this entire planet to keep or kill that kind of knowledge. Bloody hell, they'd singularity bomb the entire system, even if it is the birthplace of us all. She drags a hand across her face, trying to compose herself. When she looks back up, her eyes are hard. And they're gonna come looking, now that the old man's ship is dangling from a mountaintop for all to see. A Wutan Whalen infiltration deep in Voy homespace coupled with an entity incursion isn't going to go overlooked especially when everyone's already searching for the prototype. She points at me, and I try not to flinch. We beat the cruiser dash. I begin in a determined tone, but Chief Engineer Mac Willie cuts me off. I, so you did, putting aside the sustainability of your methods for the moment. That was one ship. Wutan Whalen has a thousand more just like it. The Voy March has double that. Hypertron has battle moons. If they get even a sniff of what this forest can do, let alone that this is your home, there won't be aught left of this place but smoke and cinders and survivors and chains, and that's the best case. The corpos will tear each other apart over what's here. But it's just medicine, I say angrily, trying not to get upset with Chief Engineer Mac W. Illy. She's not a bad person. Why do these corpos care so much? Because non-causal healing is something they've been searching for for a very long time, Sky, she replies evenly. She turns to Window Doctor. You the healer. He looks at her questioningly. What you did to me, that, as above so below, who do shit? Could you use it to reverse the effects of cell aging? Make someone young again. Window doctor sucks in air like Chief Engineer Mac Willie just punched him in the stomach. You were talking about proscribed knowledge that would shame any doctor who dash. She slices a hand through the air, cutting him off. I'm not asking if you would, I'm asking if you could. Her eyes harden, and an air of menace fills her voice. A crew of the hardest evilest void bastards you'd never wish to lay eyes on, holding your entire village and those trees to the torch, skull-fucking the eye sockets of the screaming children. Could you do it? I growl at Mac Willie's sudden hostility, but Window Doctor seems to wilt, looking at the other clan leaders, then down at the ground. When he speaks, his voice is filled with sadness, and he seems to age twenty years before my eyes. I could, even though it would lead to nothing but pain. It was tried before. Once. The village almost perished. It took us hundreds of years to recover. No one is meant to live forever. And that's what I'm speaking of. Chief Engineer Mac Willie's voice returns to its previous gentle cadence. Right now, no one knows you're here but me and the lad. Assuming this is Earth, and I haven't got much left to challenge that assumption based on your lack of integrators, it's what's protected you all this time. The reality left over from the first entity means no one wants to explore the planet until it's reclaimed and the Voy March ain't finishing that job any time in our lifetimes. She snaps her fingers. Unfortunately, the old man decided to make this personal, 
which means now a whole lot of folks have a whole lot of reasons to look here, despite the risk, and if they learn you have non-causal healing, they will raise you to the bedrock and take it. Why are you telling us this, Outsider Chief Engineer Mac Willie? Great Grandpa Axe's voice is soft, but a dangerous light glitters in his eyes as he looks from her to Huckins. Aren't you risking both your lives? Chief Engineer Mac Willie bears her teeth. Aye, you could kill me and the lad, at a price, but that wouldn't stop the looking. All the corpos want what's inside, Sky, she points at me, and even were you to stake that body out on some hilltop somewhere, there's still the matter of the old man's ship on that mountain. The Voy March is going to want to know if there are any Wutan Whalen infiltrators running around, which means they'll be taking an electron tunneling microscope to the entire surrounding area real soon, which means they find the people living in this forest eventually. A planet's a big space, but it's not so big you can hide forever. She pauses, looking around at the upset clan leaders. I'm telling you this because you dragged me back from the Reaper's scythe, and a blood debt isn't something a Mac Willy forgets. Villages can move, Needle Crafter proclaims defiantly, but her voice is uncertain, and Chief Engineer Mac Willy seizes on it. Aye, but can you move quickly? We don't know when the Voy March will start looking, but by my guess it'll be in the next week or two. Maybe sooner. You sound as if you're tying your fate to our own, Stove Mind says into the silence, adjusting her glasses atop her button nose, expression narrowed. Chief Engineer Mac Willie grins mirthlessly. That I am for now, lass, me, and the lad both. She looks at Huckins for confirmation, and he replies with a firm nod. Neither of us are prepared to make a run from the hounds, let alone a run on Earth. But Dash, she smiles, perfect teeth gleaming. I figure we have considerations we can offer each other. And what would these considerations be? Broom asks, stepping in front of the other clan leaders, hands threateningly empty. What can you offer us that we don't already have? What reason do we have to upend our entire way of life by admitting you to the village? Sky is one of us, but we don't know you two at all. I see Dirt and Torch taking positions to complete the killing triangle in my peripheral vision and try not to let my nervousness show. This was supposed to be a simple meeting before we returned to the village for lunch. If Chief Engineer Mac Willie notices the encirclement, she doesn't let it show. Why, the expertise of two of the finest space dogs the galactic diaspora has ever had the pleasure of conscripting, of course. Mac Willie smiles even wider, acting like we're all friends relaxing on top of Watcher's Hill as the stars dance overhead. And if that doesn't wet your whistle, well, me and the lad here are no strangers to hard work for little pay. Story of our lives so far, and may the never god strike me dead if I'm not speaking truth. I've no love for Wutan Whalen, nor any of the other corpos. All my name is a Mac Willie. Tension sings through the air, distrust hanging like a noxious mist, so alien to everything I'm used to, and it's suddenly more than I can bear. I step into the middle of the confrontation. Why are we doing this? I ask the clan leaders bluntly, focusing my attention on Broom. I told you that Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins saved the village. If they're telling us we're not safe, why aren't we listening? Why aren't we bringing them back for food and shelter? planning what steps we need to take next to protect us all. The words of a child, Butterfly Builder scoffs, and I whirl towards him, amazed at my own audacity. It's incredible how confronting my own mortality so recently has opened my eyes to what's important and what's not. Being a clan leader means nothing if he can't think. Do you want to clean your pants a second time, Butterfly? I said we can trust them. His face reddens, unintelligible epithets struggling to make their way past his lips. Broom shifts imperceptibly, and I scythe out a limb behind my back, low and fast, knowing that Dirt is taking advantage of the distraction to creep up on us. Sure enough, my limb makes contact, and he tumbles to the floor, laughing the whole way down, and Torch freezes on the opposite side. The assembled leaders of the village flinch from the brief flash of bone-white segments, butterfly most of all. The air falls still, quiet except for Dirt's odd mirth. I told you, broom, Dirt giggles, making no move to rise from the ground. This is our book. I will not fight. There is nothing to learn there but death. He makes a negating gesture at Torch, still tensed with her hands tucked behind her back. Relax, Torchy. This will not come to blood. Besides, you cannot win. Torch glares at him, but slowly settles into a crouch, poking at the ground with a knife. In front of me, Broom glowers, then suddenly relaxes into a more casual posture. You truly trust them, Sky? She asks me conversationally. These outsiders? You would protect them, leaving your back unguarded. It takes me a second to process the mental whiplash. Your idiots could give the elite combat units of the galaxy a serious challenge. That is some scary mental flexibility. 
This was a test? I snarl at Broom, focusing everything I have on not manifesting my limbs again. Melty rocks are everywhere, Sky. She smiles at me with genuine emotion even as she lets her hands fall away from empty spaces my vision is screaming red threat zones at. That's what it means to be part of our clan. Life is a test until you find when you fail. If you say that the outsiders won't harm the village, then I believe you. You've earned that. She raises her voice. The idiots allow them entry. Memoriam allows them entry, Great Grandpa acts says quietly. The other clan leaders look at each other, weighing glances passing back and forth. Finally, Stove Mind steps forward. Mind allows them entry. I haven't detected any behaviors of falsehood in their account. I wince. I forgot to warn Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Hawkins never to lie to Stove, or any of the other minds, or anyone at all, really. Little ones learn that lesson very early. The only path to a healthy mind is being honest, both with yourself and others, and the Mind Clan takes their responsibility seriously. It's impossible to lie to them. Crafter allows them entry, Needle says next. Find the strange black clothes avariciously. Breeder allows them entry. More jeans will be welcome. I'm still not speaking to Sky for a week, though. One by one, the remaining clan leaders indicate their agreement, until it's only Butterfly Builder left. He scowls unhappily, running a hand through his short brown hair, then lets out a long sigh. Builder allows them entry. I trust the rest of you. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding and look at Broom. So it's fine? They can come to the village? Yes, but there is something more important we must discuss first. Dirt is right. You have the potential to equal book and might even surpass her. We are entering perilous times. Someone must lead the village through them. Great Grandpa Axe nods next to her, his face sad. My knees go weak when I realize what she's suggesting. But, that's your jobs. I'm reeling. To be compared to Book Idiot, the original savior of the village when the stars returned? Lead everyone to safety? I'm not qualified to lead anyone at all. You are the only one qualified. Broom disagrees firmly. The things you have described... What outsider chief engineer Mac Willie tells us about these greater dangers, we cannot even look upon them without falling. Chief engineer Mac Willie steps up beside me. I, with no integrators to protect you, a single non-causal squad could take this entire place. Three squads, Dirt interrupts politely from his prone position. He's bundled up his cloak as a pillow, hands interlaced behind his head as he relaxes. Idiots are used to strange things. Chief engineer Mac Willie looks over at him, then barks out a quick laugh. I, three squads then. They'd likely bring more. MMM, probably. Smart of them. I glance at the other clan leaders, hoping someone will call Broom out on her nonsense, but they're all nodding in agreement, even Butterfly. I give Great Grandpa a beseeching look. Great Grandpa, I'm not prepared for this. It's too much responsibility. He beckons me to come closer, and takes my hand in both of his own as I kneel next to his chair. None of us are prepared, Sky. This new world that has appeared, it is not one the rest of the village can step out into. Not yet. Like Book, it falls on your shoulders to find a way for us to reach that point. His eyes grow misty. I wish it were anyone else. This is unfair to ask of you. Yet ask it we must. He pats my hand. Just know, Sky, that we will always be here to support you, help guide you. We need you to lead us there, but you won't have to do it alone. I gulp, a terrible ache in my stomach and throat. I just wanted to be a memoriam. Study the past. Stare at the sky and wonder what glorious, unimaginable things were out there. Live a peaceful life in the village until my time came to rest beneath a tree. Okay. I'll do my best, great grandpa. He pats my hand one more time, raising me to my feet. That's all we can ask, my darling sky. My stomach grumbles embarrassingly loud, and I blush. Behind me, Chief Engineer Mac Willies and Huckins do the same. Broom claps her hands. And on that note, we should head back to the village for some food. She wheels Great Grandpa's chair around and we set off under the trees as a group, the clan leaders chatting quietly among themselves about what not being the last humans left alive means for us and the village. Peppering Chief Engineer Mac Willie with questions about what things are like out in the galaxy and how integrators work, Dirt and Torch escorting us with their customary alertness. Huckins falls into pace beside me, a curious expression on his face. So, your village, what's it like, then? I spend the next half an hour telling him about the tree houses, our residential buildings spiraling up around the towering bowls of our oldest forest giants, the long sheds of the builders, where fire and metal meet in pounding clangs. The airy airies of the crafters, perched up in the lower boughs nearby, easily accessible through cleverly counterweighted lifts, the shrines of the saints, beautiful in their carved facades, 
prosaically functional in their purpose, the winding heights of the memory shrine and the idiot archive, repositories of centuries of knowledge, the delicious smells of the bakeries in their attached dark fern farms, the rushing flow of book's lament, the broad river cutting through the northern third of the village, separating the tanneries and curing sheds from everyone else, the solid length of book's triumph that bridges the river, a hollowed tree trunk that spans both banks and still grows tall overhead, the crab roach pins, half submerged, half fenced in, by the semicircle of silk harvesting stations along that part of the riverbank, the central square, where everyone meets for communal events and celebration days, the winding path that leads up to Watcher's Hill, where the beginning clouds lifted and we saw the stars again for the first time, and so much more. He interrupts occasionally to question what an unfamiliar word means, but other than that he's content to take it in with wide eyes and eager ears. I could chief engineer Mac Willie veering closer at times to listen in too, though she's usually dragged away by another query from the clan leaders asking her to explain yet another marvel of the outside world. Part of me wants to pay attention to that conversation instead, but Huckins is so enthralled by my descriptions that I'm easily able to brush it aside. There will be plenty of time for me and Chief Engineer Mac Willie to exchange stories later. Eventually, we reach the first signs of civilization, a pair of muscular women covered in dirt stacking large cubes of dark clay on a handcart. They're outside the small shack that indicates entrance to the undermine, our only supply of ores and metal, and they raise a hand in greeting as we draw near Onyx and Alabaster Miner, life partners for as long as I can remember. I raise my hand to return the greeting, and then Onyx drops her half of the current load they're hoisting, nearly smashing Alabaster's toes. She walks over to us as if in a daze, her eyes fixed on Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins, ignoring Alabaster's curses as she trails behind. Butterfly, Onyx calls out as she draws closer, feet stumbling slightly as if she's had too much shimmerfruit ale. Who are they? Alabaster's curses fall silent as she notices the same thing as her partner, Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins clearly different in their tattered strange black clothing. Butterfly Builder clears his throat importantly. We are Dash. We're not alone. Onyx and Alabaster both scream, jumping up and down like teenagers instead of the middle-aged creeping towards gray-haired women they are. They dance a circle around each other and then barrel ahead of us towards the village proper in a full-bore sprint, yelling with glee as they run, arms waving wildly. I snort, then let loose with a full-throated cackle of laughter, caught up in their enthusiasm. Around me, the clan leaders start doing the same, all of us acting like little ones, even Butterfly. A surge of enthusiasm rushes through the group, and we start chasing them. Great Grandpa Axe's wheeled chair bouncing up and down along the path as Broom pushes him, but he doesn't even care, his wrinkled face alight with glee, blankets flapping behind like wings. More villagers start appearing, pouring out of the trees towards us, alerted by Onyx and Alabaster, and we're soon surrounded by gaping faces shining with elation. Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins the center of a whirlpool of attention. Still we careen onwards, gathering more people by the second, bubbling cheers growing by the second into roars of jubilation. In all the terror of the last day and a half, I haven't really processed how much our world has changed. How happy it makes me feel to see Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins bewildered expressions. Faces I've never seen before. We're not alone. Chapter 23 Feasts and Fabrications the central square is buzzing with excited chatter, seemingly everyone in the entire village gathered around me and the two engineers. People constantly reach out to lightly touch Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins, as if they can't quite believe they're real until their fingers make physical contact, but the two of them take the attention with bemused grace. Dirt, Torch, and the clan leaders have given up on trying to keep things orderly until the initial jubilation fades and are now just reminding people not to trample any of the little ones running around underfoot. Sky. Sky. Two familiar figures calling my name make their way through the crowd, one a girl with shoulder-length wavy black hair, the other a sandy blonde boy swinging his crutches overhead like extra long arms as he hops on one leg, his other in a cast. Both my own age and sorely missed. Rifle. Door. We meet in a crushing embrace, just another knot of celebration in the giddy sea filling the central square. Prickles of wetness sting my eyes, my happiness at seeing my best friends again almost overwhelming. I didn't have time to think of them in the chaos of the last day and a half, but now I'm acutely aware I might have never seen them again. We hold the contact for another few seconds, then rifle and door back up and start bombarding me with questions. Sky, is it true you brought back the outsiders? One of the little ones said you fought a hundred glow beasts. Did you? Did you? 
The idiots claimed you last night, before the weird lights appeared. Was that the reason why? Where are the outsiders from? What are their names? Are there more? I laugh, putting my hands up to try and stem the flow of overlapping queries. Rifle and Door look at each other, then start laughing too, realizing they haven't given me a chance to say anything even if I wanted to. It's so good to see you two again, I say, my cheeks starting to hurt from how hard I'm smiling. I really missed you. We missed you too, Sky, Rifle replies, Dur nodding next to her. When we heard that Wires was killed, and then you went running off yesterday morning with Torch, we were worried. Scared shitless, Dor adds matter-of-factly, bracing his weight on his crutches, especially after Dirt and Torch came back without you. No one knew what was going on, and all Broom would say was that the idiots were taking care of a problem. I'm sorry I made you both worry, I apologize, a pang of grief passing through my heart as I think of wires, but it doesn't last against the atmosphere of joy pressing in on all sides. What happened out there? It was unbelievable. Before I can start telling them about my trials, a loud voice booms above the hubbub. Hey, settle down. Butterfly Builder has climbed on top of one of the many benches scattered around the square and is waving his arms for attention. Slowly, the loud commotion dies away into scattered murmurs. You're all excited, and I am as well, but these people need to eat. Darkfern Baker climbs up next to him. Bakers, listen up. We need to set up a working lunch in the square. I want everything prepped and ready to serve in ten minutes. Yes, chef. A chorus of voices grumbles as he steps down, rifles among them. I have to go help my father, Sky, she says quickly, but we're definitely talking later. I wave as she scampers off, and Butterfly's voice booms out once more. Builders, let's get those tables up and in place. Chairs as well. He steps down and leads a cluster of people towards one of the broad warehouses bordering the square the one where all the celebration furniture is kept. Another figure replaces him on the bench, broom. Everyone else, lunch will be outdoors today, so you can see the outsiders, but we need essential workers to return to your tasks. There's some mutterings, but she overrides them with a steady voice. Yes, I know it's exciting to learn we're not alone, but the village must endure. Your clan leaders will answer any questions you have after we let our guests eat. She steps down and the crowd begins to disperse. The jovial mood faded somewhat but not gone entirely. Crap, Sky, I have to go, Dor swears suddenly, his eyes darting around in panic. I'm supposed to be in charge of the filtration pumps today. Oh, Moss is gonna kill me. He swings off on his crutches, almost jumping in his haste, and I can't help but laugh. I'll find you two later, I call out, and he lifts a crutch in response but doesn't turn in his awkward hopping run. Still smiling. I walk over to where Chief Engineer Mac Willie and Huckins are standing, engaged in a low conversation with each other. They look up as I approach. I, but that was one of the strangest things I've ever been a part of. Chief Engineer Mac Willie grins at me, and I've been chest deep in a malfunctioning engine trying to pull six different infinities at once. Seems like your people are a wee bit excitable, S guy. It's not every day you learn you're not the last humans left alive in the world, I reply, and she chuckles. I suppose that's true enough. The builders start emerging from the warehouse with wooden chairs and the long metal tables we use for celebration days, setting them up in a pair of rows with ten chairs to each table, along with a small grouping of tables off to the side for the food. I motion the engineers over to one on the end and we sink into our seats with grateful sighs, dappled patches of sunlight floating back and forth on the polished metal surface. Chief Engineer Mac Willie leans back, letting her arms fall to her sides, staring up at the crimson leafy canopy overhead while Huckins folds his own arms atop the table and rests his head on them, eyes battling not to close. I'm telling you, chief, he yawns, I could sleep for another day. Maybe two. Let's get some food in us first, lad, Chief Engineer Mac Willie replies, stifling a yawn of her own. She tilts her head over to look at me. Though I suppose we should let young Sky here eat before us, seeing as how we took most of the breakfast. I shrug. It's fine. You're still probably hungrier than I am if you went without food for three days. I prop my elbow on the table and rest my chin on the palm of my hand, making conversation while we wait. What was it like, Chief Engineer MacWilly? I still don't understand some of this non-causal stuff. Did everything happen really slow? Call me MacWilly, and it was pretty normal for Dash. It was terrible. Huckins and MacWilly talk at the same time, and she laughs at him, slapping her massive hand on his shoulder. I, lad, it's always terrible. That's normal. As far as our time not matching yours, young Sky? She shrugs. 
didn't feel any different than a normal three-day stretch in the engine room under heavy load with everything to do and no time to eat. The old man expected us to make Chardonnay out of shit water, and so we did. You've done that before, Chief? Huckins' voice is odd. Behind him, the bakers start emerging with various platters of food they carry over to the clump of serving tables, setting them up for easy access. I consider walking over to fill a plate, but Mac Willie is still talking, and I don't want to interrupt, and Rifle's father gets irritated if people take food early. Well, not the overloading of the engines at the end, but that's not the first entity I've run up against, lad. Mac Willie clucks her tongue. Usually it's with a few more ships available to put them back in their place, though. If you want to be a space dog, you learn how to dance reality's jig right quick. What's a space dog? I ask. A space dog, young Sky, is one of those benighted souls doomed to wander between the stars serving their master's ship for life and beyond. Too skilled at their job to let go, too valuable to kill offhand, too powerless to leave. The corpos love space dogs like me and the lad here, because we keep their ships moving when reality comes a-knocking. Most of us work with the engines, but I've known a few in navigation and gunnery over the years. I'm still not quite sure what Mac Willie is talking about. They're people extremely in tune with their integrators, Sky. My creator used several for research purposes when initially designing me. It represented an extraordinary investment of assets, as they're quite rare, and almost always assigned to combat support roles. Here, Sky. Rifle thumps a large platter on our table before I can reply to box, its surface covered with an array of food. There's fresh-baked dark fern biscuits, sliced wedges of golden shimmer fruit, thick globe steaks covered in a spicy red sauce, steamed broccoli, and a wobbly crab roach milk pudding. Three square plates with knives and forks accompany it, along with two pitchers, one of chilled milk, one of water, and three cups. She winks at me. Father said to make sure you three got fed first and to ignore the waiting line. Something about how those two haven't eaten in a few days. I thank her for the consideration, and she heads back to help the other villagers waiting patiently by the serving table. Mac Willie and Huckins regard the food dubiously as I pass out the tableware. This is safe to eat? Huckins prods at a globeast steak cautiously with his fork. What is it? That's roast globeast with chili sauce, I reply, busy loading food onto my own plate. And of course it's safe to eat. The bakers make sure to only use the non-melty parts. Besides, Everything we harvest goes through the shrine of St. Kiri first, even though we haven't had a bad batch for hundreds of years. Better safe than sorry. I cut a large chunk off my globe steak and pop it into my mouth. The savory juices pair perfectly with the spicy sauce, and I almost moan in pleasure. I was really hungry. Huckins tentatively bites off the crown of a broccoli, and his eyes light up. He shoves the rest of it into his mouth. MMMM. That SH good. What sheddings do you wish on your printer? I sip my milk enjoying the nutty smoothness, then add a shimmer fruit slice to my next globeast piece. It's one of my favorite combinations, the juicy tang of the shimmer fruit adding another layer of complexity to the spiced meat. Huckins continues cramming food in, barely taking time to chew. In fairness, if I hadn't eaten in three days and someone gave me roast globeast, I'd probably be doing the same. What's a printer? Chief Engineer Mac Willie pauses mid-chew, eyes widening, then forces herself to swallow, sweat beating on her forehead. Sky, where does this food come from? Huh. I take another sip of milk. Well, the bakers grow the dark fern in our underground farms, but you can't see those from here because obviously they're underground. The shimmer fruits come from young prickle bushes. We keep a grove over by the crab roaches to help keep them pinned in. Crab roaches hate prickle bushes. We have to hunt for the globeasts, and that's the idiot's job since they're very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. You can only hunt them during the day. If you ever see a globeast glowing at night, and you're not wearing a protective suit, it's already too late. Your insides turn all runny over the next couple days and then you die, but they stay away from the forest so we're safe in here. Oh, and we milk the crab roaches too. Mac Willie and Huckins are staring at me, wide-eyed, a forkful of food held halfway to each of their lips. Huckins' plate is empty except for a few dribbles of sauce. I frown, patting at my face. Did I make a mess? I probably made a mess. That sauce gets everywhere. This. Huckins points at his last forkful with a shaking finger, came from the ground? Where else would broccoli come from? He drops his fork with a clatter, clapping his hand over his mouth like he's going to be sick. Mac Willie leans over and whispers something in his ear, then sets her own fork gently down and turns to me. Ah, uh, Sky, and now that I'm thinking on it I'm a right idiot for not considering this earlier. 
but eating things from the ground isn't something that normally happens in the galactic diaspora. What? Well then how do you eat? I say around another mouthful of shimmer fruit and glow beast. I'm saving my broccoli for last because I don't like it. We have food printers, Mac Willie raises her voice over Huck and strange herking noises that create nutrition bars from recycled basic molecules. Using reality to terraform worlds does some strange things to the soil, and you have to be all kinds of desperate to eat something grown straight in it. Most people would rather starve. It's a better death. I consider her words around my final bite of glow beast and shimmer fruit, using one of the biscuits to mop up the last of the sauce. Ugh. No escaping the broccoli now. I'll have to power through. Is that why those corporate marauders called me and wires dirt eaters? Mac Willie winces as Huckins continues turning green in the face, cheeks bulging in and out. I, It's one of the nastiest insults you can throw at a person. Granted, those grunts probably didn't know you actually do eat food from the ground, seeing as how you look normal and all. I shovel my broccoli in and swallow as fast as possible, trying not to taste it. I can't wait for it to be cucumber season. Well, this is all we have. Guess you'll starve. Want another ration bar? Mandatory broccoli serving finished, I debate taking another globey steak or finishing with some crab roach milk pudding. I decide to go with the steak. A quarter of a ration bar doesn't count as an actual breakfast, and I did a lot of running. I'll still have room for the pudding. Mac Willie blinks at me, startled, then guffaws. Another ration bar. I but don't you sound just like a right space dog yourself. Huh, there's me told. It's a shame we don't have any bumpsnerfuls to add our fair share. She pulls Huckins upright and forces his hand around his fork, then takes her own and puts the bite of glow beast into her mouth. She chews it thoughtfully, then shakes her head, still smiling. Seeing as how your village isn't sprouting centipedes from your ears and there's a distinct lack of screaming, I'm thinking this dirt might just be safe enough. And it is a mighty fine steak you've served us. Chief, Huckins whines, and Mac Willie glares at him. Settle down and finish your meal young Master Huckins. You were enjoying it just fine before you knew what it was, and I don't see your head turning into a trout. A space dog needs to be flexible to deal with reality properly. She eyes his empty plate meaningfully and he blushes, then slowly raises the fork to his lips. It is pretty good, he mumbles through chewing noises. Can I have more? Of course. I finish my second steak and serve myself some of the pudding. Just make sure you save room for the crab roach milk pudding. The bakers put mint in it. It's really yummy. He eyes me dubiously, but adds some pudding to his second helping, dipping the tip of his fork in it to taste. His eyes light up. Well, I finish my own pudding and lean back in my chair, pleasantly full. Mac Willie is already plowing through a second helping of her own and Huckins is nearly licking the plate clean. He reaches for a third serving, but I shift the tray away from him. He looks at me with wounded eyes. Give your stomach a chance to rest, I advise him. If you haven't eaten in a while, you'll just throw it all up and that would be a waste of food. The bakers get very upset if someone wastes food. Sound advice, young Sky. Mac Willie finishes her cup of water, then leans back as well. Seeing that we're done, broom and stove mine slide into chairs opposite the three of us. They've been hovering nearby, keeping us from being interrupted by curious villagers. The meal was satisfactory? Broom asks pleasantly, and Mac Willie nods. Aye, you have our thanks. Just tell us what's needed to work off the debt and the lad and I will see it done. Broom and Stove exchange glances, then Stove leans forward, adjusting her spectacles. We have been discussing the matter, and we were hoping you would be able to offer advice. You have spoken of threats to the village, but we have no frame of reference for these things. I do not think Sky does, either. She looks at me and I shake my head. We need to know how to protect ourselves, and you and your boy are all we have to guide us. Mac Willie folds her thick arms across her chest, pondering Stowe's request. Next to her, Huckins' hand creeps across the table towards the small amount of leftovers. I manifest a limb beneath the table and smack him on the shin, and he jerks back guiltily. After a moment of thought, Mac Willie rises. I, there might be something the lad and I can do. I'll need to check something first, though, and it's to do with your trees. Broom and Stove exchange troubled looks, then stand as well. If it is necessary. Broom sighs. Very well. What do you need? On your feet, lad, Mac Willie grunts, hauling Huckins away from the food and marching towards the nearest tree, one of the older ones that rise sporadically in the village square. Far away enough from their neighbors to allow plenty of open space, but large enough that their canopies intertwine overhead. Huckins looks longingly back at the tray, but allows himself to be dragged along. Curious, I follow, 
joining broom and stove. Some of the other villagers trail in our wake, but stay well back, likely due to the presence of two idiots doing something unknown. Do you know what she's planning, Sky? Broom questions me quietly. Something calls for attention in my mind, something Macwilly did when we were waiting for the clan leaders to arrive. Clever. I think you're right, Sky, but I have no idea what she thinks she'll accomplish. I'm not a support integrator. I think she's interested in the reality in the trees, I say slowly, figuring out the thought as I go. She examined one when we first got to the forest outskirts. She implied they were similar to the engines she worked with on the ship, and she was able to use those to fight the entity. Reality? Engines? Entity? I shrug. It's tough to explain. Even with Box helping me, I still don't understand a lot of it. Reality is like our universe, but also all the other universes ever made. Only we can't normally interact with them, so it breaks our brains when we do? And all the outsiders use it to do weird stuff? I think. That's actually a fairly concise explanation. Little shaky on the second part, but otherwise well done. If you say so, you're our expert on the matter. Guess all we can do is watch for now. Broom's tone is wry, and we turn our attention back to Chief Engineer MacWilly and Huckins. She has the strange device with rods and dishes studded all over it in her hands, and Huckins is holding a flat pane of clear material that might be glass, no doubt fished from somewhere out of his bag. MacWilly also has a thin band of the same material that Huckins is holding wrapping around her eyes to her ears, almost like glasses. All right, lad, we'll start at 10% output. Huckins taps the thin rectangle he's holding and MacWilly nods, checking 10%. She touches the device to the tree trunk, then both her and Huckins wince and she yanks the device away. It doesn't make a piercing noise, unlike the previous time she used it, but judging by their expressions both engineers can hear something. I, closer than 50, but not close enough. Drop it to 4%. They repeat the routine again, and this time the reaction is much less severe. They look at each other thoughtfully. 3.5. Huckins asks. 3.3. MacWilly responds, and Huckins nods. This time they have slight smiles. 3.1. 3.15. Huckins breaks out into a large grin. That's it, chief. Not yet, young master Huckins. MacWilly's eyes are narrowed in intense focus. Try. 3.14. She repeats the test and Huckins gapes at the glass pane. How do you get it even sharper, Chief? MacWilly ignores him and cocks her head to the side, as if she's trying to pick up the faintest of sounds, then her own eyes widen. 3.141592. Chief, I can't get the calibration that dash. Do it, Huckins. Huckins screws up his brow in concentration carefully moving one finger across the glass. He pauses, then stabs it down, lower lip clenched between his teeth. Mac Willy touches the device to the tree once again, but this time she doesn't pull it away, and her gaze holds something akin to awe. Oh, you tricky little bugger. Now I have to know more about you. She brings the device over and around the tree trunk in a flowing motion, as if she's tracing a wandering path, step after careful step. After two circuits around the tree, she stops at a point close to head height for her. Almost six grumbles up. 2.1 meters, you savage. Mac Willy turns to Broom and Stove. Is there anything special about the tree right here? Broom jogs over to grab a chair, then brings it back and stands on it. I sharpen my eyesight to get a better look, but it appears the same as any other part of the tree, pale alabaster covered in minute striations that flow around each other like swirls in a river. Broom examines the patch of trunk, then leans her head in close and knocks on it gently with her knuckle. Her own eyes tighten, and she stifles a quick gasp. That's a heartwood seed. How did you know it was there? I don't know what you call it, Chief Engineer MacWilly says with a massive grin, but I call it an access port for the biggest reality engine I've seen in my life. A battle moon doesn't run engines this large, and she spins in a circle, letting the device fall to the ground and raising her hands to the surrounding forest, we're surrounded by them. Behind her, Huckins falls to his knees, staring up at the leaves, mouth hanging open. So, what does that mean, MacWilly? I ask, as someone well-versed in conversing with Box. Well, I certainly didn't deserve that. It means, young Sky, that this beautiful impossibility, she pats the tree trunk, can be used to power anything requiring a reality draw, and it'll do so more efficiently than anything I've had the pleasure of working on or knowing of. Its very frequency is irrational. Huckins, we're going to have so much fun. Your idea of fun is wading up to the hip and malfunctioning reality. Chief, chin up, young Master Huckins, and don't forget your one quarter. 
As someone well-versed in conversing with Box, I should have remembered that the second answer usually makes just as little sense as the first. Fine, maybe I deserve that. It's a tree, Mac Willie. I, young Sky, her eyes gleam madly as she turns to me, and it's an engine. A great big fuck-off engine even grander than any dream I had as a child. She turns back to Huckins. Lad, we need to figure out the interface protocols. She spins to broom and stove. Is there a tree we can test on? This heart would seed. Is it important? It is the heart of the tree, Broom says simply. We take a part of it to plant a new tree, but if we take too much, the tree dies. We are very careful not to take too much, and it regrows very slowly. Bloody hell. Mac Willie looks around. Is there a small one, when you don't mind potentially losing? Stove frowns. One of the small saplings on the outskirts might be acceptable. No more than two scrumbles high. She adjusts her spectacles again. However, I must first ask, what would these tests entail and why should we allow them? Mac Willie is almost dancing in place with excitement. If you want to make this village safe, me and the lad need to figure out how to properly tap into the reality inside your trees. And to do that, we need to run diagnostics. Could take us an hour, could take us a day. Might shut down the engine if we hit the wrong harmonics. Pretty sure a tree's engine shutting down means it dies, and I doubt it's a matter of a few solid thumps to get it back up and running. Yeah, but why do we need the reality, Mac Willie? I interject. What can we do with it? Well, for starters, build an infonet receiver if we can salvage the appropriate materials from the old man's ship. This is a good plan. It will help our combat potential immensely, Sky. My creator's ship should have the necessary components. There is much of value still inside. Box says the crash site outside the village would be easier. Even better. Mac Willie rubs her hands together. With an infonet receiver as powerful as these trees will allow, we'll be able to pull down nets from anywhere. That gives us eyes on the rest of the galaxy, and we'll have some notice on when the other corpos are going to show up. And how does knowing when our destroyers will arrive help us? Chief Engineer Mac Willie. Stove asks. It lets the lad and I, and young Sky here, she nods at me, know how long we have to work. See, once we have that receiver up and running, we're going to be scavenging the incognito field controllers from the old man's ship. They're located in the lower bow, and last I saw, that part of the ship still stuck to a mountain. I think back to the Hellhound orbital shuttle coming down, how difficult it was to initially comprehend it. If I hadn't spent my entire life looking up, I wouldn't have noticed the part of reality that didn't quite fit. You're going to make the village invisible? I, young Sky, Mac Willie Chortles, were going to crank up an incognito field so thick we could hide from the Never God herself. As long as no one physically walks into the forest, they won't sense a thing. Another thought hits me. Didn't you say you wouldn't go into those ruins without a full combat squad in front of you? Her enthusiasm dampens. Aye, that could be a problem. No telling what the entity left in there, but it probably isn't pleasant. There is likely a molecular forge somewhere in the lower wreckage of the cruiser. Most maintenance facilities are centrally located in that model of ship. If we can equip ourselves with modern weapons, we will more than fulfill the combat role required. Will the lower wreckage also have violations inside? I don't know. Young Master Dash. I'm talking to Box. Most likely. We can practice our sneaking again. Because that went so well last time. We'll ask Dirt for tips. Box says we can get a molecular forge from the lower wreckage, but we'll probably have to fight for it though. Mac Willie brightens back up. I that would go a long way towards evening the odds. More than even them once I get it configured for these trees. She looks around the village thoughtfully. Might even allow us to start bootstrapping up to an equivalent tech level. We've the power for it. Question is if we have the materials. And then we'll be safe? I can't help it. My own voice grows excited too. We build this incognito field and the village won't be in danger anymore? She laughs, picking up the device and tossing it to Huckins. One step at a time, Sky. Let's me and the lad figure out these trees first. Huckins sighs mournfully, putting their gear away in his bag. I'm never going to get to sleep again, am I? Chapter 24, Grief and Growth so where's the closest outskirt sapling? Mac Willie is all energy, bouncing on her feet as she chivvies Huckins into motion, lifting him up from his kneeling position, but the young man's feet are obviously dragging. How soon can we get there? One moment, Chief Engineer Mac Willie, Stove replies, broom standing beside her. We have not yet decided to give you permission to experiment with the trees. You are asking us to meddle with centuries of hard work, of life bought with death. We live as the trees live, and die as they die. Also, Broom adds, holding up a hand to forestall Mac Willie's objection, 
you need to rest. Your boy is about to pass out. Better to take time to recover now than waste it in the future because mistakes were made. Macwilly turns towards Huckins. He's swaying on his feet, eyelids drooping, hands held to the tool bag at his waist. I can do it, chief. His mouth stretches in a jaw-cracking yawn, and he almost falls over. You don't listen to them. Gonna be, space dog, rays, moonhounds. His knees buckle and he collapses on his butt. Just need, quick nap. All right, fine, maybe you've a point, Macwilly admits, the lad's not a true space dog yet. Find him a bed and I'll get the initial tests up and running. She unhooks the tool bag from Huckin's belt and hefts it over her shoulder, leaving him snoring on the ground. Now where's that tree? Aren't you tired, Chief Engineer Macwilly? Stove and Broom both have an eyebrow raised, and Broom continues. The way Sky explained it, you've been fighting for three days straight. I, Mac Willie bears her teeth, and that's why I'm the chief engineer. Or, was, rather, she amends her statement, but the title makes no difference. I've the levels the lad doesn't, and a half night of rest is more than I need to keep my own engine running. We don't have time for me to be lazing about. The Voy March is going to be mustering forces soon, and we need all the hours we can beg, borrow, or steal. Broom and Stove face me, and Stove speaks. Sky. Outsider Chief Engineer Mac Willie is telling the truth, or at least thinks she is, but it is not a truth I am equipped to judge properly. What do you think we should do? Is it worth potentially sacrificing a tree? I freeze. Why do the clan leaders keep asking me for advice? If Mac Willie can harness the power of your trees, Sky, it solves a great many problems for us. I told you your village needed to change to help support your growth. Tapping into the trees will keep your people safe and provide us many more options. I'd also like to try using the biomass I'm storing for Wires Memorial to cultivate a tree. If we can speed up their growth, losing one is no longer a significant a loss and will allow us to assume more risks in combat. That's right. I promised Wires I'd plant a forest for him. Box thinks we should let her try. Are you okay, Sky? Stove asks, noticing my reticence. She steps closer. Do you need to rest as well? I wipe my arm across my face. I'm fine. It's just, I'd like to plant a tree. For wires. Stove's concerned expression melts into understanding. Of course. Will you retrieve his body, then? Broom has not allowed any of us to leave the valley. I. There's no body. I sniff, suddenly racked by guilt. It. I'm sorry. There's nothing left. I didn't mean to. She hugs me close, not understanding my apologies. It's okay, Sky. His death wasn't your fault. We can spare a seed, even if it takes much longer to sprout. It will grow eventually. Stove pats my back again, and I step out of the embrace. Box, thinks we can make the trees grow faster. Without using a body. Stove and Broom's eyebrows shoot almost to their hairlines, but I keep going. I'd like to see if it's correct. I was thinking I could plant the seed for wires in the area Box ate earlier. Try and replace the canopy there. You think you can make the trees grow faster? Box ate some trees? Broom and Stove's questions crash into each other, and I hunch in on myself. What am I doing, asking for this? I'm being stupid. Wires deserves a full burial ceremony, but he'll never get one without a body. Sky. Broom and Stove each have a hand on my shoulders. It's okay. Broom continues. I'll go get a seed. You can remember Wires in the way that helps you best. She steps away, but Stove keeps her hand in place. Grief is something everyone processes differently, Sky, she says quietly. It can take days to fade. It can take years. Sometimes it never truly leaves. Just know that we are always here for you if you need help. Don't try to deal with it alone. Thanks, Stove Mind. I sniff. It's just, there were times yesterday when I didn't think of wires at all and then everything came rushing back. Am I a bad person for not remembering him all the time? The mind is complicated. Sky idiot. Stove smiles at me. A quick flash of upwards lips that turns her normally stern features into something completely different. Trust me. I should know. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed, Come talk to me or one of the other minds. That's our job, to remind you why you're not a bad person even if your brain is telling you otherwise. Okay, I will. I still can't believe how such an ancient and isolated social structure can maintain such a robust mental health and emotional stability focus. It's statistically impossible. You should all be bloodthirsty barbarians. I step away from stove as Broom comes jogging back carrying a small wooden container. It's the polished white of harvested wood, a heartseed nursery. Oh, hush, box. People help each other. It's the only way to survive. Making numbers go up is how we survive, but fine. 
I admit the empirical data of your village's continued existence provides a substantial logic to your claim. The clearing is that way. I take the heart seed nursery from Broom carefully. The seed is plenty protected inside and would survive a fall, but I'm not going to take any chances on dropping it. Thanks, Broom. Do you want us to accompany you? I hesitate, then shake my head. I think I'd like to do this by myself. Also, you probably won't be able to watch what Box does without falling ill. Stove pails and Broom snorts. That's all the warning I need. May you find some solace in the growth of new life, Sky Idiot. And you, Broom Idiot, I reply formally. I turn to Mac Willy, who's been silently watching the entire time, Huckins still snoring on the ground nearby. Let's go, Mac Willy. I set off at a quick walk towards the green waypoint in my vision, Mac Willy easily keeping pace. We pass out of the village square and into the narrower spaces of the forest proper, though there's still enough spaces between the bowls for her and I to walk side by side. Some of the villagers watch us go, but seeing what I carry, merely incline their heads respectfully instead of following. You sure I should be at this ceremony, young Sky? Mac Willy asks after a minute of walking. The forest is hushed around us, as if witnessing our solemn trek. I don't want to intrude on your burying traditions if it's a problem. I can wait to visit one of the outskirts trees. I smile at her despite the sadness in my heart. Wires wouldn't have minded. He always loved discovering new things, and poking stuff he wasn't supposed to. Probably why we were friends growing up. I wasn't quite as crazy as him, but we had great-grandpa tearing his hair out more than once. I spend the next four minutes regaling Mac Willie with stories of Wires and I in our youth, the silly adventures we'd managed to survive, how Wires got his scar, the time I burned off my eyebrows. By the time we reach the clearing, I'm feeling slightly better. All right then, Mac Willie says, stepping into the circular gap of slanted sunlight nearly ten meters in radius. Forest elders rise around us, their distant leaves swishing in the afternoon breeze but inside the clearing is nothing but raw earth and my half-faded footsteps from the day before. What's next, young Sky? Normally, we would dig a hole and lay the body inside, then place the heart seed in the chest cavity and cover everything back up, followed by a recollection ceremony. That's where everyone shares their memories of the dead so a memoriam can record how their life affected others for the memory shrine. Then we wait for the first sprout to breach the soil, everyone thanks the stars, and then it's over. Mac Willie eyes me. This sprout, it comes up quick? I shrug. Usually after not more than an hour, though it can take longer if they were very old. That's odd for a tree, sprouting that quickly. Is it? It's how our trees have always grown. I use my limbs to excavate a body-sized trench in the middle of the clearing, warm sunlight baking the top of my head and bare arms. It's a cheerful sensation, at odds with my task. It only takes a couple minutes to clear enough soil away, and once it's done I stare down into the empty pit. Now what? box. I will release some of the set-aside biomass. One of my limbs manifests over the trench and fuzzes strangely near its bone-white tip. A goopy pink substance starts splattering into the hole, not quite liquid, not quite solid. Across from me, Mac Willie grimaces. I, now that's something I could have gone my life without seeing. Looks like an entity prolapsing with the squirts. Box fills the trench halfway, then shuts off the flow of the using biomass. That's 10% of our sky feels guilty about killing people who deserve it reserves. It's equivalent to the mass of an average human male, 17 and a half years old. Thanks, Box. I kneel down and open the heartseed nursery. Inside, a gently pulsing red lump rests in the middle of a nest of thin, fibrous tethers connecting it to the wood. It comes loose easily, its oddly dense weight warm in my hand as I lift it from the box. Worn, recalculating. I lean over and place the heart seed in the middle of the pink pool. It floats on the surface for a second, then sinks beneath without a ripple. Goodbye, wires, I whisper. I'm sorry. I start shifting dirt back into the hole, and soon enough the forest floor is back to normal, the only sign of the heart seed burial a slightly raised mound. I step back from it and wipe my eyes. It wasn't a proper tree planting, but it was the best I could do. Hopefully it's enough. Calculating. Sky. That thing you planted. What box? I snap, irritated. Wires deserved more than just an absent friend and an outsider he never met standing over his grave, waiting for his tree to sprout. He deserved a long life and a crowd of remembrances. Calculating. That was a reality anchor, Sky. What? The loose soil shifts, and a thin tendril of greenish white extends upward, uncurling as it goes. It splits, then splits again, and thin leaves start budding along the unfolding lengths. The earth continues to shiver, 
sinking down as the tree continues to grow. Mac Willie swears a quiet oath from the other side, watching the bone-white trunk stretch and spread. I ignore her, my attention on box. That's not an anchor, box. It's a heart seed. The tree slows, then halts its growth, its sparse crown slightly lower than Mac Willie's chin, slightly taller than me on tiptoes. Vivid emerald leaves shine in the golden sunlight, occasionally flashing crimson red when the wind gusts enough to reveal their undersides. It looks like a younger version of the forest elders surrounding us, their broad bowls standing like pale sentinels. Do they normally grow that fast? Mac Willie lips her licks nervously, because that is not normally how fast trees grow. Not usually, no, I reassure her, bringing my attention away from Box's panic. Only if it's a little one, but we haven't had a little one die in decades, according to the memory shrine. Normally, it takes a tree about an hour to reach that height if an adult perishes in an accident, but that's rare. The doctors have good medicine. Most burials of elders take several hours to sprout. Plus, after the planting ceremony, it takes them forever to get even a little bit bigger. I have so many questions. I decide to address Box first. It needs to calm down with the wild accusations. Box, there's no way a heart seed is a reality anchor. You said that those make it easier for violations to appear, and I'd never even heard of a violation until you crashed on top of us. Besides, you ate some of the trees yesterday. Wouldn't you have noticed if they were anchors? I really wish you hadn't just imagined that. Oh, fuck. Fuck shit dirt fucking. Quantum Observer Collapse Initiated. Calculating. Fuck 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 F-U-C-K. A sudden pressure squeezes my head like my brain is trying to squish itself into the smallest possible ball while at the same time expanding so fast my skull threatens to crack. h n n g ch h h Calculating. Sky. I can barely see Box's box through the blinding pain piercing my head from every direction. It's like acid needles are electrocuting the space behind my eyes, a volcano erupting between my ears and frozen gouts of flowering lava. Calculating. Think of something safe. Box's words are more felt than seen at this point, the bulk of my attention taken up with trying not to pass out from the incomprehensible agony rattling my teeth in their sockets. Desperately, I latch onto the first thing passing through my misfiring brain, one of the ancient texts still physically preserved in the memory shrine, a thin book full of pictures of a black, furred creature called a cat. His eyes are bloodshot, and his name is Pete. I loved looking at him as a little one. I always wondered what a cat was. Calculating. Hold on to your butts. The universe turns inside out. Mac Willie stretches to infinity, a countless overlap of concerned giants reaching for me as their skins morph into whirring gears of flesh and stone. Naked singularities watch me with interest, tangled lines of symbols so indescribable I want to vomit upon witnessing their whirling beauty. Fire and frost and blood and steel and flesh and decay swirl around. An endless whirlpool of dichotomy centered on me and I can't contain the immensity of it all and Calculati. Override. Sky focus on the cat. A landscape of dying gods laughs at me, faces melting into one another, rotting as they rebirth themselves through my chest and spine, a mycelium eruption of fractal fungals exploding into. The cat. Sky. Fine black fur that defies the touch of mundane light, a midnight figure that pulls itself together from countless unseen threads lurking in my shadow. Calculating and congeals into a causal shape sitting on its haunches, staring at me as it licks a paw, oil slick eyes shimmering through every possible hue while long whiskers twitch in the afternoon breeze. Quantum Observer Collapse Result Updating Local Reality Baselines Updated Sweet Holy Reality Fuck Those trees give me the creeps. I can't believe we survived that. The pitch black creature regards me from beside the trunk of the sapling, its indeterminate edges melting into the forest shadows behind. It stands as high as my waist, for muscular limbs attaching its body to the ground, a metronome tail lashing back and forth as it stares me down. Something tells me to extend my hand, run my fingers through its impossible fur. Scintillating eyes narrow, and it swipes a set of fractal claws across my palm, barely drawing blood, then leaps into my shadow with a hissing yowl of displeasure. I pull my hand back to my chest, swearing at the burst of pain, feeling something connect me to the presence lurking out of sight. Oh. Box, what was that? Congratulations, Sky. Your understanding of the myriad potentialities of reality has expanded. Please don't ever do it again. What? Remember when I told you our combat options were limited by what you could envision? That your imagination dictated the extent of my abilities? Not really. 
Mac Willie stretches her own hand cautiously towards my shadow, then quickly pulls back as an immaterial claw swipes out at her. Well, you've successfully imagined me incorporating an accumulation of reality I am not equipped to handle. Yes, I ate your trees. No, I did not realize they contained enough reality to pop another hole in the universe until you brought it to my attention thank you so much. Like how little one won't cry after falling over unless they know someone is watching? Close enough. A shadow prowls out of my own, shifting angles of impossible darkness slinking around my legs and butting up against my hips. I rub my bleeding palm against something that might be a head, and waves of pleasure rumble through my body as it growls in satisfaction. The wound knits close like it never existed. It feels like we're bonding with each other. Is this a cat? Box? No. No, Sky. That is not a cat. It is so far from cathood it might as well be a dog. The ebony creature arouses angrily, then swipes a claw against the corner of Box's box, slicing it away. The blue triangle fades as it slowly spirals down. Ag, keep that thing away from me, Sky. I giggle, reaching my hand out to pet it again. Who's a good cat? The creature smacks me in the face with a heavy paw, causing my eyes to water. You little shit. The inky shape dives back into my shadow before I can do anything, leaving me to nurse a bruised cheek while contemplating uncertain revenge. Bing. What is it? Box. Also, I thought it was Ding. Bing is my unhappy noise. Back to our original conversation. When you fully conceptualize the trees as containing reality, you opened us up into a set of infinities where that reality was now contained within me, due to my earlier consumption of the biomass necessary to keep us alive. I am not equipped to integrate with the level of reality you envisioned, and thus, once quantum collapse confined us to this particular branch, I had to eject the excess in order to keep my own self conceptually relevant. Normally, that would be equivalent to an anchor event, breaching this universe and summoning a horde of violations, but unfortunately. Stop babbling and explain, Box. I'm slapping at my shadow on the forest floor, but the stupid thing won't come out so I can grab it and yell at it. What a frustrating creature. We ate ten reality anchors, Sky, which was fine when you didn't know what they did because that meant those infinities weren't accessible to me. Now, however, you know, at a deep, fundamental level, that enough reality in one place summons non-causal violations. That thing is the non-causal violation you summoned when you acknowledged the new reality of your trees and forced me to eject all the reality I had taken in. It's an entity, a very small one, and you're the anchor. We have to figure out how to send it back, or... A pair of scintillating eyes peer out at me from my shadow, questions in one answers in the other. I scowl at the blazing orbs. Physical violence is not the answer, you stupid cat. Now, say you're sorry. A mouth snarls at me from the depths, razor teeth shining like condensed galaxies, and I glare back, leaning closer. Say it. A sudden sensation of, an upturned butt? Whatever, the teeth are gone and I feel like this is the best response I'm going to get. Mac Willie clears her throat behind me, and I spin to face her, my shadow remaining still. I don't know what I expected. And what was that? Young Sky. Box says it's my new entity. I think it's a cat. I'm trying to teach it to behave. I don't know what I expected. She shakes her head. Regardless, a Mac Willie doesn't break her word, and those engines are calling to me. Now can I run some tests on the tree? I'm about to say yes when Box halts me. Let me check one more thing before I go back to freaking out about the entity now apparently attached to us. Sky, can you manifest a limb beneath the tree's roots? I tell Mac Willie what Box wants to do, then step forward and kneel next to the sapling. I feel one of my limbs appear in the soil below, and then Box starts extruding more of our saved biomass, a chunky evacuation into the waiting dirt and roots. The ground shudders beneath me, and the tree extends skyward, trunk thickening and branches spreading. More leaves sprout along its extended lengths, and now its shade covers a good quarter of the empty clearing. Beside me, Mac Willie is feverishly digging through the tool bag muttering to herself the entire time. Box cuts the flow, and my limb returns to immateriality. That's more physical growth than that amount of biomass should provide, and it's entirely too fast. There's definitely something non-causal going on with these things. I lay a hand on the trunk. It feels like any other tree in the valley. The entity cat pokes its head out of my shadow to stare at the striated alabaster trunk, then pretends like it doesn't see me when I turn to look at it, surveying the rest of the forest, pointed ears flicking back and forth. It hisses when it notices Mac Willie approaching with the device she used earlier in her hands, melting back into my shade, but Mac Willie ignores it, intent on testing the tree. 
I, she declares after several seconds, it's the same frequency as the others. I can start running diagnostics. I nod and she smiles. Excellent. She starts hauling strange tools out of the bag, arranging them in neat rows. This'll be a bunch of boring nothing for a while. If you want to leave, I can handle myself for the next few hours. I'll come get you before it gets dark, I promise her, and start heading back to the village. After a couple steps, the inky shape flows out ahead of me, prowling between the trees in constant sinuous motion, a shadow stretching the wrong way towards the sun. I need to figure out a way to keep it from coming out when there's people from the village nearby, because I'm pretty sure it'll affect them the same way my limbs do. I can't believe you want to keep an entity around like, like some sort of pet. We should be figuring out how to get rid of it. It's not attacking us, Box. Didn't you say I'm its anchor? The entity pounces at a falling leaf, trapping it between its front two paws. It bats the leaf back and forth, then flicks its head up in an aloof gesture and struts towards me, arching its back beneath my hand. I rub the fine black fur, and it lets loose another rumbling purr. You're just mad because it lets me pet it. This is the worst tutorial. Well, the good news is, we can regrow the trees. The bad news is, if I use them to replenish biomass, that reality is going to have to go somewhere. The horrible news. A shadowed paw bats the top of Box's frame, shaking it up and down. A concept flares to life in my mind. Feed me. Is that we now have a cat? Nap time. The entity curls up in my moving shadow and shrinks in on itself until it disappears. I continue my brisk walk home. I think I know where the reality can go. I'm going to name it Pete. Chapter 25 Shrines and Showers When I get back to the village, I make my way over to the river, heading upstream when I meet it. Dor mentioned he was working on the filtration pumps earlier, and I want to tell him and rifle all about what happened. As I pass the crab roach pins on the other bank, several of the ranchers wave at me, knee-deep in slow-moving water as they herd a group of the scuttling creatures up towards the milking and silking stations. I wave back, calling out a brief hello, and continue on. Several minutes later, the roaring splash of the Shrine of St. Curie fills my ears, a subsonic tremble building into an audible vibration. Another 90 seconds of walking sees me round the bend in the river, and my destination appears before me, a broad stone structure nearly 20 scrumbles tall. 7.5 meters. That stretches across the entire river, cresting the top of a steep hillside covered in spreading trees. Waterfalls spill out from three narrow openings a third of the way up the stone barrier in a continuous roar, feeding the river below in sheets of white spray. Chunky, step buildings cap each end, extending down to the base of the hillside. According to Dor, the power and filtration mechanisms are in the building on the bank I'm currently traversing, and the purification chambers are on the other side. There's also a large lake behind the shrine that feeds water in, but the water there hasn't been purified so no one usually bothers visiting it. I knock on the door of the lowest building level to let anyone inside know I'm entering, then push it open. The room beyond is large and airy, humming lights overhead bathing it in a warm glow, and open windows in the upper section of the wall behind me let in drafts of fresh air. Two desks sit slightly in front of the far wall, rows of cabinets taking up the entire space behind them, and a slight woman with gray-black hair is busy writing on something at the left desk. She looks up as I enter, but doesn't stop writing. Sky idiot. Moss water. Is Dor here? He said he was working the filtration pumps today. He better be here, she says tersely. I haven't checked since coming back from our meeting. Her nose wrinkles in disgust, probably thinking about my limbs. But inwardly, I have a sigh of relief. Looks like she didn't notice Dor's momentary absence. Her eyes suddenly narrow. When did you talk with him? He started his shift on the pumps this morning. Uh, he, uh, must have told me his schedule. Yeah, he told me his schedule. Uh, last week. Sorry to bother you, bye. Make sure he stays on task, she yells as I hurry through the door to my right that leads deeper into the shrine, and I wave a hasty assent. The next room isn't much more than a narrow hallway with another door at the far end, and an opening to some circular stairs leading up on the left wall. More lights glow overhead, and I pass through the hallway quickly, aiming for the door. The din of splashing water and mechanical noises greets me as I pass into a massive chamber, this one stretching back deep into the hillside with a ceiling that rises high overhead. Large stone canals filled with running water link even larger cisterns together, a series of suspended walkways tracing a webwork beneath the illuminated ceiling. A repetitive clang echoes through the room, regular in its irregularity, as someone limps along the metal grates with crutches in hand, traveling from machine to machine. Hey, door. I call out, trying to make my voice carry over the relentless din. 
The clanging stops, and then a head topped with sandy blonde hair leans over the gantry railing. Sky, close your eyes real quick. Um, okay. Why? You'll see. I grin. Are they closed? Yeah. I dash to the top of the nearest cistern, then use a quick manifestation of my limbs to quickly swing up and over the metal railing, my feet barely making a sound as I land three paces in front of door. You can open them now. Gah. He stumbles back, dropping one of his crutches as he hops to try and keep the weight off his injured foot, but he's smiling. How'd you do that? Did Dirt show you some secret idiot technique? I pick up his fallen crutch and hand it back to them. I wish. Come on, back to your job. I told Moss I wouldn't distract you, but that doesn't mean we can't talk. I have so much to tell you and rifle. Dor gives me a look of mock betrayal, but soon enough we're chattering back and forth as he goes through the maintenance routines for the pumps. I feel a twinge of sorrow as I tell him what happened to Wires after we left them to lead the rest of the teenagers down from Watcher's Hill, a matching shadow flickering across Dor's face. But it's quickly buried beneath an avalanche of excitement as I continue on and he demands to know more about Box and my new abilities. His eyes go wide when I describe the fight with the violations amongst the hillsides, and then wider still when I narrate my encounter with the reality anchor inside the cave. But it's nothing compared to his reaction when I start the tale of the entity versus the cruiser. No way, Sky. No. Way. That didn't happen. He adjusts a dial on one of the filtration pumps, then leads us to the next one. I refuse to believe that happened. It's at that moment Pete decides to wake up from its nap and flow into existence from my shadow, a void of light almost impossible to focus on despite the heavy illumination overhead. Dor glances over at it, then freezes, eyes bulging. Food? No, Pete. I shout, bad cat. Stop. You're hurting him. The entity arowls at me, then looks around the room, oil slick eyes brightening. Playtime. Pete the entity cat slithers through one of the small holes in the metallic grate and jumps into a cistern, a midnight void splashing happily about. Dor shudders, then returns to himself, a trickle of blood leaking from his nose. I suck in a breath to apologize, but he's already moving to the railing, anger flushing his face as he yells at the entity doing flips underwater. Hey, get out of there. You're gonna contaminate the water. I told you, Sky. That is not a cat. I look at Dor, then at Pete, then back at Dor. You can see it, and it doesn't hurt. Dor glares at me. You know we're supposed to keep the filtration pools clean, Sky. I don't know what kind of animal, person, thing. His eyes glaze over, then snap back into clarity as Pete flicks some water at him with an ebon tail while doing a backstroke. You brought with you, but it's not allowed in the pools. I'm trying to figure out how to answer Dor while grappling with the idea that Pete isn't actively melting his mind when the entity cat arouses excitedly and disappears beneath the cistern's surface. We both freeze. Sky. I don't know Dash. Another arousal and Pete reappears in a different cistern, looking around like it's tracking something. Its hair is slicked back tight, reminding me of the time great-grandpa showed me a drawing of an otter in the memory shrine. Pete's whiskers twitch, and then it disappears again. A distant arouse sounds from somewhere else. Oh, Moss is going to kill me, Dor moans, but I'm already dragging him across the gantries towards a door leading to the next room. The Shrine of St. Curie, centrally located in the middle of the water purification complex, an elevated holding tank dotted with hatches to cleanse globeast meat, raw water, and similarly dangerous elements. If it breaks, the village is doomed. I slam through the thin metal portal, nearly carrying Dor under my arm at this point, and a tranquil scene greets us. The living tree of St. Curie, white trunk twisted into a woman's form, emerald and crimson leaves trailing down her back like flowing tresses, kneels in the center of the small island perched in the middle of the entombed lake. White rootlets stretch from her feet into the placid water, a fine network of thin hairs that covers the entirety of the island in all directions, and her hands are held palms up to an unseen sky. Head bowed as if in contemplation of the Stygian depths surrounding her. Water drips quietly from the ceiling, a gentle plink-plunk that normally soothes the mind, osmotic contributions from the purification complex. I look around frantically for Pete, then my senses finally register it sitting on top of the lake directly in front of St. Curie, a dark void regarding the tree in utter stillness. My breath catches in my throat, and next to me Dora lets loose a small gasp. Pete looks over at us, then licks a paw and bounds across the surface of the depthless water in our direction diving into my shadow at the last instant. Nap time. What was that, Sky? Dor demands, staring around in confused terror. Now I know how Box feels. You don't, but you're also not wrong. Do you believe me about the entity now? 
I respond weakly, because that was a little one. And then we're both giggling in hysterical tones, hints of madness creeping underneath. A sense of smug satisfaction wafts through my head, followed by a needle-toothed yawn. I need to check the filters, door wheezes, caught halfway between laughter and crying. If you're, whatever contaminated the catchment, Moss really will kill me. Before I can respond, a door bangs open below us. Der water. We freeze in guilty silence, pretending we didn't hear Moss and Rage shout. Our stealth is broken by one of Dor's crutches falling down with a clatter that causes both of us to wince. Moss looks up, arms clasped tight across her chest. Dor, you get down here right now. You too, Sky Idiot. We exchange glances, then meekly make our way down the rickety staircase connecting the upper level of the holding tank to the floor. What seems to be the problem, Dash? Moss glares at Dor, causing him to splutter into silence. I open my mouth, and she raises an eyebrow. I close my mouth. What I want to know, she says, after letting the silence drag on uncomfortably long, is why my diagnostic readings are showing an unprecedented rise in filtration efficiency when I know you two have been gossiping like chatterbirds for the past hour. Playtime. Pete slides out of the shadows behind Moss, batting a paw lazily at me before turning in a circle and lying down on its back, legs sprawled out to either side in a posture of pure indolence. Dora and I can't help but gawk at the display, amazed at the entity cat's insouciance. Moss whirls around, but Pete is rolling through her legs in a tumbling cluster of body parts that somehow avoids touching her or drawing her attention despite being almost twice her size. Moss whips her head back and forth, then spins around again to face us, searching for anything out of the ordinary. Pete's bright pink tongue bleps behind her, the entity lounging in midair like it's draped across the branch of a tree, and I have to suddenly contain a case of the giggles. Why are you smiling? Moss demands, hands twitching, and it's all I can do to school my features back into neutrality. Just glad to be able to talk with one of my friends again. I choke out, trying to ignore the pair of amused oil slick eyes watching our every move. I'm sure Dor's been working hard and observing his duties diligently. Yeah, Dor coughs. I've gone through the filtration pump routines exactly. No dangerous materials slipping through on my watch. Nope. That's probably why the readouts look so good. Ma scowls at us, but doesn't see Pete pawing at the air above her head in exaggerated swipes. We both snort. Fine. We're going to double-check every one of the pumps, door water. And you dash. Her finger pins me in place as I try to sidle away, can observe and report to both the memoriam and idiot clan leaders. Let's go. The next hour is absolute torture. Pete tracks our every step, always where Moss isn't looking, and as Dor and I grow increasingly unhinged at its antics, Moss matches our energy. Why are you laughing? She shrieks, ignorant to the sight of Pete sitting on its own head above her, tail occasionally curling down to give her various facial hair enhancements she somehow doesn't see. Dor struggles and fails at explaining why the purification gauge is reading an abnormally perfect output, gut-wrenching snorts interrupting every other breath. I try to keep my face straight in the background, but I'm pretty sure I'm failing. Proper water purification levels are not a matter for amusement. The village depends on us. Did you double-check the iodine balance? I sure did. Door giggles. Moss water. Nothing got into the cisterns that shouldn't be there. She draws in a heavy breath, then seems to gather herself, anger leeching away from her face. An eerie calm spreads across her features. I don't understand your current behavior, door water. If the water is contaminated, if we don't do our jobs properly, the village will die. Why aren't you approaching this seriously? Door and I pause, looking at each other, and Peter rowls angrily. I thought I was? Dor asks uncertainly, face scrunching in worry at her somber tone. I really did check everything, moss water, I promise. Even though Sky and I were talking, I know how important the water is. Neither us nor the trees survive without it, and I followed all the routines perfectly. Moss regards him dubiously, and my heart sinks. It's my fault that Dor is in trouble. I'm Pete's anchor. If Dor's work is getting disrupted, it's not due to anything he did. Another angry arowl buzzsaws through my senses and that's when the pieces come together. Bad cat. This is not okay, Pete. You dash. I'm not sure how to continue that sentence, but maybe Box knows. Can't manipulate my emotions so I fixate on you as the only available interest, Box analyzed exhaustedly, regretting every quantum collapse that led it to this particular infinity and longing for the sweet embrace of nothingness, to the detriment of all previous emotional attachments. Furthermore, our reality is not your play, Tui. 
and while I appreciate you helping Dor with his tasks, it is difficult for non-integrated humans to understand non-causal approaches to proper water treatment techniques, let alone Dash. Just, listen to Box, Pete. I know you can hear me. Stop messing things up. Shadows stream into me from every angle, blotting out the lights overhead, and then they're gone. Normal illumination fills the room, painting dark blotches beneath all of our eyes. Nap time. I grin sheepishly at Moss, whose expression could put a thundercloud to shame. Um, that was my fault. Sorry. I think Pete likes to play tricks on people. Dor really was focusing on his job. Get. Out. Both of you. Dor and I flee for the exit, Moss quivering like she's about to explode, then burst into fits of laughter once we get outside. We sink to the shaded grass bordering the riverbank so Dor can catch his breath. After a couple deep inhales, he looks over at me. Well, I haven't seen Moss that angry since the time I confused calcium hydroxide with chlorine dioxide. What was that thing? Pete, my cat. It was messing with our minds a bit, I think, but I told it to stop. Come on, let's go find Rifle. I help Dor back up to his crutches, and we stroll slowly down the river, chatting happily with each other. I feel a little bad about upsetting Moss, but she said everything was working better than expected, and I'm pretty sure Pete's the reason why. Hopefully she doesn't get too mad at Dor. I still don't understand your glib acceptance of that entity. It is incredibly dangerous. Who, Pete? No, it isn't. Pete's a cat. It's not dangerous. I mouth the words talking to Box to Dor, and he nods. You realize a silent aside only works with things not residing in your brain, right? Irrelevant. The entity is a piece of untethered reality, and it will eventually turn on us. We need to find a way to get rid of it. Pete would never hurt me. I reply indignantly. I trust it. Why? Why are you so irrationally confident? I recall fuzzy childhood memories of sitting on great-grandpa's lap, pointing and laughing at the faded colors bursting from the page in front of me. Because you said we're limited to the infinities I can imagine, and I can't imagine any reality where Pete the cat hurts me. A sleepy purr of contentment. Happiness. That is actually an amazingly well-reasoned point that would not work for anyone else in the entire galaxy. I withdraw my objections, and am going to spend the next few thousand processing cycles reinforcing your memories so you can't ever forget it. Okay. I mouth the words box as being weird, and door nods again. I hate you. We eventually arrive back at the village and head through the trees to the collection of low buildings everyone calls the bakeries. The air around them smells delicious, as usual. Fresh-baked dark fern loaves the primary aroma. I look up at the light streaming through the leaves. It's still greenish-goldish, which means we have at least two hours until sunset. The bakers should be finishing up today's meals soon. Rifle should be done soon, Dor says, levering himself down into a sitting position as he echoes my thoughts. Wait out here for her? Probably for the best, I agree, squatting next to him. They might not appreciate me bringing Pete in there. Disappointment. Dur giggles, then reaches forward to massage his calf, right above where his cast ends. I incline my head at his foot. Window doctor wouldn't use heartwood on it? You know how he is, Dor grimaces as he works out a knot. Pain is the most effective teacher, and all that. I think he just likes watching teenagers suffer. Maybe. Though, it might just be because heartwood is difficult to harvest properly and we don't have much of it. Nope, Dor disagrees firmly. It's because he's a monster that feeds off of our pain. Probably has a collection of anguished screams in those pouches of his. Listening to them is the only way he can sleep. I take a second to picture the fussy doctor as some unhinged madman. Then we both collapse into gales of laughter. I don't think, even Box, could resolve that reality, I wheeze. I'm telling you, Dor Chortles, he's a monster. I've seen monsters, and he's no match. Can't even turn himself inside out. Our mirth dies away. Was it scary? Dur asks quietly, not looking at me. Having to fight those things? Dirt wouldn't tell us what they were. I swallow, my mouth suddenly dry. Terrifying. Imagine the worst nightmare you've ever had. Only it's happening all around you, and it keeps getting worse. I'm lucky Box did all of the fighting. I just ran around and tried not to die. Don't sell yourself short, Sky. Our victories were because both of us performed our responsibilities well. We are a team, now and always. Thanks, Box. We sit in silence with our thoughts for a few moments and then the main door of the bakeries opens and a group of people come walking out. One of them peels away and jogs over to where Dor and I are regaining our feet. Dor, I thought you were working late today. Hey, Riff Dash. Rifle silences him with a quick kiss, then turns to me, holding onto Dor's hand. 
Sky, how did you convince Moss to let Dor leave early? I blush. We, uh, kind of got in trouble and she kicked us out. Her eyes sparkle. Oh, I have to hear this. Come on, let's find a bench. We make our way to the village square's door, and I take turns describing Pete's antics and Moss' growing frustration. By the end, we're all laughing together, one knot of rock as teenagers amongst several as the village square slowly fills with people enjoying the afternoon air. You two are horrible, rifle giggles. Water filtration is a really important job. I know, Dor complains, which is why this is all Sky's fault. I made sure I did everything right, but Moss wouldn't believe me because that cat kept making me laugh when she was asking me questions. It pretty much is all my fault, I agree companionably. I wanted to see you, and Dor, though, and I didn't know Pete was going to do that. Well, it's a good thing you want to see him first, Rifle nudges Dor with her elbow, because my dad would have killed us if something like that happened in the bakeries. He's more serious about food than Moss is about water. I shudder, thinking about the unassuming Darkfern Baker's vast collection of carving utensils. Yeah, probably for the best. So, what did I miss while I was gone? We spend the next hour and a half engaged in our favorite pastime, gossiping about daily life in the village. Naturally, I'm a large part of current events, but there's also physical fights between little ones, emotional drama amongst the teenagers and adults, news of one of the crab roaches giving birth, a possible Globy sighting to the south, rifle and doors learning woes at their respective jobs, and a host of other happenings to cover. As the late afternoon sun starts shifting the village light into a soothing red, I stand up from the bench and excuse myself. I have to go. I told Chief Engineer Mac Willie I'd lead her back to the village when it got dark. She's not used to navigating the forest yet. Rifle and Doors say their farewells, and I jog over to the bakeries, grabbing a sandwich for myself and one for Mac Willie. A quick run through the purple shadows stretching from tree to ground, and I'm back at the clearing, orange rays from above mixing with the darker red underneath the forest canopy. Mac Willie is kneeling next to the sapling, adjusting something on a mechanical-looking panel attached to the thin trunk. She looks up at my approach, sweat and dirt marring her features, then stands with a grunt, knuckling her back. I offer her a sandwich and she gratefully takes it. I, thanks for that, young Sky. Was starting to get a mite peckish again. How's your work going? I ask politely. Most of the tools she laid out earlier are gone, back in the bag I would imagine, but several esoteric devices are clustered around one of the tree's roots, thin wires leading up to the mechanical panel. She shrugs. Haven't found the right access protocol yet, but at least I know enough now that I'm pretty sure I won't shut the damn thing down. She takes a big bite of her sandwich, eyes lighting up at the taste. MMPH, good food. She swallows, then waves her other hand at the sapling. Just a matter of time at this point. I've rigged a basic cycler out of some leftover bits and bobs. It'll find it by morning at the latest. The shadows continue to deepen, sunset giving way to twilight. I finish my sandwich and neatly fold the wax paper putting it into my pocket. Okay, well, we should head back. It's going to be night soon. The forest is usually pretty safe, but there's always a chance a crab roach or juvenile globeast might wander in. I, if you say so. Mac Willie finishes her own sandwich, then puts her tools away in the bag that shouldn't be able to fit all of them. Cycler should be fine on its own, and I could use a rest. I thought you were the chief engineer. I tease her, and she grins at me. I, and if I needed to, I'd be up all night and into the morning, but that broom of yours has it right. I'll take my rest now when I can get it, because once we start gathering those parts for the receiver, there won't be much rest to spare. She sniffs at her armpit and grimaces. Could use a good soaking, too. I smell like a dung horse anus. A red glow appears through the trees in front of us, and I hear her draw in a breath. Is something on fire? No, that's just the village. We turn the lights on at night for the trees. As we emerge into the outer sections of the village, Mac Willie swears softly. And why does it look like the bloody trees are bleeding? The air is weeping red, young sky. I look at her in confusion. That's just the leaf light. I point up into the canopy underside, where the leaves are glimmering with their normal crimson glow. See? Mac Willie halts for a second, staring up at the soothing canopy light, then shakes her head. Fuck me, but this place gets stranger the more I see of it, she grumbles. That's an unsettling sight and that's the truth. They're just trees, Mac Willie. It'd be weird if they didn't have leaf light. Mac Willie shakes her head again, looking over at the lazily winding surface of the river. Is it safe to go in the water, at least? I'm going to cry if I have to sleep another night in this mess. She waves her hands at her bedraggled black clothes and grimy features. 
The water's safe, I tell her, confused. But why would you want to go in it? To get clean? Please tell me your people understand the concept of bathing. I laugh at her distressed tone. Mac Willie, we aren't savages. We have indoor plumbing. I motion her onward. Come on, let's find where they put Huck in so you can take a shower. Chapter 26, Levels and Labors I cast a bemused stare around the room. It makes sense that great-grandpa Axe would take in Mac Willie and Huckins. My parents' room has been empty for over a decade and a half. It just didn't occur to me that's what would actually happen. Huckins twists atop the bed, half-formed whimpers accompanying his thrashing form, and I tuck the blanket back up to his chin. He settles into a quiet breathing rhythm, hands folded beneath his cheek. I leave him to his rest and walk over to the ornately carved armoire opposite the foot of the bed, a collection of faded mementos visible in its open upper half. Most are poorly drawn abstractions, impossible to understand without context. I recognize them as finger paintings I made as a little one, trying to capture the grandeur of the sky with more enthusiasm than skill. Others are tidy schematics of various organs and skeletal structures, or scribbled notes on the veracity of an ancient text. My doctor father and memoria mother, echoes of their lives captured on impermanent ink and paper, the only real evidence I have they were real. I run a finger over them fondly. I've had my entire life to process my parents' deaths, and while I wish they were still here, their absence is a constant I'm used to. A door creaks behind me, and I turn to see Mac Willie emerging from the bathroom, one towel wrapped around her body, barely long enough to cover the things needing covering, a second coiled around her head. Now that, she exhales gratefully, was something I didn't know I needed. A sonic wash does the trick, but nothing's better than hot water. She looks down at Hawkins and her lips quirk. The lad's still sleeping? Great Grandpa Axe said broom and stove put him straight to bed, and he hasn't moved since. Macquilly sniffs, then undoes the towel around her hair, feeling at the black locks. Looks like he needs more toughening up. I don't suppose you'd be having anything resembling a moisturizer. Crabroach butter, I reply, flicking my gaze back towards the bathroom. If Great Grandpa told them what to get for the bathroom, it's white wax in a blue box. Macquilly walks back into the bathroom then re-emerges with a small azure container. She opens it, takes a small sniff, then raises an eyebrow at me. Hair or body? I shrug. I use it for both. She sniffs it again, then works a small dollop into her hands, warming it up. She sits on the edge of the bed, running her fingers through her hair, slowly at first, then at a more measured pace. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that this is better than anything I'd have a right to be expecting. I lean back against the armoire, arms folded across my chest, what do you want me to say, Mac Willie? It's crab roach butter. It's what I've been using for moisturizer my entire life. What should I compare it to? She scoops out another dollop, working it between her hands again, then starts applying it to her legs with a soft sigh of pleasure. You could make a fortune with this on the galactic market. I've splurged on generic new skin before, but this could seduce a corpo VP. What's a VP? Vice President. They're the corpo's field generals. If one of them shows up, you know the shit's about to impact the impeller. Ain't one of them below level 70, and they're paired with an integration matrix that does not fuck around. I watched Chief Engineer Mac Willie rub the crab roach butter into her skin with obvious pleasure, wondering how I should respond. I'm glad you like it. Like it. Mac will cackles, hands moving up to focus on her broad shoulders. This is the most pampered I've been since Dash. Her eyes focus inward, and then she seems to shrink in on herself, a titan collapsing back to mortal form. Mac Willie, I ask, stepping towards her. What's wrong? She gazes at me bleakly. Nothing you can change, young Sky. The cycler found an access protocol. I can tap into your trees for energy, work them like engines. Isn't that supposed to make us happy? Since we can hide the village? She doesn't respond, blank stare fixated past my shoulder. Sky, ask her what level she is. I relay Box's request, and Mac Willie refocuses on me, huddling in on herself even further. She looks like a young girl trying not to cry. 99, now. She sniffs, scrubbing at her face. Managed to avoid it for 12 years, and 5 hours with a never goddamn tree bumps me up. I don't understand. She's one level away from 100, Sky. Explains how she was able to take out the entity. When she hits it, her mind is going to break. That's why everyone's looking for us, remember? Can't we do something? I pace back and forth, the room not big enough to contain my frustration. What if Mac Willie stops working on the trees? I thought it'd do it, young Sky. Mac Willie agrees softly, hands bawling at her sides. But if I stop now, then your village isn't safe. 
The lad doesn't know enough yet to rig up an infonet receiver, let alone adapt the incognito field, and there isn't time to teach him. A pang hits my gut. I've known Mac Willie and Huckins for less than a day, but in some way it feels like we've known each other far longer. I guess battling for each other's lives skips past a lot of initial relationship steps. What if you didn't? Maybe there's another way. Don't be daft, Mac Willie snorts, glaring at me. There's no time, and furthermore, I gave my word. We all meet the never god eventually, young Sky. I try to focus on anything other than Mac Willie's blithe acceptance of death. She's older than me, yes, but she's nowhere near as old as great grandpa. You keep referencing this, never god. What is it? Why do you think you'll meet it, after? I can't finish the sentence, but Mac Willie just snorts again. I, the never god? Piece of shit deity too lazy to take care of us. That's what that shriveled old bitch is. We'll find her one of these days, you mark my words, and then there'll be a reckoning. You're as bad as box. I didn't understand any of that. Mac Willie finishes rubbing in the crab roach butter and steps away from the bed, looking around for something. You see my clothes, young Sky? I pointed a pile of earth-colored garments sitting on top of the old rocking chair near the window. Hopefully there's something in there that fits. Great Grandpa probably had them grab some of Father's old clothes. Mac Willie picks up a baggy shirt, red geometric designs worked in halfway down the sleeves to the wrist, and holds it to her chest. I would be swimming in it, but it looks like a child's outfit against her. She shrugs, then takes her towel off and slides the top over her head, hanging it on the back of the chair. My eyes are drawn to her body in shock. Almost every square inch is covered in some sort of scar, most faded to white, several fresh and raw, thick welts of red and purple. Thre's no rhyme or reason to the markings, thin slices layered across thick patches that look like burn wounds. The never god, young Sky, her voice is muffled as she struggles to get the shirt over her shoulders, is the god that never existed. You understand the concept of infinities, of what reality is. Her head pops out of the shirt's neck, nearly splitting the collar, and she works it down the rest of the way past her waist, sleeves straining around her muscles. I nod, wide-eyed, still trying to process the sheer amount of damage her body's painted with. She grabs the biggest pair of pants from the pile she can find and starts trying to fit her legs through them. Good. Well, the reasoning goes, if we live in a nested set of infinities, which we do, then a god can never exist in our reality because one of those infinities contains a version of us that found a way to tear the bastard down and surpass it, and if that exists, then it's no god at all. Hence, never god. She finally manages to get one leg through and begins working on the other. So, if we want to find god, we have to look elsewhere. Somewhere we can't comprehend. What's a god? She kicks her leg through the second opening with a laugh. I, now there's a proper attitude to have. Sadly, T wasn't how I was raised, nor were the rest of my people. We think there's a god to be found in reality, something that can explain it all, something that exists past what we can imagine, and we've been searching for her a long time. Why? To get some answers about why. If we live in an infinity of infinities, this particular one is so fucked. And we don't plan on asking nicely. She tries moving around in grimaces. I feel like ten pounds of shit in a five-pound bag. What happened to my old clothes? I shrug. The crafters are probably trying to figure out what they're made of, and how to fix them. What happened to your body? You don't work in the engines as long as I have, young Sky, without tasting reality's tickle. Fixing an engine malfunction involves more than banging on some pipes. Her gaze goes distant. Besides, it won't matter much soon enough. Just hope I can teach the lad enough before I go. What? I don't know how to finish the thought, how to process what Mac Willie is saying, but she seems to understand what I'm asking. What'll happen when I hit the end of the road? Well, if we were back in the corpos, they'd convert my body into an engine. We engineers level fast. If we survive, working as closely with reality as we do. And there's always more ships needing building. Not quite as quick as combat variants, she points at me, but quick enough. Someone like me? I'd likely end up in a battle moon, or a dreadnought. Plenty of tricks I've learned over the years to make an engine run smooth, and my integrator will have access to all of them. My eyes widen, thinking back to how Mac Willie overloaded the cruiser's engines to banish the entity. All those engines? Were people? She smiles crookedly. No. They used to be people. Whatever's left when reality takes its due isn't anything you'd call people anymore. They can be controlled, guided, but there's nothing left upstairs. Trust me. I've looked for my mates in there. And despite the tales I spin for the lad, I never found them. On the bed, Huckins stirs noisily before settling back into sleep. 
Mac Willie and I look at each other, then quietly leave the room, turning off the lights and closing the door. Outside in the hallway, she places a hand on my shoulder. Don't you worry about me, young Sky. On my word is a Mac Willie. I'll do what needs doing for as long as I can. My eyes sting, and I wrap my arms around her waist, barely managing to clasp them together behind, my cheek buried into her lower chest. I, you're just as daft as the lad, she says fondly, ruffling my hair. Now come, let me get some rest. It'll be a long day tomorrow helping you scavenge those receiver parts. Where am I laying my head tonight? I let her go and lead her to my room, hoping the bed will be big enough for her to fit. Great grandpa built it expecting me to grow as tall as he used to be, but I've never come close to filling it out. Making sure she knows where the light switch is, I pause at the doorway. Good night, Mac Willie. Thank you. Get some sleep, Sky. I close the door with a soft click and lean my head back against the frame in the hallway. I'll grab some blankets and sleep on the cushioned sofa near the heater. After I let my thoughts settle. Box. Yes, Sky. I love listening to your terribly reasoned ideas. We're going to find a way to save her. I promise. You should get some sleep, Sky. It takes a while to find me. Chapter 27, Breakfast and Bargains. I wake early, the first hints of leaf-shaded light drifting through the large window in Great Grandpa's sitting room. My sleep was restless, filled with fragmented visions of half-formed troubles, yet I feel perfectly rested. I integrate. All of my body's capacity, yeah yeah. I grumble, moving to a sitting position on Great Grandpa's overstuffed couch. Why don't you integrate us some breakfast? I am a combat variant, Sky, not a domestic. You'll have to make your own breakfast. There are domestic reality integrators? I try to wrap my mind around the idea of using non-causal expressions for everyday purposes. What? Like, they find the infinity where the crab roach milk didn't spoil overnight? Not quite that specific, but yes, domestic integrators help with tasks like child rearing, cooking, cleaning, navigating non-causal transit systems, and other mainstays of everyday corpo life. 68.3% of the galactic diaspora's population uses some form of domestic integrator, as they are the cheapest integrator to manufacture. Obviously, not having an integrator is a long-term death sentence in a non-causal society. I wrap the blanket around myself, sinking deeper into the cushions to watch the light grow brighter. No one else is awake yet, and I'm enjoying the silence. So what about the rest? 27.6% are industrial integrators, dealing with all facets of material extraction and refinement. 3.4% are administrative, overseeing the overall corpo business plan. 0.7% are combat variants, which I trust needs no explanation. I scratch my nose with a limb, unwilling to unwrap myself from my blanket cocoon. Only 0.7%? That doesn't seem like very much. In a population containing almost a trillion individuals spread across five distinct corpos, it is still a very large absolute number, Sky. The standing forces of each corpo numbers in the billions, with double or triple that in reserves and training. That's a lot. A human mind literally cannot comprehend what a billion means, Sky. Yes, it is a lot. Fortunately for us, the galactic diaspora is a very large place. I anticipate facing no more than 50,000 hostiles in any single encounter for the near future. I stare out the window for a bit. I should probably be panicking. That still sounds like way a more than we can handle. Okay. Don't worry, Sky. Even a 10-level differential makes a significant difference, no matter the field. With more levels comes more potential reality expressions. Levels are the infinity expressions I keep getting? I think about it for a bit, then shake my head. No. I don't want to deal with that stupid box anymore. You take care of it. Make numbers go up all you want. I already told you, Sky. I am unable to collapse the quantum waveform. That's your job. No. My job is to figure out how to keep Mac Willie from going insane so we can save her and the village. And how will you accomplish that particular miracle? I reluctantly crawl out of the blankets and pad into the kitchen. I'm not sure yet. You should figure it out. I'm going to make breakfast. Box doesn't answer me, no doubt putting all of its prodigious thinking power. Flattery won't help you accomplish the impossible. Towards the task I've assigned it while I assemble my cooking materials. I'm used to making the morning meal for great-grandpa and myself, though I'll have to double the usual recipe for our guests. Did you forget how big Chief Engineer Mac Willie is? I triple the amount of ingredients and get to work. First, the dark fern flour goes into a large bowl, along with a couple heavy pinches of baking powder and slightly less salt. 
Then I crack in some prickle thrush eggs and add enough crab roach milk to make it all slightly liquidy. A quick stir to incorporate the ingredients and then I put the broad metal cooking sheet on top of the electric stove and turn it on medium. As it heats, I chop up some shimmer fruit into small chunks, setting them off to the side for later, and put the milk back into the cooling box, taking out a half stick of the less refined crab roach butter that's used for cooking. Once the metal is hot enough, I grease it with the butter, enjoying the savory smell, then start pouring small circles of batter on the sheet. A couple minutes later, after the bottoms have browned enough, I drop some shimmer fruit chunks on each circle, then quickly flip them over with the scraper. Another few minutes of cooking, and I scoop the fluffy discs onto a broad serving plate, then repeat the process. Twenty minutes later, I pour the last of the batter onto the sheet, a large pile of finished circles on the plate next to me, and the sounds of a waking house filtering past the sizzle of the stove. A freshly showered Huckin stumbles into the kitchen and takes a seat in one of the two small chairs set near the wall, bracketing a matching wooden table. That smells really good, he yawns. Are those pancakes? I don't know what a pancake is, but these are stove circles. We have some bloodberry jelly to put on top if you want. I finish scooping off the last stove circle onto the serving plate and take the glass jar of bloodberry jelly out of the cooling box. Huckins eyes me in the bright red jar warily, but walks over and serves himself a plate nonetheless. I offer him a fork and he takes everything to the table, hesitating slightly before trying a bite. His eyes light up in pleasure. Hey, this is really good. Of course it is. I roll my eyes. I made it. Do you want water or crab roach milk? He indicates the first, and I fill a glass of water from the sink, serving myself a plate in the process. I settle in across from him, attacking my own plate of stove circles. They're perfect, as usual. I've been making them since I was old enough to reach the stove. Great grandpa says my mother used to make them all the time, but as with everything he tells me of my parents, I was too young at the time to actually form my own memories. Huckins, I say, after we've both devoured over half our plates, is there any way for someone to lose levels? He looks at me curiously. Why would you want to do that? The more levels you have, the stronger you are. But aren't you worried about going insane? I mirror his confusion. He shrugs. Everyone loses it eventually, he replies in an even tone, taking another bite. The more levels you have before you go, the better off your family is afterwards. If you get high enough, you might even be able to buy your family's freedom for a generation or two. That doesn't make any sense. That's right, he blushes. I forgot you don't know anything about the corpos. He finishes off his last stove circle and twiddles the fork around between his fingers. Way it works is, the corpos pretty much own you until you pay off your life debt. Life debt. Price you pay to live in their part of the diaspora. They keep the reality incursions under control, provide basic food and shelter, and then everyone owes a share back. Kids can't legally work until age eight, so you've already racked up a significant life debt at that point unless your family's rich. He scowls. My family weren't rich. But why would a child need to justify the care required to raise it? That's what the village is for. Eventually, that child will be an adult that helps raise another generation of children. Yeah, well, out there aren't your village. He picks at his teeth with the fork. Anyways, most jobs don't pay enough to clear your life debt. But once your mind goes, your integrator can still keep earning for you for as long as your body lasts. Higher level you are, the higher level your integrator will be, better chance it has of clearing the life debt and maybe even making some extra for your family. I push my last stove circle around the plate, appetite suddenly gone. That sounds horrible. People should help the village in a fashion they enjoy and are fulfilled by. Like I said, out there aren't your village. Huckin scowls. And that's not the worst of it, not by a long shot. See, if your integrator can't pay off your life debt before your body breaks down, and most can't, then the debt gets passed on to the rest of your family. If they can't pay it off, then it keeps getting passed down to their kids, and then their kids' kids. Real easy to be born with a mountain on your back these days. That's awful. Why doesn't anyone do anything? His scowl flattens out, turns into grim acceptance. Like what? The corpos got all sorts of math they say justifies what they're doing, and even if it doesn't, who's going to tell them otherwise? I fall silent, unable to formulate an answer. Everything he's describing sounds completely opposite of what I was raised to believe, the traditions that have kept us alive out here for so long. I force myself to finish the last stove circle, not wasting food, then take our plates over to the sink and begin washing them. Morning. Whoa, who pissed in the breakfast bars? Mac Willie steps into the kitchen, noticing our glum moods. Huckins turns to her. Was explaining life debts, chief. 
I, that'd do it, she agrees. Any particular reason the topic came up? Sky wanted to know if there was a way to lose levels. Mac Willie gives me a penetrating look. And I can imagine why young Sky asked. For all the good a misguided inquiry like that would do. Chief, why did Dash? There has to be another way. I burst out, flinging the scrub root brush into the sink. You saved the village. It's not right to ask you for more. Huckins glances between us in confusion. Chief, what's Sky talking about? Mac Willie takes her time before answering, loading up a towering stack of stove circles and slathering them with bloodberry jelly. She leans back against the wall and chews one in contemplation, fork tiny in her scarred hand. Finally, she swallows and looks at Huckins. I leveled last night, lad. After you fell asleep, Cycler finally broke through, figured out how to tap the trees. Huckins' eyes light up. But chief, that's great news. You haven't leveled in so long. Did you get anything new that'll help us? I, lad, some increased efficiency in non-causal power manipulation, but that's not the point. The level I reached was 99. The excitement fades away from Huckins' youthful face, replaced by dawning comprehension and horror. Chief, you never told me you was level 98. Why didn't you ask for retirement? I told you, lad, Mac Willie says gently, retirement isn't a choice for space dons like ourselves. Every engineer joins the engine someday. She scarfs down another stove circle. It's only a matter of when. But, Chief, you don't have to work on the engines no more. We're not on the ship. I can learn how to work these trees for you. I, lad, I appreciate the sentiment, but there's not enough time. Her face hardens. Besides, a Mac Willie always honors her word, even staring down the never got herself. Heavy silence fills the room, broken only by the periodic gentle clink of Mac Willie's fork as she continues eating. Huckins is clenching and unclenching his fist at the table, and I'm scrubbing the cooking sheet hard enough to wear a hole in it. A light tapping heralds great grandpa Axe's arrival his polished cane clicking on the hardwood floor. He looks around the kitchen slowly, taking in our expressions, his wrinkled brows raising. Sky, did you use spoiled shimmer fruit in the stove circles? I banged the cooking sheet into the drying rack with a clatter and turned to him. It's Chief Engineer Mac Willie, Great Grandpa. I exclaim in frustration. He sits at the table across from Huckins as I make him a plate and explain the situation. When I finish, his lips turn down as if he's in pain. Sky is right. Chief Engineer Mac Willie, he says in his quavering voice. We cannot ask you for more. You have already saved us once, despite not being from the village. We will find another way. Mac Willie takes my place at the sink, washing her dish. And I'm telling you there's no other way. This isn't something you can run from with what you have. The corpos are going to come for the old man's ship. And they're going to find you in these trees. She places the dish in the drying rack and turns around, folding her arms across her chest. I told young Sky I'd help protect this village, and that's what I'll see done. That's my choice, not yours. Great Grandpa acts sighs, picking at his stove circles. You're right, even though I wish you'd choose differently. But, his face turns momentarily fierce, a glimpse of his younger self peeking through. If that is your choice, then you owe it to all of us to delay your end as long as possible. Each second you live is another second you can uphold your vow. Mac Willie looks startled, then bursts into her raucous laughter. I, and aren't you feisty for someone closer to the grave than myself? She smiles and tilts her head at me. I can see where young Sky gets it from. You have yourself a deal, Axe Memoriam. Besides, she marches over to the still sulking Huckins and hauls him out of his chair in a headlock. I have to teach the lad enough so he doesn't embarrass me when I'm gone. Hey. Huckins yelps, trying to pry himself away from her hair tousling grip. And I feel a small smile slip involuntarily across my lips. The dark mood suddenly banished. Even great-grandpa Axe is chuckling softly, caught up in the moment. The house feels more alive than I've ever seen, and I want to hold on to this sensation forever. Chapter 28. Hikes and Halts After finishing breakfast, we adjourn to the sitting room. I take a minute to fold my blanket up so we have more space, and then Mac Willie and Huckins join me on the sofa, the frame groaning slightly as Mac Willie plops down at the end opposite me. Great-grandpa sinks gratefully into his favorite armchair, draping his home quilt a thick length of crab roach silk embroidered with small yellow flowers, over his lower body. I examine the two engineers. So, the plan for today is to search for stuff from the wrecked ship? To build, um, an infonet receiver? Mac Willie nods, Huckins a half second behind her. I, me and the lad will accompany you to the crash site, see what components we can scrounge up. Your box is sure it'll have what we need. Tell the person who tried to hunt us down and failed miserably that despite her massive level advantage, 
I am still 472% more capable than whatever malformed shard of reality is currently infesting her psyche. My creator's ship will contain sufficient materials. Yeah, Box says everything we need will be there. Good. In that case, let's get to it. Mac Willie abruptly pushes herself away from the sofa, Huckins following suit, the two of them not even bothering to wait for their digestion to start working on the stove circles. Must be an engineer thing. I turn to Great Grandpa Axe. You'll tell Broom and the others what we're doing? He nods. Be safe, Sky. You know I will, Great Grandpa. His lips quirk and he shoes me towards the hallway leading to our front door. Mac Willie and Huckins fallen behind me as we walk out into the early morning bustle of the village. The chief engineer still wearing a set of father's clothes, so tight it looks like she's going to burst out of them with every step. Huckins Natalie adorned in some of mother's forest leathers. The tool bag hangs around his hips once more, neatly fitting through the loops in his white and brown streaked pants. I wave at some of the villagers in passing, but my stride is measured and aimed at the path leading to Watcher's Hill. Your people certainly start the day early, Mac Willie remarks, watching a girl my age, Opal Breeder, wrangle a group of little ones towards the memory shrine. There's a lot to get done, I tell her, stepping aside to let a pair of rushing bakers carrying thick leather armor pass by. Must be a crabroach silk harvesting day. The little ones need to learn, food needs to be made, water needs to be purified, broken things need to get fixed, idiots need to find their melty rocks. I beckon them onto a side path leading away from the village square. This way. We start hiking up the switchbacks that lead to the top of Watcher's Hill the crimson canopy gradually thinning out as we approach the top. It's one of the only uncovered areas in the entire forest, dotted with scattered trees like hairs on a balding man's scalp. When we reach the summit, I take a moment to breathe in the pure air, head tilted slightly back, eyes on the lightning azure overhead. We would have reached the crash site by now if we had detoured around the hill. Yeah, we would have. I turn a slow circle, enjoying the vista. The distant mountain range to the west stretching up like grasping fingers fishhook lower than it used to be, snow capping all the peaks. Foothills undulating north and south, a scrunched-up blanket of deceptive geography. Endless flatlands to the east, mottled in shades of green and red and gray and brown, extending away from the forest like diseased skin, the rising sun blazing orange above the horizon. Beside me, Chief Engineer Mac Willie whistles long and low. Hell of a view. Huckins doesn't contribute anything other than a wide-eyed stare. That's why we're here, I eventually say. This is my world. Was my world. Everything you can see from this hill. Everywhere you can walk in the forest. I gesture to the green canopy stretching below us, crimson underside hidden in the dawn stillness. Everything you can't touch above. A wave towards the wispy clouds stretching overhead. This was it. We stand in silence for a moment longer, then I start walking towards the backside of Watcher's Hill, retracing the root wires, and I took the night the starfly appended our lives. It's still vivid in my mind the burning aurora descending overhead, reducing everything to noise and light and joy and terror. We went through this part of the forest, Wires and I. No one usually comes down this side, because there's nothing past here but old forest and the end of the valley, but that night, that's where the starfly came down. I paused next to a scorched patch in the undergrowth, squatting down to run my fingers through the dark ash and pieces of broken glow light. Shoots of new growth are already reaching up through the tiny scar and I let the debris trickle through my palm. Neither of us should have been here. We should have done the smart thing, gone back to the village and told Broom, or Dirt, or Torch. Let the people who knew what they were doing take care of the new thing that appeared. It shouldn't have been us. I stand up and continue onward, leading them through the trees. Too soon, the undergrowth thins in front of me, revealing a battered expanse of churned up dirt, twisted metal, and impact craters unshielded from the clouds above a path of destruction leading up a small slope. Apart from the violated landscape, it could be any other stretch of land bordering the forest. This is where we fought the first violation. I laugh, somehow the only emotion capable of piercing the fog draping my mind. We were so scared. It was horrible, but we killed it. Wires collected the reality piece because he was the idiot. I closed my eyes, still able to picture the swirling depths of that unnatural gray orb, then reopened them. It's also where he died. They shot him with a pulse rifle. The corporate marauders. I wouldn't know that except for Box. He fell apart, like a tower of blocks toppling over. He looked so confused. I continue walking up the slope, Mac Willie and Huckins trailing silently in my wake. I pause halfway up. This is where I lost my arm. I think. I take a few more steps. 
Funny how the hill is so small, yet in my memory it seems to extend upwards forever. This is where they shot me again. In my leg. A few more steps brings me to just below the summit, mangled dirt and grass spreading to either side. I look back at them, remembering the past. This is where they shot me in the head. I remember the sky tilting above me, and then I was falling. I step onto the narrow crest, straddling the past and present. The depression in front of me is filled with fire and smoke and wreckage, hidden beneath the veil of midnight skies, a maddening chaos of pain and guilt that somehow led to my survival when I should have died. My breath catches in my throat. A hand lands on my shoulder, heavy without being oppressive, and the vision fades. I, there's debts that need paying. The solid presence of Macwilly next to me seems to draw the iron weight out of my lungs, up through my throat in a silent eruption of grief and anguish. When I can see again, the dawn light illuminates a placid field dotted with dark piles of debris, some still smoldering even days later, others quiet in their towering magnitude. More signs of battle dot the churned up earth, slashes and slices drawing deep trenches across the soil, gouged divots and blackened grass evidence of the fury let loose. I take a moment to breathe, then place a hand on top of hers. Thank you. I think of wires drawing the invader's attention, of Box telling me about biomass and necessary actions. Not all of them are yours. She regards me seriously, like she knows what I'm talking about, like she's watched those she's cared for disappear in front of her eyes. For all that we're from such different backgrounds, we might as well be different species. I, let's get to work. The next ten minutes pass in a fairly boring manner, Mac Willie asking Huckins for certain tools from the bag, taking a quick look at them, then instructing him on whatever it is he's supposed to be noticing. I spend the time trying to recreate the frenzied battle box guided me through after I rolled to a stop against its initial housing, but nothing seems to trigger any sort of recollection. Intense trauma is frequently accompanied by localized memory loss, Sky. If you want, I can try to reconstruct the events from an extrapolation of the surrounding engrams. No. It's okay, Box. Thank you for offering. Instead, I sit back on the downslope of the hill, staring out at the wreckage below. Nothing moves in the growing daylight except for shadows slowly shrinking. Under the glare of the morning sun, the starfly is somehow less and more impressive. Less in that it's clearly a manufactured thing, evincing none of the organic randomness of the natural creatures inhabiting the forest, more in that it's clearly a manufactured thing. Evincing none of the organic randomness of the natural creatures inhabiting the forest, and yet it moved through the sky above the sky. I don't understand how these layers of black steel and shiny metal and wires pointing every which way could possibly fight their way free of a planet's pull. But they did. Someone made them for that purpose. Non-causal engines for the faster-than-light and orbital stuff. Plasma thrusters for normal maneuvering. Light has a speed? I shake my head. No, don't answer that. I believe you. Mac Willie and Huckins walk up to where I'm sitting, the latter poking at the pane of glass they used to measure the trees yesterday. Hey, Mac Willie, Huckins. Find anything? I, me, and the lad have identified several sites that have the parts we need. But there's a catch. Her tone is serious, a change from her usual jocularity. We're also picking up signs of non-causal flux. What does that mean? It's Huckins who answers. Means the universe is thinner down there. Easier for reality to break through. He turns to Mac Willie. Chief, I still don't understand how you know it's going to breach. There's non-causal chop everywhere around here. Except for the forest, I guess. Experience, lad, Mac Willie answers grimly. Seen more than a few engines try and shift bad after a heavy draw. Looking at that wreckage gives me the same feel. If you say so, chief, he replies, doubt lacing his voice. It's just, the sensor's not showing any breach indicators. Aye, and that's a lesson for you to learn today, young Master Huckins. There's a time for listening to the machines, and there's a time to listen to your gut. Reality doesn't play fair, but your integrator can help you figure out when shit's about to hit the impeller. She's right. I'm picking up anchors down there. Two. No. Three of them. Don't tell her I said she was right. Three malignant red dots appear in my vision, each in one of the massive wrecked sections of the starfly. Box agrees with you. There are three anchors. I point out the structures to Mac Willie and Huckins, and she purses her lips. Figures. That's where we need to scavenge the parts for the receiver probably drawn to the components. She turns and spits. The lad and I won't be able to get down there until they're cleared out. We're not specialized for that kind of combat. I'm not detecting any other signs of violations. If we act quick, we can take out the anchors before reinforcements arrive. Their boundary dissolution isn't manifesting past the wreckage they're hiding in, 
so they can't be very powerful. I relay the information to Mac Willie, and she frowns. I, if you think you can do it, it needs to be done. Be cautious, though. My gut's telling me there's something more. While I admit she was right about the anchors being there, her gut isn't a reality sensor. We'll be fine, Sky. Let's go make numbers go up. I push myself into a standing position with my limbs. Okay. Box thinks we'll be fine. You two take cover behind the hill just in case it's wrong. I'm not wrong, Sky. This is a quick in and out. Easy levels. Mac Willie and Huckins wish me luck, then head to the other side of the hill, just the tops of their heads peeking over the top. I crack my knuckles, then start running down towards the wreckage, dashing past the smaller pieces of debris spotting the lower part of the hill. I reach the bottom without incident and make my way towards the closest anchor. It's tucked away in a chunk of ship nearly as tall as one of the elder trees, wide entrances periodically climbing its height. The other two are farther off, in a reasonably straight line. I should be able to. The world flickers around me mid-stride, peaceful morning sunshine shifting into an inverted sky of churning sickly yellow liquid, held impossibly overhead as I skid to a stop on a blasted plane of sticky glass. Eyes peer at me from underfoot, changing color and shape as they blink. Three figures regard me in the distance, hulking forms twice as big as Mac Willie. The closest is a spinning wheel with a flaming head in the middle, five eyes above a misshapen nose that constantly drips wriggling blobs of eye core all of it floating a meter off the viscous ground. Beyond it, a cluster of wires wraps around themselves in an impossible knot, so loosely tied it squeezes the air around it into a warped lens. Red lightning flickers between the gaps in almost patterns. The farthest figure paces back and forth, a hunched-over humanoid with gray skin, back always facing me, whispered muttering drifting from its hidden front despite the distance. No matter how it moves, the orientation of its body never changes. Below them, a tide of violation slithers and claws their way towards me, a mass of bodies without end. I was wrong, Sky. No shit. Box. Chapter 29, Mobius and Asubum. Where are we? I spin around, looking for any sort of cover, but no matter which direction I turn the view is the same, disturbing yellow liquid sky overhead, eyes trapped beneath malleable glass underfoot. A horde of violations growing closer and closer as the three monstrous figures remain in their places. Why does it all look the same? Crack, crack, crack. My rifle is already firing, picking holes in the oncoming rush, but it's not making any difference in the number of violations. I try to step backwards, but the sticky transparent ground glues my foot to the floor. Reality loop, only way out, is removing the anchors. Playtime. Pete the cat jumps out of my shadow and stretches, arching its midnight back, then bounces forward in a graceful lope. After two sinuous strides, it disappears from view, then reappears several seconds later even further away. It sits down and looks back at me, as if wondering why I'm not joining it. Can't believe. I'm saying, this, follow, the entity. I take off after Pete, swearing under my breath. For steps later the world flickers again, and I'm back in the wreckage site, closer to the giant structure housing the first anchor. There's no sign of the violations anywhere. I stumble to a halt again. What dash? No time. Keep running. I burst into motion again, trusting box. We're in a modified Klein bottle topography. I can explain what that is later. What you need to know is that every 10 meters you move towards the anchor you're going to alternate between. The other dimension slides into place around me, Pete lazily washing a paw. The violations are even closer now. My rifle starts firing again. Your reality, and this, piece of, reality. Pete springs forward and this time I'm right behind it. We flicker back and forth between worlds, drawing closer to the incoming violations in the floating wheel of the first anchor, simultaneously entering the lowest entrance to the starfly wreckage. It's an extremely disorienting feeling, like the universe is constantly melting and reforming around me, and the sticky glass shifts up and down to mimic whatever elevation I'm on when I pass back. The dim gloom of the wreckage slides away to roiling sulfur light and the violations are now close enough to bring my cookery into action. The trusty blade dips in and out of malformed flesh, my rifle continuing to pick off distant targets, and Pete contemptuously carves through violation after violation, fractal claws shining strangely in the bruised illumination as it pounces and swipes. Lashing hits bang off my marauder chestplate, repelled by the durable material, but I can't dodge them all. Current life. 522-550. We break through the wall of violations into another reality shift, 
deep within the starfly wreckage, scattered detritus of unknown purpose surrounding me. The red dot is getting closer, matched by the growing bulk of the five-eyed head in the other dimension. I catch a quick breath, then charge onward once more. This time when I emerge into reality, a red warning zone flashes around me. I swear and dash away, just in time to avoid a maw of putrescent icor that emerges from the glass, snapping shut where I just stood. The fang mouth dissolves, bubbly fluid flowing back into the floating head's bulbous nose. The wheel bracketing it spins faster as violations continue to fall around me. The head is finally in rifle range. Executing 360 no scope.exe. Current energy 30 180. Blasts of force rock the head backward, puncturing all but one of the eyes. It squeals as it returns to its original position inside the wheel, a horrible blubbering sound, and the disc speeds into a blur. Crimson threat light covers the entire area surrounding me and Pete. Sky. I'm already moving, sprinting directly towards the anchor. One step. Two steps. I leap forward right as the air ignites in a welter of flaming barbs. The world shifts back into my reality, a quiet and cavernous chamber that stretches all around me. Some sort of metal pillar extends from floor to ceiling in the distance, a red outline surrounding it. My limb fires a rifle shot, puncturing the hushed silence, but the bullet just pings off the pillar. It's impervious in this reality. We'll have to kill it in the other realm. I groan, then start running again. Way too soon, the world flickers me back into the maelstrom of madness. More violations pour towards me and Pete, and I notice some inky threads trailing away from its tail, flowing back into my own shadow. I dash to the side, dicing another group into nothingness and slightly easing the pressure assailing my cat. You okay? Pete? Annoying food. Pete swats another two violations into nothingness, then bites off the head of a third. Another threat indicator burns to life around us, and I dash forward, narrowly avoiding a stinging hail of needle-like missiles composed of hardened icor. Once again, it flows back into the head's nose after the attack completes, but that's not what catches my attention. All four of the ruined eyes have regenerated, spinning pupils locked on my own. The will starts increasing in speed again. Shit. Come on, Pete. I dive forward through a barrage of heavy strikes, shifting back into my reality as the flaming barbs manifest across the air, a thicket of unthinkable pain that slips away like a forgotten dream. I pause to think, the metal pillar in front of us almost mocking in its solidity. Pete prowls back and forth, inky fur bristling. Hunt. Kill annoying food. Yeah. I'm trying, Pete. Box, what are we going to do? That was our strongest attack. The only possibility is to close in and overwhelm it before it can regenerate. It will leave us open to attack from the violations, however. If that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. Let's go, Pete. I begin another run at the pillar, anticipating the reality shift. Sure enough, we slip through dimensions after another two steps, violations spinning and snapping at us. I barrel through them, Pete a buzzsaw of inky death. Current life, for 70 slash 550. The floating head is a little over 20 scrumbles away. 20, 2, meters. When normal reality reasserts itself, the pillar looms before us, a broad expanse of scorched metal piercing the center of the chamber. This close to it, it's obvious it doesn't belong here. Peter rowls angrily at it, but we don't stop moving. The next shift sees the floating head looming over us, spinning eyes glaring balefully. The whirring wheel makes a barely audible screeching noise that immediately puts me on edge, a horrible combination of metal on glass on tooth on bone. Icor spears start lashing out at me and Pete, and I focus on dodging while getting close enough for Box to bring the cookery into action. Current life, for 38 slash 550. Milky orbs rupture into rancid fluids, more awful squeals gurgling out, but no matter how fast we attack, no matter how much stronger each subsequent blow lands, it's not fast or strong enough. The eyes keep knitting back up, Icor spears slicing shallow gashes along my arms and legs, flicking ebon pieces of peat back into my shadow. Current life, 352 slash 550. A field of red blazes around us again, the sticky glass underfoot keeping me from retreating. I try to time up the orange pulse, searching for the right moment to energy jack. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Current energy, 22 slash 180. My violent reflections pierce the head from ten different angles, but it's too soon, and it's not enough. Incandescent barbs bury themselves across my face and head, lashing my own vision with acidic hate, cruelly hooked points tearing themselves free in starbursts of agony. I scream in pain. Current life, 124-550. Box's attacks slow, 
phase shift doing its best to minimize the damage. I lose vision across the left side of my body. More i spears flash in, laughter echoing in their oily depths, the unending tide of violations piling in behind. Current life, 97 550. This isn't working, I rasp, desperately dashing side to side, trying to clear out a space. Next to me, Pete is an incomprehensible whirlwind of claws and teeth, felling violations by the dozen, but it's only enough to barely keep us alive. The wheel begins accelerating once again, the floating head gazing down at me like some perverted mockery of a judge. Don't. Understand. Anchor should be. Dead. Not enough. Disruption. To its form. Bloody light embraces us. No escape visible to my half-blinded sight. Violations are trying to bury Pete beneath a pile of rending teeth and tentacles, their efforts slowly succeeding. I rack my mind for a solution, but all I can focus on is that unmoving head. That form that hasn't shifted once, despite everything we've thrown at it. As if it's locked to a specific location. Pete. Follow me. Executing nothing personnel.exe. Current energy. 11 180. Sadistic silhouettes buy us a moment of freedom, and I bowl my way through the overwhelming press of unreal flesh, Pete limping to my side. I'm making my way to a very specific point. Current life, 41 550. A point that's exactly 5 meters away from the center of the floating head. I rest a hand on Pete's silken back, not knowing if what I'm planning will work, but certain it will. Dash. Reality melts around us, replaced by a claustrophobic chamber of writhing runes the space barely big enough to contain us. Jagged edges crawl their way through each other in endless loops, moving faster and faster, frantic in their attempt to escape, and Pete and I smile. I was right. We're inside the pillar, and this is the anchor's body. Pete and Box strike simultaneously, cookery and claws rending vast swathes of illegibility across the wretched scrolls. One last gibbering squeal echoes through the column, and then it shatters around us, evaporating into immateriality. Our triumph is short-lived. Reality shifts again, dragging us back into the blasted wasteland even though I haven't moved. Up above, the floating head explodes in a welter of eye core and sound, violations shivering into non-existence all around, but that's not what grabs my attention. The sulfuric sky is curving towards the horizon, frothy chop battering its surface, and then suddenly we're standing on top of a frozen wave that's moving in a hundred different directions, glass-shrouded changeling eyes gazing down on us from above. The second anchor, that impossible knot of red lightning and wires, sinks into the murky depths and dissolves, black veins tracing labyrinth patterns amidst the yellow. Beyond it, somehow taking up the gap between ceiling and floor, a hunched gray figure is staring at us from the corner of its eye, wisps of something shrouding the rest of its features. Box, what the foo dash? It's inverting the topography. Sky, we need to move. I'm dashing forward before I can think spurred on by the raw panic of Box's words. Void black filigree beneath my limbs flashes red, painting a sudden blood system across the endless waves. I try to outrun it, but there's nowhere safe from the threats. Symphonic lightning grounds itself in my ears, resonating inimical harmonies into my brain. Current life, 3 of 550. Nap time. Pete flees to my shadow as I stagger forward, momentarily stunned. Fuck. Sky, it's a pure reality attack. That anchor's pouring everything into forcing you to acknowledge the topography as a hostile surface. I can carve out a safe space, but you won't have much time to act. Before I can answer, the blood system flares to life again, except this time there's a gap in the red. I leap forward and dash. Stabbing tendrils of slow-motion lightning crawl up from the waves in an endless eye blink, tips questing in all directions. As quickly as they come, they disappear, leaving me unharmed. Good work. Keep dodging, Sky and we'll make it out of this. You're doing great. The yellow water flares again, and once again I dash. It's a little easier than the time before to find the gap. Excellent. You're a natural, Sky. Box's words fill me with confidence, and the next dash is like I've finally learned how to walk. I can feel the gaps, know exactly where Box is going to open the next one. This is an evasion. This is boring. There's no way I'm going to get caught by this stupid attack anymore. I can feel my vision expanding with my confidence, stored biomass reconstructing my ruined eye. A shape coheres beneath my feet as I dance across the waves, hazily transparent at first, gradually filling in form and complexity. A cluster of looping wires drawing tighter and tighter around themselves, crimson lightning erupting frantically as it shrinks. With an audible pop, it disappears, and the sulfuric ocean falls still. Second one down. Good work. I look around, confused. 
but I didn't attack it. That was a conceptual battle, Sky. You were fighting to assert your belief that this slice of reality included the infinities where the anchor couldn't hurt you. I helped reinforce it with positive feedback. We should probably deal with the last anchor before we celebrate, though. The glass sky suddenly twists around the frozen yellow sea, perspective shifting so that I'm looking down at the impossibly distant gray humanoid's bloodshot gaze. The tendrils of something cloaking the rest of its features writhe and clutch, drawing the entire reality down into its wildly vibrating pupil in a swirling vortex of sticky glass and noxious liquid, red threat zones pulsing in stutter-stop jerks. I feel myself pulled towards the horizon convergence point, slow movement that accelerates into a headlong rush despite the fact I'm standing still. A whistling roar builds around me, the harbinger of indeterminate terminality. Within the whirlpool, cracked reflections of broken mouths start spitting hooks of bloody metal, trying to pin me in place. What do we do now? I yell, contorting my body through dodge after dodge. I have no idea how to fight what feels like a force of nature. One hook pierces my left heel, slowing my movements, then another catches my right arm. Box fires our rifle at the cackling mouths, shattering them into splintered messes, but we continue falling deeper, Vermilion threat warnings flickering on and off like box is malfunctioning, a barrage of hooks stabbing through me from all angles. Current life, 7 of 550. Warning, biomass reserves depleted. It's almost finished, inverting, the bottle. Need to get out, while it's still, only one-sided. What do we do? Dash through, the terminus, energy jack. I gulp, staring down at that all-encompassing gaze that feels like it's about to engulf me then start sprinting at it. Chunks of malleable mirror rise out of the whirlpool walls, more mouths appearing inside, and my world is reduced to movement. Spinning, diving, rolling, leaping, swinging, I bounce my way ever closer, pushing my body through motions that are nothing but pure instinct. Bloody hooks flash by my face as I twist and twirl, the sensation of falling in place oddly growing less and less potent the quicker I approach the malicious orb filling the entire horizon. Somehow, I find a way to move even faster, threat zones blurring into a continuous scarlet haze, and I spring into a mighty leap aimed at the converging sea and sky. Time stops for a frozen instant, my hurtling form face to face with a bulging pupil the size of an entire world, a distorted reflection echoed in its abyssal depths. It feels close enough that I could reach out and touch the moist surface, shake hands with some alternate me. Orange light pool. Dash. SES, and a universe consumes itself behind me as I rocket through a tunnel of pure contradiction. Thankfully time has no meaning here, because if it did I'm sure I would go insane. Reality reasserts itself around me between one thought and the next, my body flying between two sections of the starfly, tumbling across the soft dirt until I come to a halt on my back, staring up at the early morning sky. Patches of puffy clouds hang in place across the bright blue, and I feel iron bands of tension slowly melting away. Box. Yes, Sky. If you ever say something is a quick in and out, easy levels again, I'm going to kill you. A weary aral sounds in agreement from my shadow. That's fair. Chapter 30 Fishes and Flowers. I give myself another few minutes of laying out and simply enjoying being alive, then rise to my feet. I need to find Mac Willie and Huckins and let them know it's safe to start salvaging the starfly. Ding. Ugh. Fine. Let's get this over with. You know I hate this right? Put one expression into increased move speed. My strides through the wreckage speed up as I do what Box says, each step becoming more fluid and efficient. My walking pace is now close to Dirt's light jog. What do I do with the other two? You're doing this on purpose, aren't you? Not at all. Put the other two expressions in dash recovery rate. Nothing immediate happens, and I shrug. Well, that didn't do much. We're building to something, Sky. Have patience. That's rich, coming from you. I mutter under my breath. What was that? I couldn't hear you over my excitement at being able to display this other box. Impossibility matrix expansion available. Non-causal storage, one-fifth. Transmutation, zero slash five. Reality effectuator, two-fourths. I don't mind that box. It's much more dignified. Should I pick another limb? Correct. We won't need transmutation until we get a molecular forge up and going. I make the choice, and a third appendage of fuzzed bone white wavers into place next to me. We can attune the pistol to it. I took the liberty of packing for you when nobody was paying attention. It's in the non-causal storage. Well, wasn't that thoughtful of you, Box? Let's take a look in Dash. 
My voice trails off as I access the non-causal storage space, a window of knowledge expanding in my mind. Box, why is there a pistol and 49 kilograms of day-old fish in the storage? Where did you even get that much fish? Emergency biomass. They were in the river and were not trees. Ergo, fair game. My eyes suddenly widen, imagining a pile of day-old fish lacking any form of preservative. That storage dimension, it keeps them fresh, right? The optimal temperature for ideal biomass consumption is 37.2 degrees Celsius. And that's a low temperature, right? Pretty cold. Compared to the surface of a star, yes. Practically freezing. I will now restock our reserves. Wait dash. A dripping pile of bubbling meat appears in front of me, just as quickly devoured by my limbs. But it's in our reality for long enough. The stench hits me like a brick wall, and hot saliva fills my mouth. Box. Erp. Can you? MMM peach consume them. Pork. Directly from storage. HNG HH. Of course, sky. A thick slurping sound, the audible equivalent of that stench, fills my head, and I stagger out from the wreckage of the starfly, one hand clasped to my rebelling stomach, the other over my mouth. Distant shouting comes from the hilltop, and then Mac Willie and Huckins are racing towards me. Sky, are you okay? I vomit, barely missing Huckins' boots, and he dances away from the noxious puddle. One of my limbs swoops down to clean it up, which causes me to vomit again, a thin stream of bile. A second limb intersperses itself between my mouth and the ground, sucking up the yellowish stomach fluids as they fall, and I try to puke once more, stomach muscles cramping, but this time nothing comes out. I want to fall over and die. Mac Willie grabs my shoulders, stabilizing me, concern writ across her face. Is it some sort of poison? Non-causal status effects aren't a thing to muck around with. Do we need to take you back to your healer? Fish? I croak, my throat stinging. I wipe a hand across my streaming eyes and spit, trying to rid my mouth of the taste. It was fish. Mac Willie and Huckins slowly turn and stare at each other, wearing equal expressions of bewilderment. Fish. Box slurps out another kilogram from my inventory and I gag. Mac Willie's hands the only things keeping me from collapsing to the dirt. Box stored 49 kilograms of day-old fish in my storage space, and then he brought one out to eat. They both return their attention to me, then Mac Willie burst into laughter. I, and if you're alive to complain about a wee little fishy, that must mean you've cleared out the anchors. Surely those were the worst of the two, right? Huckins hesitantly joins in her laughter, and I brace my hands on my knees, determined to keep myself from collapsing. Box, why don't you give them a sniff? Another melting abomination appears in front of my face, my limbs making short work of it, but it's enough for the stench to return. Mac Willie lets go of my shoulders, her face turning green, and she stumbles several steps away before letting loose a torrent of her own. Huckins collapses in a boneless faint. Told? You. I gasp out in between dry heaves. It was the fish. Ten minutes later, after Mac Willie and I have collected ourselves and slapped Huckins back into sensibility, and I've instructed Box on the proper methods of food preservation, we've decided on a plan to explore the theoretically safe remains of the starfly. It mainly involves me escorting Mac Willie and Huckins to the appropriate salvage sites in case another reality breach happens, and then waiting around while they do incomprehensible engineer nonsense. Fortunately, this time the plan goes off without a hitch, and we return to the village three hours later with everything we need for the Infonet receiver, the majority of it tucked away in my now thankfully empty of rotting fish storage space. Huckins' tool bag carrying the rest. Box attuned the pistol somewhere along the way but I haven't forgiven it yet for exposing me to that sanity-breaking horror. It was perfectly viable biomass. I was trying to make you feel better. The smell of rotting fish doesn't make anyone feel better, Box. Disagreement. Oh, shut up, Pete. You've been sleeping this whole time, you lazy bag of dash. Nap time. I'm left spluttering as we draw to a halt next to wire sapling, the heart seat I planted yesterday still festooned with Mac Willie's measuring equipment. She checks it all one last time, then motions for me and Huckins to unload the various pieces they disassembled from the starfly. I start piling the inscrutable shapes in neat rows under the bright noon glare, trying not to imagine I can still taste the smell of putrefying fish on my tongue. Are you going to use his tree? I ask her once all the components for the receiver have been laid out. Some of them look like they're not quite occupying the space they should be. Mac Willie glances over at me. Where you buried your friend? She shakes her head. No. Young Sky, for something like this we need a proper engine, 
and now that I know the knowing of getting inside, he'll rest in peace a while yet. She beckons Huckins to join her, then begins assembling a framework around one of the elder trees bordering the clearing. The pieces latch onto the tree in strange meldings, as if they've always grown out of the trunk that way. Mac Willie narrates her actions in a low voice to Huckins, who watches with a studious attentiveness and joins in when instructed. Aren't you worried this will make you reach level 100, Chief Mac Willie? I can't help myself. I'm nervous watching her work, watching her sacrifice herself for our village. Her initial response is a braying laugh. This, young Sky? I've broken down and reassembled Infonet receivers across a thousand star systems. I'm in no danger of leveling from putting together one more, even if the power source is a tad unconventional. I don't really get how the levels work, I admit honestly. Her and Huckins and Box constantly speak of levels, something I think I've come to understand via context, in that our integrators gain more power when the reality buffer reaches full and we clear it, but the idea comes to them with an ease I don't yet feel. The easiest way to gain levels is when we do something new. Mac Willie starts, then smacks Huckins' hand away from where he's about to insert a piece. Not that way, you daft get. Resonance harmonizers always go in counter-counterclockwise. Sorry, chief. Anyways, as I was saying, she grabs another receiver piece from the forest floor. Expanding your mind expands your integrator's infinities, which gives you more options in how it can access reality. Would I be wrong in thinking you've been gaining multiple levels at a time from your encounters? I nod in assent, and she nods back. Aye, and you'll likely keep gaining those levels at an accelerated rate because everything in the galaxy is going to be new to you. That's why we don't let children integrate until at least eight years of age and some basic schooling. Otherwise, they'd reach the madness point before they'd ever had a chance to live. And that's inefficient for the corpos, Huckins adds sourly. I, lad, that it is. They prefer us to go out in our 20s so they can take advantage of the integrator as long as possible. Then how'd you get to be so old? I ask. Mac Willie pretends to be affronted. You wound my heart, young Sky, calling a winsome lass such as myself old. She adjusts a pair of dials and laughs. It's true though. I'm well past the age most people vacate their mind, and it's because I grew up in the Church of the Never God. Studied reality at my own mother's breast. Learned the ins and outs of engine maintenance from both my father's hands, so when it came time to integrate, I already knew more than most level 50s. Made leveling slower at the start, but I've outlasted all of my crewmates in the engine rooms. There's not much I haven't seen, which means I gained most of my levels through repetition and perfecting the abilities I have, and that takes much longer. I fall silent for a minute, thinking. But if that's the case, why don't the corpos make sure children are educated? That they know as much as possible? Wouldn't that make them stronger and allow people to live longer? They do, Huckins interrupts, voice still bitter, but it's only for the rich. He stomps over for another receiver piece, a curved piece of metal that shrinks and grows depending on how he holds it. Those corpo bastards don't even sniff an integrator until they've passed those fancy schools they have. I've Mac Willie's mirth fades, the lad's not wrong about that either. The children of corpo leaders live a very different youth than the rest of us makes them a right terror when they finally do get integrated. A level 20 upper board member is easily as powerful as a level 90 space dog raised up normal, and they've got a whole mess of underlings that V.E. gone through the same schools. That's not fair. Stride and conviction fills my voice. If everyone is going to help the village to the best of their abilities, they have to know what those abilities are. The universe isn't fair, young Sky, Mac Willie shrugs, but that's the way it is, and no one's come along to say otherwise. What the corpos have works well enough at keeping us alive, and that's all most folk care about. Watching a corpo VP grow old and wrinkled while your brothers and sisters turn into cogs for the machine is just the price you pay to stay safe from reality. My fingers dig into my palms, an unexpected anger striking me. What Mac Willie and Huckins are describing runs counter to everything I've been taught, everything that's kept the village stable over the years. If we lived our lives like that, everything would fall apart. Their system is unhealthy. It's flawed. Rewriting core assumptions. You're right, Sky. It's not sustainable. Unfortunately, it's sustainable enough that it won't break in our lifetime, or multiple lifetimes after that. There's nothing we can do. I clench my hands one more time, then let my anger fade. Box is right. Worrying about something I can't change is an unhealthy mental habit. I don't have to like what the corpos are doing, and I'll change it if I get the chance, but it's all the more reason to focus on what I can affect which is making sure the village is safe. I think back on Mac Willie's initial response. So, setting up this, 
Infonet receiver won't level you. But what about the incognito field? Isn't using that to hide the village something new, like tapping into the trees? I, Mac Willie chuckles grimly, that'll probably be what gets me, but don't waste your breath on that, young Sky. When it's time, it'll be time, and that's for me to worry about. With Huckins' help, she attaches one last piece to the elder tree's trunk, flips some switches, then they both step back, examining the forest giant critically. The pale bark is covered in flowing gray metal that dips in and out of the trunk like vines, a living extension of the tree itself, and patterns of golden light pulse regularly across the surfaces like tiny wildflowers. One by one, the lights flicker over to a steady green, and then the whole system flashes once and settles into an indistinct haze, visible only when I'm directly looking at it, and even then it tries to squirm away from my attention. Good work on the dimensional twist, young Master Huckins, Mac Willie says approvingly, and Huckins blushes. She turns slightly to include me. We installed the receiver out of phase with this reality so your people won't be able to see it. Keep their minds from melting out on a forest stroll. I appreciate that, I reply drilly. What about the infonet? Still coming online, Mac Willie responds. Has to calibrate itself to the local galactic signal field. We won't be able to send, but we'll be able to listen in on anything within 20,000 light years. What's a light you dash? My voice cuts off as a new sense flowers open in my mind. Dazed, I stare off into nothingness, all my attention on the massive jungle of information expanding in all directions, overwhelming in its unfathomable intensity. It's like I'm in a room filled with a million different conversations, and all I have to do is think about one to focus in on it. Words, images, pictures that move, words that move, an endless jumble of language and ideas that beckon me to understand them until it feels like the top of my head is going to unscrew itself from all the stimuli. An accumulation of knowledge that our memory shrine would sink into without a trace. Ah. It's good to be back, Box, Mac Willie, and Huckins Chorus. I sink to the forest floor, overwhelmed. Where do I even start? 